Broadway's my beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The carnival scream rises high on Broadway, carried high on plumes of neon light, and its shape is of many things. The metallic anguish of a trumpet shriek, the futile beating against closed doors, the laughter, bargained for, bought, paid for, under the winking girl on the spectacular. Broadway's scream rises, shatters into fragments of glitter, prowls through the city, and finally touches you. Wherever you are, it touches you. For me, it was a phone call. A girl dying, it said, from a jackknife in a dime a dance palace on Broadway. Come to it, Danny. Maybe you can grab yourself a free dance. The welcome committee is out, the pale girls with the scarlet streaked across their mouths and the restless scarlet-tipped hands playing in the spinning lights, reaching out for you. Someone called, said a girl was hurt. Where is she? Me, I called. Sure you don't want to dance with one of those girls first? Where is she? You're square. You're a square policeman. Come on, I'll take you to her. George is the neat type. Don't like to spoil the fun. That's why she picked the lonesome lounge to die in. You got her picked out where you're gonna die. You should. You really should. The lounge with beaded curtains. With Georgia. Get out. Go dance. It's all right, Danny. You? You, Georgia? Me, Danny. Fran can stay. She's my good friend. Okay if she watches me die, isn't it? Who did it, Georgia? A dancer. Keen dancer. You should have been here for his mambo dancing. It was a show. Who? He stabbed you, Georgia. That makes it all right to tell me. Who was it? He bought five dollars worth of tickets. A man like that, you feel you know. Don't ask his name. It spoils it. With this knife? <laughs> yeah. While dancing. I'm keeping it for a souvenir. Make sure it's with me in the coffin, huh, Danny? Promise. You're a long way from home, Georgia. What brought you here? I like it here. Come here a lot. It's peaceful. The man blows the bugle so peaceful. The crowd, Georgia? Will the boys in the crowd stab you because you're not liked anymore? How can you talk when he's... Listen to it, Danny. Listen. A girl feels young again with music like that. A girl... After that, the place got cluttered up. People started to come into the lounge, policemen with notebooks, a woman in a tweed suit with a press card in her hat band, a couple of men with a stretcher. The only thing the doctor picked up on his stethoscope was a trumpet blowing what is called the blues, because there was no heartbeat from Georgia Gray, because she was dead. Find out why. <laughs> Go now to Mott Street, where it intersects an alley whose name no one remembers. Climb four flights of stairs and wonder briefly why the quality of sound and light in a tenement is like nothing else in the world. And walk a corridor where mice and men live together in perfect tolerance. And stop at a door. Stand in the light a little bit more so I'll know who's... It's Danny Clover, Benny. Uh, you come at the check? I'm okay, I'm okay. May I come in? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay, Danny, I'm okay. Except for the stomach. It hurts when I press it. You've been behaving yourself, Benny? Well, since I got out of the hospital, sure, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm beating now. 
They taught me to make things out of beads when I was resting in a ward. Belt buckles and ladies' uh, accessories. You know why I came here, don't you? I ain't a stool pigeon no more, Danny. I get cured of that, too. I'm a, I'm a beater now. Who killed Georgia Gray? I'm a beater. How long since you checked in with your parole officer, Benny? Oh, Danny. What about Georgia? You know as much as me. Georgia was close to Nicky Gowan. You know that. Bought his shirts for him. Ran down the drugstore for him. What's the word on Nicky? The crowd ain't happy with him, Danny. Oh, Danny, leave me alone. I got an order from a lady down the hall for a love bracelet. I got to deliver to there or I'll be breaking my contract. Nothing else, huh? Say, help me, Danny. Nothing. Where's Nick again? Uh, I'm a beater now. Well, you, huh? Off your beaten path, aren't you, Danny? Inside, Nicky. Don't strong arm, Danny. I was going to invite you in anyway. Georgia Gray, Nicky. She's dead. Word came to me how you closed her eyes. I wish it had been me. Maybe you got there ahead of me, Nicky. Maybe you went dancing, saw Georgia in a place you never thought she'd be. Killed her because she was getting away from you. <laughs> oh, you're tired, Danny. Awful tired. No one gets away from me, not even the dead. Come on into the den. I want you to meet my mother. She'll be hurt. I don't show her my friends. All right, Nicky. I wouldn't want her to be hurt. You'll wish yours had been like her. Just wait. Mother, look what I brought you, Danny Clover. Sit down, Danny. Have a mint. Nicky has a made-up special for me. Thanks. Well, special, huh? Nothing too good for my mother. It's always been like that with my son. Up to now. Nicky hasn't been good? He let his girl die in a cheap place. Dancing with another man for pay, for dimes. That cheap was his name. You could have stopped it, Nicky? How could I have known, Mother? I told you. Don't snap at me, Nicky boy. I'll slap your mouth. Wash it out with doit. Georgia liked that hole, Danny. I never understood why. She tried to explain it to me about the music, about dancing. Crazy for dancing. Who understands these things in a girl? When she had everything a girl... Everything you gave her. Everything you worked hard for. You're getting your share, huh, Mother? The funeral, too, Nicky? Will you buy me one like the one you're buying for Georgia? Let me show you the invoices, Danny. I never knew dying came so high. Inflation, huh? Maybe it'll wipe out the taste of what happened to her. Where it happened to her. It's just a maybe, son. Don't build a monument on it. <laughs> you want to know why they killed her, Danny? You know, Mrs. Gannon? They think my son is finished, done, used up. They killed a girl to frighten my Nicky boy. And you know what? My boy's frightened. Who does that to you, Nicky? Your friends? Your boys? You know when you see their bodies on a slab. It'll be in all the papers. You'll save the clippings for me, huh, Nicky? Oh, isn't she a dream, Danny? I told you. Wonderful girl, my mother. When I got back to headquarters, there was a file on my desk. The neatly centered sticker on its front cover was typed Georgia Gray. Open it, read it, digest it. Georgia Gray, aged between 25 and 29, computed from data gathered from arrests. Hometown, Salina, Kansas. Followed a soldier to New York port of embarkation in 1943, but never caught up with him. So she stayed. Counter girl in a 5 and 10. Then model for ladies' garments. Then nightclub hostess. And two years ago in night court... After losing a race with a squad car, she said she'd retired. Because I don't have to work anymore, she said. No a better reason, she asked. Name linked with Nicky Gannon from here on in. Address Park Avenue. Expenses shared by Fran Holland, who said now she'll have to look around. First thing I'm going to do is get another roommate. Did you get along well with Georgia? She had her ideas, I had mine. You know what I mean? Tell me. No, this and that. Georgia was what, a pretty girl? I'd say she was beautiful. Yeah, I guess she was very beautiful. Very. Ah, but she was ruining it. Ran around, danced, but she didn't enjoy herself. I know she didn't. She only enjoyed herself relaxing here with me. Something I haven't made up my mind about. Well, you better make up your mind about it, Danny. Sure. She had all that dough, and she lived with a dance hall hostess with me. You know why? Because she needed someone like me. To run home to, huh? 
Right. So she could have soft hands rubbing the back of her neck. To bring her cold tomatoes when she needed it. She run the orphan, friend? Look, Danny, she was dance happy. That's why she hung around the place I worked. A little bit of music and a guy in a high waistband with two strong feet could make her smile like she was happy. Did Nicky Gannon mind that she stepped out on him? Why did Nicky care? He used it for a front for his business. He didn't care about a dance. Who killed her, friend? A man. What else but a man? What man? Who? You know what you ought to do, Danny? You know Tommy Chandler? Nicky's hood? The padded shoulder that stands near Nicky with his hand in his pocket. Ask Tommy. See how he reacts when you ask him. You know where Tommy is? I know where he'll be in the morning. You know where the ducks are in that pond in Central Park? Eight o'clock, he throws them bread. Stale bread. But what do ducks know? That one over there likes pump a nickel, Danny. Here, give him a piece. we will make an impression. We got none of these advantages at city jail, Tommy. You gonna arrest me, kid? No. Ducks will miss me. You want a piece of pump a nickel, too, Harm? Sure you do. You see how Harm looked at me, Danny? Sad. Like he already knows about the arrest. What are you taking me down for? We'll think of something. Feeding the pintails in Central Park? I won't be able to hold up the head for the shame, huh? Let's go, kid. That's your squad car over there? You got to blush when I say suspicion of murder? That's been done to me, too. Hmm. You didn't come out for a long time. Georgia. You got me case for that. Georgia was murdered. Maybe Nicky Gannon goes, too. The whole crowd will miss him. I'll tell you something else. Whoever stabbed George ain't gonna be around long, ain't he? The crowd will see to that, huh? I didn't say that. I just said a prediction, that's all. Who takes over if Nicky is rubbed, Tommy? You? Take over what? A backroom poker game for matchsticks? What are you talking about? Look, well, baby, arrest me if you want, but don't ask me stupid questions. It makes Herm nervous. Here, Herm. Here you are, boy. Herm looked sad when I took Tommy away from him. All the ducks looked sad. For a minute. Then they found a new love with a stale loaf of bread. Swam away, screaming for it. Tommy looked back over his shoulder, stopped to call them a name. Got shoved into the squad car. But on the way down, a code call, a woman's voice in the police radio. Man dead, she announced with a quiet number. Then she said it plain, in an alley, 4th Street, off 6th. Get there, car 62. We got there. Mind if I tag along, Danny? Man dead. I recognize from the number. You gotta share these things. Hold your gun on him, Muggerman. He wiggles a toe. Break it for him. Pleasure, Danny. Let me through. Let me through. They can't skate anymore, can they, Nicky? Not anymore. He was propped up against the wall, his head thrown back, his mouth open. Like he was trying to tell someone about it. The furtive dog scrubbing for food in the trash, not listening. The small crowd he'd assembled because the blood sighed across his shirt front, but not listening. Watching an alley wind gather soot at his feet. Watching me lean over him. Watching Nicky Gannon. Dead Nicky Gannon. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. You'll find Jack Benny in the desert this Sunday night on CBS. Jack and his gang are making a safari to entertain the boys at an airbase in Nevada. And for more laughs, there'll be another session with Eve Arden as the gay, romantic, fun-loving schoolteacher, our Miss Brooks, on most of these same CBS stations. <laughs>
Broadway is wide enough for everybody. Generals in open touring cars, blondes in taxis, and sailors against lampposts. It's the place to come to, for one reason or another. To be a tourist. Or get stared at by the tourists. To make a pitch. Buy a bargain. Get cheated, insulted, or have your picture taken. And end the day with a memory, depending upon what you wanted, what you got, and what you gave for it. And part of the day's memento of Broadway will be the news item, Nicky Gannon shot down in an alley, hoodlum slain in new outbreak of mob violence, police seek clues in killing, especially me and another man, the Sergeant Gino Tartaglia, who had once passed a civil service examination. And the medical examiner, Dr. Sinsky, reveals that death was caused by hemorrhage in the pleura, parentheses, lungs, closed parentheses. And that is why Nicky Gannon was done in. Thanks, Gino. Oh, you're quite welcome, I'm sure. Anything else? May I? Yes, you may. Thank you. You know, Danny, this shooting up an alley brings to man mind a case which was solved by Lady Jane Pugh, the ne'er-do-well girl detective from London Town. Do we have to, Gino? Lady Jane looked at the deceased and flipped her shiny tuppence. Flipped her what? Her shiny tuppence. Lady Jane has a lucky tuppence which she flips before she undertakes a case. Ah, that Lady Jane. May I interrupt? Oh, you're the boss. Do you have anything else to tell me about Georgia Gray or Nicky Gannon, please? Oh, indeed I do, Danny, indeed I do. In the murder of Nicky Gannon, Tommy Chandler, our prime suspect, has been released. And without a nickel's worth of bail. What? I have said it. So help me if you're kidding, Gino. Why was he released? Oh, because another fellow has confessed to the deed. You remember Cozy Barrett? Even at this moment, he is with Sergeant Mugovan, confessing all over the place. And that, Danny, is all the news I have for today. Case is solved, huh, Danny? <laughs> And that ain't all of it, Sergeant. George ain't all of it. Lots of people met with me then ended up under a sheet in the ice house. You killed before, Cozy? Oh, hi, Danny. Come on in. Join the fun. This is a new kick, isn't it, Cozy, for you? Confessing to a murder? Well, what's the matter? You don't trust me? Read me to him, Sergeant. Yeah, I'll brief it for you, Danny. Cozy says he took a pocket full of dimes to the diamond dance joint where Georgia Gray was. To celebrate the end of a perfect day, he tells me. You danced with her, Cozy? Sure, I dance. How else I get close enough to kill? You didn't like the way she danced, huh? Crazy for her. Dream about it. Who else I dance away my hard earned door? On? That buys you her dying, too, huh? Oh, she gives his insults. And from a foot away, that. But I got close. Eventually, I got close. Yeah, yeah. Get on the phone, Mugovan. Have a policewoman sent up here with a portable radio. Danny, you all right? You've been working so hard. Do you... you got a thing against telephones, Mugovan? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll do it. Ah. What are you going to do, Danny? This you got Mugovan. tricks with batteries and portable radios to make people talk? Uh-huh. I'm talking. Yeah. Why you need electricity? Should be right up, Danny. Hey. You're going to put me away, huh, Danny? To the sound of music, huh? You treat me nice because I'm nice to you, huh? Killing. A lot of your line, isn't it, Cozy? I always figured you as more of the purse snatcher type, the jackroll kid, the friend a drunk finds in an alley. Well, I got a right to come up in the world, ain't I? This gives me class, a reputation, the things a fellow needs so he can admire himself in the night. Sure, I understand. man has to get ahead. You sent me, Lieutenant, you want this? Yes, come in, please. Turn on the radio. Go on, turn it on to dance music. That'll be all right. Dance with the lady, Cozy. Huh? Go on, dance with her. <laughs> uh, you're crazy, Danny. I give myself up to you and you, you, you go crazy. There are people like me, honest. Dance with her like you did with Georgia. Show me how it was with Georgia. You know I can't dance, Danny. You know I wouldn't go near a dame to dance with her. They laugh in my face when they see me coming. You're never near Georgia Gray, were you? Not, Not even close enough to... They, they promised me they'd get me off, Danny. They said confess, and then when I got off, they'd give me the big dough. Who promised you all that? Well, friends, Danny. I, I got good friends. They they, they, they promised me things. They, they call me up and, and, and promised me things. Hey, you got to lock me up, Danny, so I don't disappoint them. you got to lock me up. Make it come true for him, Muggerman. Lock him up. <laughs> Now the afternoon was two hours old, and the gray had turned into a wetness, a drizzle that hung scurling in the air before it touched the pavement. The citizens didn't mind getting wet. It was a sight to see. The 
funeral procession wasn't very long. Not like the good old days when a gangster's death took up a mile of Broadway. Not like the good old days at all. None of the mourners walked. They all rode. And the wreaths were wrapped in cellophane, which not only protected the snapdragons from the rain, but it was more sanitary. I went along because I'd known Nicky Gannon for a long time. The rain let up a little when they lowered him into his grave. And none of the mourners stayed, not even his mother. And I wanted to talk to his mother. Mrs. Gannon? Hello, Danny. You want to ride back to town? I wanted to tell you how sorry I... You talk like that, you don't ride with me. Come on. My son was a hoodlum. Why should you be sorry for him? We've talked together. We've had a beer together. That's the reason. You cry. Not me. Whatever you want. He was your son. My son got scared. Man gets scared, a man don't live anymore. And that's all his dying does to you, Mrs. Gannon? Look what I've got, Danny. A thug's funeral on a rainy day. He was your son. He's dead, Danny. I'm not. I'll think about him. Some things will come up in my mind from time to time that I've forgotten about right now. And I'll smile. And I'll think nice about Nicky then. You know who killed him? I know. Who? I said I know. The same person who killed Georgia? If I let you out of the car now, you'll get wet. You're going to do anything about the person who killed Nicky? I'm sure of it, Danny. Sure of what? It's going to rain all day. Funny, ain't it? The paper said it was. In a hurry, Danny Clover? Yeah, I am. Bother you, mister? Mm Mm-hmm. But it bothers me more, your unhappiness. Let's have a good cry over it in my office, huh? You in the hallway suits me. Used to draft your hallways, spend my life in them, waiting to do things for unhappy people. Spreader of good cheer. That's your business at police headquarters, Mr... What name do you spread it under? Forbes, Counselor at Law, my card. Forbes, Counselor at Law. Someone came to you, said I was unhappy. You took the case. Almost precisely how it happened. I told you what makes me sad. Kindly people, they grieve when a policeman throws away a confessed killer. Cozy Barrett? It seems to them almost ungrateful. However, they respect your analytical prowess. You got something I can hang on my wall that says that? Something much better. Silver cup, maybe, with an inscription. Better. An envelope, manila with money. It could take you hours to count. No silver cup, huh? Better. A bonus, the killer. The real true killer of George and Nicky. That could bring so much happiness to a man like you. Where do I find it? Mm, where else? Envelope and killer. The Diamond Dance Palace, where Georgia danced upstairs. One o'clock. That's this morning. Be there in a smile of grow on your face. You've brought me true happiness, Counselor. Thank you. Then he walked away. At the end of the hall, he stopped and looked back over his shoulder, grinned at me. Then he turned up his collar and walked out into the street. This was at 7 p.m. Then a walk down Broadway and dinner and a double feature on 42nd Street. Then it was time to go. The Diamond Dance Hall was blaring against its time of closing. I walked through it, pushed my way across the floor into a doorway. No one stopped me. Then up a flight of stairs and into a loft littered with old telephone books, cigarette butts, and a neatly stacked bundle of your old newspapers. The only light, the light from the spectaculars down the street, spelling out the evening's pleasure. Forty girls, forty, no cover charge. Up front with Willie and Joe continues performance. Chinese food, fried rice, and dancing. I waited. I didn't wait long. You here, Danny? Come on in, Tommy. Thanks. I brought you some. Here. It's all yours, Danny. Who is he? The killer that got promised to you. Dead? Uh Uh-huh. You bring the envelope, Tommy? (laughs) You bring it? Sure. Sure, I brought it. Yeah. Counted at your leisure. 15,000. I don't know, Tommy. A dead killer. How am I going to explain a dead killer? I thought of that, too. What did you come up with? Danny, I found a guy in Skid Row. He wasn't doing anybody any good. 
So I figured he could do us some good. So you shot him? With a police positive, just like you carry. Here's the gun. You track this killer down, he tried to escape, you shot him, makes you a hero. That's right. And how many heroes have $15,000? <laughs> We're going to get along fine. You've taken over for Gannon? I deserve, don't I? Yeah, yeah, you do. Killing George and Nick again, sure you deserve it. Took courage. You don't know how much. Had me sweating there for a while that she didn't die right away. Only Georgia was a girl with character. Live and let live. Die and let live. Great girl. Well, I call you from time to time, Danny. Wait a minute, Tommy. Get used to it, Danny. I said I'd call you. Don't go away. You're under arrest for murder. You practice in being a cop? Don't be a cop around me. You forgot something, Tommy. I can't be anything else. Let's go. Because you're pointing the police positive. You got trouble, sucker? It's that way all over. <laughs> Don't let me fall! I got your coat! Don't! Don't let me fall! I, I don't want to die that way! Hold me! Yeah! Daddy! Daddy, hold! Hold me! His fingers clawed against the sheer stone. Daddy! Body twisting. Face tortured. Daddy! Pleading for a return to life. Daddy! His body hung there, below me. Out of reach. Daddy! Then the fabric that held his life together gave way. Daddy! And the noise of the street came up to meet him. Killed her scream. When I got outside and walked through the gathering crowd, I remembered something in my hand. Tommy Chandler's torn coat. It's the gathering place of all the sleepless nights, this Broadway, and all the unwept tears. The place to come to, erase what's happened, start all over, make a memory, and try to forget it, if you can. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's cast, Anthony Barrett was heard as Tommy Chandler, Francis Cheney as Fran Holland, Martha Wentworth as Mrs. Gannon, Larry Dodkin as Nicky Gannon, Joy Terry as Georgia Gray, Leo Cleary as Benny Fain, and Junius Matthews as Cozy. Every Saturday night on CBS, Jan Murray gets on that coast-to-coast -coast phone and gives away a thousand dollars at a crack if you can identify the phantom voice. Be listening for Sing It Again, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walters speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Good evening. This is Peter Lawrence. Well, since murderers and thieves are unlikely to stay long in one place, it seems reasonable to assume that crime detection requires a certain amount of physical activity. <laughs> the theory which tonight's leading character dismisses well. Bah! Give him a chance to prove his point, won't you? 
Listen to the Mystery Playhouse. <laughs> If extreme fleshiness and a profound disinclination to move were a real handicap, then you and I would be little concerned with one Nero Wolf. Mr. Wolf, as you may be aware, has won for himself considerable acclaim as a detective par excellence, a veritable scourge of the unlawful, an avenging demon to those with guilty hands. And Nero has attained his enviable reputation without stirring from his extremely easy chair, except, of course, uh, for bare essentials such as eating, sleeping, and admiring his orchids. This sedentary mass of protoplasm, when has any distasteful movement required, or he simply calls on his confidential secretary and trusted assistant, Archie. Yes? Archie Goodwin, near Wolf's good right hand, provides the footwork. And he tells the story, too. He I dislike pessimists. Take the one who said there's nothing new under the sun. Getting down to cases, he may have been right. But he overlooked something. The basic facts may remain much the same, but there's always a new wriggle. There were babes in his day. There are, thank heavens, babes in mine. The fundamental idea hasn't changed much. But when you consider the modern materials and techniques... Well, July is warm, isn't it? Besides, he didn't say anything about under the moon, did he? The same thing is true, although not quite so important, about detectives. I'd been reading a book about the old-timers, and I remarked, Boss, I've been reading a book. Ah. No, that's not the title. The title is Great Detectives of Yesteryear. Were there any? It may strike you as a revolutionary idea, but there seem to have been some. Primitive fumblers, no doubt. That's not what the guy who wrote this book thinks. Can he think? He says there'll never be detectives as great as they were. Fiddlesticks. What could they do that I can't? Walk a hundred yards? That's simply substituting sweat for intelligence. I'm not so sure. Some of the things they did were terrific. For example, they could take one look at a man and tell you how old he was, where he was born, what he had for breakfast that morning, and whether he was intelligent or just an isolationist. Charles of the Archer. You could do it? Naturally. I don't believe it. What would you like him to do? Give you a demonstration? Sure. Ah. Bar is no contribution to conversation. Me, I think you're hedging. I'm doing nothing of the sort. It's simply that. Yeah, let's forget the whole thing. After all, you are not perfect. You have your failings. You're entitled to a few. Uh, warm for July, isn't it? Archie. Although there have been warmer Julys, on the other hand, there have been colder ones. Taking them all... Archie. All... Get up. I, uh... I'm up. Splendid. You know where the door is. Of course, you're not banishing me from hearth and home. Go through it. Stop the first man that passes this house. Bring him to me. You understand? A glimmer begins to light up my mental darkness. I look at him and tell you his profession, his matrimonial status, his habits, and many other little things about him you might like to know. You will? I said so, haven't I? I know, but, boss, should a man of your weight get so far out on a limb? Archie! I'm going, and I'll be back with a $64 question. <laughs> gentleman was passing by, and I asked him to come in. You explained why. Uh-huh. Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Henry Kramer. How do you do, sir? Hello, Mr. Wolf. Yes, yes, Mr. Kramer. You shan't have to keep you very long. Your wife must be waiting dinner for you. Huh? Yes, and the children. The limb is beginning to bend under that weight. No doubt you've had a hard day at the office, but a brisk shower, a quick shave with that old-fashioned straight razor you use, and you'd be a new man. Agree with me, Archie? I'm either on the verge of taking off my mental hat to you or else preparing to laugh. Uh, how do you know he's married and has children? You have eyes as well as I, if you use them. The old band on his finger makes it evident the gentleman's married. As for children, Mr. Kramer's in his thirties. South appears good. 
If he had no children, he'd be in the army. Maybe he's got a bum knee or... Mr. Kramer. Well, no, but... Uh... Kind of close on that. How about the office work? The cuff of his right sleeve is considerably more worn than the rest of the suit. Use of a pen for a good many hours during the day is indicated. Couple that with Mr. Kramer's pallor and... The straight razor? The blood stain on Mr. Kramer's collar. Too large to have been caused by the comparatively small nicks made by a safety razor. Maybe his wife bit him. Ah! <laughs> you all finished, Mr. Wolf? Yes. Why? <laughs> yeah, because I thought perhaps there might be something else you could figure out. My grandmother's maiden name, for instance. <laughs> Confound you, sir. Stop that brag. <laughs> I can't help it. It was clever of you, but... Uh, well, first of all, I'm not married. Naturally, I have no children. Indeed. This wedding band used to belong to my mother. Another thing, I don't work in an office. Where do you work? Troubleshooter in the field for the telephone company. Stop it. You're breaking our heart. And I never used a straight razor in my life. I wouldn't know how. The electric shaver for me. The blood on my collar is from nosebleed. I get it once in a while. That cracks the lamp. Uh, Mr. Wolf, shall I show Mr. Kramer out and fish for another one? Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't rib the old gentleman. Oh, gentlemen. <laughs> Me. Mr. Kramer's going in for a little deduction on his own. Mr. Larcher. Mr. Kramer, thank you, and good night. Uh, good night, Mr. Wolf. <laughs> Sorry, it didn't work out. <laughs> mm -hmm. As I said, it's a very warm July. Warmer since 1880, I think. Are you trying to spare my feelings? Don't be silly. I'm elaborately kibitzing, Mr. Wolf. Better not. Kramer laughed. But I rather think, Archie, it wasn't the last laugh in this matter. What do you mean? The man who was just here is not only a thorough liar, Archie, but... But what? But a murderer as well. As deductions go, that's kind of draft. So was murder. According to you, then, Kramer was lying about his family and his job, huh? Naturally. Okay, I'll make a phone call. To whom? Surprise to the phone company. Hello, operator. Personnel department, please. Thank you. Even if Kramer was lying, why should you think he's a murderer? Hello? Yes, I'm checking on a Mr. Henry Kramer. Yes, he claims to be one of your field representatives. Uh-huh. Now, oh, hold on. She sounds blonde. Yeah? Uh-huh. I see. Thanks a lot. And, uh, what do you do after work? You... Oh, well, so long. She goes home and beats her husband... About Kramer, Archie. Bad news, boss. He does work for the phone company as a field representative. So where does that leave your deductions? Untouched, of course. Let me think. Yes. Naturally. Nature covers a multitude of sins. What do you mean by naturally? I came to the conclusion that the man whom you brought to me was an office worker. We have just discovered that Kramer is not an office worker. Therefore... You were wrong. I am never wrong. Therefore, the man who was here is not Kramer. That's the limb to beat all limbs getting out on, if you know what I mean. Fiddlesticks. Look up Kramer in the phone book and call him. Okay, but what do I ask him? Let me see. Hmm. Of course. Well, that's not the kind of thing you can ask a man. Never mind, just call. You're the boss. Let's see. Uh, here he is. Malcolm. Four, nine, four, three, eight. Hello? I'd like to speak to Henry Kramer. What? Who are you? Oh, well, for... no, don't bother Captain McQuillan. Let him stay that way. So long. Yes, Archie. I understand now why you weren't bothered about what to ask Kramer. But how did you know? Logic, Archie. I was correct then in assuming that Kramer... You were correct. Henry Kramer is dead. He was... Murdered. Well, well. Oh, ha, ha. Come in, Goodwin. I've been waiting for you. Why, Captain McQuillan, how sweet of you. Why did you phone Kramer? Because he laughed at Wolf. Did you have to kill him just because Don't he... Don't be silly. What are you doing, keeping the stiff company? Yeah, and his girl. Oh, Captain. She doesn't even know I'm alive. Smart girl. Are you? Hey, huh? is that Kramer lying near the window? Yeah. You want an introduction? Never mind. We've met before. And... Hey. What's the matter? Did he pull a gun on you, the dirty corpse? You've been robbed. This corpse isn't Kramer. You've been robbed of brains. That's Kramer. His fingerprints checked with the phone companies. His girlfriend identified him. What makes you think he isn't? Because when he visited us earlier tonight, he was about a head taller, had brown hair instead of blonde, and... 
And Wolf was right, darn him. Captain McQuillan. Oh. That's all right. Ignore him. He comes with the woodwork. What's up, Miss Saunders? Do you have to let people stare at Henry as though he were an exhibit? Find what you were looking for, Miss Saunders? How dare you? What do you mean? Somebody's gone through this place like a minor league hurricane. Looking for something. You? Who is he? Uh, an adjunct to a very fat orchid fancier. Archie Goodwin. I'm Nero Wolfe's assistant. You love Kramer? We were going to be married, but... Yeah, I can see that's out. Want his murderer found? Of course I do. More than anything else in the world. Swell. You want Nero Wolf, 601 West 35th Street. And you want him fast. Now, listen, Goodwin, the police are working on this case. Sure, and... they'll protect the corpse very well. Uh, remember the address, Miss Saunders. Goodbye, Captain. Goodbye, you. You ambulance chaser. You're getting to be so brilliant, boss, it's boring. <laughs> Just my habit. <laughs> uh, passerby was not Kramer. Not a phone company employee and was a murderer. You haven't proved that last yet. I will, Archie. I will. That must be Miss Saunders. Mm. She's young and beautiful. You deduced that from the way she buzzed the buzzer? I deduced that from the gleam in your eye. Ah, ah you want. I'm going to keep the gleam shining. Hello, Miss Saunders. Come in. Thank you. Mr. Wolf is the large sitting down gentleman behind the desk. Uh, this is Miss Saunders, Mr. Wolf. How do you do, my dear? Police been successful? No, they haven't found the murderer. Have they found anything else? Anything? What do you mean? Archie tells me Henry Kramer was over 40 and remarkably unattractive. You're the reverse. Why were you marrying him? I... I loved him. Unconvincing. What were you searching for under Captain McQuillan's nose? Nothing. How did your fiancé make a living? He worked for the phone company. Fiddlesticks. He checked his record. He was absent more often than not. He earned hardly enough for cigarette money. Did he give you that engagement ring on your finger? Why, yes. Hmm. I suggest it's worth more than Henry Kramer earned in a year with the telephone company. Miss Saunders, Henry Kramer was killed and his apartment searched. In this case, post hoc propter hoc. He means, uh, translating from the Latin, that he was killed so that his killer could search the apartment. Thank you. Miss Saunders, why were you marrying Henry Kramer? I loved... I had to. That's all. Why did you have to? Because he had letters of mine that... Archie, get Miss Saunders in the kitchen at once. Cooking letters? Last you, that must be the police at the door. To your left, Miss Saunders, quickly, and stay there until I call. All right. Answer the door, Archie. Do I know Ellen is here? You know nothing. An easy role for you to play. I'll swallow that insult for the moment, but wait till the next time you drop a collar button, won't wait to pick it up with. Why, bless my old eyes if it isn't Captain McQuillan. Haven't we met before? Where's Wolf? Surprise, he's sitting down. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, hello, Mr. Wolf. Good evening, Captain. Where's Ellen Saunders? This is not the Bureau of Missing Persons. Captain. I think she's here. Indeed. Yeah, I want her. Why? To take home and show his wife how they're coming off the assembly line these days. Now, listen, good well, I... Captain, you listen. I've opened my door to you. I expect cuts, sir. What do you want? Ellen Saunders. The district attorney would like to see her. I'll tell her the next time we meet. That could be right now. She's here. I don't see her. You are, Jay. Just a second while I look around. No, I don't see any. Uh, the routine isn't very good. Mind if I looked around myself? You uh, have a search warrant, of course. Well, as it happens, no. In that case, Captain, I've enjoyed this little chat with you, and good night. Archie, the captain is leaving. Okay, okay, I'm leaving. I suppose by the time I get back with the warrant, she'll be in Hobo. Hobo? Where is that? Oh, nuts. Trail me to the door, Goodwin, to show what a good detective you are. Who is it? He was mad. <laughs> no doubt. Archie, you take Miss Saunders to a respectable hotel and register under an assumed name. You should stay there until I notify her otherwise. I don't want her arrested for murder yet. Her beauty has won you over. Then return here immediately. No stay? Ah! You say in your own repulsive way, no stay. Archie? Now. No, not Archie. Ah. Gentleman who was so amused by my demonstration. Mr. Kramer. Well, not Mr. Kramer, after all. Where's the girl? That question's beginning to bore me. I don't know. I think she's here. So do the police. Don't be a fool. Incidentally, what makes you think she was an accomplice of Kramer's? 
Well, she must have been. She... I mean... You uh... mean she must have been. But she wasn't. Kramer was blackmailing her into marriage. Just as he was blackmailing you. The story sounds attractive, Mr. Wolf. So did Kramer's stories. Where is she? I don't know. Would this help you to remember? Good heavens. Don't point at this. Let me. It annoys me. It may kill you. Ah, the police, I should think. <laughs> Open the door, my good fellow. Now, I haven't got the time. I'll be back. If I don't find her, lock the blasted door down if it isn't open. Well, I got the search water, Mr. Wolf. Indeed, Captain. Yeah. Also, no doubt, a fine tooth comb. Oh, yes, as you go through the house, close the back window. I've just had a burglar, and I rather think he left it open. You had a what? Burglar. May I point out that that warrant you're clutching in your hot little hand is not a lease on the house? Finish your search and go home. You look tired. You've been trying to think. <laughs> Yes, Archie. You've just missed Captain McQuiller. That I can stand. I'm sorry I missed the burglar, though. You'll see him in the morning where he works. He told you where? Not in so many words, but uh, take a deep breath. Mm hmm. I have. Notice anything? Perfume. Ellen's? No, I would have noticed if she'd been wearing any when I said good night. Strike that from the record. Yes. A burglar left that odor. I recognized it because it is the perfume with which a soap basely mislabeled as orchid ovals is treated. I say basely because orchids have no odor. Okay, so the guy washes with a basely mislabeled soap? No. The odor would not have been so persistent in that case. Unquestionably, our visitor works for the soap company. Every employee of a plant in which perfume is used invariably carries the odor on his clothes. And since you've already deduced he works in an office, uh -huh. I'll look him up in the morning. What with hiring rooms for girls and paying visits to a perfume factory, I'm beginning to feel like a maiden aunt. No one would ever mistake you for a maiden aunt, Archie. Thanks. Why? Because maiden aunts rarely need a shave. Orchid Oval Soap Company. Good morning. Who did you wish to see? I'd be happy just standing here and looking at you. <laughs> Yeah, but business is, as the proverb has it, business. I'm looking for one of your office employees. He's in his 30s, 5 foot 10, brown hair. Oh, you mean Harmon. Does he owe you money, too? You could say that. Is he in? He was, but he went home sick. He was green in the face. A family failing. Uh, did he get a call, maybe, from his wife or somebody? He got a call from somebody. Uh-huh. All I wanted to know, sister. So long and thanks. Yes? Archie, our unknown's name is Harmon. He left the office this morning sick after he got a call from a girl who wasn't his wife. Bad. Get Miss Saunders at once and bring her here. Right. I'm at Harmon's home now. Thought I'd check. He does have children, huh? Two. Boy and girl. How do you do Never it? Never mind. Hurry. And Archie, don't stop to console Mrs. Harmon. She's about to suffer a great loss. Ninth floor, huh? Thanks. 909. Miss Saunders. Ellen. Ellen Goodwin. Nice. Here we are. Archie and Ellen. Hmm, Archie, no like. Door open? It was. Careless of... Uh, uh. Careful, Mr. Goodwin. Archie, he's the... I'd prefer silence. Keep your hands high, Goodwin. A very distressing position makes the blood run into my head. He killed Henry, Archie. Uh, Mr. Harmon, you really shouldn't. It's against the law. Get into the bathroom, both of you. I've already shaved this morning. I phoned him. I thought he might have my leg. I burned all the filthy blackmail material he had. I don't want to kill either of you, but I must. Let's not lose our heads about this. Besides, Ellen is too young to die. I'm too young to die, too. As a matter of fact, we're all too young to die. Let's not. Get moving, Goodwin. I like it here, thanks. All right, then. Let it be here. <laughs> hey, the wrong man fell down. Harmon, you shot me. Or did you? I shot him, Goodwin. Captain McQuillan, you little flat-footed angel. Uh -huh. Lucky for you, my flat feet got me here in time. Just for that, I'll buy you a pair of arch supports on your next birthday. 
What worries me, though, is how you had this all figured out. Such heavy thinking isn't like you. Well, as a matter of fact, I, uh, it, uh... Uh Uh-huh, Wolf sent you here. Well, he did phone in and suggest I come here and do a bit of rescue work. The old devil. (laughs) You're not kidding. Because he didn't seem to be sure whether you would need rescue from Harmon. Yeah, or? Or whether Miss Saunders would need to be rescued from you. (laughs) You've been a very foolish young woman, Miss Saunders. I suggest in the future you exercise more care in your correspondence. Oh, I will, Mr. Wolfe. How can I thank you? Well, Ellen, one way would be to listen wide-eyed while he explains how he solved the case. Well, I hadn't intended to, but... Come on, boss. Stop stalling. Well, it was really quite simple. For someone as brilliant as you, Mr. Wolfe. You've got the idea, baby. He loves you. (laughs) However, my dear, the very first time we saw Harmon, he lied about an unimportant detail. Thus, I knew he was a murderer. He lied about the blood stain on his collar. He said it was nosebleed. Have you ever tried bleeding from your nose onto your collar? Just can't be done. A razor cut? He assured us he used an electric shaver. His lie about what seemed to be so trifling a matter indicated the blood was not his own. And he did lie about the rest of your analysis, too. His being married, the kids, the office work. Not the idiot. To assume I would think I'd been mistaken. Bah. I think you were wonderful, Mr. Wolf. I'm going to kiss you. Now, look here. I advise you not to... There, you darling. Mm. Archie, Miss Saunders is a dangerous young woman. I'll try to be brave. Thank you, Archie. Well, I've got to go now. Goodbye, Mr. Wolf. Archie? I'll see you to the door. Uh, what are you doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday? You didn't ask me what I was doing Sunday. Well, that's easy. The same thing you'll be doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Good night, Archie. Till Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Last you stop creating a draft with your gusty size. Have you no romance in your soul? I know the answer. But something else occurs to me. Boss, you didn't collect a fee on this case. That's terrible. Perhaps I didn't. But, well, the case came into being simply because you confronted me with the shades of great detectives. Dead and gone. Shall we say then that my fee in this case will be my membership in their ranks? Well, Mr. Nero Wolf, you have my vote. A fine job of deduction, sir. It's obvious that uh, whatever else it may be, <laughs> there's certainly no fat on your brain cells. Take it easy, Nero. As if you won't. And we'll be bringing our microphone around your way again soon. Oh, uh, uh, please don't go. We haven't visited the green room, where the cast is rehearsing our next performance. Come with me, please. Come. Come, come. Gentlemen, please, please. Uh, If you give me a chance, gentlemen, please. Thank you. Uh, the Royal Galleries are proud to announce uh, the discovery of a great art treasure. The lost Cellini Gold Cup made by the great Florentine master for the Cardinal of Ferrara. Wow. Since uh, bidders have had an opportunity to view the cup for several days, there is no need to go into a detailed description. Beyond pointing out that the inlaid detail, the magnificent design, the delicacy of the metalwork, mark this a masterpiece. <laughs> Very well, we'll proceed without further preliminary. I have here a mail bid of $25,000. Will someone bid more? 26,500. 26,500 bid. Uh, Bear in mind, gentlemen, this is probably destined to be the unique Cellini piece of the world. Uh, Do I hear another bid? 30,000. Thank you, Mr. Ecker. 30,000 bid. Uh, do I have 31? Jack, 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 Jack,
Uh, Mr. Royal, please, may I have the floor? Uh, the floor, Mr. Ecker? Well, yes, quiet. Quiet, please, quiet. Gentlemen, as many of you know, I promised the City Museum a few months ago that the next Cellini piece I bought would be donated to the museum. When the museum heard that I was interested in purchasing the lost Cellini gold cup discovered a short time ago by Mr. Samuel, give my promise. I'm afraid I'm stuck. Gentlemen, gentlemen, let Mr. Eckhart speak, please. So now I've got to buy this great Cellini piece and don't donate it to the city museum. But don't make any mistake. I'm not going to be bid up out of all reason. I'll pay my maximum figure, and that's all. Mr. Royal, my final bid is $65,000. $65,000 once? $65,000 twice? Sold to Mr. Jacob Ecker for $65,000. Valerie, I can't go on. I'm so sleepy, I can't... Oh, Lord, Lord, it's midnight. I didn't realize the Mm. time. You go on home, Nikki. Who's that? I'll take it. Okay. Hello? Valerie, Ben Royal. Ben? Midnight? What's the matter? Look, Al, maybe I'm a fool, but I'm scared. Scared? Where are you, Ben? I'm home, alone. Uh, Let me put my head close to the phone, Al. I've been here all evening in my workroom, Valerie, cleaning and polishing the Cellini cup to get it ready for delivery. Where's your father? Well, uh, Pop had to drive out to Long Island. His sister's sick, and I guess he'll stay overnight. Look, Ellery, this is going to sound like kid stuff. Never mind how it sounds, Ben. What happened? Well, while I was polishing the cup, my light suddenly went out. I think it was every light in the house, though I haven't left the room to find out. I've been afraid to. Well, go ahead, Snicker. He's been sitting in the dark? Main fuse probably blew, Ben. An accident. Yeah? Well, suppose it wasn't. Suppose someone deliberately yanked it out of the fuse box in the cellar. Maybe it was done to lure me downstairs so that whoever did it could sneak into my workroom up here on the first story and swipe the Cellini cup. How do I know? Yeah, what will I do? First thing to do is latch the door of your room, the room you're in, Ben. Yeah, well, I've already slid the bolt. There's only one door, thank the Lord. I've even locked the windows. I only had a gun. <laughs> You'd probably shoot your big toe off. Stay put, Ben. I'm coming over. You're in that old brown stone at the corner of West 77th and West End, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, you'll find my workroom at the head of the stairs. One flight up. Your pal, pal. Be there in ten minutes, and don't let anyone into that room till I get there, Ben. Anyone, understand? You bet. Ellery, I'm going with you. Oh, but there may be danger. Oh, okay. All right, I can't waste time arguing. Uh, dig that flashlight out of my desk, Nicky, and come on. Mm-hmm. That sounds like action, doesn't it? I wonder what's going on in that fellow's house. Nothing trivial, I hope. But anyway, we'll all have to wait for our next performance. When the masked detective, Mr. Henry Queen, relates the adventure of the thief in the dark, I think it might appeal to you. <laughs> I really do. This is Peter Laura closing the doors of the mystery playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. <laughs> This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's Monday night and time to call on our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's waiting for us in his study, so let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Ah, uh, there you are, Mr. Bell. I was just having a glass of extremely mellow port. Perhaps you'd care to join me. Thank you, Dr. Watson. You're always the perfect host. 
Just as you are the perfect storyteller. Oh, you flatter me, my boy. Though I must confess that the ingredients which make up tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure are so strangely assorted that even an old gentleman like myself can hardly fail to make it an exciting yarn. And just what are the ingredients in tonight's story, Dr. Watson? Well, let me see. Take an almost deserted island set deep in a Scottish lock. Sprinkle it generously with the following assorted selections of humanity. One measure of evil scientist. A faint wisp of human skeleton. A considerable pinch of fat lady. A handful of professional contortionist. And a dash of midget. Agitate these ingredients well. Then add to the mixture a detective by the name of Sherlock Holmes. And a certain doctor by the name of Watson. <laughs> Season generously with fear, danger and sudden death. And you have the recipe the story I call The Island of Death. Dr. Watson, you're, you're beginning to make the hackles rise in the back of my neck. Indeed, then, since hackle means hair, I think perhaps you'd better have your word with our listeners before I begin my story. Yes, I will. Men, if you want to be a success in life, if you want to look like a success in life, remember that well-groomed hair means a lot to a man's appearance. I've heard so many men complain lately that the hairdressing they use is too greasy or too highly perfumed that it leaves a sticky and flaky residue on the hair. That's why I urge you to try Kreml hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed, every hair in place, with a rich, healthy-looking luster. And it gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance. Yet Kreml never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you apply Kreml, just run your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. So tempting for the ladies to touch. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. Kreml always gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut look. As if you just combed it. And it keeps it that way all day long. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the new Sherlock Holmes story, The Island of Death? Well, Mr. Bell, as I told you, most of that exciting adventure took place on a tiny island in the Scottish Lake District. However, it began innocuously enough, as so many of our adventures began, in our rooms at Baker Street. It was on a stormy September evening, and Holmes and I were seated on either side of our fireplace. I remember after dinner that he began to analyze the old cliché that truth is indeed stranger than fiction. I can almost hear him now, as he said... My dear Watson, the true picture of the criminal world is stranger than anything which the mind of man could invent. Oh, I'm not sure that I agree with you, Holmes. The police reports and the papers are usually quite undistinguished and dull. True, old chap. But that's the fault of the reporters. Depend upon it, Watson, there's nothing so unnatural as the commonplace. Oh, let's put it to a practical test. I pick up the evening paper. Uh, here is the first heading upon which I come. A husband's cruelty to his wife. Now, there's... Uh, Half a column of print, and I bet you that without reading it, I can tell you the gist of the trouble. I accept your bet, Watson. Give me your deduction. Oh, it's not very hard. There is, of course, the other woman. The extra drink, the push, the blow, the bruise, and the sympathetic sister, all landlady. The crudest of writers could invent nothing more crude. <laughs> your example is an unfortunate one for your argument, old fellow. Very fortunate your the argument. article to which you refer is the Dundas separation case. Hmm? The husband was a teetotaler. There was no other woman, and the conduct complained of was that he had drifted into the unfortunate habit of winding up every meal by taking out his false teeth and hurling them at his wife. An action which I think you will agree is uh, not likely to occur to the imagination of the average storyteller. Hurling false teeth? Oh, absolutely fantastic. Quite. Who else could that be? You expecting a visitor? Yes, Watson, I am. And he might well prove a client who will point out the moral of our little discussion. Oh, what makes you say that? The gentleman calling on me is a distinctly colorful personality by the name of Stephen Singer. He's nearly seven feet tall, and yet he weighs under eight stone. Good a card God. from him this morning informed me of his intention of calling here at seven o'clock tonight. You said that he weighs under eight stone? That's only 130 pounds. He must be a human skeleton. That was the unfortunate title applied to him at the circus sideshow at which I first met him. Good Scott, circus freaks here in Baker Street. Huh. I'll have seen everything. Freak is an unkind and inappropriate word, Watson. Stephen Singer is a fellow human being, and a more than usually, unusually worthy one. In the case of the Bagshot Circus murders, he was good enough to take advantage of his uh, 
almost unique physical proportion, and obliged me by hiding in the barrel of a circus cannon. His evidence was instrumental in sending a diabolical murderer to the gallows. Uh, let him in, will you, Watson? Yeah, of course. Good evening, Mr. Singer. Come along in, won't you? It's all right. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. It's yeah. good to see you again, Stephen. Hello, Mr. Holmes. Don't want to make a nuisance of myself, but I did have a little problem, and I thought perhaps you'd help me with it. Of course, Stephen. Sit down, won't you? By the way, this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, Doctor? How do you do, Mr. Singer? My friend was just telling me that you once held him, helped him in a, in a murder case. Oh, that. To hurt nothing. Just slipped myself into the cannon barrel and heard one or two things I wasn't meant to. <laughs> Nevertheless, your help was invaluable, Stephen. I shall be only too happy to do what I can to repay the favor. What's your problem? Well, uh, perhaps I'm imagining things and perhaps I'm not. But wouldn't you say it was a rum thing if a professor offered me and three of my pals from the circus 50 quid apiece to go to some island in Scotland for a week? Yes, indeed. I should say that uh, that's extremely odd. Can you give me a few more facts? Well, Mr. Holmes, this professor come to the circus three nights ago when we was playing at Stafford at a bow. Hmm. What was his name? Uh, professor McElwraith. Funny-looking cove with a bushy red beard he was. Indeed. I've heard of the gentleman. I understand that he is something of a rebel in the medical profession. He returned from Vienna recently where he's been studying under Dr. Freud. Dr. Freud? Never heard of him. You will, Watson, you will. Mm -hmm. He devotes himself to the psychological aspects of the human body. Pray continue with your story, Stephen. Well, Mr. Holmes, he approached me and three of me pals. And uh, who are those uh, pals? Well, there was Bill Carew... The major we call him, he's a midget. And there was Belle Brackett, the fat lady. And the third was a bloke who joined the circus two days ago. Jeff Wallen is his name. I haven't seen his act, but he builds himself as the injured rubber man. Uh, Professor promised us 50 quid apiece, our tickets on the Scotch Express tomorrow morning, and told us he'd have a boat waiting to ferry us out to his island when we got there. Holmes, there's something devilish going on here. A professor who studies psychology wants four people to go to a lonely island. A midget, a contortionist, a fat lady, and the fourth... Oh, oh. Uh, that's all right. Ooh. I'm used to it, Doctor. Ooh. The force of human skeleton. Oh, I wouldn't say that. That's what you were going to say. Oh, now, we all agreed to go up there. Uh, we didn't like the bloke, but none of us can turn down 50 quid. Mm, but we got to talking after he'd gone. Supposing he's up to doing us a bit of no good. And anyway, he made us sign that paper. Paper? What paper? I don't remember it too well, Mr. Holmes, but it did say that if anything was to happen to us, the professor wasn't responsible. That's what started us to talking and worrying after he'd gone. And that's why I've come to you. I'm glad that you did, Stephen. Did you inform your friends of your decision to come to see me? See me? Uh, no, Mr. Holmes, I didn't. I might have done it if I'd have been sure you wouldn't have laughed at me. I'm convinced that this is no laughing matter, Stephen. Unless I'm much mistaken, there's devil's work afoot. Uh, then you'll come up there with us, Mr. Holmes? Yes. Tomorrow morning, Dr. Watson and I will meet you in Scotland. looks extremely choppy, Holmes. The boat's quite small. I hope it's not too far to the island. I'm a wretched sailor, you know. I'm sure it'll be a smooth trip, Watson. Well, I certainly hope so. Hello. Here comes Singer with the other three. Great Scott. What strange-looking traveling companions. Well, since they traveled on an earlier train, I think it's time to have Stephen introduce us. Hello, Stephen. Hello, Mr. Holmes. I'd like you to meet some pals of mine. Uh, Dr. Watson, Mr. Holmes... This is Miss Belle Brackett. What? Uh, careful, Belle, watch your step on the gangplank. <laughs> well, dearie, got to be a strong plank to hold me up. How are you, Mr. Holmes? Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? Thank you. Uh, this is Bert Olney. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Don't know what you do on the bill, Governors, but I can kick the back of my head with both feet at once. Oh, really? Very useful, I should imagine. Providing you're not standing up. What's your act, gentlemen? Act? Well, we haven't exactly got an act. Just regard us as friends of Stephen's. We thought a little trip to the Highlands might do us good. Huh. It'll do me 50 pounds worth of good. That's all I know. Put 50 more pounds on me, dearie, and I'd explode. And this is Bill Carew, the major, we call him. And Dr. Watson, and Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I don't know. Good evening, gentlemen. I do hope you're not 
Smoke, this isn't going to be a long journey. I'm really rather a poor sailor. Well, I just said the same thing myself, Mr. Carew. Oh, call me Major. Everyone calls me Major. I suppose it's incongruous when you consider that I'm only four foot three, but I do like you like the nickname. Have a cigar. Cigar? Oh, no, thank you, Rose. Well, Major. we're all aboard, Mr. Holmes. Might as well get going, I suppose. Why not, Stephen? All right, Captain. We're all here. You may as well get started. Dr. Watson. Uh, yes, Mr. Alder? Do me a favor, will you? Give us a scratch between the shoulder blades. Give you a what? A scratch between the shoulder blades. Oh, that's, just... oh, that's it. As soon as we cross the border, these Scots please started to bite on me. Thank you kindly. A starlit night, Watson, and a spanking breeze. I wonder what adventure lies in store for us. I have a feeling that Professor Mac- McElrath may not be too glad to see us. Why did you come here, Holmes? I know who you are and what you do. Why are you so interested in my obscure experiments? For two reasons, Professor McElrath. First, Stephen Singer is a friend of mine, and second, I have an insatiable curiosity, particularly for experiments that require obscurity. I want to know why a student of psychology wishes to isolate four malformed humans on a lonely island. All right, stay. Stay into the devil with your boat. You can't leave this island until I give the word, oh, my inquisitive yeah. friends. Yeah. 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 Quiet! Yeah. Quiet! Yeah. Four of you and my employees for the next few days. Two of you, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, are uninvited guests. Professional meddlers, as they assured me. And I've no reason to doubt that assurance. <laughs> Holmes, here, the man's as mad as a hat and quiet, Watson. Uh, <laughs> since you're all to be on my island during my experiments... I should like you to study this map and acquaint yourself with the place. Here you'll see are the guest houses, all interconnected by telephones. And I've installed the very latest form of that admirable new device. Now, down this path lies the snake house. Snakes? I can't bear snakes! It may not be necessary for you to meet them, Miss Brackett. Of course, I do use them in my experiments. Oh! Now, this path over here leads to the haunted watchtower. An interesting edifice, as you will discover. Seven enemies of James VI met a most peculiar death there. (laughs) You'll find that they continue to meet that death quite regularly. Look here, Professor. I don't like the sound of these. Nor do I. You tell us what these experiments are that you keep talking about. With pleasure. I've long known that the malformation of the body, of the freaks, if you'll forgive the expression as caused by glandular deficiencies and imbalances. My studies have convinced me that these same glandular defects produce psychological alterations. For instance, you, Miss Brackett, weigh four times as much as you, Mr. Singer. It'll be interesting to see how differently each of you reacts to the same stimuli. What do you think we are, guinea pigs? You talk of applying different stimuli to these people, Professor McElwraith. What kind of stimuli do you intend to apply, may I ask? Every stimulus that the many resources of this island will enable me to apply. Fear, hunger, desire, envy, hatred. That should prove most illuminating. Most illuminating. I won't stand for it. We're human beings, not a bunch of animals. That's right. Let's go out. Larry, you're right, Belle. Of course she is. The bloke's barmy. Let's get on the boat and go back. I quite agree with you, sir. You're... Com- Absolutely inhuman, Professor. Mind your own business, you meddling fool. I paid these people to come here, and they're going to stay. You and your friend are more than welcome to leave, however. No, Professor. I shall make myself personally responsible for seeing that these good people return to the mainland tonight. Uh, That's right, that's right. Indeed. Then you must be an extremely strong swimmer, Mr. Holmes. What do you mean? The boat left this island an hour ago. It will not return for five days. You fools! You grotesque idiots! You're trapped! So go to your quarters, all of you. Go on! And don't be surprised if I begin my experiments before the night is over. Well, Holmes, if we are marooned on an island with a madman and four members of a circus... I suppose we might as well make the best of it. Oh, dear. I think I'll turn in. What the devil's that? The telephone. Wretched instruments. Just a passing fad. 
They'll never catch on. You mark my words. Yes, what is it? Mr. Holmes, are you in your cottage? Since I'm obviously at the other end of this wire, yes. Dr. Watson, is he with you? Yes, why? I'm worried, Holmes. A few moments ago, I caught a glimpse of a figure standing near my library window. I'm speaking from there now. I thought it might be you or Dr. Watson. But if it isn't, I'm afraid... And well, you might be, if only of your own conscience. I'm afraid of them, the freaks. They're so angry. They might will... I'd hardly blame them. If you're frightened for your safety, the best thing to do is to let us all leave here at once. Are you sure it's impossible to summon the boat before five days are gone? Well, no, I did lie about that. I could give a signal in the morning by hoisting a flag on the watchtower. Just a moment. That was a stone dust against my window. I'll be back, Holmes. Don't hang up. What does that devil want, Holmes? Sounds distinctly subdued. He's frightened, Watson. He says there's someone lurking outside his window. Holmes, are you still there? Yes, Professor. What's wrong? That, that figure just standing in the shadows. I can see it from where I'm talking. I can't see the face, but it's... Holmes! It's raising its arm! It's got it! Oh. I'm afraid it's murder, Watson. Quick, we must get over to the big house as fast as we can. In just a moment, we'll find out just what happened to Professor McElrath. Every man who takes pride in his appearance should know that handsome, healthy-looking hair needs a hygienic scalp. And when you buy a hair tonic, be sure to get your money's worth. Be sure that you enjoy the extra advantages of Kreml hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains an amazing combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Kreml keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day. And it always gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance. Never sticky or greasy. But men, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kreml leaves your scalp feeling so alive. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes. And it's simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And if you, like so many men, have hair so dry it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer and more pliable. So men, buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Let Kreml help keep your scalp hygienic. Your hair always looking its very best. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, when you got over to the big house, did you find Professor McElraith was dead? Yes, Mr. Bell. A quick examination of his crumpled body told me that he was beyond mortal aid. Holmes lost no time in examining that room of death. This crime isn't very hard to reconstruct, Watson. The dead man was standing here as he spoke his last words to me on this telephone. Yes, and the window is beside the instrument. The glass in one pane is shattered. Yes, at a height of approximately five feet. Oh, the professor was shot in the temple. He was about six feet tall. The line from his wound through the broken pane would indicate that the killer stood out there in the rose garden. Watch up, Mr. Holmes. Yes, we heard a shot. Anyone get a theory? Yes, I'm afraid they did. Professor McElrath has just been murdered. Murdered? Well, can't say I'm sorry. Perhaps not, Major. But the fact remains that his killer must be brought to justice. By the way, only three of you are here. Yes, where's Bert Alner, the contortionist? I don't know. He went straight to his cottage when we got back from the big house. Uh, that's the last I saw of him. You know, it's a funny thing. I was only half awake, Mr. Holmes, but I thought I heard two shots, uh, about five minutes apart. Two shots? And Bert Alner has not appeared? We must go over to his cottage at once. <laughs> No, a flesh wound in the back. He was lucky. Curious. Observe the revolver lying on the floor beside him. The same caliber as the one used to kill the professor. Ah, see what Bert's done, Mr. Holmes. He killed the professor to save us all. That's right, Stephen. And then he tried to kill himself because he knew you'd catch him, Mr. Holmes. That's the way it must have been. Oh, he was a brave man. An interesting theory. Yes, but only a theory. Look at the position of the wound. I'll stake my medical reputation that it couldn't possibly have been self-inflicted. Holmes, this has been an attempt at another murder.
More coffee, Watson? No, thank you, Holmes. I've drunk a blasted gallon and I'm still sleepy. And I've smoked almost the entire <sighs> supply of tobacco I brought on this trip, and I'm still very wide awake. I ask questions until well after midnight. And what did I learn? That the servants all alibi each other. Precisely. And... and that of our party of four, no one is able to provide an alibi for the other. So that it must be one of them. As ill-assorted a group of suspects as we ever met. Yes. It's a strange business. Why the attack on Olney? The professor, yes, that's quite understandable. But why Olney? What singled him out from the others? Oh, I don't know. He's a contortionist, but he's perfectly normal-looking. He, he doesn't seem like a freak. Of course. That's it. Thank you, Watson. You've given me the other end of the thread. Oh, have I? Round up the others and bring them to the haunted tower. The dawn is beginning to break, but before we hang that signal for rescue, I shall find the answer to this bizarre problem. Before we fix this signal flag, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to warn you that as soon as we reach land, I shall turn Professor McElwraith's murderer over to the authorities. Let it go, Mr. Holmes. Whoever it was did us all a good turn. Let's forget it. I'm afraid that murder is not a matter to be forgotten, Major. But surely you haven't forgotten the attempt on your own life, Mr. Olney. I feel nearly as good as new, Governor. I think the Major's right. Let's forget it. No, Mr. Olney. Not even on your request. Because the whole case centers around you. Who? Me? Last night, while the murderer was standing outside his window, the professor telephoned me. He wanted to know if both Dr. Watson and I were in our cottage. The implication is obvious. You mean that the mysterious figure he'd seen resembled us in build? Precisely, Watson. Now, Mr. Singer is nearly seven feet tall. You, Miss Brackett, if you'll forgive me, could hardly be mistaken for us. You said it, dear. Well, no, because the major, he told us that he's only four foot three. It must have been you, Mr. Olney. But I got shot, too. And you said when you examined me that it was impossible. I could have done it. Medically impossible for a normal man, but I'd forgotten your profession. You're a contortionist. You could easily have shot yourself at, at, at such an angle. What do you have to say, Mr. Olney? That I, uh... Why not admit the truth? You're not a contortionist, are you? No, Mr. Holmes, I'm not. You see, my, my twin brother got the bit for this here job, but he had another engagement. And since the professor was so particular about the date, my brother told me to come here and we'd split the fee. But how did you know that he wasn't a contortionist, Holmes? You should remember, Watson. Huh? When we first saw him on the boat, he complained of the Scottish fleas and asked you to scratch between his shoulders. So he did, yes. A real contortionist would not have needed your assistance. So your medical verdict still holds good, Watson. Olney could not have shot himself. But you've ruled the rest of us out, Mr. Holmes. Not quite, Stephen. The simplest answer is that the mysterious figure that the professor described was disguised. Disguised? That theory would be confirmed by the fact that the killer, when he was in the garden, saw the professor standing at the telephone and deliberately attracted his attention by throwing a pebble at the window. Look here, Mr. Holmes, the sun's well up. I'm tired of all this theory stuff. I'm going to hang the flag on the tower. Very well, Major. But, Mr. Holmes... Don't keep us on edge like this. Yes, dearie. You said someone disguised themselves. Now, who was it? Well, surely the answer is apparent. Not to me, it ain't. Could you, Miss Brackett, have reduced your excessive weight to appear the size of a normal man? No. Nor could you, Stephen, have decreased your excessive height. But the Major could have made himself appear taller with improvised stilts. Then the Major's the only possibly gu guilty party. The Major? Well, I mean, it's hard to believe he'd done it. Well, even if he did, I still don't think we ought to turn him in, Mr. Holmes. Oh, no. Remember, he did it for us, dearie. Well, he didn't really hurt me when he took that shot at me. But that's just it, Olney. I might have been tempted if it were only the professor's murder. But he deliberately tried not to murder you, Mr. Olney, but to make it appear that you had killed the professor. But if he's arrested... There'll be a trial, dearie. And if there's a trial, you know how it'll be. They'll make out it was all because he's a freak. It'll be, it'll be harder than ever for people to accept us just as, uh, as people. It bears right, Mr. Holmes. It'd be bad for all of us. I think the Major has thought of that possibility. Look at him up there on the tower. He's hoisted the flag. Oh, he, now he's teetering on, on the edge of the parapet. He's going to... Major! Major! Blimey, he jumped. Must be a couple of hundred feet down there. He doesn't have a chance. Ah, oh, the poor Major. He done it for us. Come on, oh, Belle. I'll take you back to the cottage. Major. I suggest we all return to our quarters and pack. This unhappy tragedy has reached its final conclusion. What a shocking business. You're right, Dr. Watson. 
When I came to you in Baker Street, I never dreamed it would end up like this. But one thing I'd like to say, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Stephen? I, I want to thank you, uh, not just for solving the case, but because you treated all of us not as freaks, but as ordinary human beings. Makes a big difference, you know. I know of only one way to treat people, Stephen. And that is as each person deserves to be treated. If Professor McElwraith had only realized that truth, he would not have paid with his life. When you girls go out on an important date, you naturally want your hair to appear just as beautiful and lustrous as it can be. So here's a tip from some of the world's most divinely beautiful girls, Powers Models. Girls who are famous for their enchantingly lovely silken sheen hair. We glamour bathe our hair with cremel shampoo. And I want to state that no other shampoo leaves the hair more sparkling clean. Really, girls, you'll be amazed how cremel shampoo brings out all your hair's natural gleaming luster. It leaves hair shimmering with brilliant highlights that last for days. Cremel shampoo is not a cream shampoo, not a soapless shampoo, not a drying detergent. After a cremel shampoo, the hair fairly radiates natural glossy highlights. Cremel shampoo even has a built-in oil base, which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. How right you are, Mr. Bell. Cremel shampoo leaves the hair so much softer, silkier, with satin smoothness. The hair holds a wave better, too. So, ladies, buy a bottle of cremel shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to have naturally lustrous hair and a vision of shining beauty. K-R-E-M-L, cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, I'll never see it next week. Well, now, next week, I think I'll tell you uh, about another of our encounters with the infamous Professor Moriarty. And how Holmes deduced that an apparently unimportant robbery in a Sussex vicarage was in reality part of a plot that threatened the safety of all England. I call it the strange adventure of the pointless robbery. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Case of Identity. Nigel Bruce appeared through the courtesy of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the permission of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at the same time, when Dr. Watson will tell us about the strange adventure of the pointless robbery. <laughs> America is strong only if her school system is strong. Today, it's overcrowded and inadequate. So support your parent-teachers association. Do all you can to improve conditions in America's schools. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs> Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. To Box 13, care of the Star Times. Carl! Carl! What are you doing? Nothing. I ain't doing Nothing. It's just a book, Holiday. Somebody sent a book to Box 13. Why? And now, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd 
as Dan Holliday. Susie. Susie, come here a minute, will you? You call me Mr. Holliday? How did you guess? I heard you. All right. Now that we've cleared that up, how about this book? That one? This one. It came in the mail for box 13. You're sure? Sure, I'm sure, Mr. Holliday. The wrapping paper's right in the wastebasket there. I- I'll get it and show you. Here. Address printed. Block letters. Shaky hand. Susie, did any letter come with this? Hmm, just a book. Ex Libris. Robert and Chase. All right, Susie, we've got a problem. Somebody sends me a book from the library of Robert N. Chase. Why? Maybe it's a bestseller. Yeah, and its day it was. Still is. The poems of Sir Walter Scott. Do you like poetry, Mr. Holliday? Love it, Susie. Just love it. Listen. If thou wouldst view fair Melrose aright, go visit it by the pale moonlight. The gay beams of lightsome day gild, but to flout the ruins gray. Pretty, huh? What's it mean, Mr. Holliday? Susie, you're asking the jackpot question. The book's broken to fall open at this poem. Why? We're in a rut. There's one way to get out of it. If anyone calls for me, I'll be in the morgue. Star (laughs) Clark. Sure, sure. Robert N. Chase. We've got plenty about him, Holiday. Well, let me have it. You ought to remember him. Vaguely, I do. All right, Mac, what have we got? Headlines. Lots of them. Headlines, huh? What's he been doing? Same thing he's been doing for the past ten years. He's in a rut, too. Six foot deep. Dead? Here. You read all about it, Dan. Socialites dead in tragic blaze. I'm sure I remember now. The ten... Ten years ago, I was cutting my reporter's teeth on a police fee. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A cop wouldn't get a juicy story like this to cover. Son near death. Daughter at school escapes tragedy. Last night, fire swept the Robert N. Chase mansion. Blaze unnoticed until too late, spread rapidly. Injured son not expected to live. He did, though. Uh huh, I see. Mildred Chase, 18, was attending a college function when the flames took the lives of her parents and swept rapidly through the palatial country estate, Fair Melrose. They were... Fair Melrose. Yeah, that was the name of the estate. Fair Melrose. Mac, the uh, Chase girl, got anything on her? What paper didn't have? What do you mean? You know, too much dough, spoiled kid, wrong company. She ran smack into the gossip stuff almost every week. Know where she is now? Well, she dropped back after the fire. It kind of cooled her off. Mm, you've been a good girl ever since, is that it? Well, that's it. I tell you what, Dan, drop upstairs to see more in society. She can give you the dope. All right. Thanks, man. Say, you must come and visit my morgue sometime. Uh, I like this one. I only read about characters. I don't have to bump into them. Ah, but mine move around, Mac, and sometimes too fast. <laughs> Oui, monsieur. Ah, free French or engaged. You wish to see someone, monsieur? Yes, Miss Chase. Miss Mildred Chase. You have an appointment? Is that an offer or a business question? <laughs> monsieur, if you will tell me... Well, what... what is it? There is someone here, mademoiselle. I don't wish to be disturbed. I'm sorry, monsieur. But mademoiselle Chase, she is not home. Oh, I see. Then you've got a talking piano. <laughs> oh, please, monsieur. I cannot let you in. You are mademoiselle. Yes, I did. But if you will go in and tell Mademoiselle that Sir Walter Scott is waiting to see her, I'm sure she'll listen. What do you say? Where? Vive la France. <laughs> All right. You wait here. But I cannot promise. Yes? What is it? What do you want? Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Chase. I, I have to see you. Well, I don't know you. I've never seen you before. Well, lots of people haven't. But my name's Dan Holliday. The name means nothing to me. It means everything to my mother. (laughs) What do you want? I'm sorry, Miss Chase, bursting in like this. But I've come to see you about Fair Melrose. Who... Who are you? Oh, I told you. Dan Holliday. Occupation, fiction writer. 
And are you writing now, Mr. Holliday? Maybe. Oh, uh, is this yours? Mine? That book? Here, take it. Where did you get this? You don't know. No. Where did you get it? But you do recognize it. Yes. It, it was part of my father's collection. I asked you, how did you get it? Through the mail. It was addressed to Box 13, care of the Star Times. Or doesn't that mean anything? No. Nothing at all. You should read the classified ads, Miss Chase. Box 13. Adventure wanted. will go anywhere. Do anything. You thank see, I... you for bringing the book back to me, Mr. Holliday. You don't have any idea why the book was sent to me? Why, oh, I, I don't know any more about it than you do. Maybe you don't. That's right. Colette will show you Was there anything I... suspicious about the fire that destroyed Fair Melrose? Mr. Holliday, I don't know what you have in mind, but that was a cruel thing to say. A hateful thing. You're not proud of it, are you? I'm nothing one way or the other, Miss Chase. But that book was sent to me. It was broken to fall open at the poems about Fair Melrose. I'd just like to know why. I know nothing about it. All I know is that Tyre took my mother and father. It's very sad, Miss Chase. And my poor brother was left a hopeless invalid, completely paralyzed, unable to speak, to move. Where is your brother now? At Fair Melrose. The place he always loved. But I thought it was destroyed by fire ten years ago. Yes. But one wing remains standing. Your brother is there alone? Yes. That's where he would want to be. And I arranged for someone to care for him. Oh, I see. Now, Mr. Holliday, I'd like to forget all this. Well, I'm sorry to have bothered you, Miss Chase. I was merely curious about that book. I know nothing about it. All I want to do is to forget. To forget. <laughs> you want this hour of the night? I'm looking for Fair Melrose. Eh? What for? Will you tell me how I can get there? I'm lost. Stay lost, then. Just a minute, please. Get your foot out of the door. Get! Don't be afraid. I'm not going to harm you. I just want to know the way to Fair Melrose. Eh, what for? I've, I've got business there. You're lying. Nobody's got no business there. Nobody. All right, I'm nobody. Is your house on the ground? Well, it should be. Been here for 30 years. Oh, Nice little cottage you've got here. What do you want to go up there for? To look at it. Huh? What for? Huh. Nice waltz we're having. Young fella, I asked you a question, and you ain't answered. All right. I want to find out about the fire. Well, ain't nothing nobody needs to find out about it. It was a visitation of the Lord. It was a judgment on the sin that was going on. Heaven rained fire that night and wiped out the last of Babylon. I'm not sure I got all that. Oh, the wages of sin is death. Now you know. Wait a minute. Were you here that night? Me and Carl. Carl? And my husband. He was down here and seen the fire eaten up like the vengeance of the angels. We seen it, young fella. It was a judgment. A judgment for the years of sin. <laughs> we didn't have to do no more caretaking after that night. Providence took care for us. You and Carl uh, caretakers, is that it? That's right. <laughs> only, only one wing to take care of now. Only one wing and him. Oh, the brother. Yes, yes, him that can't move or talk or hear. And that's where they brung him. And that's where he stayed. Now, you get. I, I talked enough. I wonder. How do I get up there? You're still going up, huh? More than ever now. Which way? Uh, straight up the canyon. Turn left. It's top of the hill. Thanks. Well, maybe you should have picked a light at night. Yes, one with a moon. <laughs> Maybe she's right, Holiday. It's definitely no night for a picnic. But who said it's going to be a picnic? Hello? 
Anybody here? Hello? And the same to you with feathers on. Holiday, don't be so stupid. Is anyone here? Mr. Chase? Oh, Mr. Chase. Holy mackerel. Who are you? Answer me. You are listening to Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now, back to Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Oh. Nice ballots on voice you got there, Holliday. Clean. Inspector Clean. Where am I? Hospital. What for? For your head. There's a little dent in it about two inches deep. Oh, I remember. Where is he? He? Who? The body. Oh, the body. What body? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How did you get in? Who found me? Who told you all about this? The old girl. Caretaker's wife. She found you. Oh. Clay. I saw a body in Fair Melrose. Holiday, I don't know what merry-go-round you're on, but keep up this way and you'll get the brass ring through your nose. How do I get out of this place? Walk out. Thanks. What are you going to do now? Why? I want to know where to pick up the body. Keep in touch, Clint. What have you got in mind? A date. A date with a beautiful young lady. Slightly hysterical and more than a little mysterious. But interesting. <laughs> here again, Mr. Holliday. More to the point. What do you want? Will you please leave? Every time I come here, I get invited to leave. I don't know what you're doing, Mr. Holliday, but it's none of your business. You ought to... I went to Fair Melrose last night. What for? I wanted to see it. And your brother. You mustn't see him. Why not? What do you do, Miss Chase? Please leave him alone. All right. Did you go to Melrose last night? No. I haven't been there for ten years. You weren't there the night of the fire either, were you? No, no, I wasn't. All right, all right. I'll take the word for it. Now, mind if I ask you one more question? If you'll go, I'll answer it. It's a deal. What are you afraid of? Nothing. That's your answer? Yes. I, I'd almost forgotten that horrible night until you came here. For ten years, I've lived away from it, keeping it away from me. Now you've brought it all back. Don't you have any pity? Lots of it, Miss Chase. For a lot of people. Particularly you. What do you want to see him for? I got to. I want to talk with him. He can't talk. He can't hear. He's in the only wing left by the fire. Well, that he is. You you still want to go up to see him? Yes, I do. <sighs> The chases. Devil's brood, all of them. Devil's brood. The young and with her temper, screaming at her mother and father. And him that's upstairs now, always fighting with his sister. The fire was a visitation and a judgment of providence. Ah. Ah. There he is. Oh, no. Well, that's him. You stay here. Mr. Chase. Mr. Chase. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Can't, can't. Shut up. Mr. Chase, I'm... I'm Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13, do you understand? Not in his head. That's all he can do. Mr. Chase, you wanted to see me. You sent me that book. You had Carl send it to me. Is that right? Nod your head if that's right. 
Good. Now, why? He can hear. You can hear me a little, can't you, Mr. Chase? Good. Why did you send me that book? Why did you want me to come here? He wants me to look around, Bertha. At what? At what? Ain't nothing in here. Ain't nothing. Look, Mr. Chase. I'll walk around the room. I'll watch you. When you want me to stop, nod your head. Understand? Good. Now watch me. Here? This trophy case. Is this it? What about it? What do you want me to see in... This? Good. Bertha, come here. I ain't coming in. I said come here. Come on. Take a good look at this trophy case, Bertha. A good look. Uh, I don't see nothing. There's a plaque missing from its place. There's heavy dust around behind all those cups and trophies, but there's a clean spot here where a plaque stood. No dust, Bertha. No dust. Someone took a plaque from here not more than a few days ago. Did you? I ain't touched nothing. Never touched nothing. Mr. Chase. That plaque. Whose was it? Yours? No. Your father's? Mother's? Mildred's. It was hers. Someone took it. Mr. Chase, try to understand. Try to answer. Please, you've got to... He can't... Mr. Chase, try hard. Try hard to hear me again. Let him alone. He can't do no more. Stay with... Stay with him, Bertha. Don't leave him for a minute, do you hear? Oh, hello there. Hello, Holiday. Inspector, I'm in a hurry. No, it looks like it. But you can spare a poor cop a couple of minutes to explain something, can't you? What? That body. We found it. In a ravine about a mile down the road. All right, you found the body. Now I'm in a hurry. I gotta go. Not so fast, Holiday. There are a couple of questions I'd like to ask you. Later, Kling, later. You know where to reach me? Holiday. Come back, Holiday. I say come back here. I'd be care of box 13. <laughs> You saw my brother, Mr. Holliday? Yes, I saw him. Oh, please keep playing. I don't know why I let you in here. I do. Can't you leave me alone? Please, the piano. I like to hear it. What did you find out? So you don't know why anyone would have taken that plaque from the trophy case? No! Your brother managed to tell me it was yours. You are... Where was it? In the lower right-hand corner of the trophy case. Lower right-hand corner? Lower? That mean anything? Well, it... It was a plaque I won for dramatics at Merrifield Academy. I don't get it. What value does it have? It isn't worth anything except... Except what? The plaque was presented to me at a dinner at Merrifield. So, go on. The dinner was the night of the fire at Melrose... And the plaque would prove you were at Maryfield the night of the fire. Yes. But somebody... Somebody wants people to think you were at Fair Melrose. Were you? No, no, no. How many times do I have to say that? That's enough. Who hates you, Miss Chase? My brother. Your brother? They all hated me. My mother, my father, my brother. Sometimes I think I hated them. Watching me, picking my friends, cutting me off from the friends I'd say. I couldn't stand it. I see. All right, Miss Chase. We'll forget it for now. But can I come back this evening? Why? I said before I wanted to help you. That still goes. Miss Chase, it still goes. Please sit down, Mr. Holliday. Thanks, Miss Chase. Do, uh, do you have anything to tell me? A few things, yes. But first, uh, is there anything you want to tell me? Tell you? Why, no. You sure? Positive. What could I tell you? A story. I don't know what you mean. All right, I'll explain. Mm-hmm. 
Must you play the piano? No, but I'd like to. Miss Chase, let me tell you a story. What about? Well, I don't know whether it's exact or not. You see, I have to guess a lot. Fill in details myself. But this story is about a girl, an 18-year-old girl. That is, she was 18 10 years ago. And what's that got to do with me? Oh, you might be the girl, Miss Chase. Wild with a temper. Bad temper. She had a lot of fights with her parents. Mostly about the friends she had. The way she ran around. What are you trying to say? That one night this girl set fire to her home in a fit of temper. After a fight with her parents. Maybe she didn't mean to do what she did. But the fire destroyed her home almost completely. It meant the death of her parents and it made her brother... A You're making this up. You're guessing. I said I'd have to guess. I was at Merrifield the night of the fire. For a while. I checked. Found out you left early enough to get to Melrose. And you brought a plaque with you. The one you'd won for dramatics. Well, I, I brought it to Melrose later. The, the next day or the next. I, I, I don't remember. No, that's no good, Miss Chase. It's too hard to believe that anyone would walk into a ruined home and put a plaque in a trophy case. I say you took it to Melrose, then had the fight with your mother and father. You're lying. I don't think so. I took it there after the fire. And why is it missing? Want me to look around your apartment for it, Miss Chase? Or send for the police to look for it? No. Why not, if you haven't got it? Why are you afraid to let me look for it? So I am right. Now let's get on with the story. For ten years you held the secret. There's nothing to connect you with the fire at Melrose except that plaque. For years that fire's on your mind. Day after day you have to live with the secret. Wondering if there's anything that will connect you with that night. But there's nothing. There's nothing. Then you remember that plaque. It will prove that you were at Melrose. Because the date engraved on it is the same as the date of the fire. No. I tell you, it's not true. So there's only one thing to do. Get that plaque out of Melrose. But you didn't count on one thing. Your brother. Day after day, he saw that trophy case. Day after day, it was the same. Never changing. Like the four walls he had to stare at. But suddenly, it's different. There's... There's something missing. He racks his brains and he remembers. He remembers the plaque that was there. When he was able to read, he must have read about the fire. How you escaped the tragedy by being at school that night. How lucky everyone said you were. He read how you were presented with a plaque for dramatics. And his tortured mind puts two and two together. And he arrives at the conclusion that you were at Melrose. Home. The night of the fire. Well, Miss Chase, did you like that story? There's nothing you can prove. Maybe not. But how about Carl's murder? You killed him. Because you thought Carl was me last night. No. What, what are you doing? Calling the police. If for them now, I think they'll prove you killed Carl. They're good at that sort of thing, Miss Chase. Very good. No, no, please. What do you want? Money? I'll give you money. Anything, only don't call them. Why not? Please, please. Hello, Inspector. Jenkins. They hated me, all of them. Okay, I hated on. them and you. I hate you. Look out. Get a gun. Oh, no. <laughs> Hello, Kling. Holiday. Come to the Sunview Apartments now. I, uh, I just rang down the curtain on a ten-year dramatic act. <laughs> Thrilling, Mr. Holliday. Yeah, sure, Susie. About as thrilling as throwing dirt in a guy's face. Oh. Well, here's some more mail for Box 13. Later, Susie, later. But here's something maybe you ought to look into. What? If you subscribe to this book club, you get a free set of Sir Walter Scott's poems. Oh, fine, fine. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time... Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. 
Box 13 is directed by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. With an original story by Frank Hart Towson. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. <laughs> Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In springtime's early morning, Broadway depends upon the mood you're in. Now the seesaw of color is gone, the riot of night sounds is stilled, and the revelers have found their sleep. There's nothing here but litter and mist and the beginning sunlight. But it's the start of an April day. That's something. You walk into it. And there's something else. The man standing against the lamppost, staring, hands locked in back of him, and last night's newspaper trapped against his leg. Walk past him quickly, kid. It's better to start the day with a cup of coffee. I didn't have time for coffee. The call came while I was pouring the cream. The call with a code number that said homicide, that said an address on Fifth Avenue, that said get there. And get there and get ushered into a room and into the presence of a man who uses words instead of numbers in describing death. Here's a gun that did it, Danny. Revolver. Two shots missing from the chamber. One killed him over there on the bed. We're still looking for the other slip. Who is he, Muggerman? Philip Hunt. Securities, investments. Retired about two years ago to try to enjoy himself, the maid said. Uh, the maid called it in. Oh. But what else? Plenty. Hey, let's go. I'll show you. It's down the hall. Big party here last night, Denny. Glasses, scotch, bourbon, gin, cigarette butts, gold tip, cork tip, lipstick tip. Oh, this too. Oh, pocket lighter. Fancy one. Mm, give me a light, will you? Thanks. Yeah, real fancy. And Evans, catchy engraving on it. Barbara to Willard. It'll have to be traced. Mm-hmm. Found it in the bathroom in the shower stall. Uh, doorbell. The maid will get it. In here, Danny, the library. Uh, who are they? Well, the girl stretched out on the couch is her niece of the dead man. Name's Lois Hunt, the maid said. Lives here. Him, the soldier over there on the, ca- on the uh, chair. The maid didn't know him. Never saw him before. Well, how about the rest of the people at the party? Nothing there yet. Maybe the girl and the corporal will know when they come to. Dr. Sinsky gave him a needle. A needle to a couple of drunks? What are you talking about? They're not drunk. Their drinks were doped. Here, the girl's glass. Smell. Mm-hmm. The corporal's the same. Dr. Sinsky said it's fortunate he got here in time. Then the gathering together of the police reporters and the press photographers. The statement for the noon editions, the jolly farewells over the dead, and the promise of the mention of your name... The bribe for more detail, more, you know what, Danny, got to compete with the comics, kid. And the walking away from it. And in your office, the arrangement and rearrangement on your desk of the clutter that attended Philip Hunt's dying. A cigarette lighter, a gun fired twice, two glasses stained with death. And a few hours later, the quiet opening of the door. And two kids stand waiting, bewildered. Their eyes not touched by the morning light. Dr. Sinsky said it was all right for you to interrogate us now. He said... Oh, come in, Miss Hunt. Corporal. Sit down. Thanks. You sure you feel all right, Miss Hunt? No, no, no. I'm fine. Just a little dazed. I've had other mornings like this. Maybe not quite so sad. Uncle Phil did. You, Corporal? I'm fine, sir. Just fine. Oh, he'll be all right. Dr. Sinsky's a good man. Have you two known each other long? Been going together a long time? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir, a long time. Maybe five or six months. I saw Lois at a USO dance. You're and... lying, Tommy. Don't tell a man a lie. I know what I'm doing, kid. Just, just Mo- let me... Maybe you don't, Corporal. You, you tell me, Lois. I only met Tommy last night. He was sitting at a bar, lonely, kind of lost. Made him so attractive. I'm rich. 
I bought his drinks. Then you took him to the party at your home. Well, there wasn't a party. We made it up as we went along. You know, bar hop. Picked up people who said funny things. I took them home because I wanted to celebrate Tommy, the nice corporal. It wasn't a pickup, sir. Lois is a fine girl. Sure She's not. Sure I the... am, Tommy. You're sweet. Was your uncle at the party, Lois? We crashed in on him just as he was getting ready for bed. We all kissed him goodnight. That's how gay we were. We all kissed my uncle goodnight. That's how you left him. Going to bed? Yes, sir. Then you rejoined the party? Yes, sir. Well, this gun... Is that the one that killed my Uncle Phil? You know the gun? It was given to my Uncle Phil by his employees. They know how he loved guns. You know the gun, Corporal? Yes, sir. L- Lois took it out of the case... So I could show the party how a, how a soldier uses a gun. Who'd you show your tricks to, Tommy? Who else was at the party? I don't know, sir. Honest, I, I don't know. How could he know them if I didn't? They were strangers, funny party strangers. We had fun. Yes, sir, just fun. And then I passed out. And Lois was sitting there already passed out, with, with a book in her lap. She'd been reading poetry to me, and, and she passed out. And I laughed, I remember. And... Uh, Danny, I... Pardon me. Pardon me. Danny, they have traced the cigarette lighter from descriptions distributed hither and yon by calm, efficient men on the beat. Oh, you'll tell me, huh, Sergeant Tataglia? Sold by Tiffany's to one Willard Jordan, 2346 East 80. Steady customer by Tiffany's. Me, I only gaze in their windows on Sundays. All right, I'll check it. Do that, Danny. And also bid adieu to Miss Hunt. Her wealthy lawyer has put a bail for her. And the corporal? No, arrangements have been made with the military. Him we can keep. Bail is only for the likes of Miss Hunt. Yeah. You know, take care of things. Be calm and efficient while I'm out, at Tartaglia. I'm very sorry. I'm busy. I'm from the police. Does Willard Jordan live here? Yes, he does. I'm his wife. What is it? May I come in? I suppose so. We'll talk here, if you don't mind. I'm uh, getting ready to go out. What is it you want? Is your husband home? No. You'd better stop in another time, Mr... Clover, where is your husband? I don't know. I, I didn't invite you to go in there. Where, where do you think you're going? Is he your husband? Pepe, I told you, if you stared in that mirror once more, I'll scream. Sit down. Sit down and drink your drink. And don't you move. Don't you open your mouth. Not your husband, huh? Then who? Pepe. You must know Mr. Clover. He's a model for my husband. Willard did him as Narcissus. What's Pepe doing here now? Waiting. He dropped in to see Willard. Willard's uh, going to paint him for his summer show. When's the last time you saw your husband, Mrs. Jordan? Early yesterday morning. I handed him his sketch pad when he walked out of the door. Now, you tell me something. Why is it so important for a policeman to talk to my husband? He was at a party last night where a murder was committed. You think Willard did it? Willard? I didn't say that. I just want to talk to him, that's all. Willard commit a murder? Pepe! Pepe, one more time and out you go. Doesn't it worry you that your husband didn't come home last night? Why should it worry me? What do you mean? Willard has not come home like this before? Oh. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, Willard stays way off and he's a roamer. He goes places, talks to strange people for material to paint... Let's see. Yes, he said he was going to take a model around last night. What model? A, a Pepe? A Barbara, I think. Yes. Barbara Sullivan. Nice girl. You've seen her in the beer ads, Mr. Clover. She lives close by. I'll tell you where. If she knows where Willard is, phone me. Let me know. Will you? Of course you will. Open up, Miss Sullivan. It's the police. Open up. This is me. And last night's frock. This morning's iPads. 
Trying to sleep away the bags under my eyes so you won't lose a kick when you draw mustaches on me on the billboards. Mrs. Jordan told me you might know where her husband is. Melissa told you that? Good old Melissa. We want Willard for suspicion of murder. What? You were with him last night with Willard. Where is Willard now? Sleeping off a jag under a cold water tap in the shower stall of the Fifth Avenue mansion. I know. I threw him there myself. Everything I do myself. He's not there anymore. We peeked. Well, then go look for a man with wet coat and pants. Dry the gutter on 3rd Avenue and 28th. Willard's favorite, his pride and joy. That's where you left him? I left him in the shower stall. I told you that two yards ago. You threw Willard in the shower, went home. What time did all these good things happen to you? Maybe two, three, four in the morning. I don't remember. All was on my mind was my beauty sleep. I'm vain. Coddle my beauty. Get fat checks for coddling it. So you want Willard for murder, hmm? Anyone I know? Philip Hunt. You were in his house last night. Oh, that's where I was. That's where that pale little rich girl took us. I wish I'd known. Maybe I could have wheedled the old man into using me in his advertising. That's all it means to you, a man's murder? Our wanting Willard for it, maybe? Come to me with a Hollywood contract, mister, and I'll show you what things can mean to me. I'll change overnight for you. I'll live for it. Keep posing for beer, Miss Sullivan, just so I'll know you're around. I'll do it good. Because I'll keep it in mind you'll be staring at me through shop windows. And by now, it's iPad time again. So a half day had gone by and I had nothing. The technical division had something, though, and they gave it to me. There'd been about 17 people at the party last night at the home of Philip Hunt. 17 people, according to the kind of drinks, dregs in the bottom of liquor glasses and fingerprints. Maybe nine men and eight women. So far, I had talked to three of the 17. Result, shrugs and bleary answers. Result, nothing. Back now to the home of Philip Hunt and talk to his niece again. Outside this time in the small garden. Sit in a wrought iron chair and watch Lois Hunt take her three o'clock scotch and soda. Sure you won't have one, Mr. Clover? Uh, no, thanks. Listen to me, Lois. All I want you to do is try to remember who else was here last night. Somebody who had a motive for killing your uncle. I had a motive. Money. I inherit most of the estate. How's soldier boy, Tommy? Nice kid. I'm going to visit him tomorrow. You mean you just picked these people up and brought them home? Oh, sure. Grab bag. Miss you Lars. never know. Miss Lars! In the guest house. What's the matter, Francis? I was cleaning. Please, please look. The guest house was just across the garden and up a few steps. The place was neat as a pin. Starched linen curtains, maple chairs, and three shag throw rugs placed at interesting angles. On the one that stretched diagonally across the floor was a man. I knelt beside him. Away from the blood stain that had spilled from the bullet wound in his chest. His coat was still moist, and it was spread open. And there was a label on the inside pocket. Tailored, it said, by Jensen's Mills, expressly for Mr. Willard Jordan. And Mr. Willard Jordan was dead. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. With the kids of the Beverly Hills Beavers to the right of him and those two curious revenue agents to the left of him, Jack Benny meets plenty of trouble this Sunday night on CBS. Be listening, be laughing with the Jack Benny Show tomorrow night, and be with us, too, for the fun with Eve Arden as our Miss Brooks on most of these same CBS stations. <laughs> Long winter is dead on Broadway, and the street mourns its dying without a tear. What's to weep, kid? The dawn banging on the radiators, tearing sleep into pieces on a cold morning? The standing on the street corner in the night wind, trying to thumb through the racing foam with 100% wool mittens? And the girls so bundled up you can see their face? That's to weep? Give me the springtime, kid. In the springtime, things bud and blossom. The girls, the neon flowers, the field of golden daisies on the translux. Look at it now, kid. Artist, dead in Fifth Avenue guest house. Police sift murder clues. Search linked with death of Philip Hunt, millionaire. Ever smell posies like that, kid? 
Spring's come to Broadway. Give up to it. And at police headquarters, that's just what Sergeant Tataglia did. He gave up to it. Ah, uh, Danny, the missus has been slipping the sofa with the molasses into my pizzas lately. It's that time of the year again. Goody. Tastes good that way? The way Mrs. Tartaglia makes a pizza, Danny, no harm could come to it, no matter what felony she commits to it. Yeah, which reminds me, when you come in to partake of a springtime pizza? Oh, soon, Gino, as soon as I can. A promise? Hmm? Ah, goody. I have also by mail so invited Lady Jane Pugh, the ne'er-do-well lady detective from London Town. She's coming? No, she has not as yet replied with her RSVP. On an English caper, no doubt. What else? I will notify you, Danny, when she accepts. You do that, Gino. Now, firstly, and to the forefront. The boys in technical have deduced that the bullet that killed Willard Jordan Artist sprang from the same gun that did likewise to Philip Hunt. Thanks for telling me. I yeah, thought you would relish it. Secondly, and in the background, Major Robert E. Woodcock retired. Hmm? They try me again, Gino. I haven't had my sulfur and molasses. Major Robert E. Woodcock retired. Partook of breakfast every morning of his retirement with the late deceased Philip Hunt. A fact established by Sergeant Mugovan while questioning the housemaid. Every morning, huh? Mm-hmm. That's interesting, Gene. Only a stab in the dark. But if a fellow wanted to talk to this Major Woodcock... He would go to the Union Club where the retired Major resides. Naturally. Naturally. Major. Major Woodcock. Wake up, Major. Wake up. It never ends. It never ends. Major? I'm awake, young man. Awake. A recurrent dream, you know. Never ends. Always cut off when it gets interesting. Always cheated of the ending. I'm from the police, Major. And don't pussyfoot, boy. You're from the police. Be proud of it. Nothing to be ashamed of. Walk on tiger's feet. About Philip Hunt. My friend. My old friend. Chaperone to Mademoiselle around Paris in the old army days. Together, Phil and I. Many sunny days to remember. You want to know if I was with Phil the night he died? Were you? Dropped in for a brandy, game of chess. A lot of young people took me in tow. Made me act the major with a boy. A young corporal who was there. I'm afraid it was a rather pathetic entertainment. Then you got away from them. They were happy to dismiss me. Shunted me upstairs to old Phil. We had our quiet brandies, our endless chess game, never finished it, and cried old soldier's tears, and so to bed. You didn't come back for breakfast. Oh, you know about that, do you? Had breakfast with Phil every morning since our discharge, in the library, 7 a.m. <laughs> Pleasant. Then we'd putter around in the garden. Pleasant. A ritual. But you didn't come back that morning. Why? Too tired. Overslept. Overbranded. I wish I had come back. Why? I bid Phil a good journey. Dead men can hear things like that, you know. Pleases them. There was another reason I wish I'd have come back. What, to console Lois? Hadn't thought of that. No. To thank Phil for including me in his will. Left me quite a sum. Enormous sum. Quite an overpayment for my work in his garden. But you knew about that. No, I didn't. Makes me a suspect, though. It does. It should be interesting. When do you ask me about Willard Jordan, the artist? Right now. Painted my portrait, Willard did. There it is, hanging in back of me. Major Robert E. Woodcock, retired. <laughs> leaning against a field piece. Classic claptrap. But I've grown rather fond of it. That's all there is of me now, me and it. I can always reach you here, Major. Phil's gone. Where else would I go? It doesn't matter to you that I'm a widow now, does it? You have to ask me questions. That's right, Mrs. Jordan. I won't answer them. I don't have to answer them. Please get out and let me alone. You told me you weren't at Lois Hunt's house last night. 
Well, you heard what I said. All right. I was at Lois Hunt's house last night. I know. It was a terrible party. Pepe take you to the party? Pepe never goes to parties. He spills things on people's rugs, so I went alone. Did Lois pick you up at a bar? I never go to bars. Then you were following your husband. So what? So what? It's your right, Mrs. Jones. Of course it is. I was his wife. Just tagged along. Just in case Willard got into trouble with that brewery poster, that's all. Saw Willard go into the house. Waited a while, and then I went in, too. Willard got into trouble, Mrs. Jordan. Where were you? Well. Well, well what? Well, a girl has to be sociable at a party. Anybody knows that. If somebody gave you a drink. Never did get to see Willard. And you must have gotten to know some of the people. Oh, just names, like Nicky and John and, and Bobby. Honestly, I don't remember a lot. Honestly. Can I see you, Danny? Oh, sure, Mugovan. Come on in. What have you got? I've got a report here from the fingerprint department. You know what's strange, Danny? <laughs> the gun's got the prints of 17 people on it. Well, maybe it did have once, not anymore. Wiped clean. What's the drama for, Mugovan? Why don't you just say it didn't have any prints on it? Because it has prints on it. The most beautiful set of prints as possible. The entire hand of Lois Hunt. Here's a photostat. Without a blemish or a smear. Killer Lois Hunt, huh? You think so? I'm asking you, Danny. No, no, I don't think so. Somebody doped a drink and pressed her hand against the gun. If Lois had handled the gun to kill both men, she'd have handled it twice. Then there would have been two sets of prints, not one. Yeah. The killer tried to plant a frame, huh? I don't know, maybe. Oh, what else? Nothing. Just these. Photographs of the Hunt Mansion. Interiors, exteriors. Uh, six of the people who were at the party last night are outside. You want me to bring them in? Yeah, one at a time. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. Huh? Back here, Michael. Have you talked to that corporal lately? A couple of times. Six to his story. Passed out right after the girl did. She'd been reading to him. Isn't that what he said? Yeah, poetry. He even told me the name of the book. Uh, sonnets from... Uh... Look at this picture, Muggerman. Yeah. Library, where the kids were found dope. Boy sitting here, girl there. Yeah. See any book near them? Now, look at this one. Picture of Hunt, dead in his bedroom. Squint, Muggerman. What's the name of the book? Yeah. Sonnets from uh, Portuguese. You don't have to talk to those people now, do you, Danny? <laughs> Lois is upstairs in her room. I'll tell her you're here. Take me to her, please. This way. What time did you find Miss Lois and that soldier in the library, Francis? It's about a quarter after six. I told that other policeman that. A quarter after six, isn't that pretty early? <laughs> sure, it's early. I do it every morning. Clean up in the library so Mr. Hunt and that major could have their breakfast. Saw Miss Lois and the soldier passed out and went to tell Mr. Hunt. You saw Mr. Hunt dead and called the police. I told that other policeman that, too. Miss Lois? What is it? Policeman. Hello, Mr. Clover. Come on in. That'll be all, Francis. Well, come to tell me something about that soldier boy, that, um... Tommy Milo? I'm going to try to do everything I can for him. You want a drink? That gun that killed your uncle and Willard Jordan had your prints on it. Aren't you warm? I am. Just a second, will Casement open. It's much more pleasant, don't you think? Now, what did you say? The gun had your prints on it. Didn't it have everyone's? We all handled the gun. Why just my prints? Because you wiped off everybody's prints and put your own on it. Oh, I must have been loaded. Why did I do that? Make me think what I thought, that you'd been framed. That someone had put the gun in your hand when you'd passed out. You've come to tell me you don't think that? What were you reading to Tommy when that dope drink caught up with you? Some sonnets, I think. Everybody else had left, so I thought sonnets were just the thing. <laughs> Corny, huh? You were reading the sonnets, and all of a sudden you felt dizzy, and you went to sleep. Is that what happened? Exactly. I told you. But the book wasn't there when we found you, Lois. What? Where was it? On the night table next to your uncle. 
But I was drugged. How would it get there? You put it there. That was an oversight, Lois. You carried it up to your uncle's room. But I was drugged. You know that. The doctor knows that. I was drugged. Later, you put on an act for Tommy, pretended to pass out, waited for the drug you'd put in his drink to work on him. Then you got up, killed your uncle, came back, then drugged your own drink. Don't tell me what I did. If I'd done that, I would have died. The doctor said that drug was deadly, your own doctor. You didn't have anything to worry about. Frances, your maid, always cleaned up the library at 6 o'clock. You knew she'd yell for help. Now tell me about Willard Jordan, Lois. Don't talk to me like that. Don't tell me what to do. Willard Jordan came back, didn't he? He was looking for his cigarette lighter. You know everything. You and Uncle Phil. Came back and saw Tommy lying there alone. Then you appeared. You had a gun in your hand. You're so smart. You walked Willard to the guest house, killed him because you had to. Smart. Uncle was smart. Told me what to do, why I had to do it. It wasn't just the money. You had that. Your uncle gave you everything you wanted. Like I was a little girl. Like I didn't know my own mind. Just the way you're talking to me. Let's go, Lois. No. 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 Come on. No, I won't go. I'm going to kill myself. Get away from that window, Lois. I'm going to do it. I'm going to jump. I don't care. I'm going to jump. Listen to me. Don't you come near me. I'm going to die. You'll be sorry, all of you. But when I'm lying down there, you'll be sorry. My friends will come and they'll look at me and they'll be sorry. They'll be sorry. When I grabbed her, she didn't struggle. Just shrieked over and over. When I let her out of the room, she was still shrieking. And all of a sudden, she stopped. Then she looked at me, bewildered at first, then smiling. An etiquette smile that a girl gives a man after a pleasant dance. Then she touched my cheek. She spoke to me. I don't think my friends would have been sorry, Mr. Clover. I really don't. On Broadway, the fury of the night races against the time of dawn. It needs those hours to prove itself. The mob, the grinning faces, the voice that whispers. But hurry, time's at your heels, and the night lasts only so long. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's cast, Kathy Lewis was heard as Lois Hunt, Lee Millar as Tommy Milo, Peggy Weber as Melissa Jordan, Michael Ann Barrett as Barbara Sullivan, and Russell Simpson as Major Woodcock. Our defense program today calls for sacrifices, but the better we produce, the fewer those sacrifices will be. To do this most effectively, we must all work together toward top productivity. The free booklet, The Miracle of America, gives the story of the American system and of the benefits which increased productivity through teamwork has brought to all of us. Write Box 10, Times Square Station, New York City, for your free booklet, The Miracle of America. Remember, the better we produce... The stronger we grow. Stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The Adventures of the Saint, starring Tom Conway. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor, Tom Conway, as... The Saint. Hey, Mr. Templer. Yes, Louis? It's 8 o'clock in the morning. Oh, that's right. So for what are we driving out to the racetrack at this hour? You know, the first race don't go off till 1.30 in the afternoon. A letter from a lady in distress, Louis. Ah. And you, the Robin Hood of modern crime, are jitneying to the rescue. I might have known. Uh, Louis, yeah. keep your mind on the road, please. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Hey, is she blonde and beautiful, or is she brunette and beautiful? She's 15. She's 15? Uh, going on 16. Sounds like a dull case. Well, here's the track, Mr. Temple. Where should I park? Uh, drive over to the training track, Louis, over by the stable area. Oh, sure. And say, if you happen to pick up any inside information, Mr. Temple, you can know what I mean. Uh, save your money, Louis. You cannot beat the horses. Who wants to beat them? I'm fighting the whole even. Uh, let me out here, will you? I think I see my lady in distress. Okay. I'll wait here, Mr. Templer. Thanks, Louis. Morning, Annie. Oh, good morning. Are you Simon Templer? And you're Miss McIntyre. How do you do? I knew you'd come. It wasn't logical that you should, and I know I shouldn't have asked you, but I knew you'd come. That's the nicest thing anyone said to me all day, and it's uh, almost eight o'clock. That's Dad over there with the watch. Pete's getting ready to work. Pete? That's our horse. Peter the Great. Oh. Vic's up on him. And uh, Vic is the boy you're worried about? Yes. Please don't think I'm a silly, hysterical little girl, Mr. Templer, but Dad practically raised Vic. We grew up together. And now? No, I don't know him at all. I see. I called you because something terrible is going to happen. Hey, Annie, and... bring your friend over here. He's getting ready to break. I'll tell you later, Mr. Templer. Come on. Uh, Dad, this is Mr. Templer. My father, Mr. Templer. I'm glad to know you, Mr. McIntyre. How are you, son? Looks good, doesn't he, Annie? Full of run over there. Told Vic not to let him out, though. An easy three-eighths, that's all. Getting the horse ready for a race? Well, I might let him go any day now. Almost any day. Mm. If he's up to it. Oh, watch him. Getting close to the pole. Watch him. There he goes. Annie. Annie, Vic's letting him out too much. I told him. I said to him. He's got I a said... tight hold, Dad. He's just breathing. Well, maybe. Hold him, Vic boy. Hold him. Looks like a beautiful animal, Mr. McIntyre. Never guess he was eight years old, would you? Should have been one of the top ones, Pete should. Maybe will be yet. Hold him, boy. He's just breathing, Dad. Well, maybe. Cut him. How much did he run it in, Mr. McIntyre? Uh, Thirteen-nine and a fifth. Don't think he's quite up to a race yet. But you told Vic not to let him run, Dad. Pete was fighting for his head all the way down the stretch. Well, uh, maybe. Horseman, Mr. Templer? Uh, just um, a two-dollar better, Mr. McIntyre. Greatest animal on the face of the earth, the thoroughbred horse. That includes humans, too. More heart, more brains, and much kinder to each other. Yes, you may have a point. Has, uh... Peter the Great always been your horse. Bred him, fold him, raced him, and had him all his life. Outside of a couple of months a while back. If it hadn't been for a little leg trouble, Pete would be up there with the best. Oh, here he comes back. Thirty-nine and a fifth, Vic. You could have held him a little harder, though. Oh, Pete, steady, boy. <sighs> held him a little harder. I almost pulled both arms off holding him. All right, Vic, all right. Easy, boy. You think Pete's ready for a race, Vic? What's the matter with you, Annie? Are you getting it, too? You know he's ready for a race. He's been ready for a month. And Dad knows it, too. Well, maybe. We'll see. Steady, Pete. See? What is there to see? The horse is eight years old. What are you waiting for? A match race with citation? Vic, uh, this is Mr. Templer. He's a friend of mine. Hi. And I thought... How no, are you, Vic? Dad, what is it? Every time I work the horse, it's hold him, hold him. Every time I tell you he's ready as he'll ever be, it's, it's maybe. Let's wait and see. Is it me? Are you afraid you won't get an honest ride? Is that it? Vic. Well, is it? Uh, you know better than that, son. All right. When are you going to run him, then? Well, we'll see how he cools out today. Maybe maybe in a week or ten days. A week or ten days? Well, we'll see. We'll see. Come on, Pete. Come on, boy. Vic, 
You shouldn't have said that to Dad about an honest ride. That's what he's thinking, isn't it? That's what you're all saying behind my back, isn't it? And what's Mr. Templer here for, to spy on me? Vic! Well, I'll save you the trouble, Mr. Templer. Right now, I'm going to get some sleep. After which, I get up, eat some crumbs that pass for a meal, get in the sweat box for as long as I can stand without it killing me, ride five races this afternoon, and after that, I've got a date. Thanks for your assistance, Vic. Don't mention it. See you later. Vic, are you, are you seeing her again? Annie, you're a nice kid, but that's all you are. Just a kid. And who I see has got nothing to do with you. Understand? Yes, Vic, I understand. Goodbye. Annie. Don't worry, Mr. Templer. I won't cry. I haven't cried since I was six years old. But, Mr. Templer, don't let him make Vic... Throw a race? He wouldn't do anything dishonest. I know he wouldn't. You love him very much, don't you? I believe in him with all my heart. Let's go, Louis. What? Well, we're not staying for the races, Mr. Temple? No, we have to do. Oh, too bad. I would have had five hours to figure out the first race. Well, you can spend five hours looking at a form sheet. Oh, well, sure, sure. <laughs> well, the trouble is, by then I can't see the horses. Uh, Louis, where would I go to pick up whatever rumors might be flying around about horses and jockeys? Oh, almost any barber shop. But if you want authentic rumors, I would drop in downtown on Honest Al, your friendly neighborhood bookie. I thought Al was out of business due to uh, a slight difficulty with the court of law. Well, the technicalities of such things I don't follow all the ways, Mr. Temple, you understand. But the general principle I understand, it's like the song, there'll always be a bookie. You know, you may be right. Hello, Al. Simon Templer. A pleasure. Welcome to my humble cigar store. How's business? Haven't sold a cigar in months, but business is booming. How's things with you? No decline in crime, I hope. No, no. Good. None whatever. Just so we all keep busy. That's the big thing. Al, what do you know about a horse owner and trainer named McIntyre? Dad McIntyre? Mm -hmm. Anything you want to know. Owns Peter the Great, dog patch horse. Chestnut Gelding, eight years old. He's had a one-horse stable for years, has a daughter, 15, and raised Vic Borkowski, the jockey. Vic uh, always rides for him? Nobody else has ridden Peter the Great for years. Has um, anybody else ever owned the horse? No, oh, yeah, yeah. Some months ago, Big Ed Kleinman claimed him. Claimed him? Sure. Most cheap races are claiming races. You enter your horse for, say, $5,000, and if somebody puts in a claim for him... He owns the horse. I see. And nobody would ever claim Peter the Great because they knew how Dad felt about him. But Big Ed did. And it almost broke Dad's heart. Uh, how did Big Ed do with the horse? Mm, he won a couple of races with him, but then his legs went bad, and finally Dad claimed him back again. Uh, what about the jockey, Vic? Mm, Saint. All sorts of rumors float around about jockeys. All the time, all sorts of rumors. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. That's uh, all you can tell me, Al? Well, if a real big bet came in against the horse that Vic was riding, and Vic was on the favorite, I might be tempted to lay off the bet somewhere else. Nothing personal, just business. I see. Uh, you don't know any particular girl who Vic has been seeing, do you? Sure I do. Jacks live in a goldfish bowl. If one of them scratches his head with his left hand, 50 horse players spend the whole night trying to figure out what it means. Uh, the girl? A big blonde named Crystal Winters. Mm -hmm. Showgirl. Used to go with Ed Kleinman. She hangs out at the band box. Thanks, Al. I'll uh, be a character witness for you someday. That's a deal. I hope you get him straightened out. Get uh, who straightened out? The kid, Vic. He used to be a nice guy. Maybe he still is. Dad's a nice guy, too. And I always liked Annie. <laughs> I even liked the horse. Al. Awful, isn't it? Don't let this get out, Saint. It would ruin me in the profession. Good evening, Vic. Huh? Oh. Hi. 
Introduce your friend, Vic. This is Mr. Templer, Crystal. Friend of Annie's. Miss Winters, Mr. Templer. A pleasure, Miss Winters. And have you got a first name, Mr. Templer, so that we can be old friends and then you can sit down and join us? Well, the first name is Simon, Crystal. And uh, I'd love to join you if uh, Vic doesn't object. Object? <laughs> this is what he's been waiting for all evening, isn't it, Vic? Crystal, will you You see, off? Simon? Sit here next to me and have some champagne. Vic, you've let us run out of champagne again. Go get some more. What do you think I am, a waiter? Oh, no, you're a jockey. You're too short to be a waiter and too tall to be a midget, so you're a jockey. You're getting tight, Crystal. And you're getting the champagne. Goodbye, Vic. Now. Goodbye, Vic. Okay. You're a little rough on the boy, aren't you, Crystal? Sure. Why? Well, I could say it was to drive him away because I'm bad for him, but I'd be lying. If I wanted to drive him away, I'd have to be a lot rougher than that. I can see why. Thank you, Simon. But you can't. Little jockeys just happen to like big, expansive, expensive blondes. I found that out at an early age, which was quite some time ago. And do you like uh, little jockeys? You're becoming very personal, Simon. I don't quite know what I like. I like to think about it. And I'm a slow thinker. Uh, do you like uh, big Ed Kleinman? Why don't you ask him? He's standing right behind you. Oh. Who's your friend, Crystal? Mr. Templer, Mr. Kleinman. Mr. Kleinman, Mr. Templer, Mr. Templer. Shut up, Crystal. You a friend of Vic's Templer? Well, you might say that I'm... Vic hates him. Uh Uh-huh. Just uh, put me down as a patron of racing, Mr. Kleinman. I'm uh, interested in improving the breed. Yeah. Watched you move in on Vic, Templer. He's not big enough to object, but I am. He didn't move in on Vic. He... Shut up, Crystal. Leaving, Mr. Templer? That seems to be the majority opinion. Good night, Crystal. Every moment has been golden. You hear that, Ed? Can't you say something nice like that sometime instead of... Shut up, Crystal. Hmm. A one-track mind. Hello, what is it? Mr. Templer? Who's this? Ann McIntyre, Mr. Templer. I'm terribly sorry to bother you, but... What's wrong, Annie? It's Dad. I can't find him. He never stays out this late, Mr. Templer. He's always out at the track early in the morning. And he... What time is it? 4 a.m. I didn't want to wake you, but I've been sitting here all by myself wondering... Stay right there, Annie. Most likely your dad will show up before I get there. But I'll be right out. Thank you, Mr. Templer. Thank you. You... You don't think anything has happened to him? No, Annie. I'll be right there. Mr. Templer, he never did anything like this before. He... Easy, Anne. When did he leave here, do you know? I was here. It was around nine. Dad left to walk over to Pete's stall. He always does that just before he goes to bed. And, and then he... He just didn't come back. Uh, did you look for him? Yes, I... I went over to the stables. I didn't see him in Pete's stall and... I asked a few people, but none of them had seen him, and I, I came back here. He, he was always in bed by ten, Mr. Templer, every night of his life. All right, Annie, we'll find him. Did you call Vic? He's living at a hotel. He just moved from living with us a month ago. I, I called him. Is he in? No. All right. Don't worry, Annie. We'll find your dad. Just go over to the stables. All right, but I looked there. Oh, well, we'd better cover them again. What is it? Somebody coming. Dad? Hmm? Oh. oh, Annie. What are you doing out this late? And Templar. Hello, Al. Seen anything of Annie's dad? No, no. Just came from a poker game with some of the boys, but we didn't see him. Well, you know he never stayed out this late, Al. Never. Sure, Annie. Sure. You've been down to Pete's stall? Annie looked there earlier. But uh, we might check again. It's right over here. <laughs> Easy, boy, easy. Dad! He's not here, Mr. Templer. I'll go in just to make sure. Wait here, Annie. I'll come with you. Uh, easy does it, Pete. Well, the old boy he looks excited about something, saying. Yes, I, I noticed. Well, it doesn't look as if... Al. Yes. Yeah. Over in the corner. 
Is that? I'm afraid so. Got a lighter? There. Here. Mm. Mark of a horseshoe. Must have killed him instantly. Keep Annie out, will you? Sure. Mr. Campbell. Oh, wait a minute, dear. Dad. I'm sorry, Annie. Oh, please. I'm afraid that he is. How, how? Oh, Pete. No. Not Pete. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. He couldn't. I'll never believe he did it. Maybe I won't either. I want to help you make some plans. Plans, Mr. Templer? What's there for me to do? Just keep on going to school. I've got another year and keep on living here. I... I guess you'll keep on living at your hotel, Vic. I, uh, I think that's best, Annie. Of course. You're right. Uh, what about Peter the Great? Pete? Yes. I know Vic thinks Dad wouldn't race him because he didn't trust Vic to ride him. But I don't believe that. So, I've entered Peter the Great in the sixth race tomorrow. Will you ride him, Vic? You trust me to give you an honest ride, Annie? I trust you, yes. Oh. Thanks, kid. Thanks, I'll ride him. I'll ride him for you. So long. Did I do wrong, Mr. Templer? If you like someone very much, then you have to trust them, Annie. You just have to. And that's never wrong. Hello, Al. Well, hello, Mr. Templer. Here to place a little wager on Peter the Great for tomorrow? Word gets around fast. It's a scientific pastime, Mr. Templer. The players have to study out things well in advance. Helps them to lose their money. Mm. Had any action yet on the race? Definitely. Mr. Big Ed Kleinman placed a very substantial sum on two other horses in the race, mm. which I promptly laid off with the connection I got out of town. He's uh, pretty sure Peter won't win. He must know something. If he doesn't, he stands to go broke. Pete's picked in the consensus. He'll go off maybe even money. Well, what could uh, Big Ed know, Al? Well, what's there to know? You can't very well dope a horse these days. So what does that leave? The man on the horse's back. The monkey on the stick. You know the saying, Saint, never bet on anything with two legs. That's a bitter comment on the human race, Al. All I know is it's very hard to find a dishonest horse. Well, Big Ed isn't... Uh... Throwing money around just on speculation, I suppose. Well, uh, it's the size. The what? The size of the jocks. Mm. They're five-foot men in the six-foot world. They never get to eat a decent meal. They can't take a drink. Everybody else is trying to get big and strong, and the worst thing that can happen to them is they grow up to be normal. So if their ethics are not all they might be, well, it's... Now that's understandable. A very good word. You don't think Vic uh, Bokowski will give Annie an honest ride tomorrow? I'll tell you better this time tomorrow. How are you betting? I'm not a better, Al. I'm only interested in improving the breed. Hey, uh, who do you like in the sixth, Mr. Templer? Uh, Peter the Great, Louis. Well, you liked him at even money? I'll tell you after yeah, the race. After the race. Uh -huh. Thanks very much, yeah. Oh, sorry, Louis. It's just that I almost wish the race wasn't going to be run. I I have a feeling something tragic is about to happen, and I, I don't know what I can do to stop it. You know, I get that feeling every time I go to the window, the better horse. A girl's life can be shattered at 15 and never quite be the same. Well, you know, that's what they call a vulnerable age. Oh, here we are. You, uh, you got any plan in mind, Mr. Temple? I'm afraid it's too late to do much, Louie. Even if there was anything to be done. But just on a chance, I'm going to check the clubhouse bar. Hey, you don't think you'll find your friend Annie in the bar? Maybe another friend, Louie. In 
enjoying the races, Crystal? Oh, so, Mrs. Simon Templer. Sit down, Mrs. Simon Templer. Winning or losing? It's his sister. You divide the number of highballs you've had by five. Add three and that's your horse. Never fail. Except when you've had enough highballs to make it work, you forget how many highballs you've had. Mm. How many highballs does it take to forget this next race? I'm trying to find out. You know something about it, don't you, Crystal? Sure, I do. Why don't you ask me what? I'll ask you. Then I won't tell you. Were you ever 15, Crystal? Sure, I was. At 15, I started to dance in a chorus line. At 16, I was married. Two months later, I was back in the line. <laughs> was I ever 15? Did you ever believe in someone so hard it hurt? And have t- him take your belief and throw it away? You're talking about the kid. Annie and her jockey. Yes. What's going to happen, Crystal? You know. Tell me. That's the funny part. I don't. Nobody does. Well, what's, supposed to, what's that supposed to mean? Either Vic throws the race or he doesn't. What else is there? Either Annie gets her heart broken or she doesn't. If it's an honest race, Pete should win easily. All right, Boy Scout. I'll tell you. Why? Don't ask me why. Maybe a girl can be pushed around only so long. Maybe she can be pushed around all her life like a mop. Maybe she can have... Crystal. There isn't much time. Tell me. You've got to tell me. All right. There's nothing you can do anymore. You know my boyfriend had climbed me? Huh? You know how many kinds of a louse he is? He wouldn't bet on this race only because I was supposed to persuade poor little Vic to lose. He couldn't trust either of us that far. He's got another gimmick. What? You know, he owned Peter the Great a few months back. Yes, I know. Claimed him from Dad McIntyre. Well, poor old Pete broke down. So Ed nerved him. He what? He nerved him. Took out the nerve in his sore leg so he couldn't feel anything when he ran. Nice. Oh, what happens to the horse? Nothing. For a while. Ed won another race with him, then he let Dad claim him back. But after a while, the leg begins to die. And sooner or later, if you run the horse... One leg will cross in front of the other in a race. What happens to the jockey? I don't know. If he's not trying to win, the horse might not even fall. If he's out front with the whole pack behind him. Great dandy. Does Vic know about the horse's leg? Nobody knows. Except me and Big Ed and now you. But Dad knew, didn't he? That's why he wouldn't run the horse. Kept telling Vic to hold him back, even in a workout. Must have been nice for him knowing Pete had to die. Money, 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 money. The horses are nearing the starting gate. And you can't do anything about it. Too late. Much too late. Crystal, what happened the night Dad was killed? I told you enough. I told you too much. Did he come to the club that night looking for Kleinman? Did he? He came there. That's all I know. I don't know anything more. That's all I know. That's enough. What's enough? Race ready to go, Crystal, are you... Oh, you've been talking. Ed, I didn't say anything about that. Honest, I didn't. I... Shut up. Too late, Kleinman. Way too late. Hey, Mr. Templer, don't you want to see the race? They're in the gate. Just a minute, Louis. What? I want you to hear this. Kleinman. Why? Anyone that would kill a horse would have to figure on killing the horse's owner, too. Or get killed himself. McIntyre got kicked by his own horse. Everybody knows that. You expected Dad to show up when he found out you nerved his horse, and you were ready for him. I never saw him. He already knows you. Shut up, Chris. An old trick, Kleinman. Tie a horseshoe on a baseball bat makes it look like a man's been kicked by a horse, doesn't it? Must have been quite a job getting Dad back to the stables. But then, uh, you're a big man. Such a big man. Listen, Templar, this doesn't add up to anything. But... You're just trying to make trouble for me. You know, if it's just a question of money. Money, you know... money, money. Don't you know, honey? You haven't got that much oh, money. you shut up! You know, Kleinman, I'm getting a little tired listening to you say shut up. Go for the track police, Louis, will you? Oh, a pleasure, Mr. Tim. Wait a minute. Uh, that gun must be very heavy. I'd like to use it on all of you. But there isn't time, is there? All right, just stay where you are. I'm getting out of here. Hey, you want us to try and catch him, Mr. Tim? No, he won't go far. Get the track police after him, Louis. I've got to find Annie. And they're off. At the start, it's Speed Merchant breaking on top, followed by Count Flavacci, Harbour Light, Quizme, Fleet Arlene, and Peter the Great. Annie, 
Annie. Oh, Mr. Kemper, I've been looking for you. How, how does it look? Oh, he wants to run, Mr. Kemper. He wants to run. Well, let him out, Vic. Let him out. Feet of the great between horses. Harbor light by one and fleet on lead. Into the back stretch, Kemper Marchie is drawn out by two lengths. Speed merchant by one, moving up on the outside. Oh, now, Vic, now. Oh, get in his head, Vic. He can do it if you let him, Vic. He can do it if you let him. Into the far turn, it's still Count Ravachi showing in front by one leg. Speed Merchant with me. And now moving up very fast. And the outside is Come Peter on, the Pete. Great. He's second. He's going to get the leader. Now it's Peter the Great in front oh, by one leg. Count Ravachi, Speed on. Merchant third with me. He's riding him, Mr. Kemper. Vic is riding him. He's letting him run. And turning for home, me. it's Peter the Great by four legs. Oh, Speed Merchant is second by two. Oh, with me, Count Ravachi, Speed Ali by a neck and Harbor Light. Into the stretch, it's Peter the Great stretching out oh, by six never lengths. Catch him. They'll never catch him. Speed Merchant is second by half a length. With me, Fleet Ali, and Peter the Great wins it going away. Oh, Mr. Kemper, he's gone. He's gone. There's trouble. Peter the Great is going down. Back! Oh, Back! Templer? He's going to be all right, Annie. Oh. He was thrown clear. Well, I guess I'd better be going. Wait a minute, Annie. He wants to see you. He does? As a matter of fact, he was uh, very emphatic about it. Go on in and smile for him. But, but what will I say? I mean, how will I act? Well, how I'm... do you feel? Well, I... I don't feel like a kid anymore. You don't think he'll call me a kid again, do you, Mr. Templer? I don't believe he will. But how will I act? Oh, don't worry, Annie. When the time comes, a girl always knows how to act. You think that this is the time? This is the time, Annie. Good luck to both of you. <laughs> have been listening to another transcribed adventure of the saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. Now here is our star, Tom Conway. Ladies and gentlemen, in our cast you heard Janet Waldo's Annie and Jean Tatum as Crystal. Jack Moyles played Dad, Sam Edwards Vic, and Paul Richards Al. Paul Fries was Big Ed. Louis is played by Larry Dobkin. This is Tom Conway inviting you to join us again next week at our new time for another exciting adventure of the saint. Good night. This script of The Saint was written by Dick Powell. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Safier production and is directed by Helen Mack. Tom Conway is soon to be seen in Warner Brothers' production of Gold Diggers in Las Vegas. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer is Don Stanley. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Beginning next Sunday, July 1st, The Saint moves to a new time on most NBC stations. Yes, beginning next Sunday, you'll hear The Saint 30 minutes earlier at 4 o'clock Eastern Time. Next Sunday at this hour, a new show joins your NBC lineup of top mystery programs. Martin Kane, Private Eye, starring Lloyd Nolan. And here he is, one of Hollywood's finest actors, Lloyd Nolan. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, here is your invitation to join me as Martin Kane, Private Eye. My new role on this station beginning Sunday, July 1st. Hear Lloyd Nolan as Martin Kane, Private Eye at this same time beginning next Sunday. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. Got an old corpse kicking around you want identified? Know of any good murders you want solved? 
We've got just the girl for you. Her name is Candy Matson. Mighty cute, too. She fills out a size 12 suit to just the right proportions. Soft blonde hair, two sparkling blue eyes, and all in all, she looks as though she might have stepped right off of Arca Calendar. And what's more, she's a private eye. You scoff? You ridicule? I'll let you see for yourselves. Listen, she's talking on the phone right now. Hello, Candy Matson. Hello, Miss Matson. I'm afraid you don't know me. That makes it even. You don't know me. Let's go from there. I've read about you in the papers, Miss Matson. You handle confidential cases. That's right. However, there's a little matter of a fee involved. Yes, yes, I know. I can pay. That's item number one. Now to item number two. What's the confidential case? I can't possibly tell you on the phone, Miss Matson. I said it was confidential. Mm, okay. Where do you want to talk? I am the proprietor of a restaurant, the Charlemagne in North Beach. Oh, yeah. I ate there once. Oh, that's nice. No, it wasn't. I didn't like the food. Oh. However, I'll overlook it. Do you want to talk in about an hour? That will be fine, Miss Matson. Good. And your name would be... Martinello. Carlo Martinello. Okay, Mr. Martinello. And uh, have some ink in your pen. It costs money just to talk. I probably sounded rough and commercial, but you have to be in this racket. Most people look in a private eye as a musician. They invite you to a party and expect you to bring your harp for free. But uh uh-uh. I learned the hard way a long time ago. So now they pay in advance and take their chances later. That's the way it was with this Martinello. I was at home in my penthouse on Telegraph Hill out on the porch taking a sun bath. When the phone rings and it's this Carlo character. That part was all right because I can always use new customers. But what made me mad was the fact that I had to stop listening to the 49ers belt the bejabers out of the Cleveland Browns at Keysar Stadium. But I followed through and uncovered a couple of very done-in bodies along the way. Do you like the grotesque in your whodunit? Then follow me and we'll tiptoe lightly through the tibbets, the ponds, and the baccalonies. Because part of the story unfolds at the opera house. Reluctantly, I dressed into something Charlemagne-ish. Turned off the 49ers Cleveland game and went down to talk to Martinello. His place was typical. Located on Powell Street, a garish neon sign, and as you walked in, the air place was air conditioned by eau de garlic. Yes, miss. You wish a table? I wish a table, yes. With the right party. I'm looking for the owner. I am the owner. I am Candy Matson. Oh, Miss Matson. Walk this way, please. <sighs> if I could walk that way, I'd revive vaudeville. Pardon? Uh, where is your office? Right over here. Allow me. After you, signorina. Thank you, signor. Here, sit down, please. Thanks. Now, Martinello, what's on your mind? Always, all my life, I have run a very nice, respectable place. Mm Mm-hmm. Until this morning. What's with this morning? I go down to the basement. My icebox is down there. That is where I keep all my meat. So, you wanted some ground round? Oh, no, no. Perhaps I'd better show you. Please, you will come with me. Martinello led the way out of his office and down a flight of stairs. A cold blast hit my face. A musty aroma smothered my nostrils, and if I had had a phobia about darkness, I'd have ducked out then. But I followed the guy, and we ended up in front of a refrigerator about the size of an inquisition chamber. He opened the door, and it was the usual restaurant icebox. Choice legs of lamb hanging from hooks. Potential fillets and thick New York cuts. The box was cold and I started to shiver. Not from the refrigeration, though, because over in the corner was a man. He looked like something out of a long-lost Arctic expedition. He had a long, flowing mustache, every bristle of which was coated with ice. He was quite frozen and quite dead. I slammed the door shut and reeled out. The sight had staggered my thought processes. Martinello reached over by a salami slicing table and turned on a Mazda, a weak affair that cast dim shadows about the damp basement. Is that your little surprise? Yes, Mr. Matson. That is what I was greeted with this morning. Have you notified the police? Oh, no, no, no. Why not? As I told you, I have run a very respectable place. And two 
That is why I am hiring you. You can get in trouble, you know. Yes, yes, that is why you must help me. Please, please, Miss Madsen, say you will help me. I will pay you anything you say. I stick my neck out in the strangest places. Now it's a refrigerator. Okay, Martinello, $2,000. What? Make up your mind. Either I freeze your assets or the police find your frozen friend. Yes. All right. Come. I give you the money now. Now we're getting somewhere. What about him? Oh, he'll keep. He's on ice. Well, this was one for the books. Refrigeration the ugly way. I had to ask a few questions if I was to get anywhere. Such as like, do you know the guy? No. Had you ever seen him before? No. Who was the last one to close the icebox last night? I was. Does it lock from the inside? Unfortunately, yes. I was getting places like Wiley was with Hauser. It was inevitable. I had to take my courage in my hand and go down and look at that thing again. There it was. A male Mona Lisa etched in ice. This time I looked closer, I had to. And as I did, I realized I wasn't going to get any identification because this guy was a study in crimson. Underneath all that coating of ice, he was dressed in a devil's costume. I slammed the door once again and went upstairs. There I gave Martinello strict orders not to do a thing. Usually in cases like this, you have to wait for a break. They come along like a forcing hand in poker. So I went home to do some thinking. As I arrived, there was an old friend of mine, Rembrandt Watson. Hello, Dove. I'd almost given up. Rembrandt, how did you get in? Your door was open, dear. I took the liberty of coming in. Oh, sure, that's okay. How are things, Candy? All right, I guess. I'm kind of bush, though. I feel about as devaluated as a British pound. You look wonderful, Dove. What's wrong? I've got a deal, but I don't know where to start. Anything I can help you with? No, thanks, Rembrandt. If I told you about it, you wouldn't believe it. I've never doubted you in the past, dear. I know. Well, I was just called in by a minestrone merchant in North Beach. The guy is stuck with a corpse. That's about par for the course. The deceased had been sealed in the icebox overnight. I've never seen one like that before. That's the way it is, dear. Many are called, but few are frozen. Oh, get out of here. But, Dove, I just got here. I know, but I've got to change and get down to see Mallard. I'll wait for you, Candy. I haven't seen the gumshoe since before me vacation. All right. I'll be with you in a few moments. I did a fast change, and Rembrandt and I climbed into my car, and we dropped off Telegraph Hill on Don Kearney Street. The Hall of Justice, where Mallard hangs his star, is only a few blocks away, so we made it in about five minutes. Inspector Ray Mallard. Homicide, San Francisco Police. A lovable, shaggy dog type of character. Very keen with the crime, but dumb with the dame. Me, for instance. If I want him to say yes, he says no, and vice versa. Well, my ever-loving candy. What's new in the private eye business? Very little. How's the legitimate fat foot racket? Oh, we're holding our arches up. Well, and Rembrandt. I haven't seen you since Pup was a Hector. Please, Inspector, you're metting your mixer paws. Who writes this dialogue? I'm pretty weak, I know. What's on your mind, Candy? A character named Carlo Martinello. Have you got anything on him? <laughs> What's so funny, Mallory? Nothing, except I eat lunch there about every day of the week. Well, answer my question. Well, there's nothing on Martinello. Arrested a couple of times during Prohibition. He was dabbling in grappa a lot under the table. Have you got a case against the guy, Detective Matson? Oh, cut it out. No, seriously. Why do you want to check on the guy, Candy? No reason. Just thought I'd ask. Uh-huh. Well, Martinello's okay. Just trying to make a living. Only thing I don't like, he loves to sing to his customers. <laughs> That'd be enough to bankrupt him right there. Anything else I can do? No, that takes care of everything. I'll tell you what. I'm through in about an hour. I'll take you up to Martinello's for dinner. You can see for yourself. No, 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 that, that, that's all right. Okay, Candy. Give. Why, Mallard, dear, what on earth do you mean? You know something about something. I want in. Mallard, and, and I want you to believe this. I mean it sincerely. If I knew something, you'd be the last to know about it. He's got something there. Come, love, leave us a while. I hate to do things like that to Mallard. He's been of great help to me in the past. More than once, he's saved my life. But on a deal like this, you have to play it close. After all, a girl has to make a living. 
For the first time in a long time, I was completely baffled as to where to start. Something had to be done about that cadaver in the icebox, but what? While I was beetling my eyebrows, Rembrandt invited me up to his place for tea. He lives on California Street, just down away from old St. Mary's and only a bail bond broker's reach from the Hall of Justice. So I accepted. Do forgive the looks of the place, Candy, dear. I had a meeting my philatelist group last night. Philatelists? The stamp collectors, dear. Well, I know what they are, but I didn't think they could make such a mess. You don't know philatelists. <laughs> Sit down, though. Make yourself comfortable. I shan't be a moment. That's all right. Candy, dear, why the wrinkles? I've got cause for wrinkles. This chap in the icebox, Rembrandt. There's something I didn't tell you. He was dressed in a devil's costume. There, there, dear. Your tea will ready in just a minute. You'll feel better. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. What are you going to do, Candy? I don't know. I can't leave him in that refrigerator forever. Well, get him out, dear. I hate to think of a corpse catching pneumonia. Oh, excuse me, Candy. Help yourself to the tea. Mm -hmm. How do you do? Rembrandt Watson Enterprises. <laughs> Quiet, darling. Who? Oh, hello, Templeton. How are all your steamships? Oh, that's good. What? Could I use do what? To the opera? Of course I could. Right, oh, I'll pick them up at your office. Thank you, Templeton. Goodbye. Candy, dear, do you like the opera? I can take it or leave it. Why? It suddenly develops that I have two tickets tomorrow night for Tales of Hoffman. Oh, Rembrandt, I don't think I come, can... Come, go... come, Candy. It'll do you good. You've been working too hard. You need a little relaxation. Tales of Hoffman, hmm? Okay. Who's the pal who gave them to you? An old friend of mine, Templeton Woodruff. He runs a steamship to Java and other places Ezio Pinza sings about. I finished the tea and left. Right then, the only opera I could think of was the one going on in an icebox at Martinello's. I've always tried to play straight with Ray Mallard, so I decided to tell Martinello my plan. Miss Matson, I don't think it's such a good idea Good evening, to... Carlo. I want to talk to you. That's what I mean. There's a gentleman here who... Oh, you've got a gentleman. That's fine. Three more and you've got a crowd. What I want to talk to you about is this. You don't understand. The gentleman I'm talking about is from the police. The police? Yeah. Hello, Candy. Mallard. How about some scallopini? Well, up jumps it. The... Hello, Mallard, dear. I had an idea you'd like dinner here tonight. Uh, do you know my boy, Carlo? Yes, yes, we've met. How do you do? How do you do? The signorina wish something to eat? No. No, thanks. I want to talk to you, though, Mallard. Sure. Come on into my booth. We'll share some salami. No, no, thanks. I want to see you downstairs. I don't think the food's as good down there. I agree, but it isn't the food. I'm talking about murder. Once again, I headed down into the catacombs of the Charlemagne. This time, the act was a double. Mallard was right behind me. Then I looked around. We were a trio. Martinello was right behind Mallard. This is it. This is what? This is an icebox. Inside, you'll find a body dressed in a devil's costume. Okay, Carlo, let's humor the lady. Open the thing, will you? I... Yes. I'll open it. <laughs> Lovely view of the beef. It's gone. The body's gone. Okay, Martinello, start talking and make some sense while you're doing it. Please, Miss Matson, I don't know anything. I haven't been down here all day. Get rid of those arched eyebrows, Martinello. You know something. What is it? Wait a minute, Candy. I'll do the questioning. In the first place, Carlo, was there or was there not a body in here? I... Uh... Well, sure there was. He can't deny it. Here's a check for $2,000 signed by Martinello himself. Well, Carlo? Yes. There was a body, all right. Who was it? A friend of yours? No, Inspector. I never saw him before. Why did you call Miss Matson? Why didn't you come to see me about it? Well, you know, Inspector, the police... Uh, just because you were once arrested for bootlegging, Carlo, is no reason to be afraid of the police... Uh, well, I'll put a couple of my men on the job and see what we can turn up. What? Is that all you're going to do, Mallard? No. Right now, I'm going back upstairs and have some of Carlo's scallopini. Mallard, are you out of your head? Look, Candy, in order to have a murder case, you've got to have a body. Obviously, we're fresh out. 
And until your pal with the devil's costume turns up, I intend to live my typical everyday life. Don't forget the mushrooms, Carlo. There are times when I get so mad at Mallard I want to scream. I didn't, though. I only scrammed. I hung on to the 2,000, however. I felt I deserved it just for getting my curiosity aroused, and it was aroused plenty. Corpses don't get up and walk out of ice boxes by themselves. But after all, Mallard had a point. There was nothing to be done without a body. So I went home and waded into a stack of dirty dishes that had been piling up. Then I fixed dinner and started a new stack of dirty dishes. Got in book and ducked into bed. In the morning, I had an idea. After breakfast, I went down to the corner of Broadway and Columbus. That's where North Beach does a neat blend with Chinatown. On the corner was a Joe who sold newspapers. I'd known him for some time, and he seemed to like me. Hiya, Butch. Well, hello there, lady. How are you? Good. Can't complain. Who won the football game yesterday? Yeah, funny thing. I got all the news right inside here for seven cents. Mm, I get your point. Give me a chronicle, will you? Sure. Here. Thanks. Who do you like in the feature of Bay Meadows? A goat named Candy. What? What did you say? There's a pig named Candy running in the seventh. Take it or leave it. What a tip. I don't get it. Well, what's really on your mind, lady? Here. Here's a 20. You can play it on Candy all for yourself. Well. Do you know a gent named Martinello Butch? Yeah. He owns the Charlemagne down the block. Sure. What about him? That's what I'm asking you. What about him? Oh, he's all right. A little screwy, but he keeps his nose clean. Is that all? Yeah. Should there be more? I don't know. Thanks, Butch. I hope Candy pays off. I was getting nowhere, that was for sure. And the rest of the day went the same way. Dead ends, blind alleys. I checked as many loose ends as I possibly could, but I was still stuck in a quandary. But the crusher claimed late in the afternoon when I got a copy of the late paper and read where Candy came in at Bay Meadows and paid thirty-two twenty. And I hadn't had sense enough to get aboard. When I got home, the phone was ringing. Hello, Candy Matson. Oh, you're Candy Matson. I should play a fanfare. Oh, hello, Rembrandt, dear. How are you? Like an October morning. Every single one of the paws is breathing great, huge gulps of air. What? I just had a facial dove. Most invigorating. Uh, what on earth for? I loved your old pores just the way they were. Candy, you've forgotten. I have? Forgotten what, Rembrandt? We're going to the opera tonight. Oh, Ducky, I'm sorry. I had forgotten. I'm afraid I'll have to renege. Now, Candy, you promised. And I don't care what you're involved in. It'll do you good. But, Rembrandt, I'm working on it. Perhaps you're right. Okay, I'll get ready. Wonderful, dear. Pick me up about a quarter of eight, will you? Pick you up a quarter of eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and another thing, Lamb. We may have to do some entertaining afterward. Uh, do bring some cash, will you? Mm-hmm. That's the girl. <laughs> That Rembrandt, always stony broke. I guess photography isn't what it's cracked up to be. I didn't mind, though. He's been a friend to me on more than one occasion. Then if I was going to the opera, I had to start thinking in operatic terms. I fished around in the closet and came up with something that would have done any woman's heart good. One of those strapless affairs that you can't stop breathing in for one moment, otherwise the opera is no longer the main attraction. I powdered, perfumed, pouted, and rouged, and took off after Rembrandt. But just as I started to leave... Just a moment. Well, get a load of the Duchess. <laughs> it won't be Halloween for another couple of weeks yet. Oh, very funny. Come on in, Miller. What are you decked out for, Candy? Something you wouldn't understand. I'm going to the opera. Oh, I love the opera. Any horse opera with Tex Acuff in it. That's what I thought. What's on your mind, Mallard? I've got to pick up Rembrandt in ten minutes. Well, I was just driving by, so I thought I'd stop and tell you the news. News? About what? We found El Diablo. The guy in the icebox? Yeah. Martinello identified him. He was floating in the water off Aquatic Park. Any lead on him? The best. He was Salavini, the second baritone with the opera company. That's all, Candy. I hope you enjoy the performance tonight. <laughs> A baritone with the opera company. Well, that explained the costume, but it didn't explain a lot of other things. I walked down the stairs with Mallard. He got in his squad car, flicked on the flashing red light, and with a burst of his siren, rolled down the street. 
might have to speak to Mallard about that. All the neighbors had their heads out of their windows as I climbed into my car and followed. What an exit. I picked up Rembrandt and we drove up to the Civic Center. I found a place to park. A minor miracle. The last time I went to the opera, I had to drive almost to Palo Alto and come back by train. Rembrandt's friend must have been very influential. We had seats in the Diamond Horseshoe. They were presenting Tales of Hoffman, and a friend of mine, Dorothy Warrenchold, was singing the role of Antonia. It was a fine performance, and after the last curtain, I took Rembrandt, and we went backstage to see Dorothy. This is her dressing room, Rembrandt. Yes? Hello, Dorothy. This is Candy Matson. I have a friend with me. Oh, do come in, please, Candy. Candy, how are you? Couldn't be better. Dorothy, may I present Mr. Watson? Rembrandt, this is Miss Warren I'm delighted. You're in magnificent voice tonight, dear, dear. Thank you. Sit down, won't you? I've only a moment. We're rehearsing some of the scenes in Faust tonight. Rehearsing after a full evening's performance? It has to be done, Candy. Our baritone disappeared. We've had to replace him with a new man. Yes, yes, I know. By the way, Dorothy, I heard you on your Standard Hour broadcast a few weeks ago. It was a wonderful performance. I'm glad you liked it, Candy. I always look forward to those. What are your plans, Dorothy? Well, the season closes here, and then we open in Los Angeles. Oh, yes, of course. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Come in. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had guests. That's all right. Oh, Candy, I'd like to introduce Rolf Herberts. This is Miss Matson and Mr. Watson. Nice to meet you, Mr. Herberts. Mr. Herberts is our new baritone. Oh, yes. That's why we're rehearsing tonight. I uh, won't take any more of your time, Dorothy. I just thought we'd save a few moments of rehearsal if I told you that I don't uh, move in that last scene. I sing upstage. That will leave you free to take as much stage as you like. Fine, Rolf. That will save time. Thanks. Oh, not at all. Glad to have met you, Miss Matson. Mr. Watson. Nice to have met you, you, sir. Yeah, see you on stage, Dorothy. Yes, Rolf. Rolf has a wonderful voice, and he's a good actor, too. You know, I think he'll be even better than Salavini. I've seen him before. Oh, yes, he's been in pictures and on the concert stage, and in opera, too. But he's, he's never really had a good break. This might be it. Uh-oh, that's it, Candy. I'm sorry, but I'll have to leave. Certainly, Dorothy. Say, why don't you stand in the wings? You can watch the rehearsal if you'd like. Oh, I'd love it. Come on, then. Follow me. All right, the places, everyone. Places. This is all right, Candy. You can stay right here. Thanks, Dorothy. Glad to have met you, Mr. Watson. Also, as we used to say in the theater, go out there and kill him. <laughs> See you later. Where is Miss Warren Ah, there you are. Herbert, where's Herbert? I saw him just a moment ago in the dressing room. But it's late. We've got to keep moving. Please, somebody find Herbert. Ah! From way up in the heights of the stage, the opera house was pierced with a blood-curdling scream. That was no ordinary scream. It was the scream of death. You wait here, Rembrandt. Keep your eyes open. I'm going up to have a look. That scream wasn't in the score of Faust. I punched the button for the backstage elevator. It's a good thing they work fast and are speedy. Once inside, I pressed the button for the fourth gallery. I got out. This was the top of the opera house. The place was loaded with old sets, props, paper mache alligators, gold goblets. Then, over on the other side of the catwalk, I saw it. The body of a man all crumpled and distorted. I hit the catwalk and ran over. It was a hundred feet above the stage, and as I looked down, I could see a score of strained faces looking up through the darkness. I got on the other side and bent over the body. It was that of Rolf Herbert. Candy, down here. I think your man just ducked down underneath the stage. Again, I did a Mel Patton. The elevator shot me down to the stage level, and there was Rembrandt, wild-eyed. He came down the elevator on the other side, Candy. Then he cut across the stage and down those steps. Come on, Rembrandt, follow me. I may need help. We ran down the steps and into the bowels of the stage. It looked like a nightmare, a myriad of cross beams of steel for the rising stages. We cleared those and went around by the chorus dressing room. There was only one out. I remembered it. A door over in the corner, very seldom used, but it was open. It led into a long tunnel with giant steam pipes running overhead and to the right. This went underground over to the veterans' building. 
Down by your feet, there's a stream of water flowing in a trough. It's the old Hayes Valley Creek. Our killer decidedly knew his opera house. As we entered the tunnel, I could see him up ahead running like crazy. So we took off after him. We made the other side, and it breaks into a big engine room. As we came into the opening, I looked around. The engineer was lying on the floor out like a light, blood spurting from his scalp. Then I glanced up. There was another door. This led into the veterans' building itself and an avenue of escape onto Van Ness. I ran up. Then as we got into the long corridor, I saw Martinello breaking for the door. Stop! Stop, Martinello! Stop! You think I am a fool? I do if you don't stop. Try and get me. Okay, pal. You asked for it. <laughs> It was the first time I had ever shot a man. It didn't feel good. But he lived. And later, the doctors of law gave him a little pill. The cyanide kind they dropped inside the gas chamber at San Quentin. Martinello paid his debt. Details? Sure, I'll fill him in now. Martinello loved to sing. Ray Mallard had told me that. For years, Carlo had been hanging around the opera house, hoping to step into a role. This season, a director had jokingly told him that if he ran out of baritones, he'd let Carlo take over. Carlo took him seriously. He lured Salavini down to his restaurant on a fake emergency call, costume and all, and did him in. But then he became frightened. That's when he called me. It was worth $2,000 to have me hush things up. But I don't operate like that. He had a hunch I was going to tip off Mallard. That's when he removed the body from the icebox and dumped him into the bay. Carlo had also been at the performance of Tales of Hoffman. That's when he learned that they'd wrestled up Rolf Herbert to sing in place of Salovini. By this time, Martinello was obsessed with the idea of singing in the opera house and wouldn't stop at anything. Right after Herbert left Warren Schold's dressing room, he managed to get Herbert into the elevator and up to the fourth gallery behind the stage. That scream was produced by a six-inch stiletto through Herbert's heart. From the hands of Martinello. And that's when our chase began. I hope I never see that tunnel under the opera house again. That Mallard and his sentiments. It was he who gave me that gun just a week before. For my birthday. He said I needed protection. Well, darn it, I do. But I can't get Mallard to believe me. Instead, he just gives me guns. <laughs> Listen again at this same time next week. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 2A209. Heard tonight were Harry Bechtel as Ralph Herbert, Jerry Walter as Carlo Martinello. Henry Left plays the role of Inspector Mallard and Jack Thomas as Rembrandt. Dorothy Warren Schold, star of the Standard Hour and the San Francisco Opera Company, was heard as herself. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. With the exception of Miss Warren Schold, any resemblance to actual people in tonight's play is purely coincidental. Candy Matson comes to you from San Francisco. This is Dudley Manlove speaking. You are tuned for the stars on NBC. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you Miss Claire Trevor in Angel Face, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. The flowers are blooming this spring. Tra la. <laughs> Have nothing hey, to hey, do with hey, it. Hey, 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 hmm. hey, Hap. You better save that for the bathtub or consult a voice expert. Seems to be an expert for everything these days, Wilcox. Everything from voices to... to spark plugs. Mm. Take Autolite spark plugs, for instance. They're designed by Autolite ignition engineers. The men who engineer spark plugs, just as they engineer coils, distributors, wire, and all the other important parts of the ignition system to work together as a perfect team. 
why the skill of these ignition engineers has made Autolite spark plugs world famous for their quality and dependability. Ignition engineered Autolite spark plugs, you might say. Yes, sir, and these same Autolite engineers developed the famous Autolite resistor spark plug, one of the greatest advances in spark plug design for automotive use in the past 20 years. Real experts, eh, Wilcox? Right you are, Hap. So, friends, see your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer tomorrow. Have him replace worn-out spark plugs with world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. And whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you can't buy a better spark plug for your car because you're always right with Autolite. And now with Angel Face and the performance of Claire Trevor, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. I see her already, if you don't mind. Out of my way. They've got a doorman downstairs in this building. You're supposed to get yourself announced, honey. The name is Wheeler. Does it mean anything to you? Wheeler? I had caught Ruby Rose Redding, the noted burlesque queen, at breakfast time. Hers, not mine. Quarter to three in the afternoon. Breakfast was a tomato and lettuce, untouched, and a glass of bromo salsa. She banged her cigarette to death against an ashtray and looked me up and down, like auditioning me for her chorus, chorus line. Wheeler, what's it supposed to mean? Are you his mother? I'm a little young for the part, but I'm the only one he's ever had. Oh, now I get it. The big sister act. Okay, run through it once, then get out of here. Sure. I don't mind coming right out with it in front of your maid if you don't. Yeah. Suzette, take Fufu around the block a couple of times. Madame, I took him once already. Well, take him again. Maybe you can get him at tomorrow already. But, Madame... Get out of here! Oui, Madame. Well, I'll give it to you short. I want you to lay off my brother. Your brother? Now, let's see. What am I supposed to have done to him? He's been spending money like wild. Money that doesn't come out of his salary. And another thing, he started wearing a gun about two weeks after you started wearing him. Did I teach him to shoot it, too? No, but I think some of your friends may have. Oh, you've been reading the gossip columns. Well, I read them, too. Some big gum from Philly is supposed to be paying my rent. Forget it, honey. That's my publicity. Now, will you get out of here and let me get my massage? Look, give him a break, will you? Pick on someone your own size. Well, of all the... Say, I've heard of wives pulling this bit, and even mothers. And once in a picture, it was the old man. Now it's a sister. Well, send Grandma around tomorrow. Out, out, beat it! I walked out past her. If she touched me, I, I think I'd have murdered her. Oh, I went for a walk. Why aren't you at work? I quit my job. You did? Chick, you aren't going to Chicago with that dame, are you? Why Chicago? Well, it's in Variety. Ruby Rose is opening a club there. It, it also says a big-shot gangster from Philly is backing it. Oh, what? Well, does he know about you? What are you trying to do, scare me off? Oh, no, you're such a big shot. That wouldn't work. All that about that guy... That's nothing but publicity. Ruby told me all about it. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, look, sis, you don't know her like I do. Oh, Chick, I'm not going to let you get mixed up with this. Now, no cracks, Jerry. Look, Ruby Rose Redding makes good money, all right, but the rent on that plush-lined rat trap she lives in, if you can call it living, is around $3,000 a month. Now, somebody's paying those bills and... Oh, nuts. What do you really know about her? More than you ever will. Oh, please. I'm in show business, too, you know. Oh, lay off, will you? Chick... Wait, listen. I heard enough. Chick, please. Get away from the door, Jerry. I never raised a hand to you in my life, and I don't want to now. I won't let you go, Chick. Not for her, not for something that ought to be washed out of your hair with gas. Get out of my way, Jerry. Oh, don't go, Chick. You're heading straight for the eight ball. Chick, Chick, don't go to her. <laughs> Thank you. 
dissolved two girls sitting at kitchen table playing very solitary solitaire. About four that morning, I was looking for an aspirin. When the doorbell buzzed, Chick, I... Chick, I... You're Jerry Wheeler, aren't you? He was nice. I found out his name later. Lieutenant Nick Burns. The other one had a face like one of those cobblestones they dug out of 8th Avenue when they tore up the trolley tracks. Your brother. What time do you leave here this evening? I really couldn't say. I, my clock's out of order. Miss Wheeler, your brother was going to Chicago with Ruby Rose Redding, the dancer. You knew that, didn't you? Oh, now, why would he go anywhere with anyone with a name like that? Your brother went to the Alcazar Apartments at 8.15 tonight and beat up this Redding dame. What? Then he put his two big thumbs on her throat and throttled her until she was dead. You're just saying that. He's just saying that, isn't he? That's the way it is, Angel Faith. Well, he didn't do it. Please, please, he didn't do it. All right, I... I did know about him and Ruby Rose, but... But he couldn't have done that. I've been on the squad eight years, Angel Face, and we never in all that time caught a guy as dead to rights as your brother. <sighs> he showed up with his valise in the foyer of the Alcazar at exactly 12 minutes past eight tonight. He said to the doorman, what time is it? Did Miss Redding send her baggage down yet? We've got to make a train. Well, she had sent her baggage down, and then she changed her mind. She had it all taken back upstairs again. There's your motive right there. Well, that doesn't prove anything. The she The doorman might... rang her apartment and said through the intercom, Mr. Wheeler's here, and she gave a dirty laugh and sang out, I can hardly wait. I don't see that. So what? So she was alive at 13 minutes past 8. The doorman went out for coffee at 8.15. At 8.20, Ruby Rose asked the operator to give her the police. She was shrieking with fear. At 8.32, I arrived. Your brother was crouched over, shaking her, and she was dead. Oh, no. There were two thumbprints on her neck as well as the marks of a big signet ring where she'd been pummeled. The initial, W, for Wheeler. Is that a case, or isn't it? Was, was Chick wearing that ring when you arrested him? No, but there's a ring mark on his right third finger where he got rid of a ring he'd been wearing a long time. He pawned it. He needed money. He told us he lost it. Well, even if he did hit her... How do you know somebody else wasn't in that apartment just before Chick showed up? Where was that, that French maid of hers? Discharged. Got her notice in two weeks' pay and left around six. Story checks. Did Chick confess? Oh, no, no. He was crouched over, shaking her, trying to restore her, he said. All right. All right, I'll tell you everything. Write it down. Yeah, that's more like it. I went there this afternoon and told her if she didn't lay off my brother, I'd kill her. I came back home, found Chick packed up, ready to leave. I, I tried to stop him. He hit me. Ask the neighbors. They heard us rowing. He struck me, and I couldn't stand it. I beat it up to her place in a taxi. Got there first, went in the back way, and, and gave her one last chance to leave him alone. She wouldn't take it. She was all soft and, and squashy, and I, I just grabbed her by the neck and pushed hard. I've got big thumbs, too. Mm-hmm. Got all that, Kohler? Uh, yup. Well, that about puts the lid on it. Let's go. Yeah, let's... Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, Angel Faith? Aren't you going to take me? Who wants you? Oh, you think this is one of those phony confessions. Well, maybe the newspapers won't think so, and they'll be right. Maybe you did do it at that. Maybe I'm underestimating you. What was she wearing? Pajamas. You're right. That was a good guess. See you later, Angel Faith. The way he said it, I couldn't tell whether it was a threat or a promise. I never saw him again until after the jury had found my brother guilty of murder in the first degree. Autolite is bringing you Miss Claire Trevor in Angel Face, tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense.
Carlo, speaking of experts... Experts, did you say? That reminds me of Autolite Ignition Engineers, the men who design and build complete ignition systems, used as original factory equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. They're ignition experts. So naturally, they know how to build Autolite spark plugs so they'll work as a perfect team with all the other important parts of the ignition system. That means they know how to build into spark plugs the best in quick-starting, smoother performance and gas mileage, eh, Harlow? Righto. And say, it's the skill of these same Autolite engineers that made possible the development of the Autolite resistor spark plug. One of the greatest advances in spark plug design for automotive use in the past 20 years. Edgewise. How's that again, Hap? Just trying to get a word in edgewise, Harlow. <laughs> well, here's the last word, Hap. See your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer tomorrow. Have him replace worn-out spark plugs with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you'll be right, because you're always right with Autolite. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Claire Trevor, in Angel Face. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I was coming out of the courtroom in a wet hen frame of mind, and guess who had an umbrella? Hello, Angel Face. Get away from me, you butcher. <laughs> the girl, feeling better already, huh? Just keep out of my way. Oh, now, wait a minute, Angel Let Face. Let go of me. You need help, baby. I'm trying to give it to you. All right. Tell me the name of the little man who wasn't there. Wasn't where? In that courtroom, standing trial for her murder in place of Chick. Can't you see? It's got to be another. Oh, what's the use of trying to sell you? Oh, go on. Sell me. Convince me your brother didn't do it, and I'm with you up to the hill. Well, why did you wait till now to say that? Well, you didn't give me anything to go on. Nothing but that phony confession of yours. Well, it was better than the perjured testimony of that doorman and that, that phony French maid. Well, and you, you sat up there with your face hanging out and put in your two cents worth. Look, Angel Face, I was sent by my superiors in answer to the patrolman's call that night. Questioned Chick and put him under arrest. Don't hold that against me. What do you care whether I hold it against you? You really don't know? No. Look in the mirror sometime and find out. Right then, I decided to stop holding it against him that he was a detective. I kind of liked the guy, and maybe, just maybe, he could find a way to help clear my brother. And over a couple of Manhattans in a cheery little bar, I told him so. Uh huh. Well, you got a plan, Angel Face, or are you going into it blind? I think I'll start with that French maid. Why her? She left two hours before the murder. That's level. Yeah, maybe so, but she was greased plenty to soft-pedal the one right name that belongs in this case. Uh -huh. She may not have been there, but she knew who to expect around. She may even have tipped him that Ruby Rose was throwing him over for chick. But if she's been paid off enough to commit perjury, what makes you think she'll tell you anything? I'll club it out of her if I have to. Oh, wait a second. Here. Try this first. Use a little intimidation with it. It may work. A hundred and fifty bucks? Mm hmm Hey, aren't you married or anything? Not yet, Angel Face. Now, here's her address. Suzette LeBlanc, real name Susie White, 435 West 54th. The street had been roped off and there was a block party or something going on. Anyway, it was noisy. I elbowed my way up the steps of 435 and found Susie White's name on the bell panel. I broke my best fingernail on the button. No response. I pushed into the hall past the drunk, falling oh, out. pardon me. And fought my way through the fumes to the stairway. Her door was standing open. The lock was broken and the molding was a mess of splinters. This was the point where the private eye always finds the dead body, but I didn't find anything. Somebody had taken the room apart. I wondered if they had found what they were looking for. When I hit the street again, the ugly-faced drunk I had passed coming in was standing by the front steps. And there was a fresh wood splinter clinging to the elbow of his coat. I remembered the splinters on the broken door upstairs. I, I stopped next to him and made like straightening my seams. I looked good that way. Then I started walking fast. So did he. I paused in front of some steps leading down to a basement apartment and waited for him. Hello, beautiful. Well, how are you? Just fine. Is this your house? Yes, indeed. 
Yeah, I'll buy a little drink, baby. Uh-huh. You invite me in. Sure, you go first. Yeah. He hit the Allen railing with his head on the way down and the paving stones at the bottom did the rest. It was right there in the first pocket I looked in behind his wallet. A letter addressed to Ruby Rose Redding and postmarked Philadelphia. Nick, here I am, over here. Oh, hello, Angel Face. Nick, I... I know, I know. You didn't find her. I may as well tell you why. She doesn't live there anymore. What? Nick? They fished her body out of the Hudson about a half hour ago. Oh, well, what are you smart detectives calling it? Suicide? Yeah, we might as well. Listen, she was being paid off to keep quiet about a certain friend of Ruby Rose's. Wow. He must have decided he didn't dare leave any bets uncovered. What certain friend, for instance? This certain friend, for instance. I watched his face as he read it. I knew every word of it by heart. It said, Dear Ruby, I hear you've been running around with some punk. I don't believe a word of it, but you better get rid of him before I hit town. Mm. We'll be in New York Friday night. Milk. P.S. The Chicago deal is off. I'm giving you featured spot at the Calcutta instead. About that punk, drop him or I drop you. Milt. So yeah. that's the missing name. Milt Miletus. Plays rough, too. Runs the Calcutta Club. And Friday night, Nick. The night she was killed. Mm. Miletus. The initial on that ring could have been M as well as W. Yeah, yeah, I never thought of that. But Melita spells real dough, baby. Your brother wasn't even car fare to Ruby Rose. Well, maybe she was scared of Melita. And maybe she wanted out. Oh, yeah, could be. You could sell me, but I convince easy from you, baby. You're not selling it to the grand jury. She had something on Melita. And that's why he couldn't afford to lose control of her. Well, what Ruby Rose Redding could squeeze out of a man... I can. Yeah, what he squeezed out of her, he could also squeeze out of you. Namely, your breath. Oh, yes, but I have a friend on the force. Well, maybe Ruby Rose, Ruby Rose had a friend on the force, too. Why do you say that? If she didn't, it would be the only department she missed. Oh. <laughs> well, what now? Come and catch my act at the Calcutta Club. Go on, lift them a little higher. Don't be coy. Look, I sing and dance, and that's all. You got any numbers with you? Numbers? Look, what are we wasting time for? Let's meet the guy who does the hiring. Hey, wait a minute. Mr. Miletus, what's your... Well... She says she wants to meet you, Mr. Miletus. Sure, why not? Well, hello. Hello yourself. Oh, Mr. Miletus. You know, I've always wanted to work for you. <laughs> okay. We start the Calcutta tomorrow night. Oh, thanks. Oh. Buy yourself some up-to-date lyrics, get yourself a dress. Mac will tell you the kind uh, I like. The silver dress they put on me fit like a wet compress. I wore it for two nights, and Milt Melitus sat at its table. On the third night, after my last spot... After the orchestra had gone away, I got the message from Garcia. Hello, baby. Hello. Angel Face, huh? Yeah, mm-hmm. My name is Faye Angel, so I call myself Angel Face. <laughs> Good tag. Sit down, Angel Face. Mm -hmm. I gave him my warmest high-voltage smile and took out my compact. I saw my eyes in the mirror, and in each iris there was a little electric chair with chicks strapped in it. That made it a lot easier to keep the high voltage running through Milt Miletus. He was good-looking in a swarthy, loose-lipped sort of way. Nothing that tagged him as a gangster except his name and a habit of keeping his right hand in his coat pocket all the time as if he were holding a gun. We talked through the bottle of champagne, and he ordered another. I kept smiling because somehow I had to get into his apartment. We went back to what we'd been talking about, and I said, Well, some night I might just feel like changing the scenery around me. Dissolve. 
to girl entering the Melitis apartment on Park Avenue. It was a duplex with a two-story living room and a bedroom opening, opening off a balcony. I decided to start at the top and work down in case I needed to get out of there fast. I gave his bedroom the suspicious wife treatment. In the night table, I found the nine letters to Ruby Rose and a bunch of treasury certificates, the kind doctors have to make out to get narcotics. In a box containing studs, cufflinks, and one thirty-two caliber bullet, I found what I was really looking for and never really expected to find, a signet ring with the initial M on it. When I got the bell, I thought fast. If Miletus was out of town, everybody who knew his private number would know better than to ring it. If he was checking up on me, I had nothing to lose, so... Hello? Angel face? Oh, Nick. Oh, what a scare you gave me. Listen, I've got all I need. Some dope certificates, the rest of the letters, and best of all, a signet ring with his initial. How am I doing? Not so good. Melita's just got back. Sore as the devil over a phony wire somebody sent her to decoy him out of town. Well, that was me. Only I thought he'd stay overnight at least. How did you know I was here? Angel face, did you really think I'd let you go into this alone? I'm downstairs now. I've been watching every minute. Oh, I wish I'd known. I wouldn't have been so scared. You ought to be scared. He left the club five minutes ago. Must be Oh, half... all right, Nick. Now, look, Angel face, if you... Could... Nick, someone just came in. Take it easy, baby. Sergeant Coley and I'll be right up. I went out onto the balcony that overlooked the living room. Miletus was there. He looked surprised and pleased when he saw me. Then the man with him looked up and I... I nearly plunged over the rail. It was ugly face, the masher I had kicked down the flight of stairs. Melitis turned to him. Get out, Rocco. Can't you see I have company? Hey, wait a minute, that's her. The dame I was telling you about. Oh. Don't be calling my lady friend dame. I'm trying to tell you, Mills. Come Mil. here, Angel Face. Come on down. Don't be scared. <laughs> oh, sure, Mills. Why should I be afraid of you? At last, huh? Finally, you wanted a change of hey, look, scenery. Boss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Get out, Rocco. Well, yeah, but... Get out. Okay, Mel. It's your party. Come here, Angel. <laughs> now, 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 wait a minute. What for? Well, a girl likes some soft lights and a little sweet music, you know. <laughs> okay, I'll go mix us a drink. He came back from the bar on tiptoe with the drinks, looking like a cat stalking a bowl of cream. I threw up my first line of defense. I picked up my purse and made like making up my face. Well, honey, what's the big idea? <laughs> I'm just putting on my face. Oh, you don't need it. <gasps> my purse. Leave it there. Oh, I will not. Those are my things. You haven't any right... Hey, 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 what's that? Just things of mine, some letters. Let me see those. No. Let me see those. Oh, ho. What else did you lift out of my room? I... I was jealous. Her letters. Sit down. Uh. <laughs> you are plenty jealous. Jealous of the whole United States Treasury, eh? Bill! Bill! Open up! Stay where you are. What's up, Rocco? I tried to tell you about the dame. She's what? trying to frame you. She's Wheeler's sister. You weren't at the trial. You weren't... Shut up about Wheeler. What's got you so excited? There's cops all around the building. Two detectives coming up. Okay, Rocco. Little. I'll fix you. Even if they get me, I'll fix you. You're wrong, Milt. I took those things because I knew they were coming here. I, I did it for you. Oh, for me, she said. No, no. Ah. I looked up at Miletus. There was blood running down the part of his hair. He dropped down to his knees beside me like he wanted to apologize, but... He didn't say anything. Then he fell over on his side and didn't get up anymore. His right hand, the one he always held in his coat pocket, was grabbing at the rug. There wasn't any thumb on it. And there'd been two big thumb marks on Ruby's throat. Hey, that wasn't necessary, Nick. You didn't have to kill him. He let go of her when we came in. I, I know. I, I shouldn't have, but he had that right hand in his pocket always. I thought he had a gun in there. Yeah. 
Anyway, I saved the state some money. You got that stuff, Angel Face? It's over there in my purse. Good. Nick, Mm -hmm. Ruby Rose was throttled by a man with big hands. Two big thumb marks on her neck. Look at Miletus. No right thumb. Yeah, that's bad, Angel Face. I... Nick. uh, What? This, uh, ring here. Isn't this your fraternity ring? Don't move, Nick. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it is. Do we have to mention all this, Coley? Yeah, Nick. I think we'd better. So that's about it, Captain. Uh Uh-huh. And as you know, sir, Nick met Ruby Rose while he was doing undercover work on Milk Melita's. Yeah, Yeah. but I didn't know he'd gone on seeing her after he left the assignment. Uh, I guess nobody did, except me. Yes, that... And Sergeant Coley clinched the whole thing with that ring. Well, Miss Wheeler, the ring clinched the case, all right, but not against Melita's. An M upside down, see, is a W. But an M sideways is a Greek letter. And Nick planted it in Melita's apartment for me to find, huh? It was Nick's fraternity ring. Yeah, that's right. He was probably afraid you were digging too deep to find the real killer, so he killed Melita's to make you drop the case. Oh, his plan might have worked without Coley here. Uh, (laughs) Well, Miss Wheeler, this isn't exactly good news, but thank you for filling in some of the blanks. Oh, Captain. Yeah? When will Chick be free? Uh, It takes a little time, but he'll be home. I guess he learned about women the hard way, huh? Oh, he hasn't learned anything yet. That kid brother of mine. Just wait till I get him home. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Miss Claire Trevor. Harlow, the expert, Will Cox, the bright, never will desert the cause cause of Autolite. Mm. Because, folks, Autolite makes more than 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on money makes of America's finest cars. Generators, coils, voltage regulators, wire and cable starting motors, electric windshield wipers. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly because they're a perfect team. So, friends, if your Autolite-equipped car needs replacement parts, ask for and insist on Autolite Original Factory Parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Dennis O'Keefe. The play is called Very Much Like a Nightmare. And it is, as we say... A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Angel Face is an original play written for radio by Cornell Woolrich. Claire Trevor may currently be seen co-starred with Fred McMurray in Borderline. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Charles Boyer, Edward G. Robinson, and Jack Carson. Don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Dennis O'Keefe. You can buy world-famous Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite staple batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. The Ghost on Bliss Terrace, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger is my stock and trade. If you're crowded into a corner and you can't fight your way out alone, you've got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details.
Dear Mr. Valentine, there's no such thing as a haunted house. You know that, and I know it. Still, a great many people in our neighborhood are convinced that a certain empty house on this terrace is occupied by a ghost. I've persuaded a group of my saner neighbors to join me in raising a fee so we can prove once and for all... Prove once and for all that it's all so much poppycock. You can find me at home any morning. It's signed, Mrs. Angela McCauley. Hmm. A haunted house, no less. Well, I know how we can earn that fee in a hurry. All right, Angel. I'll play straight man. How? Just put out a for rent sign. Oh. Whatever ghosts happen to be around will be trampled to death. Brooksy, you take this too lightly. Hmm? Now, this isn't just one person's fanciful whim. This is a community project headed by a solid citizen named Angela McCauley. Hmm. We can't turn our backs on a civic enterprise like this. Well, all right. But what standard equipment for a job like this? Hand-tailored bed sheets, old props from an Abbott and Costello picture? No, Angel. Just pride in our work and a normal amount of curiosity. And as I've said, Mr. Valentine, although we're ordinary middle-class families, we take great pride in our neighborhood. Uh, yes, you've told us that, Mrs. McCauley. You can't imagine the effect all this talk about the Mitchell house has had. What do you mean? Oh, it just stands there empty. Nobody will rent it. Nobody will buy it. An eyesore for the whole neighborhood. Well, uh, outside of saying boo to the ghosts, uh, what do you expect me to do? It's entirely up to you, Mr. Valentine. We just want you to prove that all those stories about the Mitchell house are false. Well, just what are these stories, Mrs. McCauley? Well, there was the milkman, Fred Horton. He swears that when he was delivering milk one morning, he saw a curtain swing back and a face suddenly appear in the window. I see. Well, is that all that happened? Well, Tommy Koenig, that's Martha Koenig's little boy, he says he saw a face in the window, too. Well, anyway, that's two people that saw it. Hmm. I certainly wouldn't take Fred Horton's word for anything. And Tommy, that boy can dream up anything with his imagination. Um, you know, uh, I doubt very much if a group of substantial people like yourself would have asked me in at all just because a milkman made a few wayward remarks and a little boy seconded the motion. Are you sure you're not leaving anything out, Mrs. McCauley? Not a thing. As I told all the others, this never would have happened if Sam Mitchell hadn't been murdered. Murdered? Oh, well, this might be the thing you left out. Uh, did you say Sam Mitchell was murdered? Yes, that's right. About a month ago. It was never solved. Why didn't you say that at the beginning? What a way to tell a story. An unsolved murder is an afterthought. Just because Sam Mitchell was hit over the head by some passing tramp, it doesn't mean the whole neighborhood should be given a bad name. Yeah, I know, and I saw. Young man, do you or don't you want to accept this assignment? Oh, yes, Mrs. McCauley. Yes, I'd like to take it on. Good. I don't know why. Maybe, as Miss Brooks said, it's just the fascinating way you tell a story with murder as an afterthought. <laughs> Okay, Valentine, okay. I don't see why this Mitchell case has to be a private nightmare. Oh? Nightmare? Well, what would you call it, Miss Brooks? Sam Mitchell, railroad engineer, devoted husband, coming up for pension after 40 years of faithful servant. Hasn't got an enemy in the world. Suddenly we find him beaten to death in the home he worked and paid for. Yeah, we found out that much, Lieutenant. There wasn't anything stolen. Everybody loved the guy. We can't find the murder weapon. How about Mrs. Mitchell, Lieutenant? Eh? Oh, well, she was visiting her sister when her husband was murdered. He was hit over the head repeatedly with a blunt instrument by someone who apparently couldn't do the job right the first uh, time. Just and... a minute, Riley. Huh? Yeah? I told you my only job is to prove that the house on Bliss Terrace isn't haunted. I know, I know. Ghosts. Ah, that day Mrs. McCauley's been in my hair, too. Well, what about it, Lieutenant? We've been through that house with a fine-tooth comb. We've watched it from the outside. Nobody could have got in or out without us seeing them. Oh, you know how people are when they start talking. Yeah, ghosts. Of all the cockeyed jobs you've ever taken on, Valentine, Take this is easy, the... easy, Lieutenant. Take it easy. God. Suppose I look for ghosts and you try to find the murderer. I understand you deliver milk in the neighborhood of Bliss Terrace, Mr. Horton. That's right, mister. Well, now, just exactly what did you see? Uh, well, like I've been saying, a face in the window around dawn one morning. Uh -huh. A man or a woman? Oh, couldn't tell. It was a, a, a thin face, like it was almost all bone. Long, stringy hair, 
You've seen it for a minute. <laughs> Look, you believe me, don't you? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Go on, go on. Well, not only that. One morning, I heard music coming out of the Mitchell house. What's that? Yeah, a guitar or banjo or something. Uh, it went something like this. Um, da, 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 da. <laughs> you believe me, don't you? Oh, yeah, every word. <laughs> I was just marveling at the way you carry a tune. Thanks for the information, friend. Sure, I seen somebody in the Mitchell house, and I'm going to prove it, too. <laughs> okay, Tommy, take it easy. Well, tell us about it, dear. What kind of person was it? Well, lady, it was getting dark. I put my face up to the wind on the porch, and gosh, all of a sudden, there was another face looking right at me. Hmm. I bet that must have thrown a scare into you, Tommy. <laughs> me scared? Not me, lady. I just kept looking right back at him. I'd say it was me who scared the daylights out of him. Hmm. So it was a man, huh? Golly, I, I don't know for sure. He had long hair like a lady, but... Well, anyway, it was real, like Mr. Horton said. Just wait till I prove it, too. Well, that's a job we both got, son. Only it looks as though you've got a head start on me. I know it can't be easy for you to talk about this, Mrs. Mitchell, oh, but... I don't mind at all. Really, I don't. Oh, well, that's very nice of you. Tell me, dear. Do you like this perfume? It's lilac. Oh, uh, it's lovely, Do yes. Do you think I have too much on? I've always used lilac since I was a girl. As Sam used to say, it made me seem even smaller and more fragile than I am. Uh, yes. Now, about the house, Mrs. Mitchell, you were saying... After Sam was... Well, after he passed away, I tried to go back, but I couldn't stay there. You see, there's someone there. I felt it. Footsteps in the night. And once I heard... Music? Yes. How did you ever guess, Mr. Valentine? Oh, I'm psychic on my mother's side. That's nice. It was an old, old song. It reminded me of the days before Sam and I were married and moved into that house on Bliss Terrace. You know... I was quite a belle, Mr. Valentine. Yes, well, that's easy to imagine, Dances, but if... The mandolin club every Sunday, canoe rides. Oh, those were happy days. I could have married someone more romantic than Sam, like Paul Hart. Now, look, Mrs. Mitchell, I understand you were away at the time of your husband's death. Yes. I was staying here at my sister's. I'm afraid that Sam and I had a little trip. Oh, about what, if you'd care to tell me? Sam was getting his pension in a few days. He wanted to live quietly on Bliss Terrace, but I wanted to use the money to see all the wonderful places I've only read about. Poor Sam. Now, I suppose I'll have to do that alone. Yeah. Mrs. Mitchell, I wonder if you'd let me have the key to your haunted house... I'd like to take a look around. You know, George, we could sit here in the car and watch that house all night and still not see anything happen. Yeah, you're so right, Angel. I don't even know what I expect to see happen. Darling? Mm hmm. Well, when we went through the house before, I, I did get sort of a funny feeling. Oh. Not you, too, Brooksy. That's Mrs. Mitchell's private routine. Oh, well, I kept getting the feeling that I was in a honeymoon cottage that hadn't been changed in 40 years. Oh, how do you like that? A honeymoon cottage, bliss terrace, and a murder. What a combination. Oh, George. Hmm? Maybe I'm imagining things, but isn't the curtain in that window on the porch moving? Yeah. Come on, Brooksy, that's our cue. <laughs> See, somebody was moving the curtain in this room. There are no windows open. It couldn't have moved itself. Well, nobody seems to be here now. Yeah, well, we're going to keep right on looking. Come on, we'll start with the dining room. 
Okay. The light should be here on the wall somewhere. No, you don't. Huh? Stay where you are. Huh? George. Okay, you ask for it. Uh... What the... Oh. All right, Tommy. You can put away your machine gun now. Huh? Oh, it's only you guys. Uh... Say, how did you get in here anyway? Oh, one of the windows in the back. You would find the one I haven't overlooked. Prove I wasn't lying when I said I saw somebody in here. Now, look, fella, I told you we're both trying to prove the same thing. How about giving me a break? Well... Oh, I, I know you're better at this sort of thing than I am, but it happens to be my living, my job. So, uh, how about going home, huh? Yes, your mother's probably wondering where in the world you are. Come on. She knows I can take care of myself. Hey, I'll be in the kitchen, Brooksy. Oh, what a deal. Mrs. McCauley, why didn't you stay out of my life? You and your citizens' committee for the prevention of ghosts. George? Oh, George. Oh, that's Tommy. Come on, characters. Well, he's a character. Well, don't you believe in light? <gasps> oh, George. Oh, don't be a oh. Just a childhood habit sprawling out in the kitchen floor. What happened? You frightened off a remarkably agile ghost. I got tapped before I could even turn on the light. But it... It can't be. Yeah, well, this bump is no make-believe. But where did this this thing go? Couldn't get out. There's no place to hide. Tommy was playing around in here, and we were watching the house from the outside. And somebody tried to give me the same kind of scalp massage Mitchell got. Oh, what goes on here? Brooksy, we're not leaving this Victorian love bower until we find out. <laughs> Turn to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about waste. No motorist would deliberately drive with a choke out. It would be like throwing gasoline away. But some folks let the air cleaner under the hood get so dirt clogged that it can waste just as much gas as a pulled out choke. Even worse, a dirty air cleaner means that some road grit and dust is mixing with the gasoline, and that can raise cane with finely polished engine parts. So take a summer driving tip. Have the air cleaner on your own car serviced. It's an inexpensive job that you can have done quickly at an independent Chevron gas station or a standard station. While you're there, let them help keep your engine cooler by cleaning out the radiator. That's another simple, speedy service which repays its cost many times over by maintaining proper engine temperature, better all-around operation. Ask for radiator and air cleaner service tomorrow at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say, and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, a committee of interested neighbors hires you to prove that a certain house isn't haunted. Oh, yes, you discover almost accidentally that there's been a murder committed in said house. A brutal, unsolved murder at that. Finally, you have to be knocked unconscious before you're convinced you're dealing with anything but a ghost. So, just like George Valentine, you change your tactic. Well, let's face it. Somebody was right here in the kitchen with me, and he didn't have a chance to leave the house. Oh, we keep going over the same thing. All right, Angel, all right. Let's be very simple. Why should anybody want to jump me like that? Well, I'd say whoever it was didn't want you to find him in the kitchen. Ah, now you're being very nice and simple. Thanks. Since I took him by surprise, he wouldn't be carrying a shillelagh around in his hand. He probably reached out for something that he knew would be there, something nice and handy, something like... Hey, what could be handy here? What are you doing, George? This poker hanging on this old-fashioned coal stove. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. And Brooksy. It's got blood on it. Yeah, Riley. This is Samuels down in the lab, Lieutenant. And about that stove poker. Well, let's have it. We checked and talked to the medical examiner. That was the weapon used on Mitchell, all right. We're working on the fingerprints now. Well, good. Well, that does it, Lieutenant. Whoever killed Mitchell was there in the house with us tonight. Now, wait. Don't go jumping at conclusions. Well, you don't think it's just a coincidence that of all the things in the house, he used that stove poker on George. He knew just where it was. He used it before. Well, okay, okay. I'm going to buy that. And what's more, I'm going back to that house with you. I don't know what else we can find there that's... That's what has me stumped. Well, if I have to, I'm going to tear that place apart with my bare hands. Sure, 
George, I'm sure we turned all the lights off when we left. Yeah, so am I. But there's a, a light in the parlor, all right. Come on, come on. What in the name of heavens is that? Sure. Horton, a milkman. He hummed it to me. He swears he heard somebody playing it on a banjo or something when he passed the house one morning. Well, let's go inside and find out what this is all about. Oh, goodness. What must you think of me sitting here and singing to myself like this? I uh, thought you were staying at your sister's place, Mrs. Mitchell. Why did you come back here tonight? Well, let me see. Oh, yes. These two nice young people and I were talking about the old times. Just this afternoon... Yeah, yeah. ...the songs we used to sing, and that naturally reminded me of the mandolin. You can understand that, Lieutenant. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. I. Uh, what mandolin, Mrs. Mitchell? The mandolin, of course. Oh, Look, Valentine, I don't give up easily, but this is getting out of hand here. Wait a minute, will you hold it, Lieutenant? I'm very interested in that mandolin, Mrs. Mitchell. Ah, you young man. Paul Huff gave it to me when I married Sam. Paul Huff? He was one of your beaux, wasn't he? He was so handsome, and he adored me. No one could play the mandolin like Paul. I'm sure of that. He was the leader of our club. I've always felt that Paul gave me that mandolin so I'd never forget him. Or the dreams we had together. <clears throat> I uh, don't know why, but let's get back to that mandolin. Huh? Well, now, that's just it, Lieutenant. It's gone. Huh? It's the only thing in the whole house that's missing. If it was a tramp who killed Sam, why would he just steal a mandolin? Oh, you'd be surprised how many questions I can't answer, Mrs. Mitchell. Come in the next room, Valentine. I want to talk to you. Come on. Okay. You can understand, Miss Brooks. First, I thought this call, and it's my name. That's the call. That's why I was singing. Valentine, a weird thought just occurred to me. You mean that Mrs. Mitchell might be our ghost and murderer? Well, she had a choir with her husband. The milkman says he heard something that sounded like a mandolin, and the old girl plays one. Uh-huh. Ordinarily, if you wanted to kill somebody with a stove perker, just a couple of smacks on the head would have done it. Lieutenant, Mrs. Mitchell is small and fragile. Yeah, yeah. And it took a lot of blows on Mitchell's head to make her a widow. Now, I've kicked that around too, Lieutenant. But if I don't come up with anything better than that, I'm going to buy me a mandolin and play on street corners. Well, I'm going to get Doc Powell down here. Police psychiatrist? Yeah, yeah. Maybe he can get her to make some sense. I know I can. <laughs> To you, Dr. Fair. You don't mind the others being here? Oh, no. No, not at all. All right, then. We'll go on. Uh, years ago, when this house was built, you meant it to be a sort of, uh, well, dream castle. That's exactly right, Doctor. It's strange how you should know. But in back of your mind, you didn't mean it to be for you and Mr. Mitchell. Oh, but you're wrong, Doctor. Sam and I lived here for 40 years. Uh, what I mean is that you were thinking of someone else all the time, whether you were willing to admit it to yourself or not. What about that, Mrs. Mitchell? You leave me alone. Get away from nah, me. Ah, wait a minute. I Don't get excited. You, doctor. you guessed my secret. Take it easy, Mrs. Mitchell. There's nothing to be afraid of. I never let Sam know how I felt. I tried to make him happy. Believe me. Oh, I yes, we do believe you now. Uh, just a minute. In here, Riley. All right. What do you make of it, Farrell? Well, Valentine, I wouldn't say she's crazy. Well, okay, Doc, what would you say? You've heard of people who stop growing physically, others mentally. Yeah. Well, some stop growing emotionally. She's one of them. Oh, don't go technical on me. I mean, for some 40 years, that woman has tried to remain a romantic young woman, holding on fiercely to a love she had to turn her back on. It's as simple and complicated as that. And one day she couldn't stand it any longer and bumped her husband off, huh? <laughs> The answer to that, Lieutenant, is your job. I don't think you need me anymore. Good night. Uh, good night, oh, Doc. Doc. Well, it's all wrong, Riley. What? 
What's all wrong? It finally came to me, a matter of arithmetic. Play around with it all you want. Five never equals six. Oh, listen, haven't I had to unravel enough double talk here tonight? Mrs. Mitchell is not even five feet tall, and I'm over six. She couldn't hit me over the head with that stove poker. But it couldn't be anybody else. Unless he's hiding behind a molding somewhere. And if he is, we'll find him. What do you say we really take your advice and start tearing this house apart? But, George, we've been through this closet before. All right, so we'll look at it again. What are you looking for, gentlemen? I might be able to help. Uh, please, Mrs. Mitchell. Well, I only wait thought... a minute, wait a minute. That patch up there in the ceiling. Huh? That's funny. I never noticed that before. What, that little square? Well, even if it was an opening, it wouldn't lead anywhere. Uh-huh. Well, it couldn't be more than a few feet between the ceiling and the roof. Here, wait a minute. Let me have that umbrella. Oh. That does open. Well, if somebody could squeeze in and out of that hole, how, how, how could he stay up there? Well, why don't you give me a boost? Maybe I can take a look. Hey, how about that, Lieutenant? Can we borrow your flashlight? Uh, all right. Here. Okay. Up you go, Brooksy. Oh. Well, what do you see? Let me get the flashlight on, will you? Yeah, Brooksy? Oh, George! Huh? Oh, let me down, quick! I got you, Angel. Oh. What is it? What is it? Oh, there's a man crouched up there. Oh, it's horrible. Paul? How could it be Paul? Say, Valentine, I... What? Remember, Lieutenant, you're in a hospital, not down at headquarters. Oh. Oh, yes, sure. And the nurse is likely to throw you out. Well, I'm sorry. But look, Valentine, look, uh, <clears throat> you and I are on this case together, aren't we? Well? Well, I just got a confession from this Paul Huff character. He admits he killed Mitchell. Well, that's that, then. Just a minute, Miss Brooks. He must talk some more. But he keeps freezing up on me. Now, Valentine, uh, see what you can get out of him, will you, huh? Well, okay, Lieutenant. <laughs> so important that someone know I didn't plan it. I didn't mean it to happen. I... You sure you want to go on? Oh, yes, yes. yes I must you see. I, I never made anything out of my life. I never knew just what I wanted. Except a few times I'd come back here to town and pass that house on Bliss Terrace. And then I knew what I always wanted. I never could have. You mean you've been coming back here all these years? Oh, they never saw me, but this one time I knew I was getting old and old and sick. And I went into the house when they were out. Yeah? I wanted to see what life was like for them, living it so calmly and so peacefully. And suddenly I heard someone come in. I, I didn't know what to do. I ran into the closet, and there was that opening in the ceiling. Somehow I climbed up there, and, and that's where I've been staying. But how long? Oh, weeks. I don't know. It's hard to say. I, I don't think I could have stood it if I didn't hear her moving about. But Sam Mitchell was your friend once. You could have talked to him. I thought of that, too. But one night when she was away, he walked in and he saw me in the kitchen. Yes, and I was scavenging for food just like a tramp. He didn't even know who I was. Oh, don't try to sit up, Mr. Huff. Suddenly I felt nothing but hatred and envy. And I grabbed the stove poker and... And I had no place to go. I, I went on living up there. When you found me in the kitchen last night, you felt I was the intruder and you belonged in that house, huh? <laughs> and to think that she kept my mandolin for 40 years. That's a long time, isn't it, young lady? 
Yes, yes, a very long time. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's all I wanted to tell you. Sorry, but I'm beginning to feel very tired. I'll see that the lieutenant gets your story straight. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah. And I'll tell Mrs. McCauley there'll be no more ghosts on Bliss Terrace. <laughs> Finely polished and precision-built engine that gives your car all its go can't be neglected. In fact, it needs more attention when you're asleep than when you're driving. And the reason for that is internal engine rust, which goes to work when condensed moisture begins to settle over parts. Nearly any ordinary oil can fight off rust when your car is running and there's full circulation of the lubricant. But RPM motor oil is compounded to protect the engine when it's running hot and when it's standing cold. Unlike ordinary oils, RPM doesn't run away from its job when you cut the motor. A special adhering compound in RPM keeps a tough oil film on all engine parts, protects the interior of your engine from rust. And that's another reason why Western motorists choose RPM motor oil two to one over any other motor oil. Get RPM at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear Lieutenant Riley saying... Valentine, when you tell me there was a girl sitting in this chair when you came in and that she had committed suicide, Mm. natural curiosity makes me ask, where is the body? I don't know, Lieutenant, but she was there. (laughs) Uh, If you ask me, my friend, somebody's taking you for a ride. And if you ask me, my friend, I'll keep saying it's Marsha Palmer who's been taken for a ride. And, Lieutenant, I intend to find out where and why. Adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast where Sarah Selby as Mrs. McCauley, Virginia Gregg as Mrs. Mitchell, Stanley Farrar as Dr. Farrell, Howard McNear as Paul Huff, and Alan Reed Jr. as Tommy Koenig. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Map of Murder.
begin with, I'm a businessman. I run a cafe, and when business gets bad, I look for ways to pep it up. So when Musine Duval came in asking for a job as a singer, I decided to try some entertainment. All Musine asked was a week's tryout and a little salary advance to keep her going. Well, anyhow, I'll admit it, I sort of liked her. Maybe it was the way her coal black hair was bobbed, sort of like the Sphinx, and the round curve of her white shoulders as she sat at the piano under a spotlight. Anyhow, you couldn't keep the customers away. Things went swell till the fourth night. I was in my office about ten o'clock listening to the jingle of my cash register up front when it all started. What are you doing? Just who do you think you are, interrupting my song and grabbing me like a common woman of the street? I got to the door and could see Mouzine screaming at a big swarthy guy who was standing up trying to get a word in. A couple of waiters were hovering around just in case. I decided to cut in. I do not go with the drinks, monsieur. I'd like to find out just what you do go with. You will, you will find out. You do not leave and stop molesting me. Okay, what's this about? Who are you? Jordan, I run this place. I don't go in for having my entertainers. What's up? Okay, Jordan, my name is Ralph Garnett. I was only looking for a certain girl. Sure, sure. I thought this might be the one. So when she came by my table, I just reached up to turn her around. She slipped and fell in my lap. <laughs> fell? It is not so rocky. He fooled me. All right, I'll handle him, Muzin. I didn't mean to cause this much of an incident. I'll try a different approach next time. Look, Jordan, when I find the woman I want, there aren't going to be any polite words wasted between us. You ever see this guy before, Muzin? Never. Never in my life, Rocky. All right, Garnett. I suppose you blow. Okay, we're playing in your park. But I'd like to meet you on my home ground sometime. I'll work you into my 1960 skill. We play a rough game there, Jordan. I've never lost. Garnett jostled his way through the tables to the door and was gone. Right then, I wrote it off the books, and that was my first mistake. About three days later, I had a note saying an old friend of mine was in town, Gunther Rentz of the 32nd Foreign Legion Regiment. I'd met Rentz a couple of years before. He comes into Cairo every once in a while and takes a hotel room where he sits in comparative solitude and reads good books, drinks good liquor, and plays bad gin rummy. I usually join him for a quiet brandy and a few hands of gin. This time he was staying room 409 at the International Hotel on El Hakur Street. So I went over to see him. I was due at 7 and almost on time. A sign in the cage elevator said out of order, so I took the steps. Just as I reached the third floor, I heard somebody scream. <coughs> and nobody screams in Cairo for fun. It seemed to come from the room almost in front of me, so I got over to the door and knocked no one answered, so I tried the doorknob and it opened. And what I saw made me forget for the moment about my date with Rents. The phone began ringing, so I walked over and picked it up before I realized what I was doing. Hello? Is this room 309? Uh, just a minute. Yeah, yes, yeah, 309. Who's this? Mr. Amar, the hotel manager. Do you have a girl in your room? I'm afraid I do. Well, she will have to come down and register. Well, don't expect her, Mr. Omar. And why not, may I ask? She's as dead as the air in your closets. I put down the phone and took another look at the girl. And it hurt. I was going to miss her at the tambourine. Yeah, it was Musine Duval sprawled on the floor. Her beauty spoiled by a knife handle sticking from her chest. I started to look around and then changed my mind. There was nothing I could do for her now and... This was no place to be found. So I slipped out and hurried down the dark corridor to the back stairs. I was up just three steps when I heard a door slam and running footsteps. I made it back on the double. There was nobody in the corridor, but I was certain I'd heard somebody run in or out of that room. So right then, I had another look. Muzine was still alone. I looked around and found nothing. This time, I took a spread from the bed to lay over her pathetic figure. As I bent over, I noticed a thin, flat package showing from beneath her blouse at the throat. I figured the package might be an ace in the hole, so I grabbed it, shoved it in my pocket, and got out again. I met the excited manager as he hit the top step. He'd already called the police, so I decided to wait. In another 15 minutes, Captain Sam Sabaya had joined us. He listened real patiently. Yes. So that is your story, Jordan. 
Every bit of it, Sam. He was in this room when I called Captain Sabaya. He answered the phone. Jordan, you say your being here was a coincidence. Yet she worked at your cafe. Look, don't start getting ideas, Sam. I gave it to you straight. I'd like to know the answer, too. There is much more you can tell us. Yours was the voice on the phone. One moment. Miss Emma, who rented this room? Not the girl. Some man whom I did not see because I was not at the desk when he registered. Where are you when everything happens? At the time, I might have been counting linen. Do not pick at me. I am nervous enough. What was the man's name? The register says John Smith. I cannot read the city. It is blotted. Ah. Uh, take care of us, Sam. Indeed, I shall, Jordan. And as for you, I will get in touch with you soon. <laughs> I was in no mood for it, but I decided to keep my date with Gunter Rentz. But first I stopped on the back stair landing for a look at the package I'd found on Muzine. It contained two sets of passports and visas. One for a girl I'd never seen before named Helen Brecht, and the other for a man named Rudolf Crane, only there was no picture of him. Then there was a ring with a curious design on it, and most of all, five $1,000 American bills. I put the bills in one pocket and the rest of the stuff in the other. And I went up and knocked on Rents' door. Ah, uh, my good friend Rocky Jordan. Come in, please. Hello, Rents. Welcome to the big city. Oh, well, the, the city is good only because I can get away for a while from the confinement of the barracks. To the confinement of a hotel room? Eh? Yeah, yeah. But in this room, I can pick my friends, well, like you, Rocky. Yeah, yeah. Yes, please, sit down. Thanks. Well, come, Rocky. Are you not glad to see me? Oh, sure, sure. Just some unpleasant excitement. Oh, excitement? A girl was killed in a room downstairs. Ah, death. Ah, that is too bad. Uh, l let us not talk of death. You will play cards, huh? I have found some things you might help me with. Oh, so? Yeah, this, this ring here has some kind of German design. Mm. Maybe you can tell me what it is. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah, I can most certainly tell you. This is a ring worn by the members of a certain German regiment during the last war. The 274th Schutzstaffel, to be precise. Well, I found it on the girl. Ah. And these, these passports, too. Well, let me see. Hmm. Ah, well, no, no, these, these are nothing. But should you not turn them over to the police? Yeah, I'll give them this a buy in the morning. Well, now perhaps a drink would help. No? Yeah, a, a big tall one, huh? Brandy and soda. Well, in a minute I will have it. While Rents was in the washroom to fix a drink, some kind of intuition told me I'd better get rid of the stuff I'd found before somebody came digging around. I got up quickly, tried one of the knobs on the brass bedpost. It slipped off. I dropped the $5,000 down inside. I knew nobody would ever touch it with Rents as a watchdog. There was no room for the papers, and besides, Rents was coming back, so I put the knob back on and sat down. Ah, here you are, Rocky. Brandy and soda. Ah, thanks. And now the cards. The best antidote for a weary mind. Uh, uh, you shuffle, huh? Yeah, sure. Now, uh, tell me, Rocky, who do they think killed the girl? They think I did. You? Oh. <laughs> oh, no. An excellent joke. <laughs> well, uh, cut the cards, Rocky. Well, I stayed late playing gin with Rents and started home long about midnight. The taxis were scarce, so I caught a trolley as far as I could, walked the deserted streets the rest of the way to the tambourine. I was a couple of blocks from the cafe when it happened. I couldn't see who it was or where he came from. All I could hope for was a lucky punch, but it was no good. He kept behind me. And the old silken cord treatment is one thing you can't fight. I came out of it maybe a couple of minutes later, slumped against a wall and wondering why I was still alive. My pockets were inside out and my neck burned where the cord had been. I was stripped of everything I carried. The papers, the ring, the billfold, and my watch. Now I knew there was a killer in Cairo I had to meet again. <laughs> You are listening to The Map of Murder, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. 
Among other entertainment programs on CBS, mystery holds its own. You'll find more chills and more thrills per listening minute on CBS. Take Inner Sanctum, for example. This week, Everett Sloan stars as a waiter who overhears a murder plot and tries to defend its victim. It's a real thriller called Pattern for Fear, and a yarn that takes its place among the outstanding shows which have been heard on Inner Sanctum. Yes, listen to Inner Sanctum at 9 Monday night, and you'll see what I mean. More chills and more thrills per listening minute on CBS Mystery Programs. Now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, the map of murder. Well, the next morning before I opened up the tambourine, I picked up a paper from the boy down in the corner. It told the whole story of Muzin Duval's death but with names. I was listed as the man who found the body and a potential suspect. And I went back in the cafe by my back office door, and just in time, someone was going through my desk drawers before he had a chance to straighten up my tongue. He rolled, and I rolled with him. He brought his knee up. I moved aside and gave him an elbow. His fist caught me in the back of the ear. Another one of the kidneys had all but paralyzed my legs. I hit him again. I knew he felt it this time. He was on top. I doubled up my legs and threw upward. Lifted him and his head caught the edge of the desk. That's when he quit fighting. Like I said, Jordan, you're, you're great in your home field. I know the park on it. Come on, get up. Okay. You do lots of things besides annoy pretty girls, don't you? <laughs> you got a good memory for faces. What were you looking for? What you missed last night? Last night? Last night when you rolled me. I never rolled anybody in my life. Yeah? What were you doing to my desk? Looking for a stamp. <coughs> that help you remember? No more of that, Jordan. I read in the papers you found that girl, by whatever she calls herself. But nothing was found on the body. You think she had something? Plenty, if she's who I think she is. And you just dropped around to see if I had it tucked away in an odd corner. Maybe huh? you have. Should we call Sabaya in or start explaining? You won't believe me. It's pretty likely. I've been following a girl halfway around the world. I was once in love with her. And she stole $8,000 and a map from me and disappeared. What kind of a map? Why should I tell you? Because I got an idea you registered in the International Hotel under the not-too-original name of John Smith and killed the girl. Well, Jordan, you're wrong. I should have killed her, but I didn't. What about the map? Well, during the war, I was an American Army officer in charge of a front-line PW enclosure in Alsace-Lorraine. There was a German general there who wanted to get out. He offered me a map for his freedom. He said it was a map showing where he'd buried his family's wealth when it looked as if Germany was going to lose. It was worth at least $200,000. Uh, go on. I told him I'd think it over. But the next day, he was killed when the Germans started cross-shelling. I took the map off his body... Yeah. To the victor goes... The map was of a small area, but it didn't tell the general part of Germany it was in. I searched all over Germany, but I couldn't find the place. Where does the girl figure in? Well, I'd gone home to America. I was getting ready to go back to Germany for another try when... when I met this girl. She said she knew Germany like her own backyard. We were going to look for it together. Then we were going to get married. And she ended up taking all your dough and the map. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's a great yarn, Garnett, only it's a four-star phony. It's true, Jordan, every bit of it. So what would the girl you're looking for be doing in Cairo? Why was she wasting her time in my cafe? Cute way of hiding out, I'd say, till her accomplice showed up. Maybe they planned to meet here. You say a museum might be the girl, but you don't know. Why? Well, she... She looks the same. She has the same build. Only she was blonde and white-skinned. Was she French? No, but Helen could have dyed her hair and assumed an accent. Wait a minute. Did you say Helen? Yeah, that was her name, Helen Breck. Yeah. Hey, what are you doing? Who are you calling? Headquarters? Give me Captain Sam Sabaya. Jordan, what possible good will that... Uh, hold it, Gunner. Sabaya, 
Tobias speaking. Uh, it's Rocky, Sam. What now, Jordan? Listen, did the girl who was killed yesterday have most of her body stained brown and her hair dyed black? Uh, how did you know that? Thanks, Sam. That's all I wanted to know. And it's true. Yeah, maybe. Look, leave your address in the desk where I can find you, Garnett. Right now, I've got an errand. When will I hear from you? Uh, with luck, in a couple of hours. With no luck, never. All at once, Garnett's story was making plenty of sense. Helen Brecht was the name on the passport I'd found on Museum. Right then, I was on my way to the Hotel International to hunt up Gunther Rents. But I got just two blocks in the tambourine when I realized I wouldn't have to look for him. He found me. Get in, Rocky. Oh, okay, Rents. Oh, it uh, so happens I was on my way to see you. Oh, convenient. I was just going to see you, Rocky. I hired this car and thought we might drive out of the city. Well, there's uh, nothing this way but the desert. Uh, you know, you're right. There's almost nothing to see and even less to hear. Rents, uh, didn't you once tell me you came from Schwiegschaben? I admire your memory. What next, Rocky? Also that your name isn't Rents. It's Bardic. Von Bardic. Do you have a brother? A general who died in a PW camp in Alsace-Lorraine? Ah, so you have found out. Oh, I just got it today. Ah. Well, now is an excellent time, and here is an excellent place to talk. Okay. It's on your mind. Well, to begin with, this. Uh, oh, yeah. I always respect a gun. I regret to be so crude, my friend. But you have things I want, and it is necessary to get them if I must kill you. Exactly what? The money and the map you took from that girl. You'd kill me for that. Well, why not? I have killed more people than are in your cafe every night. A war and murder are two different things. Ah, there is always war. Sometimes it is national, sometimes individual. Well, just don't recruit me for your private skirmishes, Wrench. What about the money and the map? You can have the money, but I don't have the map. Where is it? I don't know. Rocky, it belongs to me, to my family. My brother was murdered for it. Yeah. Killed by a shell and the map taken off of him. Ah, so you know the man who took the map? Yeah. Well, he is a liar. A murdering liar. And once I have the map, I will certainly pay my debt to him. Well, uh, that's your war. Are you quite sure you don't have the map, Rocky? You got everything but the money when you rolled me last night. Ah, I am sorry. I tried not to let you see me. I happen to know an old Legion trick when it's played on me. Tell me, uh, how'd you know the girl had the stuff? It was very simple. I commissioned her to get it for me. Oh. Well, okay. Take me back to town, I'll deliver money to you. Well, um, how can I trust you? Look, Rance, I never let a friend down, even if he's turned into something else. Ah, so, yeah. Yeah, very well. But if you fail me, Rocky, nothing will stop me from reaching you. It's a deal. And, Rocky, this is only between us, huh? Sure. Sure, Rance. Just between friends. <laughs> Well, there you are. In two days, I've been taken in by two people I thought were friends. And if I was going to shake the police and rents and a guy named Garnett off my trail, I had my job cut out for me. Finding a certain map. But I figured the room at the International Hotel where Muzine was killed would stand a little more searching. It took a five-pound note to bribe the key away from the room clerk, and it wasn't worth it, because I turned up nothing. So that left only one other chance. Muzine's effects at the police station. At headquarters, I gave Sabaya the whole story, top to bottom. Then we had a look at Muzine's clothing and luggage. No more luck. There is no map, Jordan. But it's got to be Sam. She wouldn't let a thing as valuable as that map get two feet away from her. If there ever was one. Well, I'm betting on it. Everybody's story checks too well. The fact remains, Jordan, we have searched everything. Uh, uh, wait a minute. What about the murder weapon? Only a knife. Well, let's have a look. Where is it? Yeah, in this case. 
That's our last hope, Sam. A faint hope, Jordan. After all, this was held by the murderer. It won't hurt to try. Maybe this handle it. Oh, careful, careful. Here, use this handkerchief. Look at that, Sam. The handle comes off. Let's take a look inside. Here, these tweezers will get it out. There she comes. Now, let's see. That's it, Sam. Yes. We have the map. You know what this means? Indeed I do, Jordan. This was Musine's knife. Who's the only person she'd have to draw it on for her own protection? Friends? No, she was working for him. That leaves only the American, Garnet. Yeah. He was looking for her, and she was afraid of him. Then why would she go to his room? I don't know. You see, Jordan, I am interested only in finding the murderer. We still have no proof. All right, I'll get it for you. Just let me have that map for a little while. And for what purpose? Give, Sam. We're going to lay a little trap. Sam finally saw it my way. In another hour, I was in my office at the tambourine, and sitting across from me was Ralph Garnett. He'd received my call and gotten there in a hurry. Okay, Jordan, what's this about? You want the map, don't you, Garnett? You found it? Yeah. The map and 5,000 money Musine took from it. Where, Jordan? Let's see it. Why, you... I went to a lot of trouble to find the stuff, Garnett. Oh. A deal, huh? Well, don't think I risk my neck for nothing, do you? (laughs) Jordan, you're my type of man. You know, we could work well together. What are your terms? You get 40% of anything we find and dig up. That's fair enough. Except for one thing. Yeah? When I'm working with a guy, it's got to be an open book. Did you kill Musine? No, Jordan. After that night in your cafe, I cornered her on the street. She admitted she was Helen Breck. She promised to come to my room at the hotel and make a deal. You were there when she got there? No, I was late. And when I arrived at the hotel, the police were around and I stayed out of sight. I don't know how she got into my room. All right, Garnett, do you want the map or don't you? What does it take to get it? The confession? Right down the line. Just between the two of us? It won't change the deal. Just so I know. All right. All right, I killed her. I was scared away before I could find the map of the money. If I couldn't have... You swear to that? Yes, yes, I swear to it. He's all yours, Sam. What? Mr. Garnett, you under arrest. Why, Jordan, you cheap, lousy liar. Don't move, Garnett. You had the cop planted in your closet just to dig a confession. Yeah, it worked. Well, I didn't kill the girl. I just said that so you'd give me the map. I find that very hard to believe. Why would I follow her halfway around the world and kill her before I got the map? Oh, take him away, Sam. Get him out of here. Sabaya had his man, and I should have felt real proud of myself. Only somehow I didn't. I sat there for a long time trying to push the mess out of my mind. But always there were loose ends there that didn't tie up. Well, I'd promised to deliver the 5000 to Gunter Rents. Once that was over, I could wash out of the whole affair. So I went back to his hotel, and he was waiting for me. Well, come in, Rocky. You're surprised I kept my promise, Rents? Oh, my... I never doubted you would come. You are too intelligent to underestimate my determination. Thanks. Uh, my gun remains on the bureau, Rocky. Oh, don't worry. I'm just making sure it's not used. Yeah. Now we're even, Rex. Where is the money, Rocky? In that left corner bedpost. I can become impatient. You want to look or not? So it is $5,000. Well, your cleverness amuses me. Now, if you want the map, go talk to Sam Sabaya. The map? He has it? That's right. Well, I have every right to it. He will give it to me. And he has something else. A guy named Garnett who just confessed to Musine's murder. Ah, so the killing is finally solved. Yep, only for a while it figured kind of different. (laughs) What? With me as a suspect, perhaps? It sure looked that way. Let's say you found out she had a deal with Garnett. Yeah. Playing his offer for the map against yours. Oh, well, that much is true. All right, Garnett's room is directly below yours, so you went down to talk to him. Just then the girl came in. You argued, she pulled the knife, and you killed her. Uh, well, it is over now. As you say, Garnett has confessed all. So, now let us have a drink together. Hmm? Yeah, sure, mix him up, Rance. It will only take a moment. Oh, Rance. Yeah, Rocky? This uh, fire escape outside the window. You been on it recently? Oh, certainly not. Why do you ask? A footprint in the flower box. 
Somebody's been out here. Well, what of it, Rocky? If I didn't know different, I'd say that explained how you got into Garnet's room. Ah, now, please. Why do you not forget all about this? Unfa- Rocky, where are you going? To police headquarters, Rents. To tell Sam Sapphire you killed Muzin Duval. And with that, I took off down the hall, running as fast as I could. I knew if that got a rise out of Rents, I was finally right about the whole thing. It didn't take me long to find out. Rocky, come back here! Rents was out of the room and down the corridor after me faster than I could believe, with speed born of a lifetime of military training. Caught me from behind. Just as we reached the top of the stairs, we hit hard. We rolled down the whole flight of stairs. We hit the landing and kept rolling. Then there was a loud crash of splintering glass. Wrench disappeared through the low window. A second later, I heard him hit the alleyway, three stories below. Yeah, there was a pretty good crowd around by the time I got down there. A couple of police were trying to hold people back, but they finally let me through when I was bending over Rents. He was pretty hard to look at. Rents? Oh. Rents, it's Rocky. Oh. Rocky. You... You're not going to make it. You know that, don't you? Rocky. Rocky. My true name will be known only to you. My family must never know. It's a promise, Rens. You killed Musain, didn't you? Ha. Didn't you? Ha. Yeah. Yeah. As you said, Rocky. I killed her. <sighs> Well, Sam Sabaya got the story from me and a few other witnesses. Garnett was released, but he was still pretty sore at me. It took him a long time to prove the 5,000 was really his. But Sabaya kept the map and turned it over to the military government of Germany to decide where it belonged. So nobody's very happy. Me? Well, I'm going to miss Musine's singing. And my customers are demanding entertainment. <laughs> Wonder when Cairo is going to get television. It's CBS again at this same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Rocky Jordan. Starring Jack Moyles in the title role is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Tonight's story was by John Michael Hayes, edited by Gomer Cool and Larry Roman. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Adventures of The Saint, starring Tom Conway. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Tom Conway as... The Saint. 
Coming. Oh. Yes? Uh, ain't you going to ask me in, partner? Look, cowboy, if you've lost your horse, well, I... Let me in. I got to talk to you. I got to. All right. Uh, come in, partner. What can I do for you? You Templar, the man they call the saint? That's what's engraved on my halo. Well, uh, I'm McGowan. They call me Tex. Well, um, it fits. Born and raised in Texas and aiming to die there. Uh, somebody's stopping you? Somebody don't care where it happens, just so long as it's now. Here, look at this hat. Hmm. A funny place for air holes. Not so funny when they're bullet holes, though. Run out of rustlers to shoot at? I was bushwhacked, partner. I was stepping out of a taxi and some sidewinding bushwhacking pool cat took a shot at me. Well, we'll head him off at Eagle Pass. Go on. Well, I came to New York to have fun, not to be killed. Well, that's logical. You reckon you can ride shotgun on me? You've got me confused with the police department. I understand they have a special bureau that does nothing but protect visiting cowboys. I don't want the police department. I'll pay. Uh, 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 uh. I'm not in business. Uh, look, money's money and you're human. Oh, so you've noticed that, have you? And I ain't exactly a poor man. Raising beef's a big money business these days. Yes, yeah, so is buying it. Uh, what do you fellas fatten those cows on that makes a steak so expensive? Broccoli? <laughs> Hey, you don't want my money? Oh, it's only money. Uh, how about a cow? Oh, that's an interesting thought. Uh, but the management of this apartment house is so stuffy. The only livestock permitted is dogs and cats. Oh, I don't mean a cow on the hoof, one for the broiler. Uh, I, I beg your pardon? When I get home, I'll personally airmail you once a week the best darn steak this side of Fort Worth. Oh, you interest me. Well? I'm bought. Go ahead and brand me. Uh, good. Uh, you made me feel better. You made me feel hungry. Just see that I don't get killed, partner. That's all you're supposed to do. I um, always like to do a little more than I'm supposed to. I'll see that neither of us gets killed. Now, what's all the shooting for? In a couple of days, I'm going to Chicago to have a talk with the fella. The fella knows I'm coming, and he ain't hankering none to see me. Oh, so he sends someone to head you off with a gun. Yeah. Hmm? Why? Oh, it's just a little business matter. You see, he... Oh, but come on, partner. Tell you all about it somewhere else. This is New York City. Let's go live it up some. And we can talk during it. And what have you got in mind? Heard about a saloon where a dozen pretty gals come out and dance the can-can. <laughs> I'm fixing to cut one up from the herd. Yahoo! <laughs> Hey, Tex. What's the matter, partner? All out of bubble water? No, but that little talk we're going to Waiter, have... Waiter, I... where's that other case of champagne I ordered? You haven't told me what he did. Well, who's that, Simon? The fellow in Chicago. Oh, him. The varmint's only been short weighting me on my beef, that's all. Know what I mean? Yes, my butcher invented it. A thousand head of... That's it, boys. Fill up them glasses. We're gonna live her up tonight. <laughs> Where are we now, Mr. Templer? Greenwich Village? 52nd Street. Now, about Chicago. Say, you know, uh, I got a sudden hankering to see that old horse of mine. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, please, Tex, don't cry. Now, when you get to Chicago... He's just an old cow pony, but I wouldn't swap him for all the horses in Kentucky. Yes, I felt that way about a girl once. Now, about the man in Chicago. Oh, that crimson pool cat. Oh, so you do remember him. He underweighed a thousand head of my steers on a rigged-up scale. Cost me 20, maybe 30 pounds a head. Oh, that's a lot of T-bones. Who is this fellow? Oh, he's... Uh, <laughs> I just now decided something. What? Next time I come to New York City, I'm bringing that old horse with me. Got a feeling he'd kind of like all this. Where are we now, partner? 52nd Street. No, Greenwich Village. Who'd you say the man in Chicago was? 
The critter who's been shoving all my cattle out of the Chicago market the last ten years or so. Yahoo! Uh, Frozen. No telling how many pounds of beef he bamboozled me out of in all that time. So you're going to blow the whistle on him, huh? Huh? Meaning what? Tell the police. Nope. I ain't even telling you, partner. I want this critter all to myself, Texas style. Yahoo! That Yankee music is wonderful. Warms a waddy's blood. Where do we go from here? Home. <laughs> Here, buddy. Hotel Wentworth. Just wait here a moment, driver. That's a new twist. You always take a little walk before you pay off the cab driver. Only when I'm playing bodyguard. How much? One forty, it says. Who are you looking for? Brownies. Help me haul my cowboy friend inside, will you? I don't think I'll be able to wake him. <laughs> Not wake him. He left. What? There's a saloon across the street, buddy. He's making a beeline for it. Oh, for the love you of... Know, wait a minute, a buck forty. Here, keep the change. Yeah, thanks. Tex! Tex! Wait a minute, you darn fool. I... Tex! <laughs> Tex! Stand back, bud. Do you want it to? You murderous rat, you dirty... So you do want it, okay? Now the lousy gun jammed. Now it's going to be jammed down your throat, killer. I'm going to... Oh. Nice work, Stan. Come on, Nick. Let's get out of here. Mr. Templer. Hello, nurse. And how are we today? You're fine. How am I? I'll let you know just as soon as I've checked your pulse. What are you doing for dinner tonight? Oh, I have a date. Mm, too bad. Besides, you're not leaving the hospital until tomorrow. How can you ask me out? Oh, it's uh, just a form of exercising. You're very beautiful. Mr. Templer, if you keep me talking, how can I check your pulse? Why bother? To see if it's normal, of course. Well, if my pulse is normal when you check it, then uh, I'm not. Oh, you and your jokes. Oh, I, I forgot. You have another visitor. Oh, blonde or brunette? Redhead. Oh, cute? I think so. Mm, but you wouldn't. No? It's that nice young lieutenant from the Homicide Bureau. Oh, again. I, uh, I suppose it would be pointless to tell him I'm out. Come in, Templer. Obviously. Come in, Lieutenant Varden. I was just going. Thank you, Molly. You're welcome, Lieutenant. You, um, you don't have to ask, Lieutenant Varden. The answer is no. Thanks. Now what's the question? Have I remembered anything I forgot to mention about Tex McGowan's killer? Isn't it? No. This time I'm here with an invitation. Oh, a party. The morgue. And, oh, the, the doctor told me I was past the critical stage. The picture morgue down at headquarters. More romantically known as Rogue's Gallery. Oh, you want me to look at faces? Yeah, as soon as you're strong enough. Might just be that the guy who dumped McGowan left his face with us one time or another. Well, it'll be a nice change in the routine. Uh, what will? Uh, getting out of here. Hand me my clothes, Lieutenant. Now, wait a minute. You're not due to blow this joint till tomorrow. Lieutenant Varden, are you a public servant? Well, I'm a cop, so I'm a public servant. Hand me my clothes. You sure? Positive. Besides... There's very little point in a patient staying in the hospital when he's making so little progress. Clearing up a concussion in three days' time isn't progress? No, uh, I mean with that nurse. I'm not getting anywhere. Yeah, I know. You know? Uh-huh. Because I am. Oh. Now, don't look at me like that, Saint. We public servants got to live, too, you know. Hmm. Well, come on. We'll go look at pictures. Well? No. This one? No. Take a look through these. No. Oh. I'll take this one. Huh? Oh, for... 
<laughs> How did a pinup girl's picture get in here? I don't know, but it certainly breaks the monotony. This one? No. This? No. How about... No. One of these? Well, well. The guy who killed Tex McGowan? No, my old geometry teacher. This? No. Here? Oh. Uh, pardon me, no. Him? Mm-mm. Hey. Yeah, I know. The boy most likely to succeed in your graduating class. The boy most likely to get the electric chair for shooting down Tex McGowan. At last. You sure? Like Stanley finding Livingston. Nick Nemoshenko, check Chicago police files. It's practically done. Thanks, Tupper. Thanks, refused. I've got a slight interest in this trigger man myself, you know. If you don't believe me, ask my head. Uh, I see what you mean. Will you stay until I check on Nemoshenko? I'll stay. Well? I got Nemoshenko. Where? Chicago. Cops out there grabbed him when he came off a plane. Good. You going? Uh huh. You want it? Delighted. Nice of you to ask. You can clinch the identification for us. When are we leaving? Well, there's a train at midnight. Enough time for you? I'll go home and pack a bag. Suppose I pick you up at your apartment in about a half hour? I'll be ready. Thanks again for the invitation, Varden. And, uh, Lieutenant, mm? I uh, think I'll forgive you. Forgive me? For stealing my nurse while I was unconscious. <laughs> time you got home, Saint. Uh, what? You know what I am. Uh, animal, vegetable, or mineral? I'm the fella that watched you come out of the little building at police headquarters where they keep the pictures. Well, it's an interesting hobby, I admit, but... I uh... slugged you once, Saint, when my cousin's gun jammed up the other night. I guess now I gotta make it more permanent. Uh, don't bother on my account. It's on my cousin's account. You're the only fella can send him to the hot seat. You're the only eyewitness he killed that cowboy. Uh, you'll, uh... Excuse me while I get on with my packing, won't you? I... Where you're going, see, you ain't gonna need to pack nothing for. No? You think you're going to Chicago, but you ain't, see. Well, must you be poetic at a time like this? You ain't gonna go to Chicago and put no finger on Nick. Oh, now, wait a minute. I... Are I... you gonna go to Chicago when I'm gonna beat you to death right here in New York? Well, answer me. Oh. You call that an answer? Who's that? Detective Lieutenant Varden. Would you like to meet him? We'll see you again, Saint. Come in, Varden. Cutler? What? what are you sitting on the floor for? I've been entertaining. You know, company. Yeah? What happened to him? Oh, well, no use going after them. Out the service door. Tranquilly flew. Shy? Only of policemen. So he belted you, huh? They caught me with my vitality down. Remember, I was a hospital case only the day before yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need protecting. Come on, let's catch that train. You can tell me the whole sad story on the way to the station. Oh, it's a good thing this train had a second coat of paint. Because that's what we caught it by. Uh, here. This is us, drawing room D. Excuse me. Could one of you gentlemen tell me where to find drawing room C? Yeah. Is there one right now? Uh, you'd better let me handle it, Varden. You policemen are so dropped. Uh, drawing room C? Huh? Uh-huh. I'm so helpless on trains. Oh, that's a pity. I'm always lost. Uh, I'm always finding things. Are you? I... Oh, there's drawing room C right next to yours. We're neighbors. Well, sometimes that's uh, a very interesting relationship. If you should ever want to borrow anything, neighbor, I... Oh, I've got everything. Yes, you have. But if you should need something, well, after all, what are neighbors for? I never was really sure until now. Well, goodbye, neighbor. 
You know, Lieutenant, these trains are getting better equipment all the time. You, Deal Varden. Lieutenant. Hmm? Oh, what's my deal? Uh, get her off your mind. She'll be there when you get back. Although they are rather prone to elope with interns. Templar, what are you talking about? My nurse, or uh, should I say our nurse. Get her off your mind and start concentrating on who hired Nick Nikoshenko to smoke down Tex McGowan. Hey, hey, where are you going? Uh, you don't have to be a detective to guess that. Oh, yeah. uh, uh-huh. I'm uh, tired of cards. I'm, I'm going to be neighborly for a while. See? I uh, knew it would come to this. I'd like to borrow something. What have you got in mind? Oh, anything. What have you got? Maybe we'd better talk it over. My name's Linda Jarvis. Simon Templer. Oh, it sounds very distinguished. Won't you come in? All my life I've been easily persuaded. Now, I want you to tell me all about yourself. You going to Chicago for business? Pleasure? Well, uh... It started out to be business. And your friend, when I first met you in the corridor before, didn't didn't I hear you say he was a, a policeman? Oh, did you? I'm simply fascinated by crime and policemen, and I bet you're going to Chicago to arrest somebody. Oh, you must tell me about it, please. It, it, it's so fascinating. Only in the comic books. The man you're going to arrest, what did he do? Is he a bank robber, a murderer? Please tell me everything. I'm all ears. You are? Well, fancy that. Oh, Simon, so enjoyed the trip, but you didn't tell me half of what I expected to hear about crime and criminals. Well, and... there were many more important things to talk about. Uh, do you happen to have a phone number handy? Only my own. But I don't think I'm going to give it to you. Now, is that being neighborly? Why, we were... Uh Uh-oh. Hmm? Lieutenant Varden, on his way to fetch me, and there's an impatient look on his face. Look, Linda, when can I see you again? I I don't mean to break up what appears to be a beautiful friendship, but we're expected at Chicago Police Headquarters today. In other words, right about... Oh! Varden! Get me in the arm. No, only in the arm. Linda! She blew right after the shot. Look, I'll be all right. You go after her. All right, Barton. Excuse me, please. Let me through, please. Please, let me through. Come on. Cab, buddy. A girl, tall, brunette. You see her? In that cab. The one turning out up there. Follow her. Hurry. Mister, her cab stopped. So I see. Pull up to the curb right here. She's getting out. Going in that apartment house. Okay. This is the end of the line. Wait for me. It ain't gonna be long, is it? My shift ends in a half an hour. I've been pushing this hack all night. I'll be back in a few minutes. Don't worry about it. Flowers for Miss Jarvis. Flowers for... Oh. All right. So I'm not a rose. No. no, you can't come in. Sure I can, see? I'm in. How dare you? This is outrageous. Not nearly as outrageous as putting a finger on a fellow so that a rifleman knows who to shoot down. I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about. Oh, sure you have, baby. Sure you have. That bullet was for me, wasn't it? Lieutenant Barton just happened to stroll into it. Simon... 
darling. Why should... Why should I want to have you killed? I don't know you that well. But you know me well enough to know that I'm the only eyewitness to a murder. And that I should be eliminated, don't you? But I... What reason would I have to... If I should fail to identify a certain Nick Nemoshenko as the gunman who shot down Tex McCann, then the possibility of Mr. Nemoshenko's telling who hired him to do the job is very slight. I still have no idea what you're talking about. Then suppose we go down to police headquarters and I'll tell you all about it. Well, it's about time. How long was I supposed to keep him talking before you were ready to swing that club? Oh, I thought I'd let him feel he was living for a while. You know, Linda, I told this sucker he hadn't ought to come to Chicago. Oh, <laughs> I told him. Oh. George! Beginning to wake up, is he? Uh-huh. Oh, splendid. There's some questions I must ask him. He's beginning to flutter his eyes, boss. What? Oh, yes, sir. What are you three staring at? Have, haven't you ever seen a man with two heads before? Feeling better, Mr. Templer? Not as good as when I was unconscious. It can be a rain sucker. Making you unconscious is how I earn my pay. You had a better future when you were swinging through the trees. Huh? At least you were your own boss. That mean you're calling me an ape? If the fur fits, wear it. All right, wise guy. Now Never I'll... Never mind, Stanley. Uh... Stanley. Throw him a banana. Why? Stanley! All right, I'll... Stanley. Better not irritate him, Simon, darling. He's hot-headed. And soon he'll be sitting in a chair that's going to make him hot all over. And so will you, Linda. Oh, and last night on the train, you said such sweet things to me. Remember? I remember. Next time I go anywhere, I'll ride a freight. You meet a better class of tramps. Georgie's grouchy. Aren't you, Simon, darling? Stop pestering him, Linda. Let's get on with this. Yes, let's. Uh, Tex McGowan was a talkative man, was he not? You tell me. It's hardly likely that you'd agree to interest yourself in this affair without knowing all the facts. Uh, facts uh, concerning me. Uh, who are you? Uh, what do you do besides uh, train apes? George Haggerty, I'm a cattle broker. Oh. I'll bet you haven't been called Honest Wade Haggerty much lately. Ah, so he did tell you. Uh, what you do to a scale could uh, outmode reducing diets. What else did McGowan tell you? Uh, you've had it, no springs. Stanley. Okay, boss. The pleasure is mine. <laughs> all right, all right, Stanley. Let's keep him conscious for a while, shall we? Uh... You needn't bother. Uh, Mr. Temple, I trust you don't think all this is just idle curiosity on my part. Oh, don't apologize. I want to know how much McGowan told you so that I'll know how much you might have told the police. Thanks for the blueprint. What I mean is, if certain facts are known to the police, then it might be... Uh, well, it's quite possible, that is, that they'll be able to... Stop stabbing yourself. You want to know if the police have anything that establishes you as Nemoshenko's sponsor. Well, uh, have they? Next time you see your barber, get the top of your head shaved. The ones up at Sing Sing are so messy. You're lying. They don't know. Okay, I'm lying. Sweat it out, killer. Sweat it out. You mean beat it out, don't you? Stanley. How much? Once over lightly again? Not too lightly. But don't kill him until later. <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> Well, Templer, going to talk to me now? What's the use, George? You'll never tell the truth. I know. I had a date with him. You're boasting. This is just a waste of time. Let Stanley get it over with. Yeah, that's what I say, boss. If the cops knew anything about us, they'd have been here a long time ago. Yes, I suppose you're right. All right, Stanley. How do you want it done? Oh, anyway, I don't care. Well, I do. That's what attracted me to you from the start, Linda. You looked like a neat housekeeper. Shut up. All right, take him out of here and throw him into Lake Michigan. Uh, uh, but uh, I didn't bring my bathing suit. Who? I have the least idea. Shall I answer it? You'll have to. The doorman knows you're in. Very well. Whoever it is, get rid of him and fast. Yes, what? Let me in. I'm yes, looking what? for a guy and I'm going to pin his ears back. That's what I'm going to do. But I... Look here, you can't burst into here like oh, that. Oh, I can't. 
You'd be surprised at what I can do when I'm sore, and believe me, I'm... Oh, so there you are. Hello, Captain Carson. Don't go giving me no lip, brother. I told you I was off duty in a half an hour, and you said that you... Hey, how'd you get your face all banged up? Oh, it's all in the day's work. What's going on here? You've got your men stationed at all possible exits, Captain? Well, I... Haven't you, Captain? Well, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're surrounding the whole building. Fine, Captain. And here are your three murderers, just as I promised. Now we'll Wait see... a minute. This doesn't look like any cop I've ever seen. Nor I. Don't let him reach for that gun. Oh, no, you don't. Let me go. Give let me go. that gun. Thank you. Stanley, Stanley, hit him, hit him. Not me. I ain't gonna hit no oh. cop. Spoken like a gentleman of the old school. Not when they got all the exits covered, especially. I'm giving up. That's using your head, Stanley. Stanley, he isn't a... Here you are, Captain. Here's my gun. I'm ready to confess. I don't want your gun. I just want to. Take my... it, you fool. Take it. Okay, I've got it. Now do I get my fare? Yes, you get your fare, my friend. And you know what I'm going to give you for a tip? What's that? A new cab. But first, get on the phone and tell the police to come over, will you? Tell them there are some people here I'd like them to meet. You have been listening to another transcribed adventure of The Saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. And now, here is our star, Tom Conway. Ladies and gentlemen, in our cast, you heard Joyce McCluskey as Linda and Sandra Gould as the nurse. Brooke Temple played Tex. Ted DeCorsi as George. Lamont Johnson was the lieutenant. Ed Max Stanley and Howard McNear, the cab driver. And this is Tom Conway inviting you to join us again next week at the same time for another exciting adventure of The Saint. Good night. Tonight's script of The Saint was written by Michael Cramoy. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Safier production and is directed by Helen Mack. Tom Conway is soon to be seen in the Warner Brothers production, Painting the Clouds with Sunshine. And all you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer, Hal Gibney. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Now stay tuned for more great mystery entertainment as Lloyd Nolan stars in Martin Kane, Private Eye. Yes, now hear Martin Kane, Private Eye on this same NBC station. He's the daring private investigator who's become a popular hero throughout the nation. Now you'll hear Lloyd Nolan as Martin Kane every Sunday immediately following The Saint. Listen first for The Saint, and then stay tuned for Martin Kane, Private Eye, starring Lloyd Nolan. Hear him next. On NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. My name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Jeff Regan, investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's story of The Barefoot Boy with Shoes, Gone. There were three women in it, three guys, and seven cats. It figured for an easy trace job. All I had to do was find a missing guy named Thaddeus Mink, a painter. Only before it was over, a couple of people turned up dead. And what made me think maybe I was trailing a killer with a screw loose was what happened to those seven cats. The thing teed off for me when a letter came to the Lion Detective Bureau in the morning mail. My boss, the Lion, opened it. You could see the dollar signs in his eyes. 
Ah, Jeffrey. Well, well, look here. That rich uncle of yours finally kick off? What do you mean? You look so happy. Oh, it's not that. Jeffrey, listen to this. Uh, <clears throat> the Ezra Park Duffield Art Gallery's Pasadena from the sanctum of E.P. Duffield. Already I don't like oh, it. Oh, now, 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 Jeffrey. Mr. Duffield encloses his personal check for $50. For which we do what? Uh, yes, well, uh, <clears throat> now let me see. Uh, no, we find a missing person, Jeffrey. A man by the name of Mink, Thaddeus Mink, a painter. Uh, Mr. Duffield says uh, we'll be doing an uh, an inestimable service to the world of art. Duffield say why he doesn't go to the cops? Well, he does mention that he has personal reasons for maintaining secrecy. They all say. What do you mean by that? Listen, Lion, the L.A. police look for missing persons free. Guy doesn't want the free service, he's got a reason. Maybe he wants a finger man, maybe it's a stakeout. Jeffrey, do you think that if I thought... Sure I do. You don't mean that. I mean it, only count me out. I don't risk my private op license for 50 bucks. See you. Hey, now, wait a minute. Mr. Duffield says in his letter he's coming here to the office himself this morning. Well, you see him, fatso. I got a short thirst. Jeffrey! I'll be in Dugan's place on Hill Street if anything good turns up. You mean you won't take the case? You take it. All right, Jeffrey, I will. Well, that ought to be Duffield now. I'll let him in and me out. How do you do? Are you Mr. Lyon? I'm Regan. Uh, that's Lyon behind the desk. I see. I'm E.P. Duffield. Yeah? Oh, come in. Thank you, Mr. Regan. Uh, 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 Miss Duffield, come in, come in. Shall I sit here, Mr. Lyon? Uh, yes. Well, run along, Jeffrey. I'm taking this case, remember? You're waiting in Dugan's place on Hill Street until something good turns up. Yeah, that's right. See you. I went to Dugan's, or sat looking into it. What I kept seeing was E.P. Duffield. Red hair, gray-green eyes, tall, about 5'11". But not too much of her, just enough, any place you look. I looked up and I was still seeing E.P. Duffield. That's because she was there. Mind if I sit down, Mr. Regan? Bar's public. Thanks. What'll the lady have? Nothing, thank you. Oh, Lion didn't take your case? Well, he said you were the operative. So? Mr. Regan, I have an art gallery. Ezra Park Duffield Galleries, Pasadena. He was my father. I'm Esther Patricia Duffield. You wrote a letter. Said you wanted somebody to find a missing person. A painter named Thaddeus Mink. That's right. You didn't go to the cops. Why? Cops trace missing persons free. Well, but you see, Mr. Regan, I couldn't. They wouldn't help me. Give me more. I've never seen Thaddeus Mink. I don't know what he looks like. Keep on. It's true. You see, he's a painter. He sent me a number of paintings by express. But I haven't been able to locate him. I've tried, but... Mr. Regan, if you'd come to the gallery and see his pictures, I think you'd understand. Will you come? You put up a 50-buck retainer, lady. You want me to look at pictures for 50 bucks? I look. Jeff. With you, lady. The mink paintings are here in my office. There they are. Cats. Yes, cats. And look how he paints them. How evil he makes them. Yeah, I see what you mean. Cat phobia, Jeff. Sometimes an artist becomes great through passionate love. And sometimes through passionate hate. And mink hates cats. Is that it? <laughs> it's made him a great painter. Is that why you want me to find him? I have just these few canvases. I want more. They'll be worth thousands of dollars. Hmm. You paint those circus pictures, too? No. No, I did. You? A few years ago. I traveled with the circus, but my paintings aren't much good. Hmm. Mink ever paint anything except cats? One picture. You're here? I have all his pictures. But you've never seen him. I told you we sent them express. I tried to trace him, but I couldn't find him. All I have are the paintings. These are the cats and the one other. All signed the same way. Not with his name, but with the print of a cat's paw painted in one corner. Where's the other one? Over here. I keep it draped. It heightens me. Look. A woman. You see, Jeff, he's painted her back as she stands at the mirror fixing her hair. The back of an ordinary woman... But in the mirror, her face, the eyes, 
her of a cat and the way her fingers curl and hook into her hair. Like cat's claws. Yeah. Well, maybe she's something we can go on. What do you mean? Well, maybe somebody else has painted her, too. Maybe she's registered as a model. We find her, maybe we get a line on Mink. Might work. I found her photo in an agency. Mrs. Margaret Ames lived in Hollywood. I drove out there. Only when I got there and I rang the doorbell, I got a big surprise. Sergeant Bowles of the Hollywood Division L.A. Police opened the door. Regan, what do you want? Came to see Mrs. Margaret Ames? Yeah, it figured. See a client of yours? You do a lousy job, Regan, a lousy job. There ought to be a law against you private guys. Always getting people killed. She got strangled, Regan. It killed her. Mind if I look? Come on. Thanks. Like I say, uh, the deceased a client of yours? Nope. You know her? Nope. A lot of good you're going to give us. There she is. Sort of surprised look on her face. Maybe she hadn't planned to get strangled this morning. Oh, could be. Neighbor lady phoned us up. She come in to borrow coffee. That's what she found. Scared the hairpiece off of her, she said. Mrs. Ames live alone? Divorced, lives alone. We got nothing, Regan, nothing. And so the police haven't a line at all on who might have killed Margaret Ames, Jeffrey. No, no. Here, let me check the late edition. Hmm? No, oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, here you are, my boy. You think they may have turned up something by now, huh? Well, Sergeant Bowles wouldn't have phoned me if they had. You no, know, no, I suppose not. Jeffrey, here's an interesting item in the second section of the paper. Yeah? It says that in a place called Mountain Crest on the mountains near Los Angeles... Lion, lion. ...somebody's been putting out poison meat. Yeah, but here's the strange thing. The pieces of meat have been tied up in trees. Huh? Yes, and several cats have been poisoned. Hey, wait a second. Poison, meat up in trees? That could be it. It could be what, Jeffrey? Maybe the poisoner ties the meat in trees so dogs won't get it. Only cats. Why, Lion? Well, I don't know, Jeffrey. Maybe because he hates cats. Jeffrey, you mean that uh, that, that cat painter, Mr. Mink? It's worth a try. Mountain Crest, you said? Yes. We'll keep in touch with the Margaret Ames murder, Lion. I'm going to Mountain Crest. <laughs> It was only a couple of hour drive, but I got started late, and it was dark when I got there. Cold up there. Snow above the 4,000-foot level. Mountain Crest was half a dozen houses, abandoned lumber mill, and Mountain Crest Haven, a run-down auto court with a gas pump and cafe. I pulled in and stopped at the gas pump. All right, all right, I'm coming. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, but... We didn't expect no customer up here a mean night like this. You run this place? Oh, gosh, no, I work here. I'm Jimmy. Everybody around here knows me. That is, everybody there is around here. Some gas, mister? What it'll hold. Hey, you ought to go inside and warm up. Have a cup of coffee while I fill her up. Yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, Bunny will serve you. Bunny? Uh, she come up here a couple of weeks ago. She's the waitress. Ah, your girlfriend, huh? No. No, she ain't. I went inside. Maybe I saw why Jimmy's face clouded up when I asked him if Bunny was his girlfriend. Bunny was behind the counter, ordinary, pretty kid, corn yellow hair, about maybe 19. But on a counter stool talking to her was a slick looking guy, 25, thin face, pinstripe suit. I walked over, slow. You got no right to butt in. Well, I butt in, I butt in. Listen, you can't talk to me like that, Art Jones. Oh, no, you think you smell something? Oh, you want something? Oh. Yeah, I could use coffee, Bunny. How do you know my name? Jimmy told me. Uh, I'll see you later, Bunny. Bill collector? Him? That's Art Jones. He's in one of the cabins. Mm, You like the cold weather? He doesn't know what he likes. Cream or black, mister? Uh, Black. He didn't look like your type, Bunny. He takes me places. Dancing down to Anaheim. Sure. Here's your coffee. Anything else? No, not now. Why don't you go with Jimmy? He hasn't got a car. Yeah, but the next time I will. I don't know where Art gets off just because Mr. Mink gave me a... Mink? Yes. 
He gave me a painting. He's a painter. But that's no reason for Art to get sore. Why, Mr. Mink is old. He must be 35. Yeah. Oh. You live around here, Mink? In a cabin up on Lime Peak. Far from here? A couple of miles. You live alone? Mm Mm-hmm. He's... He's sort of funny. I think he's scared of people. But I guess he likes me. You know him, mister? By reputation. He's a very sweet man. What I hear. He gave you a painting of a cat, huh? Yes, he did. Cat's paw painted in a corner? Yes. It was a picture of a dead cat. A dead cat? Read in the paper some cats got poison around here lately, around Mountain Crest. Seven of them. The courtier mink might have done it? Oh, no. He loves cats. He loves them. Now, what I heard, I heard he hates them. I phoned the lion and told him what I had. He had something for me. Cops had traced the strangled woman mink had painted. Mrs. Margaret Ames' maiden name was Margaret Mink. She had a brother someplace, cops said. His name was Thaddeus. Next call I made was to Pasadena. Speaking. Hello, Esther. Jeff Regan. Oh, hello, Jeff. I located your painter, baby. Thaddeus Mink. You have? Yeah, in a cabin up here in the mountains. I'm near there now. Where are you? Place called Mountain Crest. Mink's cabin's up a couple of miles from here. Well, that that's fine, Jeff. Jeff, I want to see him first myself. He's very queer and temperamental. I'm sorry, baby. Um, I've got to go up there first thing in the morning. Mink's may be mixed up in a murder. <laughs> I rented one of the cabins at Mountain Crest Haven, got in bed and read some Edgar Allan Poe to quiet my nerves. About six the next morning, the wind dropped. Wind had brushed everything white, still, smooth. I started for Mink's cabin on Lime Peak about eight. Bunny went with me. There it is. Yeah, smoke through the pines. That's from his cabin. We're almost there. Hey, hold it. What, Jeff? Footprints. In the snow coming from that way. From the highway, there's a shortcut that way to the road where it goes over the summit. Man's footprints must have been made this morning since the wind dropped or they'd have been covered over. Now, come on. Wait a minute. What is it? Over there. Same footprints going back toward the highway. Running. Steps are longer and the snow is kicked between them. Yes. Come on, maybe something's happened. We ran for the cabin. It stood in the pines in front of a shelf of rock. The footprints led to the door, then running away from the door again and toward the highway. There weren't any other tracks. The cabin door stuck, but it was unlocked. It always sticks. There. There. Mr. Mink? Mr. Mink? Come on. Oh! It wasn't Mink. It was a thin-faced slick looker in a pinstripe suit. And it is stocking feet. Art Jones. Strangled. Five foot eleven of beautiful red headed dame, E. P. Duffield, Duffield Art Gallery's Pasadena, hired me to find a missing cat painter named of Mink. First track I got led to his sister. But that was a Dead end. Somebody'd strangled her. Then I went up in the mountains. Somebody'd poisoned seven cats at a place called Mountain Crest. Maybe Mink. Yeah, Mink lived up there, only when I got to his cabin, there was a corpse on the floor. Art Jones, Bunny's pal in the pinstripe suit. Strangled. No shoes on. I searched the cabin, not a shoe in the joint. Half an hour later, Bunny and I got back down to Mountain Crest Haven. The combination gas station and auto court where she worked as a waitress. Ah, whew. Ooh, this is better. Mm-hmm. I'd better get you some hot coffee. You're not used to the coffee. Uh, after I phone the sheriff. Where's the nearest place I got one? Meridian Township. Yeah, I'll be back for the coffee. Jeff. Yeah? Jeff. Mr. Mink couldn't have killed Art. Funny. Art Jones went up to Mink's cabin this morning. You and Art were quarreling about Mink last night. Art was jealous. Art was crazy to think that Mr. Mink... Maybe. But he went up there. He saw his footprints going in through the snow. 
The ones that came back out were made by the same shoes. I checked that. But Art Jones didn't make them. No. No, I know. The killer took Jones's shoes after he strangled him and wore them when he left so he wouldn't make tracks with his own shoes. Mr. Mink didn't do that. Well, there weren't any other tracks, Bunny. One pair of footsteps in, one pair of footsteps out. Jones in to see Mink. Tell him to lay off seeing you, probably. Who out? I'll get you some hot coffee. Sorry, kid. So that was it. Case just about wrapped up. Mink must have strangled Jones. Jones was strangled just like Mink's sister. If there weren't any other tracks in the snow, it didn't make sense anybody else had been there. I phoned the sheriff at Meridian Township. It took five or six minutes to get him on the phone. His name was Lyle. Sheriff Jasper Lyle, what can I do for you? My name's Regan, private investigator from Los Angeles. Yeah? You better put out a description on a Thaddeus Mink, Sheriff. I can give details. Short, about 35 years. That's out already. Huh? Out already. Mink, wanted for questioning, homicide, L.A., connections, three, regulation of his sister, Margaret Mink Ames. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. On the wires at four yesterday. Don't think he did it, though. Don't seem the kind. Sitting right here beside me in the office. Give me that again. You got Mink there in your office? No, nah, we ain't got cells, Bob. Ain't big time, you know, like you folks down there. Yeah, street. yeah, yeah. Sheriff, hmm? tell me one thing. When did you pick Mink up? Uh, yesterday. He'd picked Mink up four hours after the wanted was sent out by L.A., eight o'clock last night. Mink was in the Meridian General Store buying cat food. Yeah, and he told the sheriff a sad story. He loved cats. Loved them. Had four. But they'd come down with something, suffered. Mink had had to put them out of their misery. And when he found out they'd passed the disease around Mountain Crest, he put poison up in the trees to save the cats of the town the misery his cats had suffered. He'd bought a new cat, though. That's why he's buying cat food. So that made everything fine. Case all wrapped up. Yeah. Like a hot rod around a telephone pole. Sugar, Jeff? Jeff? Hmm? Oh. Oh, yeah, thanks. Here. Thanks. Anyway, I'm glad it wasn't Mr. Mink. Yeah, Mink didn't strangle Jones. Couldn't have. Sheriff had him. Well, I'm glad. Jones went up to the cabin to see Mink. Sore about Mink giving you the painting. That part still holds. Made tracks in the snow. Didn't walk back out. Got strangled. But his shoes walked out. Somebody in him, you think, Bunny? Not Mink, not Jones. Somebody with a motive to kill Jones? Hmm? You didn't like him. I? Well, Did you? I... Art Jones? Yeah, well, you went I... with him because he took your places, only maybe you didn't feel good about it. He wasn't your type. I guess he wasn't. He wasn't. And then he began to crowd you. Mink business, for instance. You figured he didn't have any right to butt into your life. Well, that's true, but... What about Jimmy? Jimmy? Yeah, the kid that works around here. More your style. You seem like a nice kid. He is. Yeah, only Art Jones got in between you. What are you thinking? I'll tell you what I'm thinking. I'm thinking somebody must have been in Mink's cabin when Jones got there this morning. Somebody that had gone in before the wind dropped, so the tracks covered over. Somebody that would have killed Jones. And you think you sleep that... in one of the cottages here at the Court? Yes. Sleepwalk, maybe? Jeff, I don't like now, you. listen, baby, the sheriff will be getting up to Mink Cabin in the next ten minutes on my say-so. Half an hour later, this joint here's going to be jumping, only not with customers, with cops, deputies, asking questions. Now, let's get ahead of them, huh? Well, I didn't kill Art, if that's what you want to know. I know you didn't. What? <sighs> well, then... No, you couldn't have. You couldn't have done the job, strangled him. Strangling's not a girl-sized job. Well, then why did you ask me all those questions? To get answers, baby. About you and Art Jones and Jimmy. Jimmy? Yeah. Only two people had a motive to kill Jones. You and Jimmy. Look on her face said she was scared that that might be it. Jimmy liked her, didn't like Jones. I started to look for Jimmy. And what he was doing when I found him didn't help. He was stealing my car. Hey! Hey, get out of that car. Jimmy! Jimmy, get out of that car. You won't get away. Come here. Come here. Come here. All right, this will hold you. What are you trying to do? Come here. Let me go. I got an arm lock on him. All of a sudden, he quit. Fear had worked two ways on him. Made him fight, made him quit. 
You better talk, Jimmy. Like fast, huh? Wait till I shut off the motor. We'll go inside out of the cold. And then I want answers. I... What I saw on the seat of my car when I reached in to shut off the motor stopped me. A pair of shoes. Art Jones' shoes. Still wet from being in the snow. I took Jimmy into the cafe, sat him on a stool. Bunny came in. Jimmy. Jimmy, what did you do? I, I didn't do anything. You tried to steal my car. You stole the keys out of my cottage. You'd have gotten away if the motor hadn't been cold. Jimmy, Jimmy. Why did you want to steal my car? Because I, I had to get away. Because you killed Art Jones? No, I, I, I didn't kill him. I, I... Go on, kid, get it out. I, I had to get away. I, I had to. Jeff, please. Keep out of it, Bunny. You think a lot of Bunny, Jimmy. Well, I... Yes, I do. You didn't like Jones? No, I didn't. Where'd you get his shoes? I found him. Yeah? In the snow by the highway. Look, the sheriff will want a better story than that. You'd better practice up on me. Well, I... I got up early. You sleep here someplace? I've got a room in the kitchen. Go on. I went up the highway a ways. I was trying to think. Well, because of Art Jones and Bunny. I didn't think I had any chance with her, I guess. But then I saw the shoes in the snow by the highway. I brought them back. Anybody see you coming or going? Why... Yes, yes. Yes? Well, they were scraping the road. There's where I found the shoes. I checked Jimmy's story, and it was okay. He had a snowplow crew of witnesses. So that made it great. Two people had a motive to murder Jones, Jimmy and Bunny. Bunny couldn't have strangled Jones, and Jimmy didn't. Well, if nobody with a motive to murder Jones had murdered him, then it had to be this way. Somebody without a motive to murder him had. I walked back up to the cabin where Jones was strangled. Sheriff Lyle and his deputies had been and gone. They'd made tracks in the snow. But then I saw some tracks they hadn't made. They were the paw marks of Thaddeus Mink's new cat. I asked myself where I had seen cat's paw marks before. That gave me the answer. I went back down to Mountain Crest Haven and made a phone call. I got the right answer. That left me just one place to go. It took a while to get there. Yes, this is a surprise. Painting? Oh, just touching up the still life. Been better, lady, if you just stayed E.P. Duffield art dealer. You, you mean because I paint so badly? It's part of it. You're more the outdoor type. Tall, strong. Ah, I suppose that's so. Those circus paintings over there. You painted. She showed me yesterday. Yes. You were in the circus. Strong enough for that. Jeff, just what are you trying to get at? Not trying. I've got. I phoned the model agency from Mountain Crest a little while ago. Model agency where I got the track on Margaret Ames Mink, Mink's sister that got strangled. You'd gotten her address a couple of hours before she was murdered. That doesn't mean anything. You wanted to be a great painter. Yes. Yeah, but honey, you didn't have the stuff. What happens? Thaddeus Mink sends you his paintings. He is a great painter. Go on, Jeff. Sure. Mink didn't sign his name to his paintings. Painted on a cat's paw print instead. So? Mink was a shy guy. He found out nobody knew him. Nobody knew he'd painted the great paintings of his you had. Except his sister. She'd posed for one. You killed her. And, Jeff? And that left Mink. Him dead, you'd be the genius that painted the pictures. Yes. Well, he is dead, Jeff. And I am. You went up to Mink's cabin after I talked to you on the phone last night. Nobody home, but you waited. Guy came in early this morning, you strangled him. Wore his shoes to walk out. I said, Mink's dead. Uh Uh-uh. Mink's not dead. You've never seen Mink, and you strangled the wrong guy. A guy named Jones. (laughs) Jones? Not Smith. Jeff, I'm not a fool. You're lying to save your skin. My skin? Your skin. Hasn't it occurred to you that there's somebody else who knows who painted the cat pictures? Hey, you mean Regan. That was in it from the first, Jeff. Jeff, bursting in like this into my office, perhaps trying to make love to me. You shouldn't have done it. Not when I happen to be armed. Put that gun down. Oh, no, Jeff. (laughs) There. Now, stay still. Go! Esther, you should stick to strangling. It's more accurate. (laughs) 
Next day, I gave the lion a little lecture on art. Very well, very well, very well, Jeffrey. You seem to have become quite an authority on art. But I'm afraid I'm a little more interested in art, uh, Jones. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, you went back up to Mountain Crest, I suppose. Yep. Uh, that nice young boy, Jimmy. How are he and that girl, Bunny? Uh, say, Jeffrey, uh, why did he try to steal your car and run away? Well, only he and Bunny had a motive to kill Jones. Jimmy found the shoes, then overheard my call to Sheriff Lyle. He knew he hadn't killed Jones. So? You mean he suspected... Well, he was scared. All he could think was to get those shoes far away. He knew there was strong evidence. E.P. Duffy would toss them out of her car, but he didn't know that. He thought that Bunny... Oh, I can't believe that. He was in love. That mixes you up. Yes. Yes, it does. And only Bunny hadn't done it. Jimmy hadn't either. If the two people who had reason to kill Jones hadn't killed him... It added that Jones was killed by mistake. Yes, I see that. In Mink's cabin. So it made sense the killer meant to kill Mink. Only he didn't know what Mink looked like. Only one person fitted that. E.P. Duffield. Why, that's brilliant, my boy, brilliant. But uh, what about Thaddeus Mink? Mink? Oh, Sheriff Lyle released him. And when he found out how much dough his paintings are going to bring him, he turned philanthropist. He did? Yeah. Yeah. Gave us a present in there. What? Yeah, right outside the door. Oh, Jeffrey. It may be one of his valuable paintings worth thousands of dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could be. Could be worth that much. Big enough box. You open it. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Oh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, do you think it... Oh, Jeffrey... Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written by William Frug and William Fifield, produced and directed by Sterling Tracy and stars Frank Graham as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon, original music by Dick Aran. Jeff Regan, Investigator, will be back next week at the same time. Your neighborhood Chevron gas station invites you to... Let George do it. Brought to you by the makers of Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Motor Oil. George Valentine. Yes, George Valentine, fresh out of uniform and eager to put his many talents to work, as well as to earn a living, ran an ad in the local paper. Do you have a crime that needs solving? Do you uh, have a dog that needs walking? Have you a wife that needs spanking? Let George do it. His ad attracted several clients, some who paid him a fee and some who paid him nothing. His secretary, Claire Brooks, worries about the mounting pile of bills. But George, as he sits in his office with his feet on his desk, is occupied with more important matters. Claire, I wonder, do you think I could find any sardines? Oh, I'll send Sonny out. Sardine on rye? Oh, no, no, not a sandwich. Bait. Bait? What do you want to catch? A fish. Mr. Valentine, you can't afford a fishing trip. Yeah, but if I get a client before Friday, a nice, simple case, you know, somebody wants me to find their uncle or lose their mother-in-law, just a few quick bucks and I'm on my way. You can't afford a fishing trip. <sighs> I'm sitting back in the rowboat. I haven't a care in the world. Just soaking up the sun. All of a sudden, wham! Then another wham. Mr. Valentine. I got a bite. What is it, Sonny? Yes, Sonny, what is it? Halibut, swordfish, yellowtail? Mrs. Harrington. Isabel Harrington. James Harrington's wife. There, you see, I did catch my fish. I told you, sardine's the best bait in the world. Hey, <laughs> sis, is he feeling all right? It's normal for him. Send her in, Sonny. Okay. Now, remember, Mr. Valentine, she's the Mrs. Harrington. Yeah, I got you. Oh, Mr. Valentine? Oh, come in, Mrs. Harrington. <laughs> come right on oh, in. Oh, oh. oh uh, sit here. You'll be more comfortable. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh-huh. This is my secretary, Claire Brooks. But don't let her upset you. She oh. knows all the skeletons intimately. Oh, how charming. Uh, Mr. Valentine, I, I've been trying to get up enough nerve to come here. Well, you just go right ahead and open up and talk. Nothing goes out of this office. And nothing comes in. Oh, uh, I, I, I'm afraid it's someone, someone close to me. They get into trouble. Oh, Mr. Valentine, I want you to watch that person every minute of the day. Do you understand? Well, now, wait a minute. Uh, what kind of trouble? Well, you see... Oh, it's so humiliating. This 
person uh, picks up things. Picks up? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, a kleptomaniac. Oh, Mr. Valentine, I can't go on. Oh, now, Mrs. Harrington. Oh, no, 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 please. Later. Uh, have lunch with me. Two o'clock at the Savoy. Oh, but Mrs. Harrington. Oh, please, be there. <laughs> a kleptomaniac, eh? Must be her husband. Her husband? Mr. Valentine. Yes? Don't look now, but your fountain pen is missing. <laughs> Well, look, Mrs. Harrington, the food is fine and the company excellent, but uh, <laughs> what do you say we get down to cases? Uh-huh. Give me back my fountain pen. Your, your fountain pen? Look in your purse, Mrs. Harrington. Oh. oh, then you know everything. Well, I'll be quite frank. I'm under a doctor's care. He expects to cure me in a month or two, but meanwhile, my husband is running for alderman. Oh, I see, uh... Does your husband know that you uh, pick up things? Oh, no. Oh, no. And you must never find out. Oh, please, please promise me. Oh, don't worry, Mrs. Harrington. You see, Melvin Gordon is running against my husband. You know Mr. Gordon. Gordon's department store, Mr. Valentine. Oh, yes, yes. Well, just forget about it, Mrs. Harrington. The election is tomorrow, and I'll stay with you until your husband's elected alderman. Oh, Mr. Valentine, if you'll protect me for myself, I'll pay you well. I promise. Oh, well, we'll discuss that later. Now, suppose you run along home, and I'll be there this afternoon. Oh, that's wonderful. I have a little shopping to attend to, and then I'll go straight home. Oh, good. That's fine. See you later. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. Well, how about that, Claire? I'm going home and pack my rod and reel. Mr. Valentine. Oh, I can just taste those fish. Mr. Valentine, <laughs> she went shopping. Yeah, I know she did. She... Shopping? Claire, let's get out of here. <laughs> Why come here? What makes you think she shops in Gordon's department store? Because she'd be in most danger here. You heard her. Gordon is running against her husband for alderman. Still, I... Mr. Valentine. Where? There. Hmm? Compact. Compact? Straight ahead. Oh, what's she got in her hand? Gold compact. Uh Uh-huh. With stone. How much? About $50. Oh. Oh. Did you see that? In her pocket. Come on. What are you going to do? Well, you, you look at compacts and stay close to me. You got it? But, Mr. Valentine... Shh, do as I say. Oh, all right. Well, <laughs> hello there, Mrs. Harrington. Oh, Mr. Valentine. <laughs> yes, a lovely store, isn't it? Oh, yes. I've often told Mr. Gordon that he can be proud of... I, um, <laughs> beg your pardon, madam, but may I have that compact? A compact? What compact? The one you were looking at, madam. Oh. Oh, well, uh, I decided against it, miss. Oh, that's quite all right, madam. But where is it? Why, I put it back on the counter, of course. It isn't on the counter. Oh, well, uh, now, young lady, I, I distinctly saw Mrs. Harrington put it back on the counter. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. I said hello to her. She put the compact down. All and then... I know is it isn't here. I think I ought to call the store detective. Oh, oh no, no, don't do that. He'll take you upstairs to have a little talk with Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon? No, no, wait a minute. The I... compact isn't here, mister. Oh, well, uh, well, why not search that young lady there? What? Who, me? Yeah, look in her pocket. Why, you... Did you... Oh, it is in my pocket. Well, come on, miss. Mr. Gordon will want to talk to you. Mrs. Harrington, go home. Beat it. Oh, yeah, yes, 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 I will. Come on, miss, this way. And don't make any trouble. No, no, miss, don't make any trouble. Why, you... You. Uh, 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 uh. No, no, no. You're wasting your time, young man. But, Mr. There Gordon... There are too many things disappearing from my store. I'm going to make an example of this young woman, and I can't be talked out of it. Now, you get that? Uh, uh, Mr. Gordon, are you married? Uh, I certainly am. Then you have a wife? I certainly do. Mr. Gordon, do you love your wife? Is the door closed? Yes. I love my wife. <laughs> then then you must know how I feel. Oh, that this uh, girl is your wife? Mr. Gordon, don't listen it's, to him. It's all right, Claire. In spite of everything you've done, I'm not ashamed. Oh! Look, Mr. Gordon, here's $50 for the compact. Does that cover it? No, no, no I, I guess so. Oh, I, I promise you, it'll never happen again. No, all right, take her home. Oh, thanks, Mr. Gordon. Darling, thank him. Let me out of here. Yes, darling, of course. Goodbye, Mr. Gordon. Uh, good luck, uh, young man. Oh, Clara, listen. I hate you. It was the dirtiest trick you've ever played on me, and I hate you. 
You'll never get a chance to play another trick because I quit, understand? Oh, well, I definitely quit. And I definitely hate you. Oh, Claire, honey. <laughs> now, look, you like your job. I know you do. Now, forget it, darling. It's just part of the game. <laughs> now, come on. Wipe your eyes and powder your nose. Here, use the compact. And just to show you the kind of a man I am, you can keep it. Now what? Now we go back to the office, and then I'll go to the Harrington's. Don't think I'm going to forget this in a hurry, Mr. Valentine. I'll be a good girl, and I'll bring you back a halibut. Someone's trying to attract your attention in that car. Mr. Valentine! Hmm? Oh, it's Mrs. Harrington. Mrs. Harrington, I told you to go home. Well, I'm going now, Mr. Valentine. I was worried about Miss Brooks. Oh, well, everything's fine. Oh, you were superb, Mr. Valentine. And whatever my bill will be, I want you to double it. <laughs> well, thanks a lot. Now go on home. I'll be expecting you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Don't laugh, Mr. Valentine. Maybe you don't believe in a woman's instinct. But I wish you'd drop this case. I have a feeling that... Mr. Valentine, what are you doing with that fur scarf? She did it again. A silver fox. Claire, think. Was she wearing a silver fox when we had lunch with her or while she was shopping? Oh, no, I couldn't have missed it. I noticed it in the car just now while we were talking to her. She must have picked it up when we were with Gordon. A silver fox. Oh, call her back, Mr. Valentine. Make her take care of it. Well, now, don't get excited. Why should I worry a good client? But, Mr. Valentine, I have a feeling. Will you forget that you're a woman and that you've got an instinct? Come on, we'll go back to the office. With the silver fox? With the silver fox. Come on. Oh, all right, but I've got a feeling. Oh, my feet are killing me. The least you could have done was to hail a cab. I just put out 50 bucks for that compact. Only one more block. Mr. Valentine? It's sunny. Well, why did you leave the office? I've been looking all over for you, What's two. up? Mrs. Harrington phone. Yeah? She says when you go out to her house this evening, don't worry if you bump into a cop. A cop? It seems that last year on her birthday, her husband gave her an animal to drape around her neck, and somebody stole it this afternoon out of her car. Say that again, Sonny, and slowly. Somebody stole her fur scarf. It was a silver fox, black, with... Hey! Hey, like that! You've got it. Yep, I've got it. Mr. Valentine, what are you going to do with it? Take it to Mrs. Harrington. Oh, but there might be a cop around her house. Well, I'll, I'll sneak by him. I'll find a cab and we'll go right out there. Here, Claire. What? Meanwhile, wear it around your neck. No, thank you. I'm not wearing any hot fox. It's not fashionable this season. Then here, Sonny, wind it around your head. Huh? You know, like Daniel Boone. I don't want to be Daniel Boone. Then be Buffalo Bill. I don't want to be Buffalo Bill. Sonny! I want to be Van Johnson. Never mind, I'll stuff it inside my shirt. Mr. Valentine, I've got a feeling... Sweetheart, shut up, will you? Here comes a cab. Hey, taxi, Mr. taxi! Mr. Valentine, wait! Taxi, come on! It's a police car! It... Uh-oh. Jeepers. Can I do something for you, sir? Oh, <laughs> I, I I beg your pardon, officer. I, I thought I was hailing a taxi. Oh, that's quite all right, sir. Very understandable. Can I give you a lift? Oh, no, no, no. I, I wouldn't think of troubling you. No trouble, no trouble at all. Step right in, sir. Oh, no, officer. I, I, I just can't let you do it, but thanks anyway. Goodbye. Uh, would you mind telling me your name? My name? Or uh, uh, Valentine. George Valentine. Uh, Mr. Valentine, pardon me for mentioning it, but uh, what is that sticking out of your shirt? My shirt? Oh, uh, you, you mean my, my, my pet? Yeah, my pet. I always carry him close to me. Pet? Pet what? Well, it's a, a, a gopher. That's it. My pet gopher. <laughs> Strange. First time I ever saw a gopher is polyphemous with a bushy tail. Gopher is polyphemous? Gopher. Oh, oh, oh yes. <laughs> it's a gopher. <laughs> with a bushy tail? Oh, uh, well, uh, you see, this is a funny sort of gopher. It, it, it's got a little squirrel in it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to contradict you, sir. Not squirrel. Vulpus fulvus. Vulpus fulvus? <laughs> fox. Silver fox. Hop in, Mr. Valentine. But, officer... And there's plenty of room, so bring your friends with you.
How will George talk himself out of this predicament? And while George is pondering his problem, I'll take just a moment to tell you what occurred to me as I was driving to the studio this afternoon. I was thinking that every Chevron gas station should wear a sign reading, Local Boy Makes Good. For these cream green and burgundy Chevron stations, you know, are home-owned. Generally, the Chevron dealer is a fellow who worked hard and in many cases learned the business from the ground up before he branched out for himself. Now he runs his own Chevron gas station, and you can bet your bottom dollar he's going to hustle to make it tick. That, of course, explains why the service is cheerful and willing and competent at Chevron gas stations. I'd like to see you get acquainted with the Chevron dealer in your neighborhood. You'll find that he's a nice fellow and mighty glad to help you out any time. He gives your car the best, too. Climate-tailored Chevron Supreme gasoline and RPM compounded motor oil. Drop in at a Chevron gas station this weekend and see. Remember, your Chevron credit card is good as gold with any Chevron dealer. It looks as if George is really in a jam this time, and with the law, too. Right now, George, Claire, and Sonny are cruising along in a squad car. The officer is their chauffeur. I tell you, you're making a big mistake, officer. Maybe so, sir, but they told me at the station to be on the lookout for a vulpus fulvus. Hmm. Silver fox. May I congratulate you on your vocabulary, officer? <laughs> Thank you very much. And may I congratulate you on your punctitude. What'd you say she was? Cute. Oh, oh. Now, uh, take the glove compartment in my car. Now, most people would keep cigarettes in there. What would you keep in it? Map, lipstick. Bicarbonate of soda. Well, I got it filled with books. You know, books, pocket edition. Oh, look, officer, if you'll just take us to Mrs. Harrington. She's very absent-minded. She forgot that she asked me to take care of her silver fox. I'm sorry, sir, but I'm taking you to the station. Cheapers, officer, give us a break. I'm sorry, son. I'm taking you to the station. Officer... Hmm? Now, officer? Okay, I'll take you to the Hamptons. There doesn't seem to be anyone at home. I know Mrs. Harrington is home. I told her to stay home. Wait a minute. There's someone coming. Now, uh, if you don't mind, I'll handle this in my own way. Yes? Oh! Oh, what's wrong? Mrs. Harrington. I you... said I'd handle it. Mrs. Harrington, may we please come in? Uh, yes, yes, of course. But, yeah, uh... Thank you. Mrs. Harrington, it's about your vulpus falvus. Oh, there, there must be some mistake, officer. There's no one here by that name. He means your silver fox. Oh, oh. oh uh, the, the servants are out. Uh, I'll have to answer the phone. Yeah, go right ahead, Mrs. Harrington. And maybe I shouldn't mention this, but she doesn't appear to be a close friend of yours, Mr. Valentine. Hello? Well, you didn't give her a chance to say anything. Well, uh... Oh, there's a policeman in my house now, Captain Moore. Well, you see... Uh, oh, uh, Captain Moore, uh, uh, let me talk to him, Mrs. Harrington. Uh, hello? Uh, this is Flint speaking. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Flint. Mr. Valentine, what's wrong? Get this, Mrs. Harrington. Yes, I have your scarf. I took it out of your car. Why? Well, I, I thought it was something you'd picked up. Oh, good heavens. Well, I captured somebody already, Captain. Now, it'll be all right. Just tell yes. the officer that I'm a good friend of yours. Yeah, he has it on him. Oh, if only my husband stays yes, upstairs. What's he got to do with it? Well, I, I forgot to tell you. You see, my husband is very jealous. Oh, great. Uh, thank you, Captain. Au revoir! <laughs> now then, uh, Mrs. Harrington. Is this man a dear friend of yours? Well, you see, I... Yeah, uh, please, Mrs. Harrington, just answer the question. Oh. Is this man a dear friend of yours? Is who a uh, dear friend of hers? Oh, oh, James. Uh, uh, officer, uh, this is my husband, Mr. Harrington. Isabel, the officer asked you a question. Yes. I caught him with the silver fox, Mr. Harrington. Here it is. Just a moment, officer. Isabel, is this man a dear friend of yours? Why? Yes? Why? Yes? Uh, why, I never saw him before in my life. Oh, gee, was it... Take them away, officer. We'll be down later to prefer charges. Thank you, sir. Sorry to have bothered you, Mrs. Harrington. But, officer... Sonny, be quiet. Come on. Let's go. Officer, will you please listen to me? Once and for all, Mr. Valentine, I'm taking you to the station. But if you just give me... Now, don't try to talk your way out of it, Mr. Valentine. He's got you with the goods. Where? A compact or a fur scarf, what's the difference? 
After all, we've got to protect our client, haven't we? So forget it, darling. It's just part of the game. Claire. When do they allow visitors, officer? Usually Monday. Then I'll see you Monday, Mr. Valentine. Oh, and I'll bring you a halibut. Go ahead. Rub it in. Goodbye, Mr. Valentine. Take care of him, officer. Sonny, say goodbye to him. Uh, just a minute, uh, miss. <laughs> I'm sorry to be disagreeable, but I found all three of you together. Therefore, I'm turning all three of you in together. <laughs> now, come along, if you please. Jailbirds. Cut it out, will you, Sonny? Jailbirds behind bars. Well, we're just being detained until Mr. and Mrs. Harrington get here. Yeah, then they'll put us away for good. What do you suppose they did to my sister? Poor Claire, she... Poor Claire, my eye. She was glad it happened. Well, if she saw me now, she'd probably laugh out loud. <laughs> Claire! Claire, where are you? I'm your next-door neighbor. Could I borrow a cup of sugar? Well, why didn't you tell us you were there? I wanted to listen to you, Mr. Valentine. Call me George. This is no time to be formal. I thought maybe I'd hear you say you were sorry. That shows what a little fool I am. Oh, well, Claire, listen. I'd give my right arm to have avoided this. I don't want your right arm. Just once I'd like to hear you say it. I'm sorry. Well, Claire, I... I... Take your time. You've probably got five years. Well, look... I'll tell him you two had nothing to do with this. And when you're out of here, if you're smart, you'll never see me again. You'll, you'll have nothing more to do with me. Would you promise? No. Claire. I'd miss you. Oh, hey. You do like me, don't you? Oh, I guess I do. Then why didn't you smile at that copy to let us go? Oh, now it's my fault. Everybody all right? Everybody healthy and happy? Oh, sure. Just one big happy family. <laughs> hey. He's unlocking our cell. Uh, just a minute, miss. I'll have you out, too. Where are you going to take us, officer? Just follow me, if you please. Mr. Valentine, maybe it's an electric chair. Now, take it easy, son. <laughs> and Mrs. Harrington is here. With Mr. Harrington? No, no, she's alone. A uh, most intelligent woman, Mrs. Harrington. She's looking at my books. She's very interested in them. Then you better lock them up. What? Just a joke. Oh, Oh, uh, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> here they are, Mrs. Harrington. Oh, Mr. Valentine, will you ever be able to forgive me? That depends. I was just telling Officer Flynn how absent-minded I am. I remember it all now. I was standing on the street yeah, and... Yeah, yeah. Well, you don't have to explain, Mrs. Harrington. You're not going to prefer charges against these people, are you? Oh, no. No, <laughs> no of course not. No. <laughs> Preposterous. Uh, then they're discharged. We're free? Uh, very sorry to have bothered you, miss. Oh, that's all right. Goodbye, officer. Uh, goodbye, sir. See you again sometime. I hope not. <laughs> goodbye, officer. Uh, goodbye, miss. You will always remember a glistening pearl in my treasure box of memory. <sighs> Fresh air. Uh, Mr. Valentine, whatever my bill will be, I, I want you to double it. What did you tell your husband? Well, just what I told the officer. Okay, now you're going home. And I'll stay there until the election is over tomorrow. I know, we'll see to that. We're going with you. Oh. What? All of us? Yep, all of us. That's the only way we can keep her out of trouble. Come on, Mrs. Harrington, let's go home. George. I thought I told you to stay with Mrs. Harrington. Sonny's with her, they're having breakfast George, I'm bored. Oh, now forget it, will you? It'll soon be over. George, I'm bored. Oh, now, come on, Claire. Cheer up. Let's have a big smile. I don't feel like smiling. Well, put some lipstick on. You'll feel better. I guess I could stand a little. All this ha hanging around... Oh. What's the matter? She did it again. My lipstick's gone. Oh, well, never mind. I'll buy you another one. Mr. Valentine... Okay, if I run out and buy a magazine? Sonny, you were left in charge of Mrs. Harrington. Yeah, but Mr. Valentine... When you're left in charge, you're supposed to stay with her, understand? Yeah, but Mr. Valentine... Wherever she goes, you'll follow her. Yeah, but I can't follow her everywhere. <laughs> oh. Well, all right. What time is it? My watch is always fast. Oh, mine keeps perfect time. It's exactly... Hey! Hey! Now what? I know I was wearing my watch. Oh, never mind. I'll buy you another one. Oh, Mr. Valentine! Mr. Valentine! 
found now, it. Now, take Harry. it easy, Mrs. Harrington. What's wrong? I was looking through my closet, and I found this. My silver fox. Well, of course. Don't you remember? I have. Oh, I don't mean that one. I mean this one. This one? Oh, don't you understand? There are two silver foxes in my closet. Suffering, Mr. Cat. Valentine. You were right all along. Oh, I must have picked it up. Yeah, well, now, don't go to pieces. We haven't time for hysterics. But that's not all. Mr. Gordon just phoned. He wants to see me immediately. Oh, Mr. Valentine. All right, Mrs. Harrington. Give me that silver fox. I'll handle Gordon. I knew all along Mrs. Harrington was guilty. After she shopped, something always disappeared. Will you please calm down, Mr. Gordon? I brought back the silver fox. You can keep it. Now, be reasonable. Look, when things disappear, you, you charge them to Mrs. Harrington's account, don't you? What's that got to do with Harrington's running against me for alderman? There's still time to get a story in this afternoon's paper. Now, what do you think his chances will be then? It'd be a dirty trick, Mr. Gordon. Uh, look, Valentine, just between us, uh, Harrington's the best man. He should be alderman. But if I'm made alderman, my wife will think I'm wonderful. You'd wreck Mr. Harrington just to make your wife think you're wonderful. You bet I would. Darling. Mildred, sweetheart, come in. Oh, sweetheart, this is Mr. Valentine and my wife, Miss Scott. How do you do? Hello. Well, darling. Well, darling. Is that all you have to say? Hmm? Oh, you look wonderful, sweetheart. I knew it. I'll never forgive you. Mildred, angel. Of course, a great big executive like you, so busy running a store and running for alderman, you haven't time to remember a little thing like a birthday, have you? Uh, birthday? Oh, Mildred, now, sweetheart, I... Oh, I uh, should have known. Oh, well, uh, pardon me for cutting in, Mrs. Gordon, but I can't keep my mouth shut. I, I know it's supposed to be a surprise, too. A surprise? <laughs> a surprise? He didn't forget your birthday, Mrs. Gordon. He didn't. I didn't? I mean, I didn't. Here you are. I just helped him select it for you. A silver fox. Oh, darling, oh, I'm going to give you a great big kiss. <laughs> well, I'll run along. That is, uh, unless you have something else to discuss, Mr. Gordon? Uh, oh, no, no, not a thing. Good, good. Happy birthday, Mrs. Gordon. I hope you'll enjoy the vulpus vulvas. <laughs> I come back to the office, Mr. Valentine. Well, after hanging around Mrs. Harrington for the last couple of days, I just wanted to be sure the office was still here. Well, we ought to go out and celebrate. After all, Mr. Harrington's an alderman. Okay, Sonny. Run out and buy a bucket of black coffee. And a box of aspirin. Some celebration. Go on, beat it. Okay. Well, I suppose I should congratulate you, Mr. Valentine. Well, she hasn't paid me yet. Hey, Mr. Valentine, Mr. and Mrs. Harrington are here. Oh, no. All right, send them in. Mr. Valentine, you're through with the case, understand? But, Claire, Either suppo- that or you're through with me. You see, Isabel, I told you he'd be here. <laughs> you were right, James. Mr. Valentine, my wife has told me everything. Everything? Oh, everything, yes. I-, I simply had to. I'm glad you did, Mrs. Harrington. We came to thank you for all that you've done for us, Mr. Valentine. And whatever the bill will be, I want you to double it. Oh, well, thanks a lot. Send it to my office. Oh, no need to bother you. Oh, it's no bother. Well, I mean, mailing and all that. If you happen to have your checkbook with you. Mm, checkbook? No hurry, you understand, but uh, if you want to sit right here at my desk. Oh, well, uh... oh, here you are. Here's a pen. Oh, thanks. Uh, we uh, just came from my doctor. He thinks I'm cured. Really, Mrs. Harry? Oh, yes, my dear. Uh, this last experience, I mean, James' career at stake and all. Oh, it was such a shock. Well, it, it brought me back to Earth again. Oh, I'm so happy for you. Here you are, Mr. Valentine. That's okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Harry. Well, I'm the one who's indebted. You'll come to see me, Miss Brooks? Of course, Mrs. Harrington. And you too, Mr. Valentine. Yep, you bet. Come, Isabel. <laughs> yes, James. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mrs. Harrington. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Well, Claire, I'm on my way. I'll pick up a can of sardines and my fishing tackle. See you Monday. How much, Mr. Valentine? One thousand dollars. What? One thousand dollars? Oh, I don't believe it. Well, then see for yourself. The check's right there. Where? I don't see it. Well, I distinctly remember. I put it right under that paperweight, you see? No. Well, go ahead and look. It's right under this. It's right. It. Mr. Valentine. Oh, no. She did it again. <laughs> George will be back in a moment. Meanwhile, a friend of mine owns the Chevron gas station down the street, and he was telling me a story the other day. It seems a chap he knew came in when they were putting my friend's name on the canopy of his home-owned station. Looks pretty nice, commented the chap. It certainly shows folks that you're the boss here. 
Not on your life, explained my friend. It means that they are the boss here. Well, the motorist didn't get it, so the Chevron dealer went on. The new sign and the cream green and burgundy color scheme, he said, are simply to make it plain that I run my own station. Since I'm in business for myself, how well I get along depends pretty much on how well I treat my customers. And that makes the customers strictly the boss at my Chevron gas station. Well, my friend might have said, at all Chevron gas stations. Because the friendliness, the cheerful, expert service you run into at Chevron gas stations is the best way any Chevron dealer has of making his home-owned business useful to you and to the community. Well, next week, George Valentine goes on a picnic. But instead of being bothered with the usual things, like ants and rain, he has a new experience. You'll probably hear him saying something like this. Wow, what was that? Who hit me? Somebody threw a shoe at you, Mr. Valentine. It came from that house. Wow, a lady's slipper. Hey, and a note with it. Let me see. It says, I am being held prisoner in this house. Please save me. Hey, it's written in lipstick. Orange lipstick. Must be a blonde. See you later. Chevron Gas Stations all through the West invite you to be with us again next week for another chapter of Let George Do It, brought to you by the makers of Chevron Supreme Gasoline. Let George Do It, starring Robert Bailey as George, with Francis Robinson as Claire, and Eddie Firestone Jr. as Sonny, is written by Pauline Hopkins, produced and directed by Owen Vinson. Others in the cast were Sarah Selby as Mrs. Harrington, Stanley Waxman as Mr. Harrington, Joe Gilbert as Mildred, Herbert Butterfield as Mr. Gordon, Ed Max as the officer, and Margaret Brayton as the sales girl. The music was composed and conducted by Charles Dant, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. detective is well known as Mike Shane is in the limelight pretty much of the time. This evening, Mike is not in the limelight, but behind the footlights. Or rather, he is just about to be. A new review is opening at the Empire Theater, and for reasons still unknown, Mike has been asked to attend the rehearsal. Right now, Mike and his pretty associate, Phyllis Knight, are waiting at the stage door. Yes, what do you want, son? We'd like to see Miss Beverly Pryor, please. I'm sorry, son. Rehearsal going on but now. But she asked it? us to come. It's business. Oh, business. Well, then, I guess it's okay. Come on in. Miss Pryor's dressing room is number four. Well, thanks. Mike, how long is it since you've seen Miss Beverly Pryor? Oh, years. <laughs> Ten years. We got to be good friends when I spent a couple of vacations down in New Orleans. Seems to me she could have told you what she wanted over the phone. Well, we'll know in three seconds. This is dressing room four. Come in. Oh, my. Hello. You old darling. Let me give you a... <laughs> Bev. Mike, I wish you to pieces, Mike. It's so wonderful to see you again. <laughs> Oh, I'd almost forgotten you were so handsome. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Oh, I almost forgot, too. Phyllis, uh, I mean, uh, Beverly, I want you to meet my... I mean, uh, I want you to meet oh, Miss Phyllis... Oh, Mike, you haven't gone and got yourself married. No, Miss Pryor. Not yet. I'm Phyllis Knight, Mike's associate. Oh, uh, just in a business way. <laughs> How do you do? Beverly, I didn't know you'd gone on the stage. Oh, I was always good at dancing. You remember, Mike. I've got a specialty number in the review. Oh. South American dances, rumbas and sambas. 
Do you like my costume? Oh, sure. It's uh, <clears throat> very colorful. <laughs> Shows off my legs very well, don't you think? Uh-huh. <laughs> you remember what skinny legs I used to uh, have. Miss Pryor, Mike and I don't want to hold up your rehearsal. Oh, no, no, that's right. Beverly, you said on the phone that you were afraid of something serious happening. Somebody connected with your show. Oh, oh yes, I, I was pretty scared yesterday. But some changes are being made tonight, and, well, I think things will all straighten out now. Well, what was wrong? Well, maybe it was my imagination. We've all been so nervous and hot-tempered. Yes? Well, I thought somebody was planning a murder. Somebody would... Mm -hmm. What made you think so? Hiya, beautiful. Ready for your spot? Larry says you're going to follow up. Oh, come team, in, huh? boys. I want you to meet an old friend of mine. Mike, this is our comedy team. Sweeney and March. Mike Shane and Miss Knight. Hello. Is the salt set to the pepper? Shake. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do? They're just dandy. Snug as a rug in a bug. <laughs> you get the switch. Snug as a rug. <laughs> All the friends of Ben's, huh? Uh, well, you believe me, this little gal's going places. You know, this show's just third base for her. Next strike will be home plate for Hollywood. <laughs> yes, indeed. Sweeney thinks he can sell me to Hollywood. He'd stick to comedy and forget the agent. Now, you business. wait, you wait, you'll see. I'll have Sammy Goldwyn and Louis B. strangling each other for you. Hey, come on, Sweeney. We're late for us. Okay, yeah, we'll be seeing you. Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> a slap happy pair. Mike, why don't you and Miss Knight go out in the wings and watch their routine? Well, I want to get your story first. Now, who was planning a murder? Oh, it's all straightened out now, Mike. After rehearsal, we can have a little supper, and I'll, and I'll tell you all about it. Now, go on, Scoot. I've got to finish dressing. Well, all right. Well, what's the matter, Angel? Haven't you anything to say? Angel? Your vacations in New Orleans must have been very pleasant. Oh, <laughs> yes, very pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> Did I miss a joke? You missed something. <laughs> oh, the hotter a woman gets, the more she freezes. <laughs> Okay, Sweeney, let's take that railroad spot again. All right, fine. You all set? Let's go. Right. It doesn't really matter, Mr. March. Any train will do, but I must have a ticket for Hollywood. Well, I understand that, Mr. Sweeney, but I can't let you have a ticket unless your trip is essential. Yeah, what sort of business are you in? Oh, well, I'm president of the 12 Flavors to a Foot Sausage Company. 12 Flavors to a Foot Sausage Company, Mr. Sweeney? Yes, you see, we manufacture a sausage that's 12 inches long and contains 12 different kinds of meat. Well, what's the advantage? What's the advantage, Mr. March? Just this. If you're slicing a piece of our sausage and someone comes up to you and says, no matter how thin you slice it, it's still bologna, they're probably wrong. It may be liverwurst. Oh, oh, come now, Mr. Sweeney. After all, how can I give you a train reservation for something like that? Well, if you must know, I've got to get to Hollywood to see my doctor. Oh, oh, you have a serious illness, do you? Yes, I suffer from very bad attacks of bakery face. <laughs> bakery face, Mr. Sweeney? Yes, you see, under uh, my doctor's orders, I wash my face in baking powder and lemon juice. Well, then what happens? I break out in cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sweeney, it seems to me that the thing... Help, 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 Wait a minute. What's, what's, what's going on? Mike, Mike, it's the old man, the doorman. Yes, and he's pointing into that dressing room. Come on. Just tell. Just tell. She's murdered. Wait a minute, I see her. Hell, I see her, Mike, in the dressing room. All right, stand back, everybody. Stand back. You're not coming in here. Who says we're not going in there? I do. I'm a detective. Dad, you keep him out. I sure will. Oh, it's not a pretty picture, Mike. Stabbed in the back right at her dressing table. Hmm. Done with a huge knife. A special kind of knife with a gold hilt. Mike. Yes? Look the mirror right above her head. Oh, oh. some letters and lipstick. Yeah, she tried to tell us something. It spells B-E-V-E. -E. The rest of the letters are just a red scrawl. Oh, I'm afraid we know where they were meant to be. B-E-V-E. -E. R-L-Y, Beverly. Beverly Pryor. We'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, since we told you last week that post-war gasoline was here, many of you have already tried a tank full of the powerful new 76. But just in case the Minuteman in your locality hasn't been able to supply you with the new 76 gasoline, be patient. 
as fast as the modern 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company can make and blend it, our tankers and trucks are hurrying post-war 76 gasoline to you. Watch for the signs to go up in your neighborhood announcing its arrival. Then, for a real thrill, drive in for your first tank full of the new 76. Performance of the new 76 gasoline far exceeds pre-war standards. You'll like its lighter, faster, more powerful action. And you'll like the price, too. It sells at regular prices, no increase. So, to make your old car act like new, put in a tank full of the gasoline of the future, the new 76. Now going on sale wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Your Union Oil Minuteman Station. Mike's backstage visit to the Empire Theater has taken a grim turn. Mike and Phyllis have found a girl stabbed to death. Behind a closed door in the Dead Star's dressing room, Mike and Phyllis tell their story to the inspector. And that's about it, Inspector. The old Mm. fellow who watches the stage door discovered the body. We were out in the wings watching a comedy routine when we heard him yell. The murdered girl is Estelle Carroll, Inspector. She was the dance partner of Vic Hunter. Carroll and Hunter, they're listed on the billboard. Yeah, sure, kids. But this gal, Beverly Pryor, you say she called you here tonight because you thought a murder was cooking? How does Beverly know so much? Well, you see, Inspector... I see plenty. I see in that mirror right above Estelle's head the letters B-E-V-E written in lipstick. Estelle tried to write the name of a murderer. I was coming to that. Just give me time. Now, Phyllis checked through Estelle's purse, and according to Estelle's driver's license, she was five feet four inches tall. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm six feet tall, Inspector, yet these lipstick letters are three or four inches above my head. Now, I've heard you, Inspector, lecture your boys on the squad. That a person will usually write on the level with his eyes. Sure, it's a safe generality. Well, then, Mike, you think somebody else wrote the letters B-E-V-E, huh? Some tall person to give us a false clue? That's possible, Phil, but we can't prove it. No, no, but I would like to see a woman who has been stabbed in the back rise clear out of her chair, take a lipstick, and scrawl some letters 12 inches above her eyes. All right. While we're on the subject of clues, what else have we got? Well, I searched her dressing table. It's just the usual stuff, except for one thing, this old-fashioned locket necklace. Hmm. Smear of blood on the locket. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from the murderer's fingers, probably. We found it thrown in the bottom drawer. Yeah, uh-huh. but more important, Inspector, look at the inside of the locket. Yeah, you, you can see a patch of glue and a trace of paper sticking to it. Yeah. Well, there was a photograph pasted inside this. And if we can find out whose photograph it was, I think we may know why Estelle was murdered. Okay, let's start asking questions, beginning with Beverly Pryor. No, oh, if you want, Inspector, I'll go get her for you. Thanks, Phil. Hmm. Mike, has Beverly seen the body and this writing on the mirror? No, no, we kept everybody out of the dressing room. Good, then I think I'll drape this towel over the mirror. Just as well if Miss Pryor doesn't see her own name on the glass. Or any of the others, for that matter. Hmm, this peculiar-looking knife. Gold-painted hilt. Must be a theatrical prop. Mm, Probably. Whoever the killer was, he or she must have stood behind Estelle as she sat at the dressing table. And while they were talking, plunged the knife in. Assuming the killer was supposed to be her friend. Oh, sure, sure. There's no signs of a struggle... And no closet for a murderer to spring out of. This may be this window here. Seems to open into an alley. Well, we checked it, Inspector. It was locked. Uh, Miss Pryor, this is the Inspector of Homicide. How do you do, Miss Pryor? If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Uh, no, no, of course not. You want to ask me how I knew there was going to be a murder? Yes. Well, I, I didn't know. But I saw something during rehearsal last night. Well, that's why I telephoned for you, Mike. And what did you see, Beverly? Well, I I was standing in the wings, waiting to do my number. Estelle was out front rehearsing her solo. She was supposed to do pirouettes clear across the stage into the opposite wing. And, well, just as she reached the curtain, I saw a long, thin sword slide out through the curtain. I I screamed, and, well, Estelle stopped. That's all that saved her life. You didn't see who held the sword? I I couldn't. Did anyone else in the cast see who it was? I I didn't tell them. I I said I screamed because I saw a rat. May I ask why the deception, Miss Pryor? I didn't know who it might be. I I mean, I wasn't sure. Maybe I just imagined I saw a sword. The stage lighting is so uncertain. Yet you took it seriously enough to ask Mike to come here tonight. Beverly, we want you to examine the knife here in Estelle's back. Oh, it's... Ghastly. Yes, but do you recognize the knife? Is it a theatrical prop? Yes. It's it's from Harry's act. Harry? Harry Frizee, the magician. The famous Frizee. Would he have any reason to kill Estelle? I don't know. Okay, let's find out. Let's talk to everybody. 
Oh, I have done this. Hey, I... hold on. Come back here. Yes, yes, sir. Who are you? I'm uh, I'm the doorman, sir. I was just passing. Oh, yes, and you're the man who found the body. Yes, sir. I had a telegram to deliver to Miss Carroll and her partner. I thought they were both in the dressing room. When I opened the door, man alive, there she was. You didn't tell me anything about a telegram. Well, uh, I, I forgot. Here, I got it in my pocket. Let me see that. Oh, it's addressed to Vic Hunter and Estelle Carroll. Yeah, two or three telegrams in the last uh, couple of days. And so? Oh, Sergeant. That's Inspector. Check with the telegraph office. I want the text of all wires received here in the past week. Right away, sir. Inspector, listen to this. Yeah. Carroll and Hunter have booked you three weeks, Club Belvedere, starting next Sunday. Stop. Top deal. Regards, signed McGlynn. Yeah, I have that telegram, please. Huh? I'm Vic Hunter. Oh, Estelle's partner. Mr. Hunter, do you know if Estelle had any enemies? No, not real enemies. She, well, she had several bad quarrels the last couple of days with March and with Beverly. I huh? heard that, Vic. You know it wasn't Beverly's fault. Estelle was jealous. She knew Beverly was going to steal the show. Don't be silly. Nobody can steal a show from Estelle. Then why did she tell me she'd fix it so I'd never dance again? Okay, okay, okay. Estelle was jealous. Let it go at that. Now, what about this fight with March? All right, I'll tell you. I suppose everybody knows about it anyway. I was trying to get Estelle to marry me, but she kept turning me down. We began a fight. I and... told you, much. you were wasting your time on her, but oh. no, no, you wouldn't listen to me. You even had to take our paycheck, my paycheck, to buy her an engagement. Well, she gave it back to yeah, me. Yeah, she didn't gave it back. She'll get your money. Don't worry about your money. Quiet, quiet. Money. quiet. quiet. Did any of you notice anything strange in Estelle's action the past few days? Did she seem afraid or worried? No, no, no just a fight no. with Beverly and March. Mr. Hunter. We found a necklace and locket in Estelle's dresser, an old-fashioned gold chain and locket. Yes, she always wore it. She called it her good luck charm. Whose picture did she keep inside the locket? Why, I think it was a man's photograph. I assumed it was some fellow she was or had been in love with. She never told you his name, Mr. Hunter? No, Estelle was very closed-mouthed. Mm -hmm. I want to establish the time element in this case. Estelle and Mr. Hunter finished rehearsal, and then went back to their dressing rooms. Sometime during the next 15 minutes, the murder occurred. Now, during those 15 minutes, where was everybody? Well, I was in my dressing room. Part of the time, Mike and Miss Knight were visiting with me. And Sweeney and I were just buzzing around. We stopped in and gabbed a minute with Beverly and her pals. Yeah, well, we're in the clear. A comedy guy couldn't carve a hole in a gal's back and then go out front and panic them with gags. Sure. We'd be laying turkey eggs all over the place. I'm not the one to say that you didn't, Mr. Sweeney. Huh? Didn't which? Say, listen, if you mean that Inspector... Our... We were going to talk to the magician, the famous Frisee. Yeah, it's about time. Anybody know where we can find him? Well, he was in his dressing room a few minutes ago. I'll show you where it Never is. Never mind if you'll just tell us. Oh, all right. You go right down here. The famous Frisee's dressing room is the last on the left. Okay. Thank you, Beverly. You kids got any ideas yet? I have. Huh? Mm -hmm. I'd like to know why none of these people voluntarily mentioned the famous Frisee. They know everybody in this theater is under suspicion. Yet nobody refers to the magician, mm. the owner of the knife which stabbed Estelle to death. Right. Well, probably because none of them noticed the knife. Aside from Beverly, I'm not sure the others even know how Estelle was killed. Mm, one of them does, Mike. Huh? He said a comedian couldn't carve a hole in a girl's back and then go out and do a gag routine. Sweeney. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. This must be the dressing room here. No answer. Well, there's his costume on the chair, but no Mr. Frizee. That's blame funny. We haven't seen him anywhere around the theater. He just disappeared. Mm, it's not surprising for a magician. <clears throat> hey. Hey, that window curtain. It's blowing. Yeah, and the window's wide open. And an alley right outside. I'll bet he ducked out the window and up the alley. Oh, great. Now I'll have to drag out the old net. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Low gear for a moment, Inspector. Look at that sword rack on the wall there. Sabers, swords, daggers... Yeah, in several blank places in the collection. The rack is minus two daggers, the same type that killed Estelle. And also minus two swords. Swords. Oh. Huh. oh, what, Angel? I just remembered. When I went out to get Beverly for you boys, I found her in Sweeney and March's dressing yeah, room. Yeah, and... and... I saw one of those swords on top of their trunk. Uh-uh. And last night, Beverly saw a sword come out of the curtains intended for Estelle. Mike! Mike, Inspector! What's Beverly? Matter? Beverly, what's wrong? I just got a phone call. A man told me he knew who killed Estelle. Huh? He asked me to meet him in my hotel room. I didn't know what to do. Well, I said yes. Could you recognize his voice? Oh, I think so. He was trying to disguise his voice, but it sounded like... like Harry Frizee. Frizee, swell. Then we know where to find him. Oh, I'm scared, Mike. Everybody in the troop knows I called you in tonight because I knew something. 
Maybe he's trying to lure me outside. That's exactly what he's trying to do, Beverly. Now, you're going to stay right here. We'll keep that appointment for you. Give me the key to your room. Uh, here it is. It's 9.05. Frazier's right across the hall, number 906. What time did he say to meet him? At 9.30. And it's 9.10 right now. Okay, Inspector, we've got ourselves a date. <laughs> Five. That would be this way. Yeah. Yeah, here we are. That's for Z's room across the hall. And a light shining over the transom. Okay, let's talk to him in his own room. We may get a chance to see something. It's funny. His lights are on. This is another vanishing act. Let's try the door. Unlocked. More than that. Look at the doorknob. And my hand. Blood. Mike, is... is that the famous Frazee? I'm afraid the word is was, Inspector. It was the famous Frazee. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike Shane in his adventures. How about it, friends? Have you gotten your first tank full of the new 76 gasoline? It's available right now at no increase in price at many Minuteman stations. The new post-war 76 is freshly blended from the huge 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company. That means you're getting the benefit of the latest in war-proven refining methods when you get the new 76. Its lighter, faster action beats all pre-war performance. You'll notice the difference as soon as you come down on the accelerator. So for a real motoring thrill, get a tank full of the powerful new 76 gasoline. If your Minute Man doesn't have the new 76 today, please be patient. Our tankers and trucks are making deliveries with all possible speed, but some outlying districts of necessity take longer to supply. But whether you're able to buy the new 76 right now, or whether you have to wait a few more days you'll find it the gasoline you've been waiting for. It's the new 76 gasoline, now going on sale at your Union Oil Minute Man stations. For the second time tonight, a murderer's knife has struck. The prize suspect, the famous Frazee, has been killed. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have just completed a search of the dead magician's hotel room. Ransack, turned upside down, pulled apart. I wonder what under the sun the killer was looking for. Well, we haven't the foggiest idea what to look for or what's missing. Mm. But at least this time we know the motive. For Z was killed because he knew the identity of Estelle's murderer, huh? You can't even say that, Phil. Huh? Don't forget, for Z's knife was found in Estelle's back. He may have committed the first murder tonight, then somebody else killed him. Oh, I want to take a really good look at that body. Hmm. Still wearing his overcoat, so he had just come in. Wound on the back of the head showed the murderer first tried to put him out quietly. Hey, Inspector. What? His wristwatch, it smashed. Yeah, it stopped at, let's see, 8.57. 8.57? Inspector, when Beverly rushed in and told us about Frazee's phone call, remember I looked at my watch? That's right, you said it was ten minutes past nine. Hey, hey, then Frazee was already dead. He wasn't disguising his voice on that phone call. Somebody was trying to imitate for Z. And I'll bet you that somebody made the phone call from right inside the theater to get us out of the scene for a while. Well, if you're right, Mike, it's a darn good thing I phoned the sergeant to bring these people here to the hotel. Hey, kids. Yes, what? Angel? Y you notice that for Z's right hand is closed tight, in fact, awfully tight. Yeah. You suppose maybe he's got something in his fist? Well, we shouldn't disturb the body till the coroner gets here. Go ahead. Perhaps if I just pried his fingers open. You're right, honey. Mm, let's see it. A photograph, a tiny round picture of a baby. Yeah. And look at the back of the photo. Dried glue. This is the picture that was torn out of Estelle's locker. Inspector, I've got everybody outside for you. Sweeney, March, Hunter, and Sprayer. Okay, Sergeant. We'll talk to them one at a time. Bring in Sweeney. Yes, sir. Mr. Sweeney. This thing gives me the creeps. When are you guys going to stop finding bodies? Mr. Sweeney, you have one of Frazee's swords in your dressing room. Mind telling us what for? Oh, that. Well, March and I borrowed a couple of them from Frizzy. We were cooking up a burlesque on his magic act. Oh. We figured we could get some laughs. I see. 
And now, uh, will you look at this photograph here? Sure. Do you recognize this baby? No. That's all, sir. Okay, Sergeant, bring in March. March. Mr. March, would you explain why you had one of Frizzy's swords in your dressing room tonight? Sure, we've had him a couple of days. Sweeney and I were going to do a takeoff on Frizzy's act. Oh, yeah. That checks up. Do you recognize the baby in this photograph? Mm, no, sir. Okay, thank you. That's all. all right. Sergeant, Mr. Hunter. Yes, gentlemen? Oh, Mr. Hunter, we found that photograph which was missing from your partner's locket. You have? Good. Yes, yes. Here, this is it. A baby's picture, and as uh, we recall, Mr. Hunter, you said that there was a man's picture inside. Well, there was the last time I saw it. She must have changed photographs recently. Do you know who this baby might be? Not the slightest idea. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Will you send in Miss Pryor next? Oh, yes, Inspector. Yes, I will. Excuse me, Inspector. Yes, Sergeant. One of the boys just came to the telegraph office. Here are the copies of all the telegrams sent to the theater. Swell. Then hold Miss Pryor outside till we've read them. Yes, sir. Let's see. The first wire is four days ago from Chicago. Regret to inform you your father passed away last night. Stop. Will you attend funeral? Sign Norman L. Tyre, gang cop and tire attorneys. Oh, the second wire is a duplicate. Two days later. And the last is dated yesterday. No word from you, so funeral tomorrow. Stop. Have been named administrator of your father's estate. Stop. You are again beneficiary because of John Jr., Signed, Norman L. Tyre. John, Jr. Again beneficiary because of John. Well, maybe I'm crazy, but I say the baby in this picture is John. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Back at the theater, I asked everybody if Estelle acted in any way peculiar the past few days, if she'd been frightened or worried. Yeah, and they all said that she was not upset. Well, then that's our answer. Inspector. Yeah, Mike? Somebody had better go back to the theater and pick up Dad, the old doorman. <laughs> Now, Dad, now I want you to be very careful. How many telegrams did you receive addressed to Estelle? Why, three to Estelle and one to the team of Carol and Hunter. Uh Uh-huh. Now, um, you all remember that I asked uh, whether or not Estelle had shown any signs of being worried or upset? And you all said no. Yes, Yes, right. Three of these telegrams told of her father's death. Well, she certainly didn't say anything or show any signs of grief. The answer to that is easy, Mr. Hunter. She never saw those telegrams. They were deliberately withheld from her. But but, uh, I delivered them. At least I gave them to Mr. Hunter. You're right. I did withhold them. I didn't want Estelle to go to pieces and ruin our act. How long did you and Estelle work in that act, Mr. Hunter? Over three years. And during that time, your impression was that the locket she wore as a good luck charm contained a photograph of a man? Some fellow she was or had been in love with, I think you said. That's right. You're lying, Mr. Hunter. What do you mean? Does this look like the photo of a man? It's a baby. Estelle's baby. I don't know. I told you. You told us a lot that you didn't mean to, Mr. Hunter, but you didn't tell us that Estelle's baby was your baby, too. That you and Estelle were married, that you that you had the killer. I didn't. Oh, yes, you did. And you killed Frizee because he knew. Frizee found the baby's photograph. How, I don't know, but that doesn't matter. Frizee put two and two together. You had to kill him. I can only guess at your original motive, but uh, that's something I'm quite sure the inspector will wring from you when he gets you down to police headquarters. <laughs> There it is, Angel. I know, Mike, but I still don't see how Hunter could expect to get away with it. But didn't he know somebody would check up on those telegrams? Well, certainly, honey, but he miscalculated on one thing. Hmm? He didn't know a private detective was going to be backstage right after the killing. He didn't have time to plant the telegrams in Estelle's purse or dresser. Well, I don't understand how that would help. Why, sure it would. Then he would have played it differently. Hunter would have admitted the marriage. He would have told us Estelle and he were planning to leave the show because Estelle had come into her father's money. As I see it, the reason he had the killer was because she was going to divorce him. Oh, that would cut him off from Estelle's inheritance. Yes. Mike. Yes. Thought you'd like to know we just got a confession. Seems Estelle was planning to divorce Vic and... Ah, just what I finished telling Phil, Inspector. Oh, oh, but there's one thing, one thing. How did Hunter make that phone call imitating Frizee? From the theater, Mike. He called Beverly to give himself an alibi. He wanted us to think Frizzy was still alive while Hunter was in the theater. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the one question that worried me. 
<laughs> okay, Inspector. Thanks a lot. Mm, Michael. Uh, yes? Uh, there's one more question, and it worries me. Hmm? When you were down in New Orleans, just how friendly were you with Beverly? Oh, why, Miss Knight. Well? <laughs> uh, I may have an eye for figures, but, Angel, you certainly haven't got a head for them. <laughs> how old would you say Beverly is right now? Mm, 22, 23. She's 22. I told you I knew her in New Orleans ten years ago. Yes, ma'am, we were the scandal of her grammar school. Mike Shane, you deliberately led me on. You allowed me... Oh, come here, you big lug. Oh, oh, Bev. What? I mean, the angel. Remember, friends, the new 76 gasoline will give you a driving performance that will make you think of jet propulsion. Watch for the signs to go up in your neighborhood announcing the first shipments at your Union Oil Minuteman stations. Then, for a real thrill, drive in for your first tankful of the powerful new 76 gasoline, freshly blended from the huge 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company, now going on sale at your Minuteman stations. <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. The characters of Sweeney and March were played by the comedy team of Sweeney and March. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again. The choice of men... And women and children, too. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Very important, sweetheart. Write this down. Oh, yes, Sam. I have pencil and paper ready. Ingredients, colon. Punctuation or ingredients, Sam? Both. Well, what is it, Sam? A recipe. One pound of fennel. Oh, that's liquid measure, Sam. You put that in later. Cross out funnel? Not funnel, fennel. It is not liquid. It grows in fairly pines. It fairly what, Sam? One road of St. John's wart. Who's wart? Not wart, wart. Oh, wart. Don't interrupt. Some uh, new size, a couple pounds ought to be enough. One ounce of bat's wool. One adder fork, that is not a utensil. One fillet of fenny snake. Some lizard's legs. One hemlock root digged in the dark. Direction. In the poisoned entrails throw, toad that under cold stone days and nights has 31. And if anyone drops in for trick-or-treat, Effie, leave him have it. Oh, Sam, now I get it. Halloween. It's a witch's brew. <laughs> you were only fooling. That's what you think, sweetheart. Get out your cauldron, your poison pen, and your book of malefactions. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the fairly bright caper, or I should have stood in bed and ducked for apples. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Are they saying this about you? There goes somebody who's really well-groomed, and that can go for every member of your family if they spruce up each day with Wild Root Cream Oil. 
America's favorite hair tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. If your family hasn't tried it, get Wild Root Cream Oil in the new 25-cent bottle. You'll see why Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic is, again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. To and fro in the ghost's moonshine. Oh, oh, Sam, take off that ridiculous mask. <sighs> you look about as much like a demon. As a demon, check. Uh, fly your broom into the adjoining office, sister, and we'll weave a few spells. Uh, date, uh, Effie. Yes, Sam. What is this thing on my desk? Looks like a pumpkin. It is a pumpkin. I made it this afternoon. Here, I'll light it. Well, isn't that cute? Isn't that cute? Eyes and nose and mouth. Looks like Lieutenant Dundee of Homicide. Well, thank you, Sam. Thank you. Well, I guess everyone knows it's Halloween, even if they don't listen to the radio. Shall we? We shall. Uh, date, All Hallows' Eve, 1948, to Hillary Bright, Esquire, number 13, Black Place, City, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the Fairly Bright Caper. It was a fairly bright afternoon for the fog-bound Bay Area. There was no frost upon the pumpkin. In fact, as yet, no pumpkin. But I did see a black cat and several attracted wolf girls in broomstick skirts during the bus ride down the peninsula to your client's ancestral estate, Fairly Pines. A bat flew out of a hollow tree as I mushed up a road through some pine woods to the house. In the gathering dusk, I also observed the toad... A lizard and a hooty owl, which, if memory serves, are staple ingredients for a witch's brew. Then I observed, hobbling out of the forest, an authentic hag. She was wearing a dusty black robe, a peaked black hat, and her matted gray hair coiled serpent-like around her evil countenance. She leaned on a gnarled staff of hemlock, fixed me with her yellow, glittering eyes, and said... Hello, kiddo. Yes, am Which way's the house? Which house? Fairly fine. Lost my bearings, I did. I was looking for some fennel. Oh. I got the bat's wool right enough and newt's legs. Couldn't find no adder's forks, but reckon this here copperhead will do the trick. Uh, what are you going to do with all that stuff? It's for the brew. I'm the witch I hired for tonight. Name's Gudge. Born Sophia, but of course I don't have no Christian name anymore since I sold out to old scratch. Meet me down on my price, he did, too. Look at that wart on my nose. What nose? Huh? Uh, the house is up that way. Mind if I walk along with you, pretty boy? I don't like girls. Huh? Uh, no, not at all, uh, ma'am. No need to be afeard. With a scroungy fee there obeying me, I'll be lucky if I give him a whiff of brimstone. Uh, not so close, please. But I did promise one manifestation and the scream of a soul in dormant is the witching hour. Yeah. Settle, settle. Aye, aye, settle. Ready or not, here I come. Oh, I'll shoot. Who is that? What's your hurry, sir? Uh, where do I find Mr. Hillary Bright? Oh, you're the detective, Mr. Spade? Right. Oh, well, I'm Homer Langdon, attorney for the Fairly Estate. Uh, come along, I'll take you to him. Sorry for that challenge just now. I've been hearing strange noises around the grounds. You notice anything peculiar as you came up the road? Uh, well, there was an old lady. I use the term loosely. Looking for fennel? Yeah. Uh, that's the witch. Mr. Bright hired her for the party tonight. Takes her work kind of seriously, doesn't she? Well, you know how it is. Seasonal work. What does she do between Halloweens? Uh, claims she hibernates. <laughs> Adephelia. Mrs. Fairley Spade, she's uh, eccentric, don't let her know. Check. Oh, here I am, Homer. What was it you wanted? Oh, it's the man from the caterer. No, Ophelia, this is Mr. Spade, the detective that Mr. Bright employed. Oh, well, about that recipe for the aspic. 
Cook says she's never heard of putting fennel and lizard's claws in a tomato aspic. And Mr. Bright says hemlock is poison. Uh, you've got it mixed up, Ophelia. That's the recipe for the witch's brew. Well, anyway, the grocer says he doesn't stock them, so you'll have to garnish it with parsley. Uh, uh, Ophelia, he's not the caterer. He's the detective. Oh! Well, keep your eye on those pumpkins. Mice, you know. Mice? You know. Mice. Pumpkins? Where is that witch? I've got to tell her about the parsley. Oh, witch? Yes, witch! Where are you? <sighs> Sad case, but harmless. Shall we go in? Yeah. Now, uh, watch his jawbone, Wilma. Oh, you've already broken his neck. Oh, why don't you hire an assistant? I don't like hanging him in the house anyway. We we don't even know who he is. What are they up to now? Halloween comes but once a year. Oh, it's a skeleton, part of the decoration. Uh, Hillary. Oh, yes, Omar. I couldn't find the witch, but here's the detective. Oh, well, you can have the witch. I'll take him. Oh, watch what you're doing, Wilma. The ladder. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <sighs> this just about completes the arrangements. Oh, this is Miss Wilma Fairley, for whom I'm managing this nauseous ball, uh, Sam Spade. Hillary. Is that any way to speak about a girl's fifth engagement party? Uh, forgive me if I'm guilty of understatement. Oh, fix that wire, Wilma. The top of Frankenstein's head's caving in. And look at that. The bolts are coming out of his neck already. Oh, well, come along, Spade. And I'll tell you how you fit into this mess. See you at the party, Sam. Uh, in here, Spade. Privacy. I uh, don't think we're quite alone, are uh, we? Ninety-nine percent. This is fairly fiancé number five, Ralph Cram by name. Oh, wake up, Ralph. Oh, uh, don't bother. He uh, started the party a little early? Mm, before lunch. But can you blame him? <laughs> if I weren't a teetotaler, I'd be out staggering around the woods with, with that witch. Uh-huh. Now, uh, what exactly is my assignment, Mr. Bright? I want you to be present at this miserable party tonight and pretend to have a good time. Why didn't you hire an actor? <clears throat> this is a new kind of masquerade ball. Even I have a unique problem here. A Halloween party combined with a party announcing the engagement of a socially prominent young woman. <laughs> well, naturally, the press will be on hand. They always are at my parties. But I doubt if any of the invited guests will show up. That's where you come in. You are one of the uninvited guests. I don't get it. Well, it's very simply this. I have a reputation to maintain. I'm sure you have better things to do than read the society page, so like, I'll explain. I believe some ill-informed columnists have referred to me as the male Elsa Maxwell. That's not true. She is the male Hillary Bright. Uh, female, that is. Uh, anyway, you're a professional party giver, is that it? Uh, exactly. What's the matter with Wilma? Why won't anybody come to her party? Because everyone on the guest list is either a relative or a friend of some poor swain she has jilted on the very steps of the altar. Oh, now I get it. Exactly. Now, as to the party. Masquerade. Natch. What else can you have on Halloween? Figures. Yes. Uh, if anyone came, they'd probably be dressed as witches or pumpkins, mm. which is dull enough in itself. Quite so. But the fairies in their immediate circle will undoubtedly trot out their moth-eaten Beaux-Arts costume. Old Langdon as Louis XIV, Wilma and her mother trying to look like Greek goddesses and some old drapes from a Fanchon and Marco idea. What about the boyfriend here? Well, you can see how hideous it's all going to be. And Life magazine has promised to cover it. Well, I simply had to do something. Well, what about the boy? I think it's the party idea of the year. Twenty uninvited guests who will come as themselves. Uh, who's my date, the witch? Oh, isn't she priceless? <laughs> you know, I thought of burning her at the stake as the grand climax of the evening. I've got matches. No, I decided against it. It's too messy. Well, it sounds like loads of fun, Mr. Bright, but I'm afraid you called the wrong detective. Now, so wait I'll... a minute, please. Hear me out. Now, there's method in my madness. I believe I mentioned twenty uninvited guests. Who are coming as themselves, yes. Exactly. Well, I've gone to a great deal of trouble and expense getting together a really colorful group. All authentic types. A gangster, a shrimp fisherman, a swami, three bubble dancers, three. a gypsy, hmm, a paroled axe murderer, a sand hog. Oh, that reminds me, I must see whether the blubber arrived for that Eskimo they're flying down from Nome. Yeah, well... well what uh... I'm getting at, Spade, is that with a collection of people like that, well, anything might happen. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, why don't you invite the uh, local police force? Oh, they're coming, and... Costume, of course. Good, then you won't need me. Besides, I get $800 a day in expenses. Mr. Spade, at the last party our local chief of police attended, the guests were held up and robbed at $50,000 worth of jewels, including the chief's gold badge. So, you see, we do need you. Hey, hey, what's that? Oh, go 
back to sleep, Ralph. It's only the guests arriving. I get a thousand dollars a day. You were right. You did need a detective. In fact, you could have used several of us. First, the pickpocket you'd invited lifted the police chief's wallet. The axe murderer chased the witch up a tree. And the gangster and the cowboy tried to shoot it out over one of the bubble dancers. After I'd foiled a safe cracker in the act of blowing the vault in the library, things quieted down and everybody formed a circle around a, a bonfire. Oh. All right, quiet, please. Quiet, everyone. Quiet. Yes, I smile, please. Mrs. Fairley has a very important announcement to make. Ophelia? She was here just a few moments ago. Well, have you seen her around Langdon? A few minutes ago, she said she had a headache and went upstairs to get some aspirin. Sam, I'm worried about Mother. Would you mind going upstairs to see what she's up to? She's been behaving so strangely tonight. She's been behaving strangely. Uh, sure, uh, well, no, I'll be right well, back. Come along, let's get on with it. A witch. Agent! You, you stand over here. Here? No, 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 bring your broom. <laughs> That's it. And don't look so pleasant. You're supposed to be evil. <laughs> Beware. Those not wearing toad bane is subject to wart. There's evil in this place tonight. Blood on the stone, blood in the cauldron. I hated to miss the manifestation, and I hoped I'd get back in time for the scream of the soul in torment the witch had promised earlier in the evening. I cased the rooms in the second floor. Wilma's fiancé, Ralph Cram, was in one of them asleep. Ophelia wasn't in any of them. But in one of the bedrooms, I found something that puzzled me. A rope made out of bed sheets dangled out of the window, but the window was closed. I walked over and opened it. The witch was still at it. I couldn't see the merry little group around the bonfire, but where the firelight glowed against the tree trunks at the edge of the woods, I saw a white-robed figure crouching in the shadows. Then I heard it. Sprawl on her face at the foot of a big pine tree at the edge of the clearing. A single slug had entered her body just below her left shoulder blade. If this was part of Mr. Bright's Halloween production, I thought he'd overdone it just a little, because she was dead. As nearly as I could reconstruct it, Wilma had been standing outside the circle of people grouped around the fire as if somebody in the woods had called to her and she'd left the group to investigate. She'd been facing the fire when she was shot. Then what about the two shots that had missed her? The killer had been aiming at her and missed. He couldn't have avoided hitting somebody else in the crowd. I went back to the house to check the guests. All there, unwounded and accounted for, except the witch. According to the local chief of police, who was rapidly turning into a toad, she had flown away on a broom. I checked my nose for warts. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective... Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil again and again. The choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to the fairly bright caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade.
By dawn the next morning, Aloysius Becker, boy police chief, still hadn't sweated anything out of his 20-odd suspects, but yawns. The family lawyer, Langdon, had an old gun permit, no gun. Then he canvassed the town for Wilma's 18 jilted suitors. They were all alibied by their wives and children, which knocked that angle out. She carried no insurance, nobody stood to gain anything financially by her death, and nobody but you, Mr. Bright, actively disliked her. About then, Chief Becker put Ophelia back on the griddle. Now, look here, Mrs. Fairley. You still aren't coming clean with us. Clean? Oh, the ashtrays. I'll call the maid. Come back here. Yes, Chief Becker. Now, sit down, Mrs. Fairley. Now, let's go over the part of your story where we found the bed sheets hanging out your window. Yes. Why did you tie the bed sheets together and hang them out the window? For a rope. So, you admit that you used that rope to snake out. I did no such thing. I always go out that way at night. Then you admit that... Uh... Oh, I give up. Uh, Mrs. Fairley. Oh, it's you, Mr. Spade. I want to thank you for guarding the pumpkin so well. I didn't see a mouse all evening. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Fairley. I only did what... Oh, why is Chief Becker so angry? I think what's worrying him, Mrs. Fairley, is why you closed the window behind you when you went out on your rope. So no one would know. Wilma worries about me. You won't tell her. Ah, it's as plain as a nose on your face what she's doing. Working up to an, an insanity plea. Ingenious theory, Chief, but look, uh, can I talk to you a minute outside? Yeah, could use a little air. Keep them all here, Monahan. Look, uh, Chief, why don't you lay off that poor old dame? She's right. too vague, disorganized. It yeah. took a marksman. The way the wound was, no point of exit. Just punctured the wall of the heart and stopped. The low velocity impact. Sure. A what? It had been fired from about the maximum range of a thirty-eight pistol. He'd have to figure on the drop in trajectory as the bullet slowed down. It was either a trick shot or one that just connected accidentally. By the way, we only have your word for it that you were upstairs in the house when those shots were fired. You carry a thirty-eight, don't you, Spade? What kind of gun do you carry, Chief? Uh, yes. Well, we'd better wait till Ballistic sends back the report on the slug. Gosh, if we could only figure out where she hid the gun. Uh, don't look now, Chief, but that witch is back again. What? Pretty boy! Where have you been? I've been looking all over for you, mortal. You're going to have a good deal of explaining to do, lady. Why did you fly away like that last night? I had to see to my cauldron. A good thing I did, too. Look what I found in it. No wonder my manifestation didn't work. Base metal in my brew. Hmm. Thirty-eight caliber, too. Three bullets fired. Gee, that settles it. You're under arrest. Who, me? Yes. Well, uh, no, her. Oh, no, you don't. I'll put a spell on you, I will. I'll turn you into a toad. Look, Chief, where's that gun permit you took out of Langdon's room? Oh, I forgot. I forgot about that. Here, it's in my pocket. Let's see that serial number. Well? They match. It's Langdon's gun. Boy, oh, boy, then it's settled. That's what you think, boy, oh, boy. Don't forget, he's a lawyer. <laughs> I headed for the woods. I found the spot where I'd seen the figure in white crouching just before the shots were fired. A little way back in the woods, I found footprints. French heels, short, mincing stride. Following along behind them was another set, flat soles, long, manly stride. The mannish footprints followed the feminine footprints almost to the clearing and then stopped. The feminine footprints went on straight to the spot where Wilma had fallen. I knew that no woman had been over this trail since the murder except the witch, who probably had cloven hoofs. Her cauldron had vanished, but the fire was still smoldering. I kicked through the ashes. I didn't know what I was looking for, but I found it. I raked it out with a stick and prodded it. The blackened outer layers crumbled away. It had been a raging bonfire, but there were a few things harder to burn than a telephone book. The middle pages were yellowed from the heat and seared around the edges, but they were still intact. There was a hole punched in the middle of each page. Feminine footprints right up to the X that marked the spot in the phone book through which a bullet had been fired. I had a hunch the ballistics report would prove that Langdon's gun did not fire the fatal bullet. I was right, but for the wrong reason. Yeah, you can't get around it, Chief. Ballistics don't lie. You can see here. You don't even need a magnifying glass. Take a look there. Uh, don't have my glasses. Well, you ought to be able to feel it. Two big ridges on the test slug. The other one's almost smooth. Rust bits wouldn't make a ridge like that, would they? No, we figure they must have used a faulty cutter at the factory when they rifled the barrel. Well, that settles it. 
That and those women's footprints and that phone book all point to Mrs. Fairley. What's about a phone book? Whoever shot her fired the slug through a phone book to make it look like a long-range job. It was a low-velocity hit, all right, but it was tearing through that phone book that slowed it down. That proves the killer didn't have to be a marksman. Stood right next to her. <laughs> What's so funny? This picture in the morning paper, you and those bubble dancers, Chief. <laughs> uh, let me see that. Why, that's libelous. It's more than that. Huh? They're in the background, Langdon and Mrs. Fairley. What about them? Their shoes. Langdon's dressed as Louis the Fourteenth, French heels. Mrs. Fairley and that Greek goddess get up, sandals, flat heels. It's Langdon's gun, then it's not Langdon's gun. It's a long-range shot, then it's through a seed catalog. Phone book. Now it's a man in woman's shoes, an attorney at that. Monahan, get me some fingerprints, something I can work with. I didn't blame the chief. My somersaulting clues were getting me dizzy, too. So far, Langdon, like the good lawyer he was, had kept his mouth shut, which meant nothing one way or the other. That was smart. But he disposed of his gun by throwing it in the witch's cauldron, which was stupid. A, because it was sure to be found, and B, because there was no reason for hiding it anyway. But two stupid sometimes make a smart. If he wanted it to be found, he must have had a story ready in case he had to talk. If I were in that spot, my story would have been that I fired those shots into the woods after the fleeing killer. But I didn't know how I would explain the fact that only three shots were heard, one of which killed Wilma. Then I thought of those two ridges on that test slug. Two ridges... Two shots into the woods. This time, I did know what I was looking for. They were buried deep in the soft trunk of a pine tree near the ground. I dropped to my knees and dug. I got the first one out and was looking at it. It was a misshapen hunk of worthless lead. Something embedded in the side of it glittered in the sun like a diamond. In fact, it was a diamond. Then it stopped glittering. Something behind me had come between it and the sun. I flopped on my side and rolled over. I grabbed his legs and tripped him. Then I saw his face. It was Langdon. Yeah. I was halfway to my feet when his foot caught me where it hurt and my legs doubled up. I tried to keep moving and get my gun out at the same time. He was on his feet again before I was, so I fired without aiming from flat on my back. He only scorched his coat, but it stopped him a second. He swung his gun up, and I got ready to jump him. But I didn't have to. A pointed black hat rose up out of the brush behind him. Something flashed in the sun, and he collapsed. Put a spell on him, I did. With this here magic wand. Blown in for it to you, Sonny. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Witch. God is the handle, son. Witch is my profession. <sighs> well, boy, that was a close call. Put the cuffs on him, Monahan. Hey, what are you doing? Oh, no, Monahan, not Spade. Langdon there. Been following him since I found out he was wearing women's shoes. Well, that's settled today, Spade. Yeah, but you'll need this. What is it? A jeweled bullet. A slug with a diamond set in it. Come on, hero. It's the master clue of this caper. Oh, yeah, the master clue. Uh, You better come along, too, lady, for questioning. We'll book her for a vagrancy if we need it. Oh, no, you don't. I'll turn you into a toad. You don't believe me, do you? Hoppy toad, hoppy toad, warty and green. (laughs) Feel anything? Well, on, on second thought, I reckon she's harmless, poor old soul. Soul, indeed. Ain't got any. I sold out to old Scratch 30 years ago, come next Halloween. <laughs> See you then, Sonny. Go home and gargle. Period. End of report. But, Sam, what was the significance of the jewel bullet? Hmm? Oh. Well, after he uh, shot Wilma, Langdon fired two shots into the woods, remember? Yes. Those two bullets had diamond insets so placed that they would gouge the inside of the gun barrel. All bullets fired from the gun thereafter would have markings different from the one fired into Wilma's body. Oh. He was wrong, of course, but it was noble of him to want to cover up for poor Mrs. Fairley. What for, Abby? Well, she killed her daughter, of course, because she was just out of patience with her, getting engaged and unengaged all the time till they hadn't a friend in the world. That's so. That was the motive, wasn't it, Sam? Uh, that's fairly bright, sweetheart, except that Mrs. Fairley did not kill her daughter. <gasps> Langdon did. You mean she was his daughter, too, by a previous marriage? Go take that up, sweetheart, before I turn you into a toad. And now, listen to this. For here's a good tip. Spruce up right, spruce up now with Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. 
Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. Get the 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle or the large economy size and ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Well, here it is, Sam. Of course, you know best, but Mrs. Sally was the only one with a motive. And that Mr. Bright was secretly in love with her and, and wanted to marry her himself. So he killed her. That was fairly bright. Or her fiancé. What happened to him? He woke up and went home. Oh, well, then I guess he didn't have a motive. Pay attention, sweetheart. Langdon, as trustee of the Fairley estate, had embezzled large sums of money, which he would have to account for under the community property law if she got married. She got married. He had already broken up many of her romances, but when the old lady went soft in the head, he decided to end the danger once and for all. He could explain matters any way he wanted to, and there'd be nobody to contradict him. Are you, uh, listening up? Hmm. Sam, what does she do between Halloween? The witch? Mm-hmm. Oh, she's the uh, squeak in the door on Inner Sanctum. Oh, Sam. <laughs> you made the joke too small. <laughs> well, good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin with score composed by Renee Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with Susan Lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Oh, never mind, Mary. It's trouble. I'll tell her to go away. I said we were going to the theater tonight, and I meant it. Uh-huh. I'll believe we're going after we get there. <laughs> That's my girl who said that. Package for Boston Blackie. Valuable package. Funny valuable. You Boston Blackie? Uh-huh. Okay. Sign here, and you get the package. All right. What's in this thing that makes it so valuable? Who's it from? I can't say who it's from, and I don't know what's in it. Only I got orders to tell you something, too. Okay. Don't lose this package and what's in it, and get it to the police as fast as you can. Here's an envelope with $1,000 in it for your trouble. So long. Hey, oh, wait a minute. Uh, hey, Blackie. I know good things come in small packages, but trouble comes in small packages, too. <laughs> this is some kind of a gag, Mary. A valuable gag, according to Messenger. I wonder what's in the package. Uh, I don't know. But this could be a frame-up. I'm not taking it to the police until I see what it is. Well, if it's valuable, maybe the sender wants to take me to the police for safekeeping. That's a thought. I wonder what's so valuable about it. Oh, maybe it's a box of money. A million dollars. Or jewelry. No. Uh, it's too light for that. It's only wrapped carefully enough. Must be priceless. Well, open the box, will you? Okay, here it goes. What the... Blackie, am I seeing things? Somebody gave you $1,000 to take this to the police? Yes. And all it is is a shoe. A worn and battered old shoe. <laughs> Thank you. 
And now, back to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. <laughs> Look, Blackie, it's bad enough when you clutter up my office with a bunch of worthless things, <laughs> including yourself, but when you bring me an old shoe... Now, wait a minute, Faraday. I thought this shoe was some kind of a gag, too, but I was paid a thousand dollars to deliver it to you. So someone has a good reason for wanting you to have it. Yeah, well, let him send a mate to it, and I'll wear it. <laughs> what do I want with an old shoe? I... <laughs> wait a minute, I just thought of something. What? Listen. Yes, Inspector. Matthews, there was a case about nine or ten years ago that's still unsolved. Yeah. A case involving a shoe print. We never found the shoe that made it. I think I remember something about it, Inspector. Well, check the files, will you? Tell me what case it was. Yes, sir. Right away. Well, Blackie, what do you think of that? I think it's wonderful, Faraday, if this is the shoe that figured in that case. Some shoe made that print. We never found the shoe. Mm -hmm. Why would anyone want a shoe brought to the police unless it was some kind of evidence in some case? Well, there might be other reasons. What other reasons? Well, I don't know. Seems just a little too simple that this shoe is evidence in a murder case. Oh, you always want to make things complicated, don't you? Well, this is one time... Yeah? Inspector, this is Matthew. Yeah? Uh, about that case, What Inspector, case was it? Could you find it? Yes. The only unsolved case we have involving a shoe prints, the Richards case. That was ten years ago. Thanks, Matthews. That's all I want to know for now. Okay. I remember the rest of the case. Yes, sir. Well, your memory's really sharp today, isn't it, Faraday? Yes, I know all about this now. The person who sent the shoe to you knows that it's evidence and doesn't want to be mixed up in it, which is also the reason it was delivered to you and not directly to me. We still have the plaster impression of that shoe print. Well, take the shoe and see if it matches the print. Now, oh, by the way, who was the chief suspect in the Richards murder? Don't tell me what to do! Tut, tut, tut. The chief suspect was Eddie Maley. He was a punk at that time, but he's an east side big shot now. Eddie Maley, huh? That's right. Well, while you have a little conference with your footprint experts, I think I'll go down and have a little talk with Eddie Maley. <laughs> Mr. Melly, I heard over at the joint that Mickey Elvis is looking for you on account of that diamond robbery we pulled. Looking for me, is he, huh? Yeah. Well, he knows where to find me. Why doesn't he drop in? Because <laughs> he knows we'll drop him, I guess. I'm going to take you. <laughs> hey, Mr. Melly, something smashed away. Take guns where they are, boys. Mr. Melly, it's Boston Black. So I see. What's the idea coming through the window, Blackie? Well, I wanted to get in to see you, and some guy at the door had a different idea. Hope I didn't catch you when you were busy, Maley. I'm never too busy to see an old enemy, Blackie. Come, I'll talk to you later. Hey, sure, Mr. Maley. Sit down, Blackie. No, thanks. I prefer to stand. That's up to you. What can I do for you? Just remember a few things about the Richards murder case, Maley. The Richards murder... For ten years, the plaster impression of a footprint has been waiting at police headquarters for the shoe that would fit it. Well, we think that shoe turned up this evening. And it might be your shoe. Don't look at me, Prince Charming. I'm not the Cinderella you wore. Maley, you were never brought to trial in the Richards case, but you were Richards' only enemy. You don't know what you're talking about. If that about. shoe fits that plaster impression, and if Faraday can prove that shoe belonged to you, you'll go to trial in the chair. Thanks for the warning, Blackie. So long, Maley. I'll be seeing you. You'll be sorry to hear. Uh, the wind is open. Why don't you go out the way you came in? You're going out of this world the way you came in. You're going to be carried out. So long, Yeah, Mr. Malley. Tom Blackie just left my office. You want us to muss him up as he gets to the front door, huh? No, let him go. But send Dan down to the airline's office right away and get me a ticket to Mexico on the first flight out. Mm, I had a lovely evening. Not going to the theater. <laughs> Mary, I'm sorry, honestly. I promise you we'll see that play tomorrow night, for sure. I'm sure we will. Unless tomorrow night you get another priceless shoe. The case of the priceless shoe is just about over, Mary. Huh? If Faraday was able to trace its owner, and if it, it fits a certain plaster impression, I'm going to run in and see him for a minute to get the good news. Oh, I'll wait in the car if you don't mind. Okay. Look, uh, it's time to go to a newsreel theater, if that's any consolation. Oh, it's better than nothing. I'll be right back. I'll use Faraday's private entrance so I won't get tangled up with the boys at the desk. Don't whistle at any characters while I'm gone. Any objections if I just whistle back? <laughs> Hello, Faraday. Well, Blackie. Well, what do you know? You didn't say get out of here. Well, and I know why, too. You want to thank me for helping you solve the Richards case. Yeah? It took ten years, Faraday, You have solved I... the Richards case, all right. Well, that old shoe fit the plaster impression, didn't it? No. That's what I... 
No. That's right, no. N-O, no. But Faraday... Frankie, that shoe not only didn't fit the impression of the print in the Richards case, but it's a style of shoe that wasn't made till four years ago. And the print in the Richards case is ten years old. Uh Uh-oh. What's the matter, Blanky? You're not laughing. That old shoe gave our theory a good swift kick. Faraday, you have a right to be wrong, but I know you aren't this time. Well, we'll have to forget about the Richards case and look for something else. Somebody sent me that shoe for a reason, you know that. Brilliant. Positively brilliant logic, Blanky. I know. That messenger had strict orders to deliver that shoe directly to me. But he was told that he was carrying something valuable. And I believe it, too. Here, take your old shoe and get out of here, will you? All right, Faraday. But I'll be back with it. Uh, Never mind. And if I can find the messenger who brought it to me, I'll be back with proof that it's valuable, too. Paper? Paper? Who buy a paper from the north? Oh, Miss Brown. Uh, you never fail to get a paper from me, do you? Haven't missed years. How's everything? Well, the same as it's been at my newsstand every night since you bought my first paper. Yeah. Here you are. Thank you. And how's Mr. Brown? Fine, thank you. See you tomorrow evening. Uh, good night. Good night, Miss Johnson. Paper? Paper? Latest paper? Let's wait for you, Mr. I'd like to change any minute. Well, might as well cross here as anywhere else, Bill. Paper? Will you buy a paper, please, gentlemen? Oh, why don't you get lost? The disposition you've got, Rod. Buy a paper from the guy. Get lost, will you? Grandpa, this won't buy a yacht, but I'll buy a paper from you. Keep the change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Paper? Who will buy a paper? Hey, come on, Bill. Life's change. That's cross. Oh, come on, will you? Hey. Holy mackerel, what a disposition you've got. Did you inherit that from your old man? (laughs) I inherited nothing from him. I love this. Me with an old man worth a half a million bucks, and I haven't got a dime. You'll get the money soon. As your lawyer, I can promise that. So what do you care? I care because I want to know. I want to feel it in my pocket. I want to spend it. I want to be rich. I know. I was born to be rich, Bill. And until I am, I'm going to be miserable. I wonder if you won't still be miserable after you get your old man's money. Oh, yes, Blackie, we have a messenger who answers to that description. Well, I'd like to see him. He's here. Yeah, just a minute, I'll get him. Well, Blackie, I hope he's the one. We've been to almost every messenger service in town. Well, we just uh, lucked the guy who delivered that shoe wasn't from a messenger service yeah. at all. Will you come in a minute? Come, Pat. Blackie, this boy fixed this picture you give me. Is he the one? Yes, he is. I had last. Oh, hiya, Blackie. Hello there. What's your name, son? Harry Young. Well, Harry... Yeah? Uh, did you know what was in the package that you delivered to me early this evening? No, I didn't. Well, it was this. This old shoe. Huh? Who told you to bring it to me? Well, I, I, I can't tell you that, Blackie. I promised I wouldn't. Well, give me the address of the place where you picked up the package. The shoe may be involved in the murder, Harry. Well, in that case, I went to 2121st Street. 2121st Street. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Gabe. Come on, Mary. Okay. okay. We're going to 2121st Street so we can learn something new about an old shoe. I love the way we went to the newsreel theater, Blackie. Oh, Mary, I know when to talk until four in the morning. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's 2110, 21st Street. Uh-huh, and there's 2108. 2106. 2104, going, going down. 2102. Right, next is 2100. Yeah, there it is. The real estate sign says, yes, that's it. 2100 is an empty lot. So I see. And it's one time when a lot tells us nothing. Now, back to Boston Blackie. Blackie receives a package, the contents of which are supposed to be valuable. But all the package contains is an old shoe. Blackie surmises that the shoe is the one which made a footprint in a ten-year-old still unsolved murder case. But it isn't. Blackie then finds out at what address the shoe was picked up for delivery. The address is an empty lot. As we return to our story, it is the next day. An old man is selling papers at his street corner newsstand. Papers? Papers? Who'll buy a 
my papers hey, from hey, an old... Mister? Oh, hello there, Please. son. How's the messenger business today? Okay, Grandpa. Hey, but look, I got to talk to you. Why, did something go wrong? No, everything went off okay. You delivered that package to Boston Blackie and you told him to take it to the police? Yeah, sure. I took your dough to do it, so I did it. Hey, but look, Grandpa, what cooks? Well, what do you mean? Well, you said that package was valuable, but all it was in it was a crummy-looking old shoe. Then I told you not to look at what was in that package. I didn't, but Blackie came and told me what was in it. And then you told him you delivered it for me. No, Son, no, I shouldn't. didn't do that. I didn't open my yap, Grant. And I, I even told Blackie that I picked up the package from you at an empty lot. Oh, thank you, son, thank you. You'll be rewarded for what you've done. Look, that dough you gave me was plenty for the job. But... I, I sure wish I knew what was such hot stuff about that old shoe. Well, boy. Yeah? For someone in this town, it's worth $500,000. Play leaving at gate 11 for Washington, Dallas, and Mexico City. Just about Hello there. You, you still of me? You don't mind? Well, maybe I do. Well, maybe you better not. Going somewhere, Mailey? How'd you know my name? I make it my business to know the names of guys like you. And the faces, too. My car. My badge, yeah. Williams is the name, Mailey. Deputy Inspector Williams. Now that we're old friends, maybe you'd like to come along with me. Some other time, Williams. I have other plans right now. Plans for a trip on a plane, huh, Mailey? I don't think you'll like it in Mexico. The chili con carne might not agree with you. Besides, I don't think Inspector Faraday would like you leaving town. Look, I'm not doing anything wrong. How about there's a chance you did do something wrong, and very recently. Come on, Mailey. Inspector Faraday wants to talk to you. You haven't any right to take me in. I know. Isn't that all? Come on, Mailey. Let's get moving. Hey, wait a minute. My plane's leaving. Isn't that a coincidence? Your plane's leaving. And so are you. Only you're heading in different directions. Homicide, oh. Faraday speaking. Inspector Faraday, this is Deputy Inspector Williams at the airport. Yes, William. Guess who was down here getting ready to board the plane for Mexico? Oh, a Mexican? No, a guy we don't like here, and they won't like in Mexico. Eddie Maley. Maley, huh? Yeah, I spotted him just a minute ago. And Blackie talked to him yesterday about the Richard Murder case. Yeah, I know, but I found a lot of stolen diamonds on him. Stuff taken in that big hold up last week. Well. Don't go away, Inspector. I'm bringing him in. Roger. There's someone at the door. All right, you answer it, will you, Bill? How lazy can a guy get? All right, I'll answer. Yeah. Hi, Mac. I'm a reporter from the Star Journal. I'd like to talk to Roger Hollister. Okay, come in. Roger, it's a reporter to talk to you. You talk to him, Bill. You're my lawyer. Well, I'd like to talk to you, Mr. Hollister. What about? About the money you're coming into next week. I understand it's quite a lot and that you're getting married, too. Beat it, will you? I hate reporters. Oh, Roger, minute. what's the matter with you? It won't do you any harm to talk to Look, him. you talk to him if you want to, Bill. I'm going to read a book. Say, what's the matter with that guy? Nothing. He's just his usual disagreeable self. Well, look, maybe you'll tell me what I want to know. Maybe. <laughs> Young Hollister gets his dad's stone next week, right? Yeah, a week from the day. I understand nobody knows whether old Hollister is dead or alive. No, no one knows for sure. He just left home for his office one morning and was never heard from or seen again. Mm -hmm. Neither he nor his body have ever turned up anywhere. But it'll be seven years to the day next Wednesday, huh? That's right. And at the end of seven years, old Hollister is legally dead, and young Hollister goes from rags to rich and from bachelorhood to married life. <laughs> Some break for the day, Miss Mary. Young Hollister inherits, huh? Quite a hunk of dough it is, too. Yeah, Roger's the only living heir. His mother was killed in an auto accident two years ago. And neither she nor the son could touch a cent of the old guy's money all the years he's been missing. Not a dime of it. But next week, Roger gets it all. Well, some guys get all the breaks. Yeah, I know. But why is it, friend, that it's generally the wrong guys? <laughs> Blackie, will you stop it? You know you've been sitting there staring at that shoe for a half hour. I know it. Mary, look at it. Sitting there on the table. Now, what Now, how can you be interested in an old shoe when there's so much in the newspapers? What's in the newspapers with news? Well, Roger Hollister's getting married. So what? A shoe. An old shoe. Mm. Who's Roger Hollister? The sole survivor of the famous Hollister family. Now, what an old shoe. The Hollister family certainly had tough luck. Roger's mother was killed in an accident two years ago, and his father disappeared nearly seven years ago. Hmm. Roger comes into a half million dollars a week from today, when his father will be declared legally dead. Mary, why would an old shoe be valuable? I don't know. 
<laughs> wouldn't it be funny if old man Hollister were alive? I'll bet anything his son wouldn't be getting married mm, next week. He's marrying Sally Lawrence, and she marries for money at least once a year. Mary. What's the matter? Mary, the shoe. The shoe, I think I've got it. I'll say you've got it. You can have it. Mary, it's impossible. It just can't be true. I, I don't tell me, Blackie. I know it can't be true, but it is. All I can say is, if it is, I know why that shoe was sent to me, what it means, and how that one shoe is going to walk right down the aisle and break up a wedding. <laughs> Yes? Are you Roger Hollison? So what if I am? So you're just the guy I want to see. Hey, nobody invited you in. I took the invitation for granted. I'm Boston Blackie. Boston Blackie, huh? What do you want with me? Not much. From what I hear of you, you're not worth much. But you will be a week from today. Does this shoe look familiar to you? No. Should it? No, not especially. But would you say it was the size shoe your father wore? How should I know? I haven't seen my old man for almost seven years. And you've really missed him, haven't you? Look, what did you come up here for? To insult me? No, but now that you mention it, certainly isn't a bad idea. That is, if it's possible to insult someone like you. I'll tell you what is possible. You're going to be thrown out of here on your ear. Which ear? I'm particular about which one I land on. This ear. Right here, wrong ear. Right here, wrong ear. Pleasant visit, Hollister. I'm going to see Faraday now. I'm going to see Faraday now, but if I were you, I wouldn't mention the fact that I was here. If you do, I might come back. Well, Faraday, whose fingerprints were on the old shoe? You only brought it back an hour ago. What do you think? We have nothing else to do but check it for you? No, but I think you did. We did. Your fingerprints were on it. And yours. Uh Uh-huh. And the lab technician. Uh Uh-huh. And another print, too. Uh, How fresh is that other print? Very. It was made in the last day or two, I'd say. And made very definitely, too. You know whose print that is? Yeah. We have a duplicate in our non-criminal file. Naturally. I hate to tell you whose it was. You won't believe me. I'll tell you whose it was. Go ahead, whose. It was Martin Hollis's. What? The man missing for so long. Just give me an envelope and a piece of paper, lend me a policeman, and I'll find him for you, too. Papers? Papers? Who's my hey, papers? Grandpa? Grandpa? Oh, hello there, son. Uh, Still delivering messages? Yeah, and this time I got one for you. For me? Uh-huh. A man came into the office and asked for me. Then he gave me this envelope and told me to deliver it to whoever sent that old shoe to Boston Black. Oh, I see. Maybe you better open it, huh? And maybe you want me to take a message back. The guy said he'd wait in the office. Yes, yes, I'll open it. Look, Grandpa, what cook? I don't know. I couldn't sleep last night thinking about that old shoe. Are you nuts or something? No, but there are some people who might think so, son. What? Look, there's no message in this envelope. What? It's a piece of blank paper. Well, maybe I should have written you a greeting, Grandpa. Blackie! Thanks for making it easy for me to follow you, Harry. And if you want to know who gave you that envelope, you deliver, it was a policeman I borrowed from Faraday. Blackie, I didn't want anyone to find me, but... You know who I am, don't you? Yes, I do. You're Martin Hollister. What? Yes, I am. I'm glad to know you're alive, which is a sentiment that I don't think will be shared by your son. Well, Mr. Hollister, how does it feel to be back from the dead? <laughs> Never having been dead, Miss Wesley, I, I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> but as Blackie probably told you, my whole scheme was to make it known that I was still alive, but... Not to give up my disguise as the old newsstand owner on the corner. I had to break through your disguise to prove my theory to Faraday, Mr. Hollister. I may have brought you out of hiding, but I didn't upset your primary purpose in sending me that shoe. Oh, what was that, Blackie? To prove he was alive so his son Roger couldn't get his money? Exactly. Hollister was going to continue to let the world think him dead if his son Roger changed his ways. Yeah, but he didn't change, Miss Wesley. I opened my newsstand on a corner that he passed every day just so I could watch him. But he continued to be the same Roger Hollister I ran away from. And my wife was just like him. I see where your son's marriage to gold-digging Sally Lawrence has been called off. Yes, I read that. No money, no love. Well, I assure you, my son isn't upset about it. I don't imagine he is. No. I like the way you tied up your fortune so that it couldn't be inherited until you were declared legally dead. My family deserved to live in comparative poverty, Blackie. As you guessed, I hoped it would change them, but... When it didn't, I decided never to let them see me again. No, let your remaining heir get your money. 
Well, you certainly accomplished your purpose. But I can't understand why your son never recognized you if he passed your newsstand every day. Well, you see, I've changed a lot. I left town at first and became quite ill. I had lost a lot of weight. My hair had turned quite white. And then I came back to open the newsstand when I was sure I wouldn't be recognized and could watch Roger without his seeing me. Oh, I see. Well, Mr. Hollister, I guess that's that. We've accomplished everything we set out to do. Oh, did we, Blackie? Oh, hey, that's right. We never did get to the theater, did we, Mary? Oh, we never even got to a newsreel. Say, I've got an idea. Suppose you and I and Mr. Hollister go to the theater tonight. No, no, thank you, Blackie. I, I don't care to get to the theater. Well, in that case, Mr. Hollister, by all means, come with us. We'll never get there, either. Gentlemen, Mr. Jeffers. Be seated, gentlemen. Be seated. The entire board is here, Mr. Jeffers, except Williams at the credit department. And why is he not here, Mr. Wilson? His wife's sick, sir. But his reports are ready. I've brought them for him. Well, thank you, Mr. Wilson. We'll get to the credit reports in just a minute. Uh, gentlemen, uh, this is a sales meeting. And the purpose of this meeting is sales. And uh, what creates sales, Mr. Wilson? A satisfied client and a client who is able to pay the price we ask. A satisfied client represents a sale already made, Mr. Wilson. To sell a product, the maker of that commodity must first create a demand for his product and then deliver to the satisfaction of his customer. But, uh, Mr. Jeffers, so far the market's been small. Our uh, prospects are limited. We sell an expensive item, Mr. Weatherby, but market research will reveal to us a larger demand for our product than you realize. So to make more sales, we must investigate the market more thoroughly. We're in business for profit, and we need a greater turnover. We mustn't forget the risks, though, Mr. Jeffers. Yes, we must give great consideration to credit risk, Mr. Wilson. And the percentage of profit must outweigh the percentage of risk. And where does our greatest risk lie? With uh, our clients? Exactly right, Mr. Weatherby. Therefore, the character, the reliability, the motives, and the credit rating of our prospective clients must be given careful scrutiny. Because we must remember, gentlemen, that the commodity we sell is murder. Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. (laughs) 
Why are camels by far America's most popular cigarette? Two of the reasons are flavor and mildness. No other cigarette has camel's rich, full flavor. And no other cigarette offers this proof of mildness. In a coast-to-coast test of hundreds of people with normal throats, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Try camels yourself. Then you'll know why Camel leads all other brands by billions of cigarettes per year. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, we make crime pay for a hundred a day. Hi. Plus expenses. Hi, Helen. I'd like to hire you. No cut rates for attractive redheads. But I'm a working girl. I only make $12.40 a week. Doing what? Running an elevator in the automat. My dear girl, there are no elevators in the automat. Oh, no wonder they wouldn't give me a raise. Oh, that's funny. I want to hire you to protect me from a man. He's been bothering me. And just who is this man? His name's Richard Diamond. Well, no wonder he's been bothering you. You've been bothering him. Can you take my case? Just as far as my apartment. We'll open it up and have a party. Are you ridiculous? Only when I try hard. I miss you. I saw you last night. You're just bored. Uh Uh-huh. And I miss you. I'm lonesome. I'm broke. I've got to hang around and pray for a client. Well, I've got a wonderful suggestion. Why don't you Uh come on? Uh-oh. What? Mr. Diamond? Why, yes. Come in. Rick, who is it? I don't know, but I'm making plans for some extensive research. I didn't mean to disturb you. I don't know how you could help it. Rick, who is that? I'll call you back when I find out. That's a girl. It certainly is. Rick! Bye. Now, Rick, you... Your girl? Hmm? On the phone. Oh, oh, uh, just an old wealthy aunt. She's leaving me her lumber fortune. Oh, nice. Yes, uh, sit down, uh, sit down, Miss, uh... Simpson. Mrs. Oh. Now. So you have an aunt in lumber. Oh, yes, yes. Broke one day, made a million the next. Discovered trees on her property. Trees on her property. Well, what are you going to do? I came in to hire you, Mr. Diamond. You have a kind heart and plenty of money, I hope. My husband needs protection. Yeah. I beg your pardon? Nothing, nothing. Just snapping at judgments. Occupational hazard. My husband is John Simpson. Perhaps you've heard of him. The John Simpson? Yes. No. He's retired. He discovered oil on his property. Oh, that one. Oh, sure. He was responsible for my bearings burning out at 700,000 miles. He was walking in the garden the other day. Going to drill in the daisy bed? Someone shot at him. Oh. He's all right. They didn't hit him. But I've been terribly worried ever since. Not to mention how your husband feels. He wouldn't call the police and wouldn't give me a reason. But he wants me to protect him. He doesn't even know I've come to see you. Well, what's he going to say? I'm hiring you, and I hope you'll understand. Well, I hope so, too. I charge a hundred a day at expenses. I have my own bank account. Oh, no. Diamond Detective... Who is she? Well, Aunt Hannah. What? Oh, that's nice, Aunt Hannah. I think Spruce is just the thing. Aunt Hannah. Spruce. Richard Diamond, you... Of course, Aunt Hannah. I'll talk to you later. I knew it. She's a blonde. She sure is, Aunt Hannah. Aunt Hannah. The one with the trees. Thinking about buying a carload of spruce. How nice. Am I hired? Of course. Then let's get out of here. Aunt Hannah might be over with a bat. Spruce? Of course. Well, that's how it started. A lovely blonde named Simpson with a wealthy husband... The husband had ducked a bullet in his garden, and now the lovely blonde wanted protection for him. A few casual jokes, a fat retainer, and Richard Diamond was once more in the ranks of the employed. We left the office and climbed in our station wagon. Forty minutes later, we were pulling up in front of the Simpson house on Long Island. Ah, quite a place. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, if you like money. John's probably in the study. May I take your hat? Well, I'll just keep it with me. Your husband might not want a bodyguard. Well, you're back in a hurry. Oh, hello, Ralph. This is Mr. Diamond. Glad to meet you, Mr. Diamond. Hello. This is Ralph Simpson, Mr. Diamond, my stepson. 
People are more inclined to think we're brother and sister. Well, I can understand. Ralph was the one who suggested you. Oh, why me? From reputation. Looks like everyone knows about me but the man I'm supposed to protect. And he won't like it much at first. I've already been briefed. But whether he understands or not, it's most necessary he has protection. Well, let's get it over with. Oh, dear. What is this, a convention? Hello, Jane. Hello, Professor. Who is this man, this person with the hat? This is Mr. Diamond, John. Mr. Diamond, this is my husband, Mr. Simpson. Yeah, charmed. And this is Professor Fisher. How do you do, Mr. Diamond? Hello, Professor. What do you do, young man? Do? Mr. Diamond is a private detective, dear. What? Now, dear, it was my idea. A a private detective? Now, just relax. Oh, go away, you quack. I've been relaxing enough. I can't think straight anymore. You've been making me relax so much. If you're not careful... Jane, I told you I didn't want anyone. But after being shot at... She pay your retainer, Diamond? Yeah. Did she explain my feeling on this subject? Well, yeah. And you still took the money? I've been poor. I told every one of you I can take care of myself. You know, I think he's right. Here's your retainer, Mr. But, Mr. Simpson. Diamond, please. Where do you think you're going? Out to find the guy who took a shot at you and give him some target practice. You've been paid a retainer to do a job. Now, let's see you do it. Oh, John. I had a feeling you were going to do something like this. Bring in a private detective or a policeman or something. Well, if he's supposed to give me protection, that's what he'll do. Now, all of you, get out of here. I want to talk to this Mr. Diamond. Thank you, John. I'll see you at dinner, dear. Now, you take care of yourself, you old scoundrel. Oh, be it! Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. Nice meeting you, Professor. Well, Mr. Diamond, I have a feeling you might regret this job. It's possible. I really wanted you. I was just keeping up a front for the benefit of the family. Is Professor Fisher one of the family? An old friend. Professor Fisher's a psychologist. After my stroke, he came to help me. He teaches me how to relax. You had a stroke? Three months ago. The professor's been a great help. You have a physician also? I don't need one. Now, as long as you're here to protect me, I might as well tell you what it's all about. Answer me one question first. I'll try. Why not call in the police? I have you. Do I need the police now? When someone takes a shot at someone, I think the police should be the first to know about it. Now, if you are quite done, Mr. Diamond, I'll continue. I'm well done. This morning, if my wife had brought you in, I would have had you thrown out. I didn't want any outsiders mixed up in this. What says your mind? A letter. Here. Mm-hmm. Type. Oh, read it. All right, I will. I missed you in the garden. I won't miss again. You'll pay for... Ashanti. Ashanti. It's in Africa. Oh. Twenty years ago, I was in the mining business. I had a partner, Frank Victor. We didn't get along, and there was an argument one day in the mine. It was quite a scrap, and there was a cave in. I got out. Frank didn't. There was an investigation, and I was cleared. Why tell me? The shooting in the garden could have been any crackpot. I didn't want any publicity, so I didn't want any outsiders. Then this letter. I have to confide in someone so they'll know who to look for. Who else knew about it? No one that it should make any difference to. Victor was a bachelor without a family. Could be blackmail. Someone who was there or at the investigation. Then why shoot at me? To give you a good scare. You'll probably get another letter demanding money. This person must be caught. In my position, I can't afford the scandal. You say I'm the first one you've told. Outside of your family? I haven't told my family a thing. Even my first wife didn't know about it. Hmm. You've heard nothing of the incident for 20 years? Nothing. Well, I'll see what I can find out. I promised John Simpson my confidence. He offered me a large bonus if I should discover who had sent him the threatening letter. Then I borrowed one of his cars and drove back to the city where I looked up an old friend. Lieutenant Levinson, 5th Precinct Police Station. Well, the smiling gumshoe. Well, hello, happiness and light. Want to do me a favor? Depends. Well, if you can strain your arches, I'd like some confidential information on a few people. What is in it for me? <laughs> I promise not to tell anyone what a mercenary policeman you are. I'd like dinner, maybe a big steak. You'll get dinner, maybe chow mein. You got a deal with that restaurant? Certainly. They saved me all the leftover fortunes stuck in the cookies. <laughs> Who are you interested in? 
I want to know about a young guy named Ralph Simpson, an attractive blonde named Mrs. Simpson, and a man named Professor Fisher. Simpson, Simpson, and Fisher. The boy named Ralph is the son of John Simpson. No. Yeah. The John Simpson? Know who he is? No. Well, unlike my Aunt Hannah, who discovered trees in her property... Your Aunt Hannah? Simpson discovered oil. Oh, that one. His wife is the blonde. Which blonde? The one I want you to check on, Mrs. Simpson. Oh, how silly of me. I should have known. Don't forget the professor. I thought you said his name was Fisher. I did. How does he fit in with Simpson? A friend of the family. Now, you got everything? Sure, sure. Blonde named Mrs. Simpson, a son named Ralph. He's not her son. Well, you just said he was John's son. Who's the blonde? John's other wife? John's other wife. That's right. Oh. He's her stepson. Oh. Well, why the devil do you want me to check on these people? I'm thinking about having a bridge party. Uh, give me the rundown on them. Sure. Uh, Walt. Yeah? Put your shoes on. Oh. I gave Walt the rundown he wanted and headed for the newspaper where I knew I could wallow through the morgue file and not be disturbed. I went back 20 years and after wallowing for three or four hours found a small article dated Ashanti, Africa, 1930. It didn't say much more than what John Simpson already told me. It mentioned the mine cave-in and the pending investigation on the death of Frank Victor. In an addition dated three weeks later, I found the account of the investigation and it verified Simpson's story. I left the newspaper went back to my office to check on a few things. Then, as I was about to leave and close up until I'd finished the case, I got a phone call. Yeah? Diamond? Yeah? This is John Simpson. I took a chance you might be in your office. Oh, I was just coming back out there. This is John Simpson. I took a chance you might be in your office. Yeah, 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 you said that. I'd like you to pick up something for me. Oh, sure. It's a package. It's at a bar on 57th Street. The Blue Pheasant. The Blue Pheasant on 57th Street. Mr. Diamond, this is John Simpson. Yes, yes, I, I, I know, I know. Anything else? Hello? Mr. Simpson. Bring it out to me right away. It's very important. I'll pick it up and bring it right out. Something wrong, Mr. Simpson? Hello? Hello? Hmm. Funny. Before we continue with Richard Diamond... Here is an important question. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? That question was asked a few years ago of 113,597 doctors. The brand name most was Camel. Recently, that question was again asked of tens of thousands of doctors across the country. Doctors in all branches of medicine. And again, the brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to these nationwide surveys... More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Friends, smoke the cigarette so many doctors enjoy. Change to camels for 30 days and see how mild, how flavorful, how enjoyable a cigarette can be. Yes, change to camels for 30 days and you'll stay with camels from then on. How mild, how mild, how mild mild can a cigarette be? Make the camels 30 days test. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I left the office and went down to 57th Street in the Blue Pheasant, where I told the bartender who I was, and he handed me the package Simpson had wanted me to pick up for him. I drove back out to the house on Long Island. The maid let me in, and Mrs. Simpson met me at the study door. Hello. Well, hi. Where's your husband? Oh, I think he's still in the study. He was a little while ago. You going out? Some shopping. You're staying for dinner. Hmm? Where's your stepson? Ralph went out just after you left. Did you want him for something? No, no, no. Just wondered. Been shopping? Oh, this is a package for your husband. Wanted me to pick it up. Dinner's at seven. Uh, Mrs. Simpson. Yes? It's Professor Fisher. What about him? How long have you known him? Since I've been married to John. Your husband said he was helping him to relax. Yes. Is there something wrong? I don't know. I talked to your husband earlier when he asked me to pick up this package. He sounded rather strange. Kept repeating himself. 
Since he had his stroke, he does that sometimes. Well, shouldn't he have a nurse? He should, but he won't. If something should happen, Professor Fisher's number is in the book on John's desk. I'll call the maid. Mm. I'll see you at dinner. Bye. Well, hello, Mr. Simpson. I've got the package. Give me the package. Uh, Mr. Simpson. Give me the package. Uh, are you feeling all right? Give me the package. Oh, okay, here. Oh, I did some checking on your story about a shanty, and I... Give me the package. You've got it. Mr. Simpson. What? Hey, what's wrong? Mr. Simpson, did you hear me? Oh, I better get the maid. The maid! Maid! Mr. Diamond? Yeah, Ralph? Yeah. What's wrong? I don't know. Your father's acting... It felt like the whole building was coming down around my ears. Ralph and I were thrown back against the wall, and by the time we got up, the study was a smoking black hole. Dad! Dad! I stumbled in after Ralph, but there wasn't much to stumble in after. John Simpson had been blown to kingdom come. You're sure it was Simpson on the phone? Sure, I'm sure it was Simpson on the phone, Walt. He asked you to pick up the package. That's right. He wanted it when I brought it in to him. He wouldn't say anything else. He just demanded that package. He'd been pretty sick, hadn't he? Yeah, but a man doesn't go to that much trouble to commit suicide. No. Well, maybe somebody planted the bomb. Look, let's uh, let's check with that bartender at the Blue Pheasant. Yeah, I want to talk to the rest of the family first. So by the way, uh, what did you find out about them? No police records. Can't find out much about the professor. He has no practice, no license in the state. Well, let's see if you can find out something. Interested? Yeah. It's funny when a man has a heart condition and won't have a doctor. I'll drag the professor in if you like. No, no, no. You go talk to the family. I'll go over and check with the bartender. Uh, wait a minute, Sherlock. You better tell me how you got into this mess. Okay, Fatty. Guess it won't hurt now. I told Walt everything the late Mr. Simpson had told me, then headed back to town in the Blue Pheasant on 57th Street. By the time I got there, the place was pretty well filled, but the bartender who had given me the package that afternoon wasn't in sight. Yeah, well, it be. Uh, where's the bartender who was working this afternoon? How do I know? He just works in the afternoon. Now, where does he live? Why? Well, I'm collecting addresses of bartenders. Now, where does he live? You collect addresses. I collect wise guys. Beat it. You mean I got to show my little old badge? Your little old badge? Well, why didn't you say so? Complex. He lives at 500 West 157th Street. What's his name? Earl. Earl Collins. No relation to town. <laughs> <laughs> no relation to time. Well, what are you going to do? I piled out of the bar and back in the car. Drove across town to 157th Street and 500 West. It was a big apartment house and Earl Collins was registered in 405. I climbed the stairs and knocked. Gave him a few minutes while I knocked my knuckles loose. Then went and dug up the landlady to have her open the door. She was a charmer, about four years older than Grant's tomb, with a gin disposition that would make a lost weekend seem like a Miami vacation. The type that should never have been dug up. Look, honey, I got cleaning to do. Sweetheart. Uh, Sweetheart. Oh, an expression of fond endearment. Look, Buster, don't give me no words longer than one syllable. Cop. You? Yes, mother. Mother. Sweetheart. Some cop. We'll discuss my qualifications as soon as you open that door. Okay. Sweetheart. There you are. Holy. You said it. Is he dead? As dead as he can get. Mm, still warm. I'm not interested. I need a drink. Did you see him come in? No. Did you see anybody else come in? I've been in my apartment all afternoon. I'm going back there. Killer used something awfully sharp. Neat job. Neat? <laughs> what are you looking at? What's that other room? Hi, what's wrong? Keep it quiet. What's that room? Oh, good gosh, bedroom. Any other rooms? Hi. Answer me. Bathroom. Fire escape? Huh? Where is it? End of the hall. Look, there's some blood leading to that bedroom. Oh. 
Now, sh- take it easy. Go downstairs and call Lieutenant Walter Levinson. No, Lieutenant Levin Walterson. Walter Levinson. Oh, goodbye. At the 5th Precinct. 5th Precinct, oh, yes. There were several drops of blood leading to the bedroom door. There was a good chance that the killer had been surprised and couldn't get out. I went to the door and tried it as quietly as I could. It gave, and I kicked it open. The shades were down, the room was dark enough to make it difficult to spot anyone. I moved in with my gun in front of me. He was standing right by the door, and he had a knife. Drop it. No. You should have listened. Didn't want to. Sorry, Professor. Don't be. It's better this way. Look, look, you're in bad shape. You better tell me about it. You fired the shot in the garden and sent the letter? Yeah. Help me sit up. Okay. Yeah. Lean against the wall. Thank you. Well, I, I still can't figure why Simpson had me pick up that bomb. I made him. You did? I've been treating him for nerves. I started giving him a hypnotic when he had his first spells. During one of those times, he reenacted the Ashanti affair. So you decided to blackmail him? At first... And when you took the case, we decided to eliminate him. We? Mrs. Simpson and I have been... <coughs> I haven't got much time. Internal bleeding. Police will be here pretty quick. Decided to kill the old man and Jane would get the estate. I thought you'd be blown up with him. Mr. Simpson was under some sort of influence when I walked into the study. My profession. After you left, I... Returned and talked him into a deep sleep. I had him call you at your office. He nearly messed it up. Hypnosis. Nothing unusual. Simple suggestions. And when I walked into the study... He'd been ordered to ask for the package and open it. You mean he was asleep when I walked in? Yes, you see. It's too late. You'll have to guess the rest. Bleeding in... Oh. Yeah. Well, you better lie down again, Professor. You'll have to get used to it. But why did he kill the bartender? Well, Walt checked and the professor had been coming into the bar for some time in the afternoons. He made friends with Earl, the bartender, left the package with him. When he found out I hadn't been killed in the blast, he killed Earl to keep him from identifying him. Oh, charming. Yeah, like an asylum in an earthquake. Well, I told you to stick to redheads. Oh, really? Well, you know any available ones? One. (laughs) How available? Um, you'll have to do some extensive research. Okay. After dinner. I do not do any research on a schedule. Don't you want any dinner? Well, Sure. Well, it gets cold. Let it. Rick. What? I'm hungry. Oh, for Pete's sake. You sing something while I go put the food on a tray and we can eat in here by the fire. You're going to get fat and sassy. Rick. I take it back. You're already sassy. You sing something. I'll be right back. Nah, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Got to sing for everything. Oh, dee doo 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 That's nice. Just get the food, huh? Just sing, huh? Oh, I think of you with every breath I take And every breath becomes a sigh Not a sigh of despair But a sign that I care for you I hear your name with every breath I take On every breeze that wanders by And your name is the song I remember the long years through Even though I walk alone You guide me In the darkness you light my way And all 
all the while inside me love seems to say someday someday and when i sleep you keep my heart awake but when i wake from dreams divine every breath that i take is a prayer that i'll make you mine Rick. hmm is there really anything to this hypnosis well there sure is the old professor made simpson open that package is it hard to do ah oh, look i'll show you just sit right there rick i i it's all right just look me right in the eye. All right. You're going to sleep. You're going to sleep. You just want to go to sleep. Nothing makes any difference. Just sleep. 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 Wish. Deep, deep sleep. A deep, sour, peaceful... Oh, for Pete's sake. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. To find out how well camels agree with the throats of smokers, this far-reaching test was made. Hundreds of people from coast to coast, people with normal throats, smoked only camels for 30 days each week. Leading throat specialists examined the throats of these smokers. They made 2,470 examinations and reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Try camels for 30 days and see how mild, how flavorful, how enjoyable a cigarette can be. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of camels have sent more than 198 million gift camels to our armed forces. This week, gift camels go to hospitalized servicemen and veterans at Veterans Hospitals, Framingham, Massachusetts, and Durban, Michigan, U.S. Naval Hospital, San Diego, California, and to all hospitals operated for the U.S. Air Forces in the Far East. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond was written and directed by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Virginia Gregg played the part of Helen Asher and Alan Reed was Lieutenant Levinson. Others in the cast were Gene Bates, Herbert Butterfield, and Tony Michaels. Be sure to listen to another great camel show, Vaughn Monroe and the Camel Caravan, every Saturday night. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against the backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Big Ditch. Maybe there's a reason why I happen to settle down in Cairo. Maybe because it's on a great river like the Mississippi that flows down past St. Louis. Only the Nile's somehow different. Egypt lives by its rise and fall. And when it starts to run low in summer, the spirits of the people seem to go down with it. That includes me. And the best thing to give me a lift is to see an old friend. Even a guy like Matt Gallagher. I'd had a big Saturday night in the tambourine, and along about 11 in the morning, I got the receipts out of the safe and sat down to a front table where I could be under a fan while counting up. I was just finished when there was a knock at the door. I shoved the money bag under the counter. As I threw the latch on the door, I saw his face through the window. It hadn't changed much in five years. 
except for a few new scars picked up in some waterfront brawls. He barged in like a big battered freighter riding out a storm. <laughs> Ah, uh, Rocky, me boy, the saints be praised. Well, what wind blew you in, Matt? A good wind it was, lad, for the sight of you again. Let's see, now, where was it? Uh, uh, Calcutta, Frisco, Singapore? Oh, don't make me remember. <laughs> if you're thinking of the set to, we had a sultan's daughter in Istanbul. We rode it out, didn't we, lad? Sure. Uh, by the way, how much money did I loan you to get out of town? Uh, uh, bygones, Rocky, bygones. Come now, uh, set me up with a nip, will you? Sure, just add it to your bill. Yeah, that's an idea. Hey, and bring around the bottle, me lad. We'll be drinking to all times. Uh, just leave a little of the cash customers. Huh? Yeah, never worry, me lad. Never worry. One day you'll be marking my account paid in full. And, and plenty to boot. Well, yeah, I won't hold my breath till then. Rocky? There are two of us. Yeah. That calls for it. All right, just one more. Who two this time? Yeah, I got an answer to that, lad. To Francie Bayon. This lovely lady to have a set her dainty feet on the streets of Cairo. Who? Uh, up with it now, Rocky. Don't be insulting the lady. All right. <laughs> Who's Francie? Not a new girlfriend. Aye, aye, sir. And there'll never be another. With eyes as blue as the lakes of Killarney. Uh, you never learn, do you, Matt? Ah, oh, Rocky, I know what you're thinking. But never again. This is the real thing. Now, tell me, when did a girl ever come into your life that there wasn't trouble? Lad, I won't have you saying that about Francie. She ain't like the others. Sure, okay, okay. You say uh, Baby Blue Eyes is here in Cairo? At the Shadrach Hotel, pining her heart out for me at this very minute. Oh, there's nobody like her, me lad. You got it bad again. Aye, and we'll be settling down if all goes well. And that's what I'm wanting to talk to you about. Okay. How much? Well, the fact of the matter is this, that uh, I, I, I will be needing a little money. I wondered when you'd get around to it. But it, you don't understand, lad. I'm cutting you in. On what? Rocky, how would you like to own the Suez Canal? <laughs> Great. <laughs> how about it, lad? <laughs> the Suez? Sure. <laughs> I'll put it right alongside the Brooklyn Bridge. You, you think I'm lying to you? Eh? Yeah, no more than usual. But I'm telling you, Rocky... Look, Matt, this is a touch, and we both know it. It's nothing of the kind. You only show up once every four or five years, but every time I end up with less money. Now, come on, how much do you want? Ah, now, that's more like it, me lad. A hundred and fifty pounds will swing it. I don't know what I'm doing this, but I'll let you have twenty. Only twenty pounds? But the deal, lad. You're lucky I had a good night. I tell you, it's a touch now, Rocky. All right, call it a wedding present, then. Here. Well, you want it or not? I'll take it. But are you... Uh, there's a phone in my office. I'll be right back. I'll be waiting, Rocky. You can later that. It was a call asking for a contribution to the home for indigent goat herders. Oh, I brushed it off naturally and went back front. First thing I noticed was that Gallagher was gone. Second, he'd taken the bottle from the table with him. That's when I made for the money bag behind the bar. Oh, it was there, and so were a few loose piastres, but that was all. I yanked the front door open, but the street was deserted. Matt Gallagher had made a smoother getaway than the super chief. A little figuring told me that along with the 20 I'd given him, he'd gotten off with a total of 150 Egyptian pounds, which comes to exactly 600 good round American dollars. Well, that's what you get for helping a guy. I don't like being suckered, so I didn't tell anybody, just waited around. He didn't turn up among the other million and a half people around Cairo, so I decided he lit out for places unknown. I was sure of it after a couple of weeks went by, but I still hadn't cooled off. Then I got a call from Captain Sam Sabaya. Jordan, is it possible that you know a man named Matt Gallagher? Sure I know him, Sam, and I'm looking for him. For what purpose? I'm going to dig 150 pounds out of his hide that he owes me. I fear you will have trouble collecting, Jordan. Yeah? Why? Come to the morgue and you will see. Matt Gallagher is on a slab. Well, I can't stay sore at a guy on a slab. I wanted it over with and forgotten, so I caught the first cab that came along for headquarters. Sam was waiting for me and led me downstairs to the morgue where he drew back one of the sheets. 
Gunshots, as you can see, Jordan. Uh, where'd you find him, Sam? Lying in some out-of-the-way ruins near the old uh, Babylon Roman fortress in the old part of the city. He had been dead for several days. How'd you happen to call me? A match pack from the cafe tambourine was in his pocket. There was this small chance you might have seen him there. I've known Gallagher off and on for a long time. When did you see him last? A couple of Sundays ago at my cafe. He uh, borrowed a pocket full of money while I wasn't looking. And you did not report this to me, Jordan? Oh, it was a personal affair. Personal affair indeed. Too often you take matters into your own hands, but someday you will learn. Sure, sure. Uh, what else was in his pocket, Sam? There was no money, if that is what you mean. Well, what about identification? No, this passport and Seaman's card. You may see them if you like. Thanks. Also, a few other personal articles, if you care to look at them. Oh, no, no, I've seen enough. Now, Jordan, if there is anything more you can tell me about this man... Nothing at all, Sam. He's all yours. Very well. But, Jordan, give it some thought. I intend that this murder be disposed of very quickly. I could feel Sam's eyes on the back of my head as I went out. He generally figures I'm holding something back. And this time he was right. To begin with, I'd never seen that man on a slab before. It wasn't Matt Gallagher at all. Besides, Gallagher was a seaman. And this was a fair-skinned man with soft hands that had never done a lick of rough work in his life. Now, I wondered if Sam had noticed that. Well, I had a hunch now that Gallagher was still kicking around Cairo with my 150 pounds. And I wanted first crack at him. What he had to do with the murder and the switch in identity was anybody's guess. Looking in on Matt's girlfriend at the Shadrach Hotel was one thing I'd avoided up to now. But this is where I had to see her. It turned out she was sharing a suite with somebody, so I got the room number and went on up. The door was opened by a friendly-looking little guy with a mustache, and his gray hair parted in the middle. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, what can I do for you? I'd like to see Francie Bion. Name's Jordan. Oh, of course, of course. Please come in. Thanks. Who is it, Uncle Julius? It's Mr. Jordan, Francie. Oh, so you're Rocky Jordan. That's right. Matt Gallagher mentioned my name? Yes. Bosom pals, he said. A big oaf. Yeah. Uh, Francie, perhaps Mr. Jordan will be able to tell us... Give him time, Uncle dear. Oh, uh, yes, of course, of course, uh, my dear. Well? I'm looking for Gallagher. Where is he? I haven't seen him for weeks. What's your guess? From what he told me, you ought to know everything about him. What did he tell you? Oh, something about you and him settling down. Real cozy. (laughs) Fine chance. He'd better show up in a hurry, that's all I gotta say. What's he up to, Francie? He's up to his gills and Irish whiskey, if you ask me. Eh, uh, what else? Oh, I don't know. He's been acting crazy for the last month. A lot of wild talk. Brother, what he wasn't gonna do for me. Buy me minks and sables and yachts. Did he say what with? <laughs> Who cares? It makes sense. What do you want with him? A hundred and fifty pounds, due and payable. Did he steal it from you? Well, he didn't exactly sign a promissory note. Uh, Francie, my dear, this is just as I told you. I expressly do not approve of that man for you. We've been all over that, Uncle Julius. But a girl of your culture and refinement, I cannot understand what you see in a person like that. Then stop trying. Where do I look for him, Francie? You might take a swim in the Suez Canal. He says he's going to buy it. Oh. Gallagher told you that too, huh? (laughs) That's what he's telling everybody. And the more he talks, the crazier he gets. All he needs is a little dough to swing it, he says. Then it's big times for us. (laughs) Can you beat that guy? Well, let me know when he shows up, will you? Better be in a hurry. We're washing out of this town plenty quick. Okay, thanks. Don't mention it. Oh, uh, Mr. Jordan. Hmm? Mr. Jordan. Yeah, Julius? Uh, about this, uh, robbery. Have you mentioned it to the police? Not yet. Why? Well, it's for Francie's sake. She's such a sensitive child. Well, don't worry, Julius. What I've got to settle with Matt Gallagher is between just him and me. I finally shook Uncle Julius from my lapels, got out of the Shadrach Hotel, and back to my tambourine. As I walked into the cafe, Chris flagged me down from behind the bar and handed over a package wrapped in old dirty paper. It's for you, Rocky. Well, what is it? I don't know. Messenger said he was supposed to give it to you personal. Only got tired waiting. And did he say who it was from? Yeah, Matt Gallagher. Gallagher? Let's have a look. 
It ain't wrapped up so good. I'm interested in what's inside. Oh, careful. It's coming apart. Oh, here. Help me here, will you, Chris? Yeah. Great jumping Jehoshaphat, Rocky. What's that? The bundle had come apart in my hands, and a lot of strange-looking pieces of paper lay scattered all around me. While Chris was getting them together, I picked one up and had a look. Like all the rest, it was old-looking and yellow, with everything written in French. At the top, in real fancy lettering, it read, Compagnie Universelle du Canal Maritain de Suez. I began scrambling through the others, and they were all the same, except for a different serial number. I didn't need to know much French to realize that these were shares of stock. Yeah? From where I stood, I, Rocky Jordan, now own part of the Suez Canal. You are listening to The Big Ditch, an adventure with Rocky Jordan. You'll find mystery to your heart's content on CBS, fine yarns woven by some of radio's top mystery writers. But you can also vary the fare with music and comedy. Here's a comedy you won't want to miss. Monday night, on CBS Radio Theater, Mickey Rooney stars in Merton of the Movies, a satire on the movie-making industry. Remember, CBS Radio Theater, tomorrow, Monday night, at 6. Now we return you to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, The Big Ditch. What would you do if somebody sent you a whole stack of shares in the Suez Canal? Paper the wall with them or ask a few questions first? Well, my curiosity got the best of me, too, so I wrapped up the bundle again and headed for the Cairo Securities Exchange. I didn't expect to find the answer there to why a murdered man was found with Matt Gallagher's identification on him, or why Gallagher had sent the shares to me. That was something else. I finally got to the right man at the exchange, gave him my name, opened up the bundle on his desk, and waited for him to start laughing. Yes, Mr. Jordan? Oh. What about these things? Hmm. It's the Company Universal de Suez. I say, Mr. Jordan. Yeah? Uh, this is most remarkable. You're bringing such valuable securities in this fashion. Now, wait a minute. Don't tell me they're the real thing. Authentic in every detail. I've seen many of these. The man is indeed fortunate to possess Suez Canal shares. But what are they doing here? A big pardon. I mean, doesn't the Suez belong to a government? France or England? Oh, a common error, Mr. Jordan. True, the British Crown owns seven sixteenths of the Suez Canal, thanks, of course, to the brilliant statesmanship of Disraeli when he purchased them from the Khedive of Egypt. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, a great man, Disraeli. A credit to the empire, Mr. Jordan. Uh, look, getting back to these shares. Oh, oh, oh quite. <laughs> Carried away, you know. Sorry. Um, are you trying to tell me that private individuals can own shares in the Suez Canal? Most assuredly. Many people are fortunate to own stock in the Suez. Uh, the fact of it is, thousands of shares have been lost through the years. The company is nearing its century mark, you know. Well, how much are they worth? Uh, they sold originally for 250 pounds a share. They now run as high as 20,000 pounds. Each? Yes, you have 200 shares here. It's possible that dividends have accumulated. All in all, these are worth, uh, in your currency approximately uh, $16 million. May I ask where you got them? I bought them for 150 pounds. Oh, I say, Mr. Jordan, you're pulling my leg. No, I wouldn't dare. Uh, now, now, of course, these must be transferred to your name. Oh, yeah, sure, but uh, some other time. Uh, you mean you're taking them with you in this manner? Yeah, thanks for everything. Uh, but why? I've decided to get my money back. I put the bundle inside my coat and came out of there with a great education on the Suez Canal. Enough to know that there was a sweet setup for a neat little racket. Only it gets too big when a man's murdered and the stuff's planted on me. And right then I knew I had to find Gallagher and shove the whole bundle down his throat. It was already evening and I moved along the street, not noticing the beggars or anything else. 
a little native water salesman started getting under my feet. Effendi, I have the pure fine water for you. Water like crystal. All right, move along. Him, she. Oh, but it is not of the Nile, Effendi. My water is from the hidden springs of the desert. One piaster is all. Hello, your cheek. What's good now? Uh, two centimes, then. Only for you. No water. Him, she. Uh, Mr. Jordan. Where'd you learn the name? This concerns another matter. The Afranki would be wise to listen. All right, get it out. Mr. Jordan, there are certain people with money. They will bargain well. What people? What do they want? I cannot tell you who they are, but they are interested in certain pieces of paper. You tell certain people that certain pieces of paper aren't for sale. Get it? Alwa Effendi. Uh, you know where Matt Gallagher is? The name I do not know. Yeah. This helps. Uh, but uh, perhaps there is another who can help you. Who? The street of many knives up the hill past the rug weaver's hut. I'll need more than that. I have the water. Hey, uh, wait a minute. Very pure water like fine crystal water. I could have followed the water cellar, but already night was setting in and I had another errand. It took a lot of asking around and some strange looks, but I was finally in the street of many knives. Nothing more than a passageway that winds up through the desolate native quarter to the east. It's a place a foreigner doesn't go around, even in daylight, much less at night. And I could guess how it got its name. The wild dogs were out, but they'd found something else and didn't bother with me. Just before the street ended at a hill, I found the rug weaver's hut and a door just beyond. There was no light, but I knocked. I thought I heard a quick movement inside. So I knocked again. I tried the knob. It was locked. I put my shoulder against the door and one shot was all it took. The lock snapped and I was inside just as a hulking figure lunged from the shadows. He had powerful arms around me and we went down. My knees came up and we went on over. Then I was on top with my hand in his face. And that and the smell of Irish whiskey cut it short. Matt. Rocky. Rocky, lad, I, I didn't know. How'd you find me? Yeah, we'll skip that. Oh, let's get some light in here. There's a candle on a corner table. But you have to light it now, lad. Why not? Oh, Rocky boy, am I glad to see you. Yeah, you won't be, Matt. Not till you hand over my money. Oh, now, 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 Rocky lad, go easy on me. I've been in for a rough time of it. Why the hideout? Well, I'll admit it to you, Rocky. I'm scared. Of what, the police? Uh, not exactly. But I, I'm in a bit of trouble. Why not run to Francie? She's getting out of Cairo. Well, uh, I, I tell you, lad, I, I'm giving her up. Francie's too good for the likes of me. Ah. Uh, Anyhow, I've learned me lesson, Rocky. There's been a bit of strike north of Johannesburg. I'm going there and dig for gold. Come on with me now. I'll start clearing it up, Matt. What about the guy down on the morgue? Uh, in, the, in the morgue? You know he's dead. He was carrying your seaman's card and your passport. Sure. Sure, I, I know. But you don't think I killed him, lad. You couldn't think that. I, I value life too much. Spit it out, Gallagher. Who was he? Uh, Walter Logan. He used to work for the Suez Company in Paris. You get all those shares from him? Right, me boy. He offered a quick sale for 150 pounds. Well, they'd be worth thousands. Why a price like that? Now, Rock, you know I don't bother with trifles, asking a lot of embarrassing questions. Go on. We had a little rendezvous, and I bought the shares. I left him, and I wasn't more than a block away, and I heard the gunshots. I ran back and found him dead. See anybody else around? No, Rocky. But I knew people would be accusing me. They always make things tough and poor, Matt Gallagher. Come on, come on. Why the switch? Well, I had to think fast. If they thought I was dead, they wouldn't be looking for me. So I put my stuff in his pockets. Then why send the shares to me? That was our deal, Rocky. Anyhow, uh, I was sort of hot, and I knew you'd take care of them. Yeah. All that over a stack of worthless paper. Worthless? What do you mean, Rocky? A lot of Suez shares have been lost. Nobody knows what happened to them. You say Logan worked for the company in Paris. He could have found out the serial numbers of the missing shares, made up some to match the real ones. Counterfeit? Sure. He turns up with a bunch of lost shares, and if he's lucky, no one's a wiser. Only, he wasn't so lucky. What now, then, lad? I still want my 150 pounds. But, Rocky, I'd give it to you if I had it. Hey, hold it, Matt. Hold it. Yes. 
Maybe I heard, or maybe I just felt it, but I knew there was somebody at the door. As I opened it, a barefoot native ducked away. I was after him fast, and just as I was on him, he whirled and faced me. Mr. Jordan. All right, what is it now, Buster? You don't sell water around here. Uh, no, it concerns the other matter, Effendi. Uh, you ready to tell me who sent you? I cannot, uh, but about the certain pieces of paper, uh, my master offers you 5,000 pounds. Uh... Is that all? Oh, but Mr. Jordan, he is prepared to go higher. Uh, possibly six or seven thousand pounds. I'll go the other way. The other way? Yeah. Tell your master he can have the pieces of paper for 150 pounds. You will give them to me? Not on your life. I'll deliver them in person. Well, I meet your master. At the ruins of the Minya Tower in Old Cairo. Uh, there you will not be disturbed. I'll be there at 11 o'clock. <laughs> The little water cellar vanished in thin air, and I was back dragging Gallagher into the street and down the hill. I figured as long as he'd started this thing for me, he could be in at the finish. He complained like a dyspeptic camel all the way, but I finally got him with me to the tambourine, and there I put in a quick call to Sabaya. What are you trying to say to me, George? I told you, the guy you have in the morgue isn't Matt Gallagher. But you saw him yourself. Why did you not tell me? You didn't ask me, Sam. I didn't. You, of all the incredible... Then who is this man? His name's Walter Logan. Jordan, listen to me. You have completely upset my investigation. You have come dangerously... Sam, close. do you want to find Gallagher or not? Indeed I do. Then put on your snowshoes and mush on out to the Minya Tower in Old Cairo. Jordan, you will first explain this to me, Jordan. See you there, Sam. Gallagher heard every word of the conversation and he was crying real tears as I tucked the pieces of paper under my arm and shoved him into a taxi out front. Between him and the lazy taxi driver, I had myself a time as we rolled south into Old Cairo. Finally, we drove through what once, centuries ago, was the gate to the Roman fortress called Babylon. A little farther on, the cabbie pulled up, and he wouldn't go an inch farther for all the fish in the Nile. So we walked it from there. In another quarter hour, we were nearing the crumbling Minya Tower, surrounded by ruins. Just a few minutes before 11. A full moon was out now, almost white against the ancient sandstone walls. It was quite a sight, but Gallagher wasn't impressed. Rocky. Rocky, I, I don't like it at all. Yeah, we're early. There's nobody here. It's right there that Walter Logan was killed, don't you see? Yeah. Somebody might repeat themselves. Look, Rocky, this is not for me. Let's get out of here. I, I'm sorry for getting you into this land. I'll make it up if it takes the rest of my life. Might not be long enough, Matt. No, Rocky, me boy. That's exactly get back what in I the mean. shadows. We'll wait here. Matt dug for a dark corner and we waited. Not more than three or four minutes. Then we heard footsteps along the passageway from the way we'd come. Whoever it was kept to the shadows on the far side. The steps were confident with no trace of hesitation. They passed. And then the figure stepped out. Certain pieces of paper... Five thousand pounds. Why did you make it a hundred and fifty? I'm satisfied. Do you have them? Yeah. All right, give them to me. Oh, let's keep it honest, Blue Eyes. <laughs> Here's your money. Now hand them over. They're all yours. Thanks. Now we'll get a few things straight. Skip it, Rocky. Come on out, Julius. Yes, I'll take over now, Francie. Julius. It's Uncle Julius. I've been wanting... Careful, to... Matt. That gun in his hand, he'll use it. You're quite right, Mr. Jordan. Oh, I'm getting it now. I should have known why you didn't like me, Uncle Julius. Always come between Francie and me. What's bothering you, Julius? Matt and I know too much. You've still got a lot of phony shares to sell. You could quite well interfere with our plans. So I'm going to kill you. Just like you did Walter Logan. Yes. Well, he fixed you up with his stuff. Why drop it? He was a little man. Our meth frightened him. He began trying to dump the shares at quick prices. There was no telling what he would do next. I had to kill him. That leaves just you and Francie. Great team. I give her full credit. It was she who masterminded our plan. It ain't true. It ain't true at all. I'll not have you saying that about Francie. Shut up, you stupid ox. You fostered into it. You never liked me. And I don't like you either, George. Matt, keep back. You'll be poisoning her mind against me no more. Stop, you fool. Stop. You or nobody can stop Matt Gavin. <laughs> Matt stopped two slugs head on and kept walking in. Then his big gnarled hands were on the man's neck and driving back. Julius had no more chance than a day-old kitten. 
All at once, it was a snap, and he dropped like a wet bar rag. Matt stood over him for a full second, and then he piled on top. <laughs> Francie was suddenly wild and running. And I didn't follow because just then I saw Sam Sabaya and a couple of his men coming up to meet her. Well, there was a lot of talk and explaining for a while. Then Uncle Julius was wheeled off to the morgue, Matt Gallagher to the hospital, and Francie off to a cell. Sam kept the package. And about an hour later, he and I were resting at a table in my cafe tambourine. Jordan, you you make very good coffee. Sounds that way, Sam. Mm. You should confine your activities to just such things as this. Oh, I'm willing. But when a poor sucker like Gallagher comes around, what are you going to do? It is possible there will not be another time. Uh, <laughs> takes one a couple of slugs to knock out a guy like him. What Francie did to him will hurt him worse. Mm, perhaps, By the way, Jordan, I'm wondering now what I should do about you. Me? What for? You are guilty of selling counterfeit shares for 150 pounds. I uh, think it's about time you looked in that package, Sam. What do you mean? My deal with Francie was for certain pieces of paper. And that's just what she got. All torn out of the Cairo Gazette. <laughs> It's CBS at this same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. Rocky Jordan, written by Larry Roman and Gomer Cool, stars Jack Moyles in the title role and is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Adventures of the Saint, starring Tom Conway. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Tom Conway. As the Saint. Mind if I sit down here, mister? Huh? Oh, no, I don't mind. Thanks. Usually I get a little more enthusiasm than that. What? Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're a good-looking babe. Oh, you're just saying that to be sociable, mister. Mr., uh, what? The name's Doyle. Lola's mine. Um, how's the chicken tonight, Mr. Doyle? It's okay. How would you know? You haven't touched it. Being on a train kind of spoils my appetite. So that's what's spoiling your appetite. Sure. What else? I wouldn't know. Uh, Mr. Doyle, who's paying for my dinner, me or you? Well, <laughs> now that I take a good look, I'd be glad to buy your dinner. Oh, good thing I'm not the demure type. Restrain your joy and hand me that menu, huh? Sure. Thanks. Yeah. And button your jacket, your gun's showing. Hello? 
Oh? Yeah, I want some information. Listen, I want to know if the Chicago Limited's on time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, passing through town here. Yeah, thanks. Well? On the dot, Mitch, 2.30 in the a.m. Hmm. It's a little past 11 now. Yeah, train stops here for 10 minutes. That ain't an awful long time, Colonel. It's long enough. Maybe. I want another drink. You don't need it. I hope Doyle's enjoying his train ride. I wouldn't know. You think you'd be glad to see us, Mitch? I want another drink. Yeah, you know something? I think he'll be so happy that uh, it's just liable to kill him. I'm closed for the night. I've gone out of business. Oh, I'll hate you in the morning. Okay, just a second. Uh... Mr. Templer? Yes, and the hour is midnight, and I'm about to go to sleep. You look very nice. Oh, you must say that to all the boys whose bells you ring. I'm not working my way through college, Simon. No. Uh, from where I stand, I'd say you'd... Uh... Graduated. From where I stand, I'm getting tired of standing. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Come in. Come in. It's um, a little late to begin a beautiful friendship. I'm frightened. Your eyes tell me that. And uh, they're very beautiful. You know a lot about women, don't you? Uh, not as much as I'd like. I'm married to Jimmy Doyle. Doyle? Uh, I don't know him. I want you to meet him tonight. So uh, I can be frightened, too? He's coming into town on the Chicago Limited in a few hours. Oh, you... Uh, Want me to bring him flowers? I want you to see that he gets home. Alive. Well, the uh, police do fairly well at that kind of thing. I can't go to them. Oh, you're afraid to. Why? Jimmy would kill me if he found out. I see. Where is home? 49 Marble Avenue. And I'm to see that he gets there alive? You uh, haven't told me why he might not. Nor do you intend to. Why should I bother, Mrs. Doyle? Perhaps because I'm lonely and afraid. Perhaps because I'd like you to call me Madge. Hmm. Simon, I've no one else to go to. All right. I'll meet his train. When's it due? Five in the morning. Five hours to go, then. I'll go home now. Oh. Knowing that you're taking care of things, Simon. I might even be able to sleep. Pleasant dreams, Madge. <laughs> Another drink, Laura? <laughs> what are you trying to do, launch me? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be that way, baby. I'm drinking right along with you. Right now, I'd say you were a couple of blocks in front of me. <laughs> hey, what time is it, anyway? It's, uh, let me see. Yeah, uh, 2.30 almost. <laughs> Early hours, baby. <laughs> Hey, you don't tell me the train's running out of gas. That's disgraceful. That's what it is. Yeah, just a whistle stop. Who's talking about whistling? I said it was a whistle stop. Nothing personal. It's awful dark out. You think somebody lives in these towns? I knew a fellow once, lived in a small town. (laughs) Yeah. He was a dope. What did you see out the window? A couple of people getting off. Some waiting to get it. Hey, who are you throwing your whiskey at? I didn't throw it. It slipped out of my hand. That's so. Uh, yeah. Then why is your hand shaking? I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> You're scared. Now, look, look, let, let's get out of this club car. Too many people. Okay, anything you say. Yeah, too many people. <laughs> it yeah. is kind of a switch. The girl's seeing the fellow home. Yeah, funny. <laughs> then why didn't she laugh? Hey! Somebody pulling the train out from under me. Right, just hold on to me, will you please? Yes, sir. They're just switching engines. They ought to fasten these trains down better. Yeah, this here's my car. The compartment is right along here. Oh, aren't you fancy? I just got a lower berth. Yeah. I'll be seeing you. Oh, no, 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 no. Come on in, will you? Well, a girl's got to be careful of her reputation. Nobody around but you. Yeah, well, so... Please come in. We'll, we'll gab a while, huh? Oh, well, that's better. Okay, give me your arm. Right here. It's kind of dark in here. Why don't you put a light on? No! Hey, Templar. 
Hart? Oh. Lieutenant Flynn. Hello, Templar. What are you doing here? Is there a law against lurking on station platforms? Don't tell the commissioner. You meaning the train? Uh, it's easy to see why they made you a lieutenant. Well, thanks very much. Uh. Friend of yours coming in on the limited? Uh, that's um, hard to say. Translated, you mean you're not saying. Why are you here? I'm crazy about trains. Oh. Also, the department got a wire. Seems somebody on that train wasn't a very good traveler. Huh? Seems he died en route. Yes, train sickness can be overdone, huh? Wasn't exactly train sickness. What was the name of the man you were meeting again? I didn't say it was a man. No. This fellow stopped a couple of bullets in the worst possible place. Oh? Are there any good places to stop bullets? You're not too busy, Templar. When the train pulls in, maybe you'd like to climb aboard with me. Mm -hmm. Take a look at the fellow I'm talking about. Oh, I might not be too busy. What's his name? Doyle. Jimmy Doyle. They didn't improve his appearance. The bullets, I mean. Whoever shot him didn't have a beauty treatment in mind. You know him, Templar? Uh, his name is Doyle. Jimmy Doyle. Isn't that what you told me? You fence very nice. When did he die? Close as the medical examiner just figured it, he must have been shot around two or three in the morning. Well, it's nice to know he died in a private compartment. Whoever shot him had fun ripping the place up. He could have been looking for something. Wonder what? Yes, I'm wondering too, Lieutenant. Nice to have company. Could have been diamonds, though. Doyle collected them? I hate to tell you this, but he was a bad boy. He stole them. Oh, for shame. In Chicago. He and a couple of other bad boys. One of whom uh, wore glasses? How do you know that? Not much of a guess, Lieutenant. This is what I just picked up off the floor. Looks like a tiny hunk of crumbled tissue to it me. It came out of a sight saver package, Lieutenant. That tissue was used to wipe a pair of glasses. Let me have it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. One of the bad boys who pitched in on the Chicago deal with Doyle is a man named Kerner. The important point at the moment being, he wears glasses. Well, that tissue is mildly flimsy as evidence, but it uh, helps your thinking, huh? No, no, no. Nobody heard the shots? When Doyle was killed? No, it's noisy on the train. It may mm. have been going through a tunnel at the time. Well, it's been fun, Lieutenant, but... It I... could be even more fun, Templar. Oh? If you would, uh... Let me introduce you to Lola. And who is Lola? The kind of girl your mother wouldn't have liked. Well, since I'm not my mother, some other time perhaps, but May I not have... be another time. We're booking her on suspicion of murder. She wear glasses? Mm-hmm. And the men do make passes. You're being too kind to me. She and Doyle were lapping up firewater all evening. She went with him to his compartment, this one. Claimed she chatted with him for a while, then went to her own berth. Nobody saw her at the important times, though. Too bad. It's only suspicion of murder. Lola's been chummy with lots of crooks, especially jewel crooks. Hmm, sounds like a case. The only trouble is, whoever knocked off Doyle was after the diamonds. Lola doesn't have them on her. Lucky for Lola. Did the train stop anywhere en route? Jerkwater town named Haynesville at two. Interesting. But I... I'd so... still like to have you talk to Lola. Why? You're prettier than I am. Oh, thank you. You might, uh, you might get something out of her. Furthermore, if you do, I'll stop wondering what brought you here. Well, that does it. I couldn't bear to think of you staying up nights wondering. Lead me to her. We're keeping her in compartment C, a couple of doors down from here. Keep her company. We've got to search everybody on the train. Oh, aren't you going to introduce me? <laughs> Just smile at him. Oh, I'll do my best. Well, remember, the last guy who was alone with her wound up dead. <laughs> We have to hole up in this room. Not long. You'll just be glad you're off of that train. Yeah, yeah. You know, I never did like cops. But one thing you got to give them credit for. They know how to search a man. For a while back there, I wasn't sure they were going to leave the skin on me. Hey, what's the matter, Mitch? I, uh, I'm wondering where the stones are, Colonel. Yeah, yeah, so am I. They weren't in that compartment. We tore it apart. Couldn't find them. I didn't. Now, wait a minute, Mitch. You were with me all the time. Sure, when we got on the train. But according to what the cops were throwing at us, somebody visited Doyle while you and me split up. 
Locating our berths? Yeah, but we had to take berths in different cars. We'd have been spotted too easy if we hadn't. Sure. Sure, except for the way it worked out, you could have got to Doyle's compartment before his body was found. You could have shot him and ditched the stone something. Yeah, so my friend could you. Would I bring it up if I... You might, that... you might. Just to make sure that I didn't. Now, look, Mitch, there's one thing we know. Neither of us has got the stones on us now, no matter who killed Doyle. So? So do you care who killed him? I care about the stones. All right, then let's start using our heads, huh? Doyle reached the station in Chicago with the stones. We figured he'd have them with him all the time, but maybe he arranged to have them reach New York separate from himself, you see? Yeah. Yeah. All right, now I got an idea of where in New York those stones would have to wind up if that's what Doyle did. And that's where? That's Doyle's home. So uh, why don't we drop in on Mrs. Doyle and tell her the sad news? Yeah. Yeah, that way we get a seat on the inside. Yeah, where we sit and wait for company. Good evening, Lola. Or should it be, uh, good morning? Go away. I want everyone to go away and drop dead. But you haven't even met me. I'm uh, Simon Templer, Lola. You can drop dead, too. Wait. Simon Templer? That's right. The Santa. That's all a girl in my condition needs. Go away. Oh, Lola. What? Lieutenant Flynn told me to smile. I'm uh, smiling. Dr. West would be proud of Oh, me. I don't know. He just gives me the brush every morning. <laughs> You're funny. Sit down. Thank you. But sit down slow. I don't want you shaking the train. Oh, I'll be careful. Oh, these trains shake awful easy. Or it could be I have a hangover. Oh, were you uh, drinking last night? I was drinking. Well, a hangover seems plausible, then. Oh, I can think of a lot better words for it than that. For example... Uh, Lola. Yeah? You're in trouble. Huh? What are you doing? Practicing to be Sir Galahad? Not exactly. Because I'm... if you are, you're wasting your time. Lola, about Doyle. Don't mention him. I can see his face right now. Half blown up. That's a fairly accurate description. Would you mind leaving me and my hangover alone? But according to what you told the police... You left him in his compartment alive. No, oh, no. Then I... how do you know what his face looked like? Dead. Get out of here. That won't help much. Did you kill Doyle? You don't look like my diary. Go away. Did you kill Doyle? No. Do you believe me? I can't tell as yet. You were after his diamonds, weren't you? It's possible, but I'm not answering that one. How did you know what his face looked like after he'd been shot? All right, you got me on that. I didn't spill to the cops because I figure I didn't have to. All right, now it's different. I went with Doyle to his compartment. We were both kind of on the drunk side, you know what I mean? Yeah, I've been there. Well, anyway, he was drunker than me, so I... I thought maybe I could pick up a few carrots, you know? Mm, I think so, yes. So we walk into his compartment. It was dark in there. The first thing that happens is Doyle gets shot. and Somebody hits me on the head before I can get a good size scream out. You didn't see who it was? No, no. When I came to, I was dead. The compartments had been turned upside down, and I felt rotten. I went away from there fast. That lower berth looked just like home. You could be telling the truth. Lean over. What are you going to do? Ouch! Hey! There is a bruise on your head. Well, that proves... One of two things. Either that your story is true, or that you were clever enough to acquire that bump all by yourself. It's not the kind of thing I like to go around acquiring. Mm, I... Don't know if the police will hold you. I suspect they won't. If they do release you, yeah. I'd advise you to be very careful. Avoid diamonds. They're beautiful, but they might be the death of you. Just a second. Oh. Hello, Mrs. Doyle. Kerner. Kerner and Mitch. You mind if we come in? I... You don't mind. Ah, she looks all broken up by grief, don't she, Mitch? All broken up. Is that a new routine? Yeah, she don't sound like a new widow at all. Did you say new widow? Oh, don't tell me you didn't know. Didn't the cops get in touch with you? About what? I guess they didn't. I guess maybe Doyle didn't bother keeping him posted about his home address. Will you tell me what happened, please? Sure. Somebody took a sudden dislike to your husband. So you're a widow. When? Two o'clock this morning. 
He was on a train. People die on trains, too. You said the police. They was murdered, Mrs. Doyle. He isn't bringing home the bacon. Would you mind leaving? But uh, somebody else may bring it around. Oh, we like bacon. I don't... We'll just have to put up with this for a while. Uh, Mitch, take a look around. See if there's any other entrance to the apartment. Okay. What do you want of me? Well, Mitch and I figure that you're going to have a visitor soon. We want to be in on the welcoming committee, and we ought to figure that uh, it should be a very warm welcome. <laughs> Aren't police stations attractive? Well, uh, they're useful. I guess I have you to thank for being able to walk out of there. No, forget it. Unless, of course, you really killed Doyle. I'd never kill a man. Why not? I like them. Now, you might like diamonds even more. I might, but I don't. Well, it's uh, been nice meeting you, Lola, but I have... Uh, a... Simon, why are you in such a hurry? Oh, I've got a special date. Oh, who is a widow. What's so special about a widow? I just want to see if she's merry. Hey, Kerner. Yeah? Time's passing. We got lots of it. Back door's bolted and all we got to do... <gasps> oh, there it is, Grandpa. Yeah. Grandpa. I got my hand across her mouth. She'll be quiet. Okay, we kill the lights. And wait. The door's unlocked, and after a while, Junior out there is going to get impatient. Try the handle, find that the door is open, and walk right into... Let go of me. Let it wrestle, friend. This shouldn't take very long. Madge, put the lights on. All right. Oh. You had a glass jaw. Oh, Simon, I'm so glad. So glad. So am I. But when you rang the bell, I was terrified. And then when the door opened, you weren't there. Well, you took too long answering the doorbell. I thought maybe something might be wrong, so I kicked the door open and ducked to a side until the fireworks stopped. This gentleman with the glasses here... That's Kerner. Hmm. No one's going to make passes at him, either. Except the coroner. He's dead. The other... Mitch. Yes. He'll recover. Uh, Kerner was near the door. Mitch fired. The gun's lying on the floor near him, and he hit Kerner instead of me. A very pleasant error. Simon. They told me Jimmy is dead. He is. He was killed, wasn't he? Yes. Why? He was carrying a tidy parcel of stolen diamonds. Kerner and Mitch were trying to... Remove them from him. Apparently, they'd helped in the original theft. Oh. So they came here to wait for... Whom? Not for Jimmy. They knew he was dead. Then they... I think you could use a drink, and not a soft one at that. Where can I find the... the... In the kitchen. Come on. Jimmy kept everything in the... Time. The door. Shh. It's bolted. I'm going to make it easier for our unknown friend outside. Get over to a side match in case they start trying bullets. Hello, Lola. Oh. Come in and shut the door behind you. Simon, I'll... I'll do it then. Lend me your bag, Lola. Well, you mustn't think I... I won't. Till later. Mm-hmm. No gun? Of course not. Oh, you may have your bag back. You also may have uh, dropped the gun someplace else. Uh, Madge, this is a lady named Lola. Lola, this is Doyle. Who is she, son? A girl with a lower berth who strayed into the wrong compartment. Let's go into the living room. Simon, I came here because I was afraid for you. Or for the diamonds? No, it wasn't that I... Is the objects on the floor bothering you? Oh. Only one of them's dead. This one. Uh, Mr. Kerner... Nothing interesting in his pockets. As for Mitch... But Simon, he wouldn't have the jewels. Let's say he shouldn't have. But he has. Look. Rings? Necklace? Simon? Yes, half a dozen pieces. The only question is, are they the things Doyle was bringing in from Chicago? Uh, where's your phone, Madge? Over there. Thanks. Thanks. 
Uh, Mitch is starting to come to. One of you had better take that gun. I've got it. Uh, hello, Lieutenant Flint, please. Uh, point that gun at Mitch. I huh? am. If he acts up, don't be delicate. I won't. When I think of how he made Jimmy look, I... Mm-hmm. Flynn, Simon Templer, uh, would you mind reading off a list of the stolen jewels Doyle was supposed to have on him? That's right, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fine. Oh, no, Lieutenant. Not intellectual curiosity, you see. I have exactly those jewels with me. Not to mention a corpse and a killer. The address is 49 Marble Avenue, apartment C. Uh, and oh, uh, Lieutenant, don't hurry. I'm having fun. Then the jewels you found on Mitch... Are part of the Chicago loot, yes. Uh, only one thing bothers me. What's that? Madge, Mitch couldn't have shot Kerner. The angle's wrong. The angle? Yes. Besides... Why should either of them have uh, started shooting? They didn't know who would be coming through the door. Simon, I I didn't want to get involved, but I shot Kerner. Mitch was holding his hand over my mouth. I had a hand free. I didn't want them to kill you, Simon. Uh, We're in uh, unanimous agreement on that. As for Lola, I... I don't like the way you're looking at me. Oh, you imagine standing side by side a, a, a very pretty picture. Don't talk to me about pictures. They got frames around them. You just said the stuff you found on Mitch is part of the stuff Doyle had with him on the train. That's right. Well, that proves Mitch killed Doyle and stole the diamonds. No. It merely proves that the diamonds were not on the train. What? Look, I, I never even got through high school. For me, you have to make it a lot simpler. Well, I'll be glad to. Everyone who walked off the train this morning was thoroughly searched. No one could have got away with the jewels. Therefore, the jewels weren't on the train. Not when it reached New York, that is. I think I know what you mean, Simon. Yes, probably because you got through high school, Madge. However, where does that leave us? It leaves us with a stop the train made at around two o'clock in the morning at a small town named Haynesville. I remember that. That's where Kerner and Mitch got on. Doyle saw them. He got scared. So that means they got to be the ones who killed him. It uh, means something else, Lola. It means that other people could have got on the train at Hainesville, too. You mean someone else is involved? Someone we don't know about? No. Then you'd have searched these other people you mentioned in New York. The stopover at Hainesville was um, how long, Lola? Around ten minutes. They switch engines there. Which means that someone could have got aboard the train, shot Doyle, taken the diamonds, and then... Got off the train at Haynesville. But who could have done that, Simon? You, Madge. Madge, that's ridiculous. I was You here. saw me at midnight, did a very pretty song and dance, and then left. You then took a plane to Haynesville, met the train, and your husband there killed him, and flew back to New York. No, I... Oh, it'll be easy to trace the plane, Madge. If anyone thinks of it. I have. What makes you think I'll let you pass those thoughts on? Oh, you won't be able to help yourself. True, you've uh, a gun. But you've already killed two men. Uh, Lola doesn't approve of killing men. Lola. I got her. Oh, good, Simon. You'd better let me have that gun. Thank you. You. Better save it for a jury, Madge. Because you'll be seeing one. You have been listening to another transcribed adventure of The Saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. And now here is our star, Tom Conway. Ladies and gentlemen, democracy demands an active faith, a dynamic struggle against the fanatics who would destroy our national unity with a poison of prejudice. We must protect ourselves and our families against prejudice by accepting or rejecting people on their individual worth, by refusing to listen to or spread rumors against a race or religion, by speaking up wherever we are against prejudice and for understanding. Remember, freedom and prejudice cannot exist side by side. If we choose freedom, we must fight prejudice. This is Tom Conway inviting you to join us again next week at the same time for... Another exciting adventure of The Saint. Good night.
This script of The Saint was written by Louis Vitties. In our cast, you heard Gloria Blondell as Lola and Joyce McCluskey as Madge. Paul Richards and Peter Leeds played Kerner and Mitch. Shepard Mencken was Doyle and Ken Christie, Lieutenant Flynn. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Safier production and is directed by Helen Mack. Tom Conway is soon to be seen in the Warner Brothers production of Gold Diggers in Las Vegas. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer, Don Rickles. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 2, 8209. Just a moment. Oh, people can barge in on you at the... Now, where is that? Oh. Oh, that's better than nothing. Wait a second. Hi, Candy. Well, Mallard, my favorite foot flat. You caught me at the wrong time. Depends on your viewpoint. Shall I leave? No, no, come on in. What brings you up to Telegraph Hill, Mallard, dear? You. An interesting subject. Care for a drink? No, I'm on duty. You mean I'm being honored with an official call? Sort of. In that case, you can leave. No, seriously, Candy. Uh, you can help me, if you will. Well, the mountain coming to the mountain. Oh, you're not so large. Now you can leave. Only kidding. Uh, here's a pitch... An acquaintance of mine, Gordon Ayers, has a little problem on his hands. He needs your help. What is this? Oh, don't get excited, Candy. He's an insurance adjuster for an aviation outfit here in San Francisco. A couple of months ago, a guy and his wife took off in a private plane from one of those little airports down the peninsula and crashed. She burned to death. Ayers investigated and okayed the claim. A rather fancy amount. But his company doesn't like it. They don't think the crash was legit. It gets interesting. Well, he has to prove he was right. He came to me, he wanted us to verify the facts. But we're the San Francisco police, and that's out of our jurisdiction. So? So, I mentioned you. Oh. He wants to meet you and have a little talk. If you can get the guy out of the soup, there's a nice little hunk of cabbage in it for you. Mallard, I'll take it, but there's something phony. Well, how do you mean, Kenny? This is the first time you've ever given me a helping hand in my private eyeing. Could be there's a reason. Could be a reason why I'm going to take the case, too. Must be the rabbit in me. I love to nibble on large hunks of cabbage. Do you recall the lyrics from that old song, the one that goes, He floats through the air with the greatest of ease? Well, that's what happened to Candy Matson, one of San Francisco's better-known private investigators. She found herself floating through the air all right but not with the greatest of ease. As a matter of fact, it was one of the most hair-raising experiences this pert little gal detective ever ran into. Well, why go on about it? Here she is to tell you about it herself. Well, that's the way it started. Inspector Ray Mallard, an old friend of mine. And that's all I can call him, darn it, an old friend of mine. 
Dropped by and insisted I meet this Gordon Ayers, an aviation insurance adjuster. Two things induced me to take the deal. Mallard's big spaniel-like eyes and the money angle. It was right after Christmas and I was a bit short. Mallard left and I took the slip of paper he'd given me with Ayers' phone number on it, sat down by Amici's pet aversion and doodled with the dial. Good afternoon, Pacific Seaboard Fidelity. How do you do? Is there a Mr. Gordon Ayers there? Speaking. Inspector Mallard suggested I call you Mr. Mr. Ayers. This is Candy Matson. Oh, Miss Matson, yes. Happy to know you. Uh, I imagine Mallard explained my dilemma. Not in detail, no. Well, uh, the situation is quite complicated. I was wondering if we could meet and discuss it at length. Uh, can we get together this afternoon? If you say so, yes. Uh, time is of the utmost importance, Miss Matson. All right, you call it, Mr. Ayers. Splendid. I'm just leaving the office now. I have an appointment down the peninsula in an hour. Uh, do you have a car? Yes, I do. Uh, could you meet me at the San Mateo Airport, Cranston Flying Service? That's okay. Uh, about an hour and a half? Hour and a half. Fine. Goodbye, Miss Matson. This I didn't like. Already I was money in the hole. San Mateo Airport. Right on the water next to Bay Meadows, separated by the highway and a couple of salt marshes. Why should I have to meet the guy down there? Oh, me. Well, I drove down to the San Mateo Airport, found the, found the Cranston Flying Service building, and got out of the car and waited. It was a nice afternoon, so I stood watching some of the planes take off and land. Uh, pardon me, uh, you, uh, you aren't by any chance... Oh, no, of course not. No, I'm not by any chance. I'm Candy Matson. Are you Mr. Ayers? That's right. I didn't expect anyone quite so young. Well, did, did you want to talk, Mr. Ayers, or just stand there like a sea bass out of water? Oh, uh, pardon me. I want to talk, of course. Uh, by the way, have you ever flown? On commercial airlines, many times. Why? Uh, would you like to take a little hop this afternoon? Hmm? Well, what's that got to do with why I'm here? Plenty. It'll give you a picture of what I'm up against. In what do we fly, and who's going to be our guiding angel? Well, we'll probably fly in that Cessna over there, and I shall do the piloting. Well, I don't know. Have you been flying long? <laughs> About 20 years. Oh. And I also flew for Uncle Sam in the late mess over Germany. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Good. Let's go into the office. <laughs> Mother told me there would be days like this. Candy, she used to say, never leave the house without your parachute. <laughs> We slipped through some prop wash, and I displayed a bit of silk that didn't belong to a parachute. Then into the building that housed the Cranston office. It was typical. A glass-topped counter with various flying trophies hung about the walls. Old propellers, silver cups, pictures of planes, and assorted certificates. Ayers plopped his wallet on the counter, and the chap proceeded to check him out. We went out onto the field and climbed into the plane. Then Ayers gunned the motor, and we were taking off. This is all very cozy, Mr. Ayers, but what's the idea? There's a very definite reason for it, Miss Matson. Uh, see that tower down there? Mm -hmm. No, no, down there toward Redwood City. Oh, yes, I see it. Oh, that's where we're going. About a mile east of that, there's a private airport run by a man named Folger. We're going to simulate a landing at that field. Well, I'm still not with it. I want you to notice all the physical qualities of that field as we come in for a landing. Notice the boundaries, the hazards, and the amount of free space a plane has. Especially a light plane. You make me feel like a latter-day Nellie Bly. Okay, Mr. Ayers, let's go. I'll watch. Fascinated as I am by flying, I started looking around. The lower end of the bay on our left, the skyline to our right, and the bustling peninsula directly beneath us. I was shocked out of my reverie when the plane turned on its side and we cut sharply to our right and out over the bay. I thought Ares had lost control of the ship, but no, it was just a routine bank. Then another bank right, and we were nosing in toward an airfield down and in front of us. Did I startle you? A little. It's all right now that I know we're not playing tag with gravity. I'm going to cut the throttle now and nose in for a fake landing. I'm glad you told me. I'll know how to behave. Keep your eyes open, Miss Matson. You see any high-tension lines around the airport? No. Any fences, highways, or any other obstructions? No, no, I don't. 
Now, look, this is a normal landing. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were to sit the plane down here, I'd be about a mile from the waterfront. Then if I let the plane taxi the usual amount, I'd be up by those hangars. Any problems about that? None that I can see at the moment. Now, look carefully. You see anything at all? Anything? No. If I didn't know better, I'd say we were in the Sahara. Okay. Then I'm going to give it the gun. Without the wheels touching the ground, we were climbing into the sky again and back toward the San Mateo airport. In less than minutes, Ayers brought the plane in for a neat landing, and we were over a very dry martini in a little spot in Berlingame. Okay, we've played charades long enough, Mr. Ayers. Cut me in on the plot. Oh, it's merely this. The man who owns that airport, Folger, was out flying with his wife one afternoon. Brand new plane. They came in for a normal landing. Just as we did. As far as I could figure out, the plane nosed over and caught fire. He escaped. His wife didn't. As the adjuster on the case, I voted straight accident and asked my company to pay the claim. They didn't like the idea. Well, you know how insurance companies are, Miss Matson. Naturally, they have to be suspicious. But in this case, their fears are groundless. Mm-hmm. What about Folger? Where is he now? Still running the airport. Now, let's get down to cases, Mr. Ayers. Just why did I get the free plane ride this afternoon? Well, I've known your friend Mallard for some time. I wanted him to sign this affidavit saying the field is perfectly safe for normal flying. He wouldn't do it. Naturally. Naturally, being with the San Francisco police. Then he suggested you. I have to have some licensed representative of the law's signature in order to clear my neck with my company. Here, you saw for yourself. Will you sign it? Whoa there, boy. Wait a minute. Feather your prop. You... You mean you won't sign it? I didn't say that. But I don't sign anything until I read the fine print, not even for my pal Mallard. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave now, after I have another olive and what goes with it. And then I'm going home. I'll call you tomorrow afternoon sometime. What, Miss Matson? Don't you... start to argue, Mr. Ayers. After my second olive, I get very stubborn. This got wilder by the moment. I was supposed to sign an affidavit clearing this joker on the basis of a 30-second buzz over a cow pasture. But oh no, I wasn't going to get caught with my flaps down, not for Mallard or anybody. I drove home to my penthouse on Telegraph Hill, dished up a warm tub, some warm soup, and then some warm blankets, and blacked out for the night. In the morning, I drove over to California Street near Old St. Mary's. I wanted to see a good luck piece of mine, Rembrandt Watson. Rembrandt's a photographer and tops in his profession now that he's not supplying the rent for all the bistros on the Barbary Coast. Candy, my lily. Greetings. Uh, you know, if I was a G.I., I'd slug you for that. How are you, Rembrandt? Strictly, just we play bon. I... That's French. Well, that's your opinion. And that's English. Oh, dove. You look as well scrubbed as Mount Diablo after a rainfall. <laughs> There's a romantic parallel. What brings you about on this lovely day? This lovely day. How would you like to go for a little drive, Ducky? Well, let's see. I was supposed to have tea with Diogenes Murphy, the honest Irishman. But he'll understand. Yes, I'd love it. Where are we going and why? San Mateo. And for why, I don't know. Well, that's San Mateo for you. <laughs> Anyone else going with us? No, just the two of us. Oh, good. Then I shan't have to ride in the tunnel. Wait just a moment, Dove. Whilst I toss Henry me great day in a brisket or two, and I'll be right with you. <laughs> Rembrandt fed his monster. We piled into the car and whooshed off to San Mateo. On the way down, I tried to plot a course of action. It wasn't easy. As my friend Ayers had said, the field was free from flaws, and where do you go from there? I was soon to find out. Is this our destination, Dove? That's right. Arid little spot, what? Yes. Reminds me of the recruiting posters I used to see for the Foreign Legion. Come on, Rembrandt. I want to see something. What, dear? The other side of this hangar over here. What's over there? The burnt fuselage of a plane. You can't be, girl. Your sense of the macabre knows no bounds. Can't help it. This is business. Is that the one? I should imagine so. Hmm. Quite a mess, isn't it? Ooh, what a horrible way to go. Look it over, Rembrandt. Anything strike you as strange? Wait a moment. Yes. Why are there tattered pieces of fabric on this side of the plane and on the other, nothing but melted steel frame? 
Good point, Laddie Buck. And another thing. Look inside the cabin there. The safety belt on the other side. Intact. So it is. And I should sign affidavits yet. Wait till I see that mallard. Pardon me. Was there something you wanted? Oh, how do you do? I don't like his looks, dear. Did you want a ride? Is that why you're here? We have cubs, Cessnas, just about anything. No, no, nothing like that. Then, uh, what is it? I happen to own this airport, and I don't like people poking about. But the owner? Well, then you must be Mr. Folger. Why, uh, yes. That's right. Who are you? Santa Claus. A little late. Come on, Mr. Folger. Let's go into your office. I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. Folger led the way, and we went into a little Quonset hut type of building that served as the airport office. There were no trophies here, nothing but bareness. On one side was a pot-bellied stove, and on the other a mangy-looking parrot inside a cage. Folger motioned us to a couple of firehouse chairs and sat down himself in one that swiveled. Now then, what's this all about? I'm Candy Matson. This is my friend, Mr. Watson. I see. I'll be frank with you, Mr. Folger. I'm working with a Mr. Gordon Ayers of the Pacific Seaboard Fidelity Company. What? That's right. And they're holding up payment of your claim until Ayers can get a signed affidavit verifying his judgment. Ah, oh, Fidelity! What in the world? Oh, Fidelity! Pay no attention, Miss Matson. That fool parrot picks up anything you say. I must admit this is somewhat of a shock. I thought it would be. Now, is there anything you can do to help me? Pictures, diagrams, anything like that? Yes, I have a complete file, including a newspaper photograph of the crash itself. May I see them? Uh, newspaper! Crash! Quiet, you idiot! Quiet, you idiot! Quiet, you idiot! Yes, you may see them. I keep them in my apartment in the city. If you'd uh, care to drop by this evening, I'll show them to you. Good. Supposing you give me a call when you get in town. Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Mm, I'll write that down. Candy Matson, Candy Matson. That's right, Polly. NC 98012. I said quiet. Oh, someday I'll wring that blasted bird's neck. The only reason I keep her around is because she belonged to my wife. Uh, I'll call you this evening, Miss Matson. <laughs> We left the place, got in the car, drove back down the road, and ducked into a little clump of trees, well hidden. Rembrandt looked at me as though I was losing my mind. But in about ten minutes, we heard the sound of a car coming from the airport. It roared past us, and at the wheel was Folger. That's all I wanted. I whipped us back to the Quonset hut, fully expecting the place to be locked tighter than a drum, but it wasn't. The door was wide open. What's the idea, Candy? I'm not sure, Rembrandt. It's just a hunch. That open door, though, means we're going to have to work fast. Work fast? At what? My telephone number is Yukon, not NC something or other. I have a sneaking idea that somewhere in back in the dim recesses of that parrot's memory, I can get a key to this whole thing. Now, hello, Polly. Pretty Polly. Give me a pencil, Rembrandt. Pencil? Here. Thanks. Pretty Polly. Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Pretty Polly. Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Candy Matson, Candy Matson. NC, NC. NC, 98012. 98012, that's it. Thanks, Polly. Come on, Rembrandt, let's get gone with the wind. I left Rembrandt off at Diogenes Murphy's place on Van Ness Avenue and drove downtown. I ran into a present-day miracle by finding a place to park then took the elevator up to the offices of the Pacific Seaboard Fidelity Company. I spotted Ayers' office and walked in. Well, Miss Matson, sit down, sit down. You're as good as your word. Thanks. Got anything for me? I may have, but first I want to know if you've got anything for me. Some little piece of information you've been holding out, from your own company, for instance. I don't quite understand you, Miss Matson. I'll come to the point, then. How in the name of Kitty Hawk could you honestly pay a claim on that wreck at Folgers Airport? The plane was obviously burned only on one side, the passengers. And also, the passenger's safety belt was still intact, tightly fastened. <laughs> You're a suspicious little thing, aren't you? Well, I'm like the insurance companies. I made the same mistake myself. That fuselage you saw was a training plane. It cracked up on a routine flight. No one hurt. The plane in which Mrs. Folger was killed was sold for scrap a week after my formal investigation. Oh, well... 
Looks like I pulled the trigger on the wrong target. Oh, well, that's all right. As I said, I made the same mistake myself. However, I don't think it was advisable for you to go down there without consulting me first. Oh? Folger called me on the phone right after you left. You've given him a fine case of the jitters. Look, Mr. Ayers, I operate in my own manner. If I saw reason to give Folger's cow pasture the once-over, that's as it should be. And if that isn't agreeable to you, you can get another boy or, or girl. Oh, now, now, wait a moment. I'm sorry. No, no, you continue doing as you are. Good. Naturally, you want to be thorough about this thing, and I can't blame you. Right. Uh, now then, what's the next step, Miss Matson? I... Well, offhand, I really don't know. I'll call you first thing in the morning. First thing in the morning, fine. <laughs> I knew what the next step was, but I wasn't telling heirs or anybody. This was more than just working for a commission. I felt I was on to something now, and I was going to follow through. I called a friend of mine at an aviation insurance brokerage and got enough night work to keep me going until next St. Swithin's Day. I took my material home and started in. It was a history of every fatal plane crash in the United States for the past ten years. About eleven, I fixed some coffee. About two, I started to nod. Pinched my cheeks and snapped out of it. About four, I had some more coffee. Then at seven, just as the sky dawned, red streaked across the bay, I found what I wanted. Exactly what I wanted. It didn't tie together yet, not all of it. But the knot was now begun. It only needed a little tightening. I stretched out on the couch, set the alarm for nine, and woke up right on schedule. Once again, I got airs on the phone. Pacific Seaport Fidelity, Air speaking. Good morning, Mr. Ayers. Candy Matson. Oh, good morning, Miss Matson. How do things look? Well, if you're referring to me, awful. I've been up all night. By the way, I wonder if we could make that flight again. Flight? Yes, over Folgers Airport. Only this time, I'd like to make an actual landing. Oh, why, sure. That can be arranged. And I'd like Folger to come with us. I want him to describe just what happened as we go along. Oh, well, yes. Uh, this morning okay? The sooner the better. I'll call him right now. Have him get a plane ready. I'll uh, meet you there about noon. Now I had to work fast. I called Mallard, explained the situation, and he agreed to get one of his radio technicians and come along with me. We drove back down the peninsula, and I left them both at Cranston's flying service where they went to work. Then I continued to Folger's airport. It was a little before noon, and Folger had the ship out on the runway warming it up. Hi there, Mr. Folger. Seen anything of Ayers? Yeah, he's in the office. He'll be right out. Come on, you can get in. Okay. Here comes Ayers now. Here, let me give you a hand. Mm -hmm. You can sit up front, and I'll sit back here. All right. Oh, thank you. Right on time, I see, Miss Matson. Yes. Got the plane gas, Folger? Yeah, I'll sit. Well, I guess we can take off. Here we go. then, Miss Matson, What's your plan? Just do what we did before. Circle out over the bay and come in for a normal landing. Okay. I'll bank her here. Fine. Now, is there any way for Folger to take the wheel? I... I beg your pardon? I said, is there any way for Folger to take the wheel? Oh, why, no, I don't think so. He's back there. That's because he can't fly, isn't that right? Isn't that right, Folger? What? What's she talking about, Ayers? I don't know. She must be out of her head. But I'm not taking any chances with her. I'm going to set the ship down right now. The way you set it down with Folger's wife in it? So she burned beyond recognition? Why, you... I can get the whole story, Ayers. Look at Folger, white as a sheet. He's ready to talk right now, aren't you, Folger? Yes. I'll talk. I'll tell everything. Including the story about the same kind of crash in Toledo, Ohio? All right, you two, don't move. I assure you this gun is very deadly. You, Folger, open the starboard door. Go on, open it. God, you don't know what you're doing. Oh, yes, I do. And neither one of you are going to live to tell about it. Go on, Folger, get up by the door. Go on. God, please don't do it. Yeah. 
What a fine rat you are, Ears. You're next, Miss Matson. Just a little too darn smart for your own good, aren't you? I should have known better than to try to use a dame for the fall guy. Go on, stand up by the cabin door. Sure. Okay. I'll stand up by the cabin door. Oh. Oh. Well, candy girl, let's see you get yourself out of this one. I hope Mallard's still listening to this mic. Mallard. Mallard, you big dumb cop, can you hear me? I can hear you, Candy. What's wrong? I had to tap airs over the head. What do I do now? I don't know how to fly this thing. Uh, uh, wait a minute. I'll put Cranston on. Miss Matson, listen carefully. Take the wheel and hold it in the middle. Get your nose up a little. That's it. How am I doing? Fine. Now look down at the horizontal bar at your feet. Press the left one ever so slightly and turn the wheel left at the same time. Like this? Keep your nose up. Up. So it's just above the horizon. That's it. Keep it there. Better. Now straighten both the bar and the wheel. Slowly. Slowly. I've got it. Now you're headed towards San Mateo Airport. Now try to drift off to your right a little, using the opposite technique. Better? You're doing fine. Hang on, Candy. You're going great. Now look for the protruding gadget on the right side of the dashboard. Mark throttle. Push it in about a third of the way. I'm falling. Mallard, I'm falling. No, you're not. Just do as I say. You're coming in for a landing. Now, don't move the wheel or the bars until I tell you to. Well, the ground's coming up awfully fast. You're coming in just right. Now, ready? Pull back the wheel just a little. No, not too much. That's it. Okay, gal. Right her on in. <laughs> Now, quick, kill your ignition. Kill it. Turn off the key. Candy, you made it. Candy, I said... Come on, crash, and let's get out to that plane. You all right, kid? Uh, yeah. My knees feel like I did the conga from here to L.A., but otherwise I'm all right. Uh, the boys will take care of theirs. Come on, we've got a report to make. Report? Sure. I sicked you on to this heirs guy purposely. What? Sam Mateo didn't want to scare the guy off until they solved the case, so we cut you in on the deal without you knowing it. Oh. Candy, you did it. We've got a recording of the whole thing made over the plane's radio. Congratulations, Candy. You'll get a nice hunk of dough for this. Nice hunk of dough of all the dirty tricks. Mallard, you... I... Oh, what's the use? I can't boil you out now. I'm airsick. It was a very slick deal. Ayers was a top-notch insurance boy. About five years ago, he met up with Folger. This was in Toledo, Ohio. Folger was married to a very wealthy gal, but couldn't get his hands on any of the money. Ayers hit upon a pretty little method of mayhem back there. He took out a license plate under Folger's name, fireproofed his half of the plane, also the passenger's safety belt. Then one fine day, he came in for a landing, deliberately pancaked the ship, left the motor running, and let the crate burn, with Folger's wife in it. They collected plenty. In those days, they had the names of Smith and Jones or something like that, and Ayers was the insurance adjuster. They moved on to California, took the names of Ayers and Folger, and set about to do an encore on the same old act. Folger met another wealthy gal, married her, and set himself up in the airport business. Ayers got himself a job with a San Francisco insurance outfit, and voila, they were ready for another crack-up. My suspicions were first lit up when I saw Ayers' face. He had more scars and stitches than a well-seasoned hockey player. And that broken-up fuselage behind Folger's airport, that was another giveaway. It was a test model they'd used to make sure their plans were all set. But the real giveaway was the parent. What a memory. NC-98012 was the license number of the plane that crashed in Toledo, killing Folger's first wife. The parrot was also her pet, and Folger had kept it for sentimental reasons. He shouldn't ought to have done it, though. 
because through the parrot I traced the whole thing. It was a nice one-time racket, but they should have quit before the police tripped them up. Oh, yes, Ayers was convicted. And Pacific Seaboard Fidelity rewarded me quite handsomely. But that mallard, deliberately using me for bait. <laughs> I got even with him, though. I made him take me deep sea fishing about a week later. Oh, did he get sick. Seasick. And I just stood there and laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. Listen again next week at this same time for excitement and adventure. Just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Heard tonight were Lou Tobin as Ayers, Harry Bechtel as Folger, and Jack Cahill as Cranston. Henry Leff as Inspector Ray Mallard, and Jack Thomas plays the part of Rembrandt Watson. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. Sound effects were created by Bill Brownell and Jay Rendon. Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. The characters in tonight's story are entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The program came to you from San Francisco. Dudley Manlove speaking. You are tuned for the stars on NBC. Johnny Dollar. This is Harry Branson at Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Harry, it's been a long time. What's on your mind? John, I have a case for you involving several of our very important clients. Good. Then it ought to pay me a nice big fee. I'm not sure about that, John. Of course, we'll pay your regular expenses and your regular commission. But no extra fee? I don't know. You, huh? Uh, That is to say, it all depends on what you're able to, shall we say, uh, unearth. Something or someone, Harry. Uh, What? You said unearth, didn't you? What facts you're able to ascertain is what I meant. Oh. So what about these very important clients of yours? John, they have disappeared. Oh, well, then maybe unearth is the proper term. What? What have the police got to say about them? You did call in the police, didn't oh, you? Oh, yes, but they gave up years ago. At least Years in the case... ago? That's right. At least in the case... Now, wait a minute, Harry. You say they disappeared years ago. Well, some of them... But now, all of a sudden, you expect me to be able to... What did you say the extra fee will be on this case? I told you it It all all depends. depends. Exactly. Yeah, on whether I'm able to literally dig them up for you. You know where they're buried? John, this morbid so-called sense of humor. Okay, Harry, okay. I'll be down to see you. And you might have a good, strong shovel ready and waiting for me. John! Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the cask of death matter. Expense account item 1, 1340, train fare and incidentals, Hartford of Philadelphia. I went by train since Harry Branson didn't seem to be in a hurry and I enjoyed a look at the countryside this time of year. It was a little afternoon by the time I reached the office on Walnut Street and sat down to talk with Harry. But I thought I impressed the... Old Sobersides Branson hadn't changed a bit since the last time I'd seen him. And he still looked as though he was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. However, now that you have finally arrived, suppose I get right to the point and tell you what this is all about. Well, you said on the phone that some of your policyholders have disappeared. Uh, Yes, and you must understand this, John. Yeah? In accordance with Pennsylvania law... In a case of a mysterious disappearance, and I'm sure you're familiar with the mysterious disappearance clause that's part of all our life insurance contracts. Well, if you mean did I ever read the fine print on one of your policies, the answer is no. You should sometime. The fact remains that when the insured disappears and fails to return or otherwise be accounted for by the end of seven years, 
When the company has received no proof the insured is still alive, the company then presumes the insured to be deceased. Do I make myself clear? Uh, keep talking, Harry. It simply means that at the end of seven years, the full amount of the insurance is then paid to the beneficiary or beneficiaries, whichever the case may be. So? So, seven years ago, a Mr. Wilbur Davis of Goshenville here in Pennsylvania mysteriously disappeared. Now his beneficiary is demanding payment of the insurance. Naturally. So why don't you pay it? We shall. But in checking through the files, I've suddenly discovered that his was only the first in a long series of mysterious disappearances. There have been a total of eight, all within a relatively small area, and of recently increasing frequency. When was the last one? The fourth of last month, Mr. Charles Moody. Charles Moody. Where? In the little town of Kirkwood, New Jersey. And the police have found no clue as to what might have happened to him? None whatsoever. One in Goshenville, Pennsylvania, one in Kirkwood, New Jersey. Where were the others? Two in other small Jersey towns, two here in Pennsylvania, and two down in Delaware. Hmm. Any, uh... Any relationship among the beneficiaries? None. That is, none that we know of. Why do you ask that? Uh, I just wondered if some one person was killing them off to collect the insurance. No, the beneficiaries are all widely separated individuals, so you can dismiss any possibility of murder. Harry, in a case of this kind, that's the one possibility I never dismiss. <laughs> Harry's secretary put together a comprehensive list of the people we were concerned with. Their names, addresses, beneficiaries, and so on. In my room at the Bellevue Stratford that evening, I went over it carefully. All of these people had disappeared from their homes in small communities. All of them had been in their 60s, had been widowers or bachelors. As for the beneficiaries, they were scattered about all over the country. Early the next morning, I paid my hotel bill. That's item two, $18 even for the room and a couple of meals... Then spent item three, 50 bucks deposit on a rental car. I drove first to the little town of Kirkwood, New Jersey, from which a Mr. Charles Moody had disappeared just about a month ago. I stopped to make inquiries at the general store. Thank you, Miss Peterson. I'll see you next week again. Now, uh, as you were saying, Mr. Hurley? Yes, Mr. Dollar, I certainly hope Mr. Moody shows up again. You're a fine man. Fine man. Used to come down here at the store for a quiet game of checkers now and then. And uh, the police have no idea where he might have gone or why. Yeah, well, I guess I'm about the only police we have here in Kirkwood. Oh? Of course, I notified the state police. And I presume they're still looking for him. Just, uh, what happened, Mr. Hurley? Just took the bus into Philadelphia one day, and, well, that's the last we heard of him. Do you know anything about the beneficiary of his insurance? Yeah. Let's see. According to my list... Uh... It's a nephew, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. Charles Moody. Lives out in California. Yeah, Mr. Moody always felt that he was the most deserving of his relatives. Left him everything, huh? Well, the insurance and his money, yes. You know, I know because, well, I'm the only lawyer here in Kirkwood, and I made out a will for him. You say just the money to his nephew. Except for his wine cellar, all his property will go to the town. Wine cellar? Yes, if Mr. Moody doesn't come back or if he's proved to be dead, the wine cellar will go over to a man over in Philadelphia. Had themselves a sort of a, a gourmet club, I guess you'd call it. I see. But now tell me... You know, I kind of wish he'd have willed me that wine cellar. You see, oh, you should see the collection he has there from all over the world. Yes. German I... wines and French and Italian. Yes, I'm sure. Swiss, but, uh, Hungarian, Now, Mr. Hurley, champagne. is there anything else you can tell me that might help me to find him? How about his friends? Everybody was Mr. Moody's friend, Mr. Dollar. But as I started to say about those wines he had... So I checked out all of Mr. Moody's friends there in Kirkwood and ended up with no more information than I got from the storekeeper. But you know something? If I had had sense enough to realize it, I'd have gotten plenty from him. He had given me a real key to the disappearance, not only of Mr. Moody, but of the seven other people on the list. And what a key. Yeah, to what turned out to be one of the weirdest cases I ever handled. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Cask of Death Matter. <laughs> Item five, 4270, traveling expenses, food and lodging for the next two days. I drove my rental car to Pitts Grove and Malaga, New Jersey. Armstrong and Mount Pleasant down in Delaware. Then Hickoryville, Pennsylvania, Goshenville, and the nearby town of Mill May. I contacted not only the local police, such as they were, but dug up the lawyers who'd written wills for the missing men. And by doing so, I learned a strange, intriguing fact. 
You see, my last contact was there in the village of Mildmay with the one lawyer in town. Yes, Mr. Dollar. If my client, Mr. Frederick Burton, fails to return by the end of seven years, your company will have to pay the insurance. As for the rest of his estate... Including uh, a wine cellar? Yes, a very excellent one. Its contents will go to a friend of his who lives in Philadelphia. Uh, Mr. Edward Alden Pulley. Yes, that's right. How did you know? Well, I've been doing a little poking around these past couple of days. You understand, of course, that's only if we receive some definite evidence of Mr. Burton's death. Or if he fails to return before the seven years is up and therefore legally is presumed to be deceased. Do you know anything about this man, Pulley? No, I don't. It seems they had a sort of epicures club. Do you know who the other members of it were? Uh, well, Mr. Burton told me who they are sometime before he disappeared. Uh, if you'll just give me a moment, perhaps I can recall their name. Hey, want to check them against this list of mine? Yeah, if you like. All right, let's see. Mr. Frederick Burton, that's your plan. Yes. John L. Wakeman over in Hickoryville. Mm-hmm. Wilbur Davis in Goshenville. That's correct. Carmen Phillips and Ralph Hunter from down in Delaware. That's right. And finally, Charles Moody, Nathan Norwood, and William Harnell over in Jersey. Uh, your list is quite correct, Mr. Dollar, except for one omission. There was another? Uh, Mr. Bradford W. Turner. Do you know where he lives? Yes, in the little town of Alloway here in Pennsylvania. That is, if he hasn't disappeared. Yes, I... Good heavens. Do you mean to say that all the others... Well, I know, of course, that Mr. Burton did, but... Do you mean to say that all the others on that list have disappeared, too? Yes, sir. And I'm going to find out about this Mr. Turner right now. In the town of Alloway, did you say? Yes, it's about 18 miles north of here. Okay, sir. And I'm very much obliged Uh, to you. Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Do you really think there can be some connection between these disappearances and the fact that all these men have willed their wine collections to this Edward Alden Poley? What do you think? Wait a minute. Had I told him the others all willed their wine collections to Poley? Or had he just come to that conclusion? Or what? Hmm. Anyway, I drove due north to Alloway. The one large, rather nice home belonged to Mr. Bradford W. Turner, the man whose name was not on my list. So I hoped that he was still here in the land of the living. He was, and he turned out to be a very fine gentleman, despite his preoccupation with vintage wines. Oh, Mr. Dollar, our little order of epicures has not been very active since several of the members have well disappeared. But not you or Mr. E.A. Poley. I was just preparing to make the trip over to Philadelphia to pay a visit to Mr. Poley. Oh, Mind telling me why, Mr. Turner? Not at all, sir. Not at all. I happen to have an excellent wine cellar. Yes, I rather guessed that. Oh, but it's nothing compared to that, Mr. Polis. Edward is younger than I, younger than any of us. But his vast labyrinthine cellar is a veritable treasure house of rare and priceless vintage. I see. Now... Even I haven't seen the full extent of it, but... Oh, if only I could get hold of some of that ancient, rare Amontillado he has so often told us about. Promised you show us so many times. Up until now, I've not had anything worthy to offer him in exchange. Ah, but now, I've acquired a bottle of very old and very fine Medoc, a de Graf. So I shall take it to him in the home. You know, you talk as though this wine collecting were the most important thing in your life. Oh, it is, sir. And with Poli, it's an almost overpowering passion. It is his life. The kind of man who'd kill his own mother for a bottle of wine, huh? That's not the jest you may think it is, Mr. Dollar. Which is why I wonder if this bottle of fine Medoc will be enough. Mr. Turner, you're not taking it over to him. I beg your pardon. I am. Now, look here, Mr. Dollar. I've been awaiting this opportunity for years. Yeah, and you'd probably give just about anything. You are right, sir. I would. Your life? Every one of the old men who disappeared had been a nut on the subject of wine collecting and had provided in his will that his cellar was to go to a Mr. Edward Alden Poley. You know something? When I talked to Poley at his home in the old Germantown section of Philadelphia, I decided he was the biggest nut of all and possibly a dangerous one. It was an old house and a big one. It must have been one of the original Philadelphia mansions. As for Poley himself, well, I'd say he was a man of about 50. He was short and heavy set, and his face... 
Well, his face reminded me of a bird of prey. Very thin, with a long, aquiline nose. His eyes were far apart and almost beady. In spite of his shortness, he seemed to almost hover over things, including me. As he led me into the library, his eyes kept glancing at the package I carried, and there was a kind of inner glow in them. I can think of only one thing. Madness. Dollar. Dollar, did you say? That's right. Johnny Dollar. I see. Oh? I mean, it's a very unusual name. I, uh... <clears throat> Can't uh, help but uh, admire this library, Mr. Foley. Only the best. I must have only the best, Mr. Dollar. Yes, it, it looks so. Nothing, no one must stand in the way of my having the rarest, the finest of everything. Sometimes it takes years, Mr. Dollar, but sooner or later I get what I want. I notice you have a lot of the works of Edgar Allan Poe. The greatest writer who ever lived... I am fortunate to bear the same initials. What? Oh, yeah. Look there. First copies of his works. And look there. The manuscript of one of them. Of the... Well, it, it has to do with a certain wine. Yeah, I see. Which brings us to what you have there. Well, it's a famous old Medoc, uh, Mr. Poli. A de Gras. It's age. The vintage. Let me see. What? Well, Sure. Yes, yes. Look at it. Well, I only brought it here for your opinion. Huh? Oh, but I must have this. I must have... I'm afraid that's impossible. Oh. We shall see. Perhaps we'll make an exchange. I have in my vaults an old, a rare, a priceless Amontillado. Uh, come, Mr. Dollar. The cask of Amontillado, huh? Eh? What was that? Nothing, sir. Lead the way. He did. Yeah, he sure did. Through a hidden door behind a panel in the wall. Instead of using a flashlight, he took along a sort of torch, a flambeau, I think you call it, that gave off an evil, oily smell that stained the passageway with smoke. He led me down a long, winding staircase between the walls. Then finally we came to the vast wine vaults deep underground. This was really something out of Edgar Allan Poe. It was cool and damp with great drops of water slipping down the old stone walls. On one of them was a motto. Nemo me impune la quesit. I'm afraid my Latin is a little rusty. No one dare seek to best me with impunity. I, uh, yeah. But uh, now the Amontillado... A little further. Are you a mason... A mason? A little joke, Mr. Dollar. You see, I am. He pulled a small trowel out of the inner pocket of his coat, then laughed <laughs> strangely. <laughs> sure. The cask of Amontillado, just like in the story by Edgar Allan Poe. The dark, damp wine vaults, that motto on the wall, the trowel. And this madman was living the park. No wonder his friends had disappeared, because each of them had had some priceless wine that he wouldn't part with. That is, until... The next vault, Mr. Dollar. A large crypt with niches in the wall. Some of them blocked in, others empty, waiting. There I'll introduce you to my friends who are gathered there. Your friends? Of the order of epicures. They, too, have brought me wines for my collection. Davis, Norwood, Harnell, Hunter, Phillips, Wakeman, Frederick Burton. Those names. Even my old friend, Charles Moody. You killed them, didn't you? Killed them? You brought them down here. Let me see the bottle of de Gras. You promised to show them the cask of Amontillado. Yes. Then buried them here in one of these crypts. Yes. But, Mr. Dollar, you must not keep our friends waiting. Yeah. There's the mortar and the bricks. And the Amontillado? In the niche behind you. The mortar box. A hole for mixing in that shovel. Yes, the shovel. And with it, you join my friends. Oh, no. This isn't the way to the story. The eight men who disappeared, yeah, they were all buried behind the bricks and mortar that walled up eight of the niches in that deep underground vault. 
Funny, I completely forgot to look to see if there was a cask of Amontillado in that cellar. Edward Alden Poli, when the courts get through with his case, I'm sure he'll be committed to an institution for the rest of his life. Yeah, I told you in the beginning, this was the weirdest case I ever tackled. Expense account total, including incidentals, and the trip back to Hartford, 101.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, I run into a girl who is fabulously rich. And because of it, fabulously poor. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Harry Bartell, Forrest Lewis, Bartlett Robinson, Farley Bear, and Marvin Miller. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, here we are again visiting the genial Dr. Watson in his cheerful study. We sit back in our comfortable chair and wait to hear another exciting story. What could be pleasant? <laughs> you go again, Mr. Bell, flattering me again. If only Sherlock Holmes were here to make the picture complete. No, Mr. Bell, you know that's impossible. He retired to Sussex years ago and took up bee farming. I suppose you visited him there. Naturally. As a matter of fact, I remember one Saturday towards the end of July in 1907 that we... Is this the beginning of a story, Dr. Watson? I shouldn't be surprised. But hadn't you better have your word with our listeners first? Yes, Dr. Watson, I had. Men... I'm sure you'll be interested to learn that a recent survey showed that Kreml hair tonic is preferred among America's top flight executives and most successful men. But after all, why shouldn't it be? Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kreml gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look, such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. Kreml always keeps the hair neatly in place longer with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet it never leaves your hair looking or feeling greasy, sticky, or dirty. After you apply Kreml, you can rub your hand over your hair and your hair always feels so delightfully clean. Notice, too, how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. Just use a little Kreml on your hair in the morning, and at night your hair looks as neatly groomed as when you first combed it in the morning. Remember, no other hair tonic keeps your hair more handsomely groomed. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, I'm all ears. Well, I was paying Holmes one of my frequent visits. His cottage is situated on the southern slope of the Sussex Downs, commanding an excellent view of the English Channel. At this point, the coast is made up of chalk cliffs, which can only be descended by a single tortuous path, which is steep and slippery. At the bottom of the path, there are curves and hollows, which make splendid swimming pools and are filled afresh with each flow of the tide and warmed by the sun. What town is Mr. Holmes' place near? A village called Falworth. But even that is at a distance, and the house is quite lonely. Half a mile away is Holmes' only neighbor. And who is that? Harold Stackhurst, who's the headmaster of the well-known preparatory school, the Gables. A private school, I suppose you would call it. It was summer, and most of the boys were away on holiday, except a few who were catching up. The teaching staff was reduced to three. First of all, there was Harold Stackhurst himself, who was an old pal of mine. We went to stool together. He was a splendid fellow and a well-known blue for rowing in his day. Assisting him were two younger men, Fitzroy McPherson, red-headed and cheerful. In summer and winter, he went for his morning swim. Winter swimming, quite a spartan. <laughs> yes, indeed. The other schoolmaster was Ian Murdoch, a tall, dark man, taciturn and aloof, with occasional outbursts of temper. 
the villain of the piece. Hmm? There you go, anticipating again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Stop this. Well, it was early one morning, just after sunrise. There'd been a severe gale the day before, but the wind and the waves had finally abated and everything looked newly washed and fresh. The air had a decided nip to it, and Holmes and I were on our way down to the beach for our morning start. I say, Holmes, that water's blue this morning, isn't it? Rather cold-looking, if you ask me. Do you good, Watson. Your circulation needs toning up. You can run all the way home. Run up the cliff path? Oh, that's the hard... Rubbish. The boys do it. Well, I'm not under the delusion that I'm still in my first youth. <laughs> Hello. Isn't that Stackhurst coming along the cliff? He's got a towel over his arm, obviously going down to the beach. He's not afraid of a little cold water. And he's almost as old as you are. He's older. Oh? Oh, great deal older. He was two forms above me at school. Dear, dear, quite an old man. I had no idea oh, that... stop ragging me, Holmes. Hello there, Sackhurst. Hello. Hello. Going swimming? Yes, wait for us. Come on, Watson. Oh, bless my soul if it isn't Watson. Delighted to see you, old chap. I thought you weren't coming down for another well, month. Well, I just couldn't stay away any longer. I'm so fond of the swimming here. Yes, Watson has just been saying that there's nothing like a good dip before breakfast to tone up the system. <laughs> What did you say, Watson? Oh, I think, I think so. Stankhurst, where are your two young assistants, McPherson and Murdoch, the gloomy Scott? I've never known them to miss their matutinal plunge. Oh, well, Murdoch has had to keep some of the boys at their algebra. He'll be along later. Uh, McPherson has gone on ahead. I expect he's in the water now. Any more outbursts of temper on Murdoch's part lately? No, not since last week, when he found a boy putting toads in his bed. <laughs> His temper is ferocious, Holmes. I suppose I should give him dismissal, but he's such a confoundedly good teacher. A little bit of temper won't harm the boys now and then. Help to keep them in line. Yes, I'll wager the next fellow who wants to put extraneous objects in Murdoch's bed will think twice about it. Look, there's someone staggering up the edge of the cliffs. Yes, he's in bathing trunks and an overcoat flapping in the wind. What's the matter with him? He's drunk, probably. Look at him real. A fine example for my boys. Um, who the devil can it be? It's... Yes, it's McPherson. I could tell that red hair anywhere. He's trying to wave to us. I've never known him to behave like this. He's not drunk. He is in agony. He needs help. Hurry, Watson, run. I say, he, he, he's fainted. No, 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 he's, he's trying to get up again. Help! Well, he, he's writhing on the ground. Courage, old boy. We're coming. Pain. Pain. Uh, I can't breathe. He's killing me. What is it? What's happened to you? <laughs> The maid. The lion's maid. But, good heavens, he's having convulsions. His face is turning purple. Uh, yeah, now he's stopped. Thank heaven. How is he, Watson? I can't see him breathe. He, uh... Wait a minute. Yes, he's, he's dead. Some terrific shock. His heart gave out. Look, he's bitten through his lower lip in a paroxysm of his agony. What could it have been? He's not wounded. There's no signs of a struggle. And take that coat off. Let's take a look at him. Easy now, easy. Good heavens, Holmes, his back. Just look at his back. Great red welts round his shoulders and round his ribs. Oh, this is terrible. What was it he tried to tell us? He said something about a lion. A lion's mane, to be exact. Well, you don't think he's being clawed by a lion or some wild beast? In this part of England? It, it, it's, it's unthinkable. Quite. Besides, the claws of an animal would have dug deeper. These welts are inflamed and there are little red spots at certain intervals. It looks as if someone has used a lash on him. A thin iron scourge with knots, poisoned knots. Who could it have been? There's been no one along the edge of the cliff. And we can see for miles. No, no, on the beach. And there are some fishing boats, but they're too far out. I wonder... Uh, did anyone bear him a grudge? Had he quarreled with anyone? Why, no, I... That is, not recently. I... Hello. What's up? Why do you all look so serious? Well, hello, Murdoch. Where did you come from? The classroom. I just left the boys. But what's the matter with McPherson? What's he lying like that for? He's dead. Murdered. He's been flogged to death. Dead? That's horrible. Who could have... We don't know. Is there anything I can do? Yes. Yes, go back to the house. Send for the police and keep the boys indoors. 
I don't want them mixed up in this. Certainly, of course. Dead, I... I can't believe it. Stankhurst, you stay here with the body. Watson and I will go down to the beach to see what we can find. Good. But don't be any longer than you can help. Come along, Watson. Here's the path leading down the face of the cliff. The only path for miles. If he was attacked down on the beach, the murderer is still there. I say, he may be armed. I'd better go back for my revolver. Suppose the murderer goes for us. Oh, rubbish. Come along. We've no time to waste. May escape. Careful. There's clay here. Slippery. Look, Holmes. Footprints. Yes, the same ones descending and then returning again. But first, and undoubtedly, that means no one else has been to the beach by this path since the storm. And here's the mark of his hand where he fell. And the print of both knees. That's all that the path holds for us. Now to the beach itself. Look, look, there's quite a lagoon left by the tide. His towel is lying beside it. Folded and dry so he didn't enter the water. There's his sweater beside the pool. Look here, on the sand, footprints. Naked and with a canvas shoe. Crescents again, that proves he made ready to bathe, but the towel shows he returned without bathing, or at any rate, without drying himself. Well, look, Holmes, there are some distant figures up there on the beach. Mm, too far away. Besides, this lagoon lay between them and the person. Perhaps the fishing boat. Perhaps, but I can see no sign of a boat having been beached along this shore. Yes, but then uh, who, uh, how... Uh... Quite. Couldn't it be Stackhurst? We saw him coming from the direction of the gables. Hmm. How about Murdoch? He has a glowering look. I don't trust him. Do you think that he really was up at the school with the boys? That is an alibi we shall have to look into. Uh... Hello, Stackhurst. Why did you leave the body? Uh, Murdoch set down one of the gardeners to stand watch over it, so I, I came along. Besides, I, I just thought of something. Yes? Uh, you asked if anyone had a grudge against McPherson, and I, I thought I ought to tell you. Go on. Well, about a year ago, this chap Murdoch was rather fond of a girl down in the village. But McPherson cut him out. Uh, Murdoch didn't seem to mind at the time, but about two months later... McPherson and Murdoch had a pretty bad row. Now, Murdoch was always a bit fiery, you know. Well, when McPherson's dog got excited, he went for Murdoch, and Murdoch went into one of his rages and threw the animal out of the window. Well, the dog wasn't hurt, and the, the quarrel was patched up. At least so we all thought. But you never know. Resentment sometimes smolders for a long time. Yeah, particularly if there's a woman in the case. Quite. Well, let's have a look at the towel and sweater. We've seen everything else there's to see down here. Hello. There's something in the pocket of the sweater. Hmm. It's a note. Dear me. A note of assignation. Huh? Well, what's it say? We'll be there in the same place, darling. Oh, until there you are, then, woman. Oh, my love, oh. Maudie. Why, that's the girl. The one I told you about, Maud Bellamy. McPherson was in love with her. Obviously. This whole affair has upset me so... It may give the school a bad reputation. It was only by chance that several of the boys weren't with McPherson when it happened. I say, was it chance? After all, it was Murdoch who held them back. He was the one who insisted on algebra before breakfast. At present, I'm more interested in this girl than in Murdoch. Suppose we take a walk to Falworth and call on her. Oh, I do. I'm with you. Come along. Oh, not so fast, Watson. Not so fast. We'd better dress first. We might cause quite a stir parading down the village streets in these costumes. Remember, you've still got your bathing suit on. Oh, do you? Sure, I have. And I'd forgotten all about how, how chilly it was. In just a moment, we'll find out what Sherlock Holmes discovers in his visit to Maud Bellamy. Men, I'm sure you'll agree that well-groomed hair adds a great deal to a man's appearance. And one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So start at once and take better care of the hair you've got. If you're smart, you'll use Kremel hair tonic. No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly in place without looking or feeling greasy. But Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kremel's light oils have a grand lubricating effect on a dry scalp. At the same time, Kremel removes itchy, loose dandruff. Notice how alive, how tingling your scalp feels. And men, you like to massage Kremel on your scalp because it's such a clean product. It never feels greasy or sticky. And if your hair, like so many men's, is so dry that it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. 
So for handsome groomed hair and a more hygienic scalp, use Cremel daily. Buy a bottle of Cremel at any drugstore. Ask for an application at your barber's. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Hair Tonic. That famous modern hair tonic which has become such a nationwide favorite. Now, Dr. Watson, you dressed and went over to Falworth to call on McPherson's girl. Is that right? Uh, that's right, Mr. Bell. Stackhouse pointed the house out to us. That's the Bellamy house over there, Mr. Holmes. The one with the corner tower and the slate roof. Maud is the daughter of old Tom Bellamy, who owns all the boats and bathing huts at Falworth. He was a fisherman to start with, but uh, now a man of some substance, I believe. Yes, judging from the house, he must have come up in the world. And Maud is the prettiest girl for miles around. Quite a beauty, in fact. She must have had scores of admirers. By Jove, look who's coming out of the front gate. I say, it's Murdoch. And what in thunder is he doing here? Hey there, Murdoch. What do you mean by coming over here? I thought I... I am your subordinate, sir, under your own roof. I am not aware that I owe you any account of my private actions. Your answer is pure impertinence. So is your question. This is not the first time that I've had to overlook your insubordinate ways. But it will certainly be the last... You will make arrangements to leave my school as soon as possible. I intended to go in any case. Lost the only person who made the Gables habitable. Insolence. How dare he, young whippersnapper. Mrs. Stackhouse, he seemed very eager to clear out of here. Perhaps you were a trifle hasty in giving him an excuse to go. I never thought of that. Shall I tell the police to place him under arrest? No. We can prove nothing against him as yet. Better persuade him to stay until we are sure he didn't do it. Very well. It's against my principles, but I'll, I'll go after him and see what I can do. Splendid. Now, Watson, suppose we call on Miss Bellamy and present our condolences. I take it that Mr. Murdoch has already broken the news of the tragedy. Ring the bell, that's a good fellow. Well, don't you think it's a, a bit heartless, Holmes, calling at this time? If the girl has any character at all, she will want to help us discover the murder of her sweetheart... Any woman with any... What do you want? We would like to speak to Miss Bellamy. Well, you can't. You are her father, I take it. Yes, I'm her father, and I know you be, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. And I'm not having you mixing my daughter up in any of your dirty business. I thought you might want to help us solve the murder. Ah, oh, you did, did you? Well, I'll have you know I consider Mr. McPherson's attentions to my maud was insulting. And my son, William, is of the same mind. Letters and meetings, but never a word of marriage. I'll not have you breaking her out. I'll not have her name dragged That's through the... That's all right, Father. I know that Fitzroy is dead. I want to help find his murderer. I'll not have you mixing... This is my business, Father. Let me manage it in my own way. I'll do anything you say, Mr. Holmes, to help bring them to justice. Why do you say them? Mr. McPherson was not a weakling. He was brave and strong. No single person could have inflicted such an outrage on him. Uh, one thing more. We found this note in the dead man's pocket. Can you throw any light on it? Did he go down to the beach expecting to meet you? No. I sent it. It's true. But we were to meet tonight. I see no reason for mystery. We were engaged to be married. We only kept it secret because Fitz didn't want to be ragged by the boys at the school. Here is my engagement ring. Well, you might have told me. I would. If you had shown a little more sympathy, Father. But the note, it didn't come by post. Who was your go-between? I'd rather not answer that question. It really has nothing to do with the matter. Do you realize that this go-between was the only person who knew of your meetings with young McPherson? Had he any reason to resent him? That's no business of yours. You had many suitors, I believe. <laughs> that she did. Was Ian Murdoch one of them? There was a time when I thought he was. But all that was changed when he found that Fitzroy and I cared for each other. Miss Bellamy, do you think it natural that a hot-tempered young fellow like Murdoch would get over his feeling as easily as that? What are you trying to make me say? If you think Ian Murdoch had anything to do with a murder, you're wrong. A finer man never drew the breath of life. He wanted us to be happy. He wasn't the kind to think of himself first. He'd gotten over his feeling for me. Then why did he want to be the first to tell you the news of your fiancé's death? Because he was Fitzroy's friend. He thought it was his duty. He thought he... What does it matter? Fitz is dead. Why don't you find his murderer? What's the good of all this? Hmm. 
Thank you for your information, Miss Bellamy. Leave me alone, can't you? Leave me alone. Go and find the murderer if you're so clever. Perhaps we shall. Well, good day. Looks like another blank wall to me, Holmes. Perhaps. But even that is enlightening. There are only so many possibilities, Watson. We may finally arrive at the correct solution by crossing off all the rest. detective on a case, you seem extraordinary lackadaisical. You spent the better part of the last three days up in your garret among your books. I've been looking for the solution, something I once read. It's in the back of my mind, but I can't seem to bring it into the light of my consciousness. Yes, and in the meantime, this Murdoch fellow may slip through our fingers. Once he leaves the school, we'll never be able to get our hands on him again. I wonder that he has, hasn't left before this. Oh, how can you sit there so calmly and say that, Holmes? You're losing your grip. Perhaps I am, perhaps I am, I... I could only find the fact that I'm looking for. It began with a C. I'll swear it began with a C. Well, then, how about the old encyclopedia there? Look up all the C's in the book. But I'm not sure it is C. Oh, Holmes, you're being exasperating and exaggerating. You know that the murderer didn't escape along the beach or even climb to the top of the cliff. But did it ever occur to you that it it might see be, be somebody hiding in one of those caves? Some sadistic maniac? Yes, it did occur to me. But it's not possible. I searched every one of those caves and there's no trace of human habitation in any of them. Oh, and my theory of the sadistic maniac's all wrong? Yes. Huh? Oh, huh? And horrible as that theory sounds, I'm convinced that the truth is even more horrible. That death came from the sea. And the truth is more ghastly than anything you can imagine. Oh, you make the chills run down my spine. I must say, I shall never have the courage to go swimming down there again. And a wise thing, too. At least for some time. Well, I must say, I don't see how young Murdoch has the nerve. Murdoch? Murdoch went swimming down on that beach? When? About a quarter of an hour ago, I saw him go by with a towel over his arm. Why didn't you tell me? Come on, we must bring him back. Poor boy, he hasn't a chance. Oh, oh good heavens, Holmes. I, I had no idea. Look. Something's happened. Someone's coming up the path. Stackhurst. He's carrying someone on his back. By thunder, it's Murdoch. And he's in bathing trunks. Help! Holmes! Watson! Something's happened to murder! What is it? It's the same thing that killed young McPherson. I met him, I met him staggering up the face of the cliff. He was too far gone for me to get him home, so I, I brought him here. Put him on the couch. Have uh, a look at him. His heart is giving out. He can hardly breathe. His face is turning quite black. Here, quick, Holmes. Pour me out a glass of that brandy over there. Right. Hold his head while I, I try to get it down. That's it. That's it. If he can only swallow. That's it. Now, now some more. That's better. Take the bottle. You can't give him too much. His, his color is coming back. He's, he's beginning to breathe again. His heart is getting stronger. Look, he's trying to talk. It lashed me. In the water. It lashed me. Now I remember. In the water, of course. The pain. It's terrible. I can't stand it. Give me something. Morphine. Anything. I don't give him a sedative. It might affect the heart. Holmes, here, get the cotton wool there and the, and the olive oil. Right. Uh, what is it? It's a poison of some kind. It affects the nerves, apparently. Must be terribly painful. Here's the stuff you wanted. Good. But now saturate the cotton wool. You put a dressing... On his back. Now, that's right. You use, use plenty of oil. There we are. That's better. Oh, that's much better. By Jove, he's fainted. I don't think so. He's just fallen asleep from sheer exhaustion. Watson, 
How's our patient coming along? Splendidly. The nurse says we can move him tomorrow. Splendid physique that boy must have had to stand up under the strain. I says, Techest, we all owe that chap an apology for suspecting of uh, McPherson's death. Yes. But who in Sunday did kill him? I'll show him to you, if you like. You... You discovered the murderer? Yes. One of the most gruesome instruments of torture ever devised. He is waiting for us at the foot of this cliff. But is it safe to go down? You said that murder... Yes, if you don't go too near. Come along. All right, if you say so. Well, the, the tide's coming in. I don't see any murderer. I mean... No, he's not as obvious as all that. Treacherous as well as deadly. I must say that this place gets on my nerves since the tragedy. I, I haven't allowed the boys to go in swimming lately. I, I suppose it's foolish of me. I... On the contrary. You would have had a few more tragedies if you'd allowed them to swim. For this death strikes like lightning. There's no escaping it. But, great Scott, if, if it's as dangerous as all that, we'd better get back up the cliff before, before the murderer finds us. We're quite safe unless we take a dip in the lagoon McPherson went swimming in. Well, but I thought you said that he, he didn't go into the water. So I did. The towel fooled me. The truth of the matter is that he was in such agony when he came out that he failed to use the towel. That's what threw me off the track in the first place. But the murderer? Down here. Where's he? Under the cliff where the lagoon is quite deep. Ah, there's your murderer on that rocky shelf about three feet below the surface. Look down there. See it? Why, it's a tangled mass. Great Scott, it's alive. It's vibrating and waving. A hairy creature with streaks of silver amongst its, its yellow stresses. Oh, what a, what a foul and sinister thing. Sinister enough. The death that comes from the sea... As fatal as a cobra and more far-reaching. That is Cyanea, the fearful stinger, sometimes called the lion's mane. Well, I've been born and bred in these parts, and I've never seen anything like it. Ugh, look at that foul thing. Well, it doesn't belong to Sussex, I swear. Just as well for Sussex. The southwest gale must have brought it up. What do you say? Shall we end this murder forever? Oh, shall we end it by all means? Very well. I think this boulder should do the trick. Help me move it. It's too heavy for one man. Right. There she goes. Good. The boulder has settled right on the filthy creature, pinning it to the ledge. One edge of yellow membrane is still flapping. Not for long. Notice the oily scum oozing out from under the stone and rising slowly to the surface. That is the end of the killer. Lion's mane. I've never heard of that before, Dr. Watson. Ah, uh, Mr. Bell, now that I, Holmes discovered the article that he'd been searching for and read it to us. The full name of the dreadful creature is Cynia capillata. It radiates almost invisible filaments to the distance of 50 feet. Within that radius, it is as deadly and far more painful than the bite of a poisonous snake. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell you about next week's story. But first, ladies, here's a sensational beauty tip direct from Hollywood. When you want your hair to look its radiant best for an important date... Do this the night before. Give your hair a glamour bath with Cremel Shampoo. I certainly agree with that, Mr. Bell. And you know, Cremel Shampoo is the shampoo used by those famous beauties, the flowers mottled. Cremel Shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays that way for days. And please bear in mind that Cremel Shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. Yes, Cremel Shampoo uncovers all the natural highlights that lie concealed in every woman's hair. Yet it never dries the hair. In fact, Cremel Shampoo has a built-in oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Cremel Shampoo whips up a luxuriant, active foam, even in the hardest water. It rinses out so easily and never leaves any dull, soapy film. So, ladies, why not buy a bottle of Cremel Shampoo at any drug counter and glamour bathe your hair to tantalizing loveliness? 
K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, next week I think I'll tell you where Holmes and I visited a mad scientist who lived on a rocky island in one of the Scottish locks. And of the strange things that happened there, I call it the adventure of the island of death. Tonight's adventure was adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Lion's Mane. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at the same time, regardless of whether you change to daylight saving time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the island of death. This is Tom Conway. Your help is vital in the drive on cancer, the disease that must be stopped. Help save future lives. Give to the cancer drive. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In the early twilight, Broadway is dappled with beginning shadows. It's the time of the small shock. The springtime's day starts its long scream down into night. It's time clock time, the hour for going home again. Close the ledger, lock the store, figure the overtime, smile at the boss, and out into the street. Blink, then run. The subway waits for no man. Home again. End another day again. But my day was just beginning, north on Broadway and to the east, Central Park around the 80s, and pushed through the crowd whose focus was a park bench that faced the street. And Sergeant Muggerman tells you why you're there. Right over here, Danny. Land right there near the bench. I found the knife. I didn't pick it up. I ripped... Who's the boy? Paul, uh... Paul Gilbert. Yeah. I haven't been home from school yet. Oh, you'll go home in a squad car, Paul. I promised him with the siren, Danny. Yeah, with the siren. What happened, Paul? How did the knife get there? I saw the man take it out of his own back and throw it down. And then the man staggered away. Mm-hmm. Did I show you this, Danny? All this blood? Wherever he is, he's hurt real bad. I want you to think for a minute, Paul. What did this man look like? Tall, I guess. Yeah, I guess that's all. He was tall. Uh, Most grown-ups are tall, aren't they, Paul? All of them, except for midgets. One more thing, Paul. Was there anyone with this man? Think hard. No, I don't think so. Well, you told me that... The other man I saw wasn't with him. The other man in the hat just watched him. Then the man in the hat ran away. He wasn't with him. What did the man in the hat look like? He had a hat. That's all I know. I got scared. I ran. That's right, Danny. Paul ran right into Officer Curcio on the beat. Almost knocked him down. Curcio came back, saw the blood on the bench, the knife, phoned it in. Paul, did you know the man, the man with the knife? No. Uh Uh-uh. I usually don't come home from school this way. We had an after-school game with the 8B2 over there on the playground. This is the first game of the intramural. Squad car, Muggerman, for Paul, with a siren. Then the careful tracing, the sifting through the shadows of a city, the dust of a city, the hiding places of a city into which a wounded man must crawl and lie for a time and then wander in search of a kindlier place, a darker place, and leave behind him the trail of the wounded, the blood of his life. But the man who'd been stabbed had done none of these things. The hospitals told me that, the doctors, the fellow in the neat white jacket in the drugstore across from the park who, not having a wounded man, offered me a special on shaving cream. Then the legwork of the man on the beat, harvesting the crop of those who had been at the scene of the crime, sorting them, packaging them, parceling them out to me, one by one. 
Look, mister, how many rights do we have to give you guys? I was calling on my girl. I brought her a box of chocolate-covered peppermints. She was beginning to understand me. Oh, we won't keep you long. Y you don't understand, mister. I don't stick close to my little bird. She busts out of her cage. I've known her to do that when I pop out two minutes for a corner newspaper. You were in the park this afternoon. Saw a man who was stabbed. Can you describe the man? I was never in no park where an unfortunate got stabbed. An officer took your name. You made him erase it. Start all over again because he wasn't spelling it right. So you caught me in a lie. Can you describe the man who was hurt? Describe? Who got a chance to get close to him? Everybody pushing, shoving like it was a parade for a general. I'm lucky I got a peek at the top of his fleeing skull. Oh, well, that's all. Look, uh, I, I won't explain why I lied about not being in the park. Uh, my girl, the bird, thinks I work for a living. It's a little white lie I used to keep a cage. That's all. You can go. Then the man who is eager, whose eyes dart and pierce, who follows you as you move away from him, stays close to you, needs the lapel of your coat. I was real close to him. He had a knife in his back. He breathed in my face. I could tell you the color of his eyes, how close I was. Now tell me. Blue eyes. Washed out blue and no tears in them. No tears at all. No remorse for the evil doing that had brought wrath upon him. Blue eyes. What color hair? Dirty. A dirty color. All matted. No. No, it was blonde. And shining. And it was a kind of light that shone about it. That's because he was dying. Dying in protest against all the wickedness that will drown. Drown us all. A uh, big man or short man of the... What does it matter how he looked? I was close to him, I tell you. He reached out his hand to me. Touched my hand. Tears on my face. Help him out of your office. Motion a policeman over. Watch him be gentle with the man. Take him away. And then motion for the next one to come in. I realize, of course, that you're imposing on my time. Not that I mind. It could be a welcome relief from those spoiled monsters I simper and smile at and diaper. You're a nursemaid, Miss Cram, is that right? Call me governess and call me Virginia. Miss Cram doesn't sound like me at all, don't you think? You take the children to the park every day? Four to five thirty, except on rainy days. Hmm? On rainy days, the children and I stay at home, and I'm permitted callers from 4 to 5.30. That's on rainy days. You told an officer you saw the man who was hurt. I was making conversation. I needed that to get those brats out of my hair. You didn't see him? I wouldn't have gone near him. But I can tell you who did see him, the looker. Who? The looker. All of us in the park know her. She sits in a window across the street on the fifth floor, watches every move we make every day. It's there and watches. It makes you feel as if you're being spied on. You know what I mean? Fifth floor in an apartment on 80th and 5th. Well, you can't miss her. Just stand out in the street for a while. Her eyes will bore right through you. But on a rainy day... I know. I... You're permitted callers. That's all, Miss Graham. I'm Danny Clover, police. <laughs> we haven't done anything. I know. I don't even know who you are. There's no name card on your door. You want to come in and talk to us? All right. I'm George Mason. She's my... in the wheelchair. Diane's my wife. Good evening, Miss Mason. Diane? Diane, dear. Diane, we've got a visitor. He said good evening to you. Say hello, Diane. This is Mr. Clover. He's from the police. Mr. Mason, there was some trouble earlier across the street from you. Your... Talk to her, will you? I'm trying something. Maybe it'll do her some good, talking to her. No one ever does, you know. You just talk to her and I'll answer you. All right. There was a man stabbed across the street from you, Mrs. Mason, in the park. Yes, I heard about it when I came home. Have you found the man? No. Mrs. Mason... I understand that you sit by a window every day. That's right, that one. She sits there and watches. It's her pleasure. Today? Every day. Then she must have seen what happened. She must pretty, have... Uh... Pretty, pretty. What? What are you trying to say, Diane? Mm -hmm. Can't you see how it is? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. George? Yes. What is it? 
I saw a man today. I saw a knife today. Is there anything you can do? Can you talk to her? Diane. A man today. A knife today. Yes, well, can you tell me what the man looked like, sweetheart? Knife. Was he a big man? Was he a small man? Was he a nice man? Man. Did you like him? And try to erase from memory the eyes of the woman filled with the named terrors, the known terrors that dart and scurry, gnaw and nibble at the fleeting instance of serenity within her. And try to wash away in the city's night screaming the crooning of a tuneless song. And suddenly the known words, a man, a knife. And know that the eyes that absorb all movement, all shadow, all light on faces, and things that pass before them have seen nothing. Not the man who was stabbed, not the one who did the stabbing. And then the long walk to the darkened room, turn on the shaded light bulb and search the cupboards for sleep. And finally, it comes. In the morning, the scorching cup of coffee, the walk to headquarters, and the cheery greeting on the threshold from the cheery Sergeant Attaglia. Oh, welcome, Danny. Welcome to your abode away from your abode. Uh, good morning, Gino. Ah, the best. The sunniest, the bravest. Uh, not so early. Uh, Gino, all I've had is a cup of coffee. For which I am delighted. Huh? For which I am delighted. Come, I will escort you to your office, Danny. You will see there how I have taken the liberty to spread upon your desk a repast. I shouldn't have done it, Gino. A repast consisting of a hot paper container of coffee and a half a dozen cinnamon bums. Voila, the repast. Partake. Uh, looks good. How else should they look? The cinnamon bums were baked in the oven of Mrs. Tartaglia with her own two lily whites. Go ahead, partake. Munch, if you like. Mmm, delicious. Uh, thank Mrs. Tartaglia for me. Goes without saying. And now, to the events of the morning. <clears throat> uh, okay if I disturb while you munch? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We of the department have discovered that this park bench upon which an alleged man was allegedly stabbed has been a lucky bench. Or unlucky, depending, of course, on the point of view of whom sat there. You'll explain it to me, Aunt Gino. Goes without saying. The lucky part of the bench is that five weeks ago, a man found upon it, wrapped in a newspaper, $300. Turned it over to Lost and Found. So? So is that four weeks ago, same man turned into Lost and Found from the same bench a like newspaper containing another 300. And we have not seen this pleasant, honest citizen since. Do you have his name? Oh, it goes with our... <clears throat> uh, Harry Forster, 1345 West 16th. Want I should keep the cinnamon buns hot for you, Danny? I'll do that, Gino. You go ahead and do that. <laughs> Please help me. Please come in and help me. What's the matter? My husband. No one will help me. I asked the neighbors. They said, call the police. Call an ambulance. Please help Where is he? You'll help. He's in our bedroom. I think he's... I think he's dying, and no one would... No one... You know Mrs. Foster? Yes, Harry's wife. He came home last night, and, and there was blood. He just looked at me like an animal, and... There he is, mister. Help him. Please help him. Dead. No. No, you're wrong. He's been dead for a long time. He was asleep. Only asleep. <laughs> You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. On CBS this Sunday evening, Charlie McCarthy will play a tattoo artist for a group of sailors, while beautiful Ann Southern acts as his reluctant model. There'll be more fun with Eve Arden, Amos and Andy, Red Skelton, and Corliss Archer. Stay with CBS this Sunday, for these great comedy programs will be heard on most of these same stations.
In the Maytime, the sun grins down and pats Broadway's cheek. Broadway loves it. The sunlit minutes are added to the ten-minute break for a cigarette. The walk is slower, the sway gentler. The windows are opened wide, and the doors, too. And glints of sunlight are carried through long hallways on the sigh of a summer's wind, touching the lips of the girl at the typewriter, touching the hand of the man at the water cooler watching her, touching the steel of the file cabinets, warming them. And having made the tour, back onto Broadway and start all over again. But where I was, there was no warmth. Only a woman drawing a shawl tight around her shoulders and talking quietly to her dead. Harry, Harry, listen to me. You were right. We should have told them. We should have told them all about it. Then you wouldn't be like this, and I would Mrs. Foster, what should you have told us? What? What did you say? What should you and your husband have told us? About the money, nothing else. The money he found on the park bench? Yes. You see, we should have told them, Harry. But he did, Mrs. Foster. He reported it. Turned it in. You don't understand. I knew no one would understand. Then maybe you can help me. Friday was always Harry's day off. From the factory out there. You can see it from here, see? On his day off, I'd pack him a little lunch and he'd kiss me goodbye. Walk uptown to Central Park. He... Go on. He always went alone. He always sat on the same bench. Harry used to describe it to me. What he saw, people he talked to. Felt as if I'd been there with him. And one day he found money in a newspaper. And turned it in, like you said. The next week turned it in. But after that, I told him he didn't have to do that anymore. You mean he found more money? Is that what you're trying to tell me? What? You mean he found more money? For five weeks in a row. I told Harry he didn't have to turn it in anymore. I told him to go back. To be sure and keep going back. Every week. Yesterday, too. (laughs) And we'd be rich. No more of this... No more factory. Why didn't you call us when he came home hurt? Call a doctor? It would have spoiled it, ended it. The money, don't you see? I thought he'd live and we... With that money... No. You couldn't. You couldn't see. Then she turned from me and walked over to the window, stared out of it. Across her shoulder, into the noon sunshine, I could see the factory emptying its lunchtime employees, the crowd breaking off its fragments, to the curb with the lunch pails, to the push carts for the ham on white and coffee. Then the other sound, the feet in the doorway, the entrance of the professionals, coroner, photographer, reporter. The man had been murdered. I left. Then back again to Central Park and the park bench of the stabbing. Sit on it. A man named Harry Foster used to find money here, and he was killed. And a woman who had seen it happen, a woman who sat at a window every day. I looked up to the window. She wasn't there. I wondered why. I knew why. She was in the wheelchair. There was a man pushing it carefully down the steps. Scooch a little to the side, friend. Oh, need a hand? Uh, yeah, if you want. Ah, thanks. How are you feeling, Mrs. Mason? She ain't gonna answer you. I didn't know she left the house. Why should you even bother? Oh, I'm Danny Clover, police. Oh, hi, I'm Ben Taylor. I got a you drive down the street. Only Mrs. Mason here, different. <laughs> kind of a take drive. Oh, I see. Just today? Oh, no, all the time. Uh, From one to three, uh, the elements willing. Uh, I take her for a ride. Sometimes here, sometimes there. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, Right away, Miss Mason. Uh, See you, Danny. Oh, wait a minute. How long have you been doing this, Ben? Ride? Well, since her accident. Since at Coney last year. Hide her back here and up here, her head. Ride, car, ride. Uh, I I guess I better take her. I heard her cry like that before. I can't stand it. Sure. It's a nice day, Mrs. Mason. I hope you enjoy your ride. Oh, she will. She likes riding in the car. See you around, Danny. I 
I watched Ben lift her gently out of the wheelchair, lift her into the back of the car, close the door, fold the chair, place it in the car trunk. Then back and saying something to her. She looked up for an instant. Her eyes found me. Then she smiled and shaped a lost word with her lips. They were gone. And back at headquarters, the wall clock ticking off the hours of Harry Foster's death. Ticking off the hours that his murderer came to a park bench, looked at it, smiled, walked away in the warm sun. Ticked off the question of why money had been left there for Harry Foster to find week after week on Friday's twilight. And at four o'clock, the door opening slightly, and all you saw of the man was his cocked head. You Mr. Danny Clover? That's right. You want something? Only to know if you Mr. Danny Clover, and to give you what I have in my pocket. They said I should give it to you, you being the interested party and all. Uh, what have you got in your pocket? This. An envelope. Stamped and everything. I found it. Now give it to me. It's addressed to George Mason. Anybody can see that. That's the husband of that woman. The cripple. The one they call a looker in the papers. The one they think they saw that stabbing. <laughs> I did right bringing it to you, huh? It's been opened. You open it? Don't lie to me. You opened it and then resealed it. All right. I opened it. I'm a normal kind of fellow with all the normal curiosities. First, I was going to mail it when I found it. But then I saw who was addressed to. I couldn't restrain myself. I'm like the proverbial cat, Mr. Clover. It could be I... trouble for you being like that. Not when you see what's in it. Not when you see what it says. It says, you've made a terrible mistake. That's all. Not another word. See? You can't do anything to me for just reading that. You just read it yourself. That's why I brought it here. Because I'm a cooperative citizen. Now, where'd you find I... it? At Grant's tomb. You know, I've been curious about that tomb for years now. Finally, I took time off to go to study it. Then I found a letter on the steps. And I never did get to really study Grant's tomb. Tough. You'll stick around, huh? Some of our boys want to have a long chat with you. They enjoy curious fellas. Sure, anything you say. I'm nothing if I'm not cooperative. Just nothing. I wouldn't say that, but you stick around, huh? Hi, Ben. Well, hello, Danny. Hey, how do you like this, huh? I rigged up so when it's a sunny day, the telephone is on the outside of my shack. Inspiration, huh? Uh, fine. Who wants to be on the inside when outside it's sunny? <laughs> you car renting, Danny? I can give you rates. Oh, uh, just talk. <laughs> if you don't do business together, we never become enemies, huh? What's on your mind? Mrs. Mason. Ah, oh, yeah. Sad, huh? You know, if you set your mind to it and consider all she's been through, and then look at her, she's a pretty woman. I noticed. You said she was hurt in an accident at Coney Island, Ben. What, what kind of an accident? Uh, on a roller coaster. You know, one of them rides. Fell off right near the end of the ride. She stood up, fell. Was she with anyone? Uh, yeah, her husband. You want to know something? In spite of the heartbreak of having a wife like that, you know, Mr. Mason is one of the nicest guys I ever met. What about Mrs. Mason, Ben? Hmm? What about her? Can anyone ever talk to her, have a conversation with her? I talk to her. About what? Things. You know, ain't it a pretty day, Mrs. Mason? Is there a draft on you, Mrs. Mason? I talk to her, but she just hums and sings. But, you know, I think she's getting better. Maybe I'm contributing. Where'd you go driving today? Um, down Riverside Drive. You know, the river, Grant's tomb, the churches. Thanks a lot, Ben. Anytime, Danny, anytime at all. Mr. Clover. Good evening, Mr. Mason. Uh, we're, we're delighted to see you. Please come in. Diane, it's Mr. Clover. Diane looks better, doesn't she, Mr. Clover? Yes, yes, she does. I brought you something, Mr. Mason. Here. Oh? A letter? It's addressed to you. Read it. I don't understand. Read it. Yes, it is. It's addressed to me, but it's been opened. That's right. Read it. All right. No. The note says you made a mistake, Mr. Mason. <laughs> Mrs. Mason, your husband might be electrocuted for a murder he committed. Leave her alone. I wasn't going to touch her. Cut it out, Mrs. Mason. 
What's the matter with you? Have you gone out of your mind, Clover? I said cut it out, Mrs. Mason. I told you leave her alone. All right, you've come here to accuse me of murder, but leave her alone. George. Don't, don't worry about anything, dear. Get me a drink of water. What? What did you say? A drink of water, George. Cold water from the refrigerator. Diane. Darling, a drink of water. Do it. You won't be able to wait on me anymore. Mr. Clover's going to take you away from me. You're talking like... like you know what you're saying. You do know what you're saying. What's happening? What's happening to us? It's already happened. It's all over. <laughs> Poor George. It paid off, didn't it, Mrs. Mason? Sitting at the window watching, watching for a man your husband could kill. Simple little man. He came and sat on the same bench every Friday. He got paid for a while. It was you. You wrote that first letter to Han. And this one made me pay blackmail to a man who didn't even know me, didn't know anything about me. It was so simple. Write a letter, put a stamp on it, drop it from the car. Someone picked up the first letter and mailed it. About five weeks ago, a letter with instructions in it. Why, yes. Leave money every Friday on the park bench. And the man who picked it up, Mr. Mason, you thought was a blackmailer, so you killed him. Well, she's crazy. She really is. She's crazy. No, I'm not. I'm just a cripple, George. I can't move from this chair. Honest. But I'm not crazy. She's crazy. What did that first letter say, Mr. Mason? Well, that a man saw me push my wife off a ride at Coney Island. He demanded blackmail, but I didn't push, Diane. <laughs> Then why did you pay the money, darling? But you weren't going to let your husband alone, were you, Mrs. Mason? Even after he did what you wanted him to do, murder a man. Another letter that one your husband's holding, telling him he killed the wrong man. It's not much to ask, is it? Wanting George to suffer? Look at me. You're an accessory, Mrs. Mason. Am I? What can you do to me? A cripple in a wheelchair. In a prison? Will that be different? Tell me how. I didn't push you, Diane. I didn't push you. You fell off that ride. You fell. Liar. Diane. You're a liar, Diane, George. Diane, will you listen to me? I made it up to you. I carried you. I waited on you. I, I went crazy that day. I hated you. I don't know why. I don't know. Oh, I know why. You're an evil woman. Evil. Poor George. You should have died. You should have. You should have... <laughs> Poor George. Poor It's night on Broadway now. There's easy laughter, and a trumpet scurls its music into the grinning mob. It's top of the evening. Have another drink on me, kid, and let's set this dance up. It's a street gouged out of a scarlet dream. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. <laughs> Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Lamont Johnson was heard as George Mason, Kathy Lewis as Diane Mason, and Virginia Gregg as Mrs. Foster. Others in the cast were Herb Vigran, Lou Krugman, and Johnny McGovern.
Every Saturday night, Jan Murray takes a tip from Danny Clover and goes looking for people. Only Jan's beat is the United States. By coast-to-coast phone, he offers a grand in cold, hard cash if you can identify the phantom voice. So stay tuned now as Jan Murray and Sing It Again follow immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Adventures of the Saint, starring Tom Conway. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Tom Conway as... The Saint. Yes? I'm Simon Templer. I have an appointment with... uh... Oh, yes, Mr. Templer. We've been waiting for you. Come in, please. Thank you. This way. You had no trouble finding the place, sir? None. The Allison house is too large to overlook. I should apologize for not sending the car for you. You see... As soon as I'm leaving now, will you tell Mother... Oh. Well, Hello. Hello. Mm, you are cute, aren't you? Uh, frankly, I've never given it much thought. Let's see. Mother hired you to drive the car. No, that wouldn't be it at all. She hired you to escort her to Bermuda. Uh-uh. You're not the escort type. Miss Allison, this is the saint. Oh, then that's why Mother hired you. Well, good luck. Here's if Mr. Dunn calls, tell him I've already left for the track. Uh, goodbye, Dreamboat. Go- uh, goodbye. She uh, goes with the house, I take it. Mrs. Allison's daughter, Cora, by a late marriage. A very spirited young lady. Oh, here's Mrs. Allison's bedroom. Mrs. Allison, Mr. Templer is here. Well, send him in. Send him in. Come over here, Mr. Templer. Let's have a look at you. Hmm. Very nice. Just, uh... Exactly what is being hired, Mrs. Allison? A detective or a profile? Oh, now sit down. I'm not ill, Mr. Templer, just wearing out. And please don't allow the appurtenances of an aged woman to distress you. They're the wages of an extremely indulgent, but not uninteresting life. You don't seem as weak a woman as you let on, Mrs. Allison. (laughs) A gentlemanly thing to say, Mr. Templer. But the strength you see left in me is only the extra strong light of the candle before it burns out. Here, Mr. Templer, is a check for $1,000. It's yours. Just like that? I never thought money was for anything but spending. And now, shall we talk of my need for you? Uh, For $1,000 to my favorite charity, you can talk of anything. You have seen her? Who? My daughter. I ran into a light breeze on the stairs. Uh, Field said she was your daughter. Mr. Templer, Cora is an exciting, spirited girl. She's had everything that's fine in life. And now her only reading matter is the racing form. Her only art, self-beautification. Her only music, the raucous sounds of a nightclub. Look. Hmm. I found this gun in her room. She thinks it's cute to carry a gun. But that isn't all. The real problem goes deeper. Oh, a man? How did you know? It usually is. His name is Frank Dunn. Yes, he runs the Paradise Club. You know him? Yes. Then you know that he's a ruthless man. Cora is in love with him, or thinks she is. He's no good for her. I want you to take her away from him. I know, Cora. I know of you. 
I know you're the kind of man who can do it. And that's all? Yes. No, I think you've left out something. The real reason for paying me a thousand dollars. We'll start with Cora. You made her what she is, Mrs. Anderson, and uh, you like it. You like her flamboyance and her excesses because you liked them yourself when you were young. Uh, you're not angry at her. You're worried about her. You think Frank Dunn is going to get her into trouble, criminal trouble. You are a discerning man, Mr. Templer, and a frank one. Then uh, we understand each other? Yes. Good. Fabrication between a man and his client is usually unhealthy, especially when there's someone in the middle with a loaded gun. Now, uh, just how is Dunn using Cora? I don't know. Well, then I'll find out. They're at the track. They're always at the track. Fields tells me they have a box. I'll phone you as soon as I get something. Remember, Mr. Templer, whatever it is, the important thing is that Cora be kept out of it completely. Do you understand? I understand, Mrs. Allison, that I'm about to play nursemaid to a very beautiful young lady. Now, Frankie, which horse did we have? The winner, Cora. Oh, uh, you always say that. But this one was a photo finish, darling. Which one did he have, Moose? You tell me. I wouldn't know, Cora. Hey, Frankie, look who's coming. Oh, hello, Cora. Oh, hello, cute stuff. I hope you're following me. Uh, no. I dropped a few hundred dollars at this track last season. I, I wondered if any of you had found it. Oh, we found more than that. <laughs> Frankie, darling, this is Simon Templer. Mr. Templer, this is Mr. Uh, hello, Frankie. Hello, Saint. Oh, you know each other? Yeah. Yeah, we know this, Saint. And you're a gorilla named Moose, aren't you? Or, or are you a moose named Gorilla? Now listen, Gumshoe. Easy, Moose. So, you know this guy, Cora? Huh? Well, not as well as I'd like to. I met him at the house. Mother hired him. He's kind of luscious, don't you think? Come on in and join us. I'd be delighted. Cora, the box is full. Oh, but there's an empty seat, darling. I'm saving that for Bronson. Bronson never comes. Besides, the last race is over. We'll only be here a few minutes longer. I said it? the seat is taken. Darling, I guess you're right. Now that I see him in the sunlight, I, I don't like him. He looks too moral to me. <laughs> you heard the lady say. Well, I don't think you're treating me very kindly, Frankie. And I have such nice things to tell Cora about you that you... Spent three years in Joliet, a few more in state pens for various infractions of the law, and... Oh, well, I know all that, Saint. That's Frankie's charm. That's why I'm going to marry him. I see. Does your mother know? We're going to elope when the meat closes. It's going to be a surprise. Mother's done a lot in her day, but never anything as exciting as marrying a man like Frankie. <laughs> and you're going to congratulate her, Saint? I'm going right out and buy her some black crepe. Let me press him, Frankie. Let me press Results him. Wait a minute. The eighth race. The winner, number three, Inferno. Lace, number eight, Happy Bride. Show, number one, Hair Ace. The Parry Mutuals are on the tote board. Official. Is the one ticket, Cora? Go cash in. You did have Inferno. $100 is 11 to 1. Not bad for when it's today, five yesterday. Keep this up and you'll have as much money as the Hellison. I'll be right back. All right. Uh, picking a lot of winners, Frankie? Uh, enough. What do you suppose is making you so lucky? Sunspots. Or maybe a system. I'd like to hear all about it. <coughs> oh. Kind of soft in the middle, huh, Templar? Now move along before your mouth gets you into more trouble. I'm, I'm going. Yeah. Oh, uh, by the way, whatever happened to Patricia, Frankie? Seems to me you two were good and married. Look, you leave Patricia out of this, Templar. Oh, just thought I'd ask. She was a nice kid. Seemed to love you and oh, I... Oh, this wise guy. If you keep pressing me like this, you're going to end up on a slab. Oh, beat it. Cross watch. Oh, I'll be glad to. That's the only way to stay ahead, Frankie. Take leave when you get a winner. Leaving a track so soon, Mr. Templer? Yes, Eddie, it was a little too crowded. Oh, uh, where to? Over to Jersey, Eddie. I... Wait a minute. Hold up. Well, what's the matter? That girl standing there, the one with the dark glasses and veil. Oh, yeah, she's a melon. She's right? the one I'd go all the way to Jersey for. 
Hello, Patricia. Huh? Frankie know you're at the track? I don't know you. Oh, wait a minute. Don't go. Let go of my arm. Not until we've had a chance to Let's talk. Let go of my arm. I said I'm going to call a cop. I don't think you will. You don't want to draw any attention to yourself. That's why the dark glasses. Who are you hiding from, Patricia? Frankie? What do you want, Steve? I told you. A few moments of pleasant conversation. You won't get it from me. I might. You know, Frankie and I were just talking about you. You know I'm in town? You know I'm here? I've got a cab waiting. Come on, I'll take you home. I don't want to go home. Where do you want to go? To? Staying at a hotel in Madison. All right, I'll take you there. And we'll drive slowly. We've got a few things to talk about. <laughs> Anything. Thanks for being so talkative. Don't remember saying anything? You didn't. What's bothering you? Why did you go to the track and hide in the corner behind dark glasses and a veil? It's my business. Who is Bronson? Frankie mentioned him at the track. Who is he? Never heard of him. Frank is making a lot of money off the races. How's it done? Well, you can fix one race sometimes. But you can't fix four one day, five the day before, and I don't know how many before then. That uh, takes a lot of organization. Does it? How do you feel about Cora Allison? The way all brunettes feel about blondes. Hmm. That's uh, a nice wedding ring you're wearing. I like it. You and Frank are still married? Why shouldn't we be? Well, no reason. Except it seems to me that if Frank is going to marry Cora in a few days, as he says, it would be better for him not to be married to you. That's his problem. Sure you don't want to tell me about Bronson? I don't want to tell you anything. All right. I'll see you again. Don't bet on it. Frank? Yeah? Does Frank know I'm in town? That I've come over from Jersey? I don't know. Do me a favor, will you? Don't tell him I'm in town. No matter what, don't tell him. Why not? Won't be good for me, that's why. All right, Patricia, I... I won't tell him. Going out, sir? Yes, thank you. Hey, those were shot. How astute of you. Locked. Got a key? No, but I can get one at the desk. No, give me a hand. Right. Come on. Come on. Just a little more. There. There she is, mister. Wow, look at that rug. Whoever did it made sure. Yeah, and the window's open. Fire escape, alley one pipe down. Call the police. Right away. Boy, Mr. Cunningham's sure going to be sure about that rug. Eddie. Eddie, come over here. I hear you, sir, but I don't see you. Up at this window. Oh, yeah. You were parked at the end of the alley. Did you see anyone come out of it? Oh, well, I was trying to go uh, a blonde with a nice shake, Maybe. Maybe. Got an old black limousine, maybe? Cora Allison. Hello, Field. Oh, Mr. Templer. I tried to phone you at your apartment. Mrs. Allison has asked me to inform you that your services are no longer needed. Uh, just a moment, Field. Uh, Please, take your foot out of the doorway or I shall be forced to call the police. Hardly likely, Field. You haven't forgotten the murder was committed not long ago. I was standing outside Patricia Dunn's apartment when it happened. I don't know what you're talking about, sir. I don't want to call you a liar, Field, but you're tempting me. I've got a strong feeling Cora did it. I also think you drove her van back in the limousine. You're wrong, Mr. Templer. I haven't left the house all afternoon, nor has the car left the garage. Oh, there you go again. I felt the hood on the limousine not two minutes ago. It's still warm. And I'd also like to find something else that's warm. What's that, sir? A gun. Fired probably by the dainty hand of a girl who has everything except the right upbringing. Now, believe me, Fields, it, it'd be a lot less trouble if you let me into talk to Cora than if I find a telephone and talk to the police. Well... Cora's in her bedroom. Please come in, Mr. Templer. <laughs> Cora, if you 
you're going to keep on trying, we're not going to get anywhere. Well, I tell you, I didn't kill her. Yes, I heard you. And you don't believe it? I'd like to, but you've got a lot of things to explain. One is the automatic you used to carry. What's a pistol for if not for shooting? Oh, I never shot a pistol in my life. Oh, I see. You uh, used it as a paperweight. No. I carried it because... Well, because it looked good. Uh-huh. Like uh, a mink cape? Oh, I tell you, I didn't kill her. Oh, how would anyone know if you ever told the truth? <sighs> you know, to some people, it also looks good to tell a lot of clever lies. You also said you went to Patricia's apartment. I wasn't. I came home right after the races and had dinner here. Yes, I came right home. All of which reminds me of Pinocchio, whose nose got longer every time he lied. Well, well Askfield. I was home all afternoon. He saw me. Uh, we've already been through it. His nose is getting longer, too. Oh. Cora, listen to me. A cab driver saw you running up the alley away from Patricia's place after the shots were fired. Who? Oh. Somebody. It doesn't matter who. You're making it up. Strangely enough, I'm not like you, Cora. I don't think it looks good to make things up. Especially when murder's concerned. The cabbie saw you and the limousine and Fields. And I'll tell you one thing more. The police will be able to prove you were there. Oh, you're... Luscious, I know, I know. You told me. <laughs> All right. All right, I was there. I killed her. I killed her. Now are you satisfied? Now do you believe me? No. Don't believe her, Mr. Templer. She's lying. Oh, mother... She didn't kill Patricia Dunn. I know because I did. I just phoned the police and confessed. Uh, shall I have a bartender set us up again, sir? No, not for me. You go ahead, Eddie. I, I know you've got to get fortified to face the New York traffic. No, no, I'll skip it. Hey, hey, what are we doing here, anyway? Waiting? What for? Frankie Dunn. This is his place. If and when he shows up, I want to see if he's in mourning. You mean after all that's happened, you're still in a case? No, no, not exactly. What good the client if uh, she's on the way to the death house? The meeting, Mrs. Alice. Meaning the same? Then you really think she's done it? She says so. Then why don't you go home and go to sleep? Let's just say I'm restless. Uh, Eddie... I've been watching that man at the end of the bar. The one in the brown pinstripe. What? His uh, oh, name yeah, is Bronson. Yeah. At least that's what the barkeep called him. So? So he's the one who was in with Frank Dunn on the horse race scheme. He gave the bartender a package. The bartender locked the package in the safe, then gave Bronson an envelope. Bronson opened the envelope and put the contents into his wallet. Eddie, what would you put in your wallet that was... Uh, Green and negotiable. Cabbage, if I had any. Mm, it was cabbage, all right. Cabbage and lettuce, moolah, fish plans, or whatever euphemism you want to use. His share of track winnings. Maybe. Let's see if I can find out. Good evening, Mr. Bronson. We have met. Uh, not uh, formally, but we have mutual friends. Frank Dunn. Cora Allison, they tell me you have a great way to beat the horses. A sure thing, uh, until you're caught, that is. Who are you, young man? Uh, Superman. And my X-ray eyes penetrate your coat and see the money in your inside pocket. Your share of done track winning. You're the most absurd young man I've ever met. That money was for a package I left Mr. Dunn. Oh, and uh, what was in the package? I fail to see how that's any of your affair. Well, let's just say it, uh, it is and uh, relieve my curiosity. Books, young man. I'm a book dealer. I have a shop on Third Avenue. You must come and see it sometime. The money Mr. Dunn gave me was simply payment for the books. They must be pretty expensive. But there was a lot of money in that envelope. Rare books. Tell me, young man, where did you ever get that delightful notion that I know how to beat the horses or that I'm involved in something with Mr. Dunn and, uh, uh, what was the girl's name? Uh, Cora Allison. Oh, yes, yes. A charming idea. I'll tell you what you do, young man. You investigate me, and if you determine that I am engaged in something criminal, please inform me. I should be delighted to know. Now, goodbye, Mr. Templer. 
And don't try to follow me. Oh, of course not. It's bad manners, Mr. Bronson, to follow anyone who isn't female. I've been waiting for you in the hallway for almost two hours. I was wondering if you'd ever get home. I was out getting my mind off a no-good case. Mr. Templer, I'd like to talk to you. May I come in? I don't think you have anything to say to me, Cora. You could have said anything you wanted to before the police took your mother. Well, that's no reason I can't say it now. Please. All right, but I hope it's worthwhile. I'm very sleepy. Well... I saw Mother in jail a few hours ago. It, it was an unpleasant sight. Well, it should have been. Jails aren't designed to give kicks. Mother doesn't belong there, Mr. Templer. I know it. She didn't kill Patricia Dunn. She just said she did. To protect me. She's convinced I killed Patricia. And well, she feels responsible because of the way she brought me up. Well, I admit there's wisdom there. So, uh, were you going to let her give herself up? I suppose so. It was an awful thing to do. I... Well, I know I can't. Why? I told you. I saw her in jail. Well, you don't have to worry about that, Cora. The police will soon find out they haven't got a case against her and she'll be released. Of course, um, they'll look for someone else to take her place. Meaning me? Have you got a better suggestion? That's just it, Mr. Templer. No matter what you and Mother think, I didn't kill Patricia Dunn. And that's the truth. Oh, frankly, Cora, I don't know whether to believe you or not. You, you've you told so many lies already. You were at Patricia's apartment. I know you were. Yes, I was there. I heard that Frankie was still married to her. I knew he couldn't marry me then. And I knew something was wrong. Well, I went to see her. I, I was inside her apartment when you left her there. The manager let me in. I told him I was her sister. Then you saw who killed her? No. The shots came in through the window. I got frightened. I may put on a lot, but I do get frightened. I ran down the fire escape and up the alley. That's when the cab driver saw me. Fields took me home, and I told Mother what happened. And she didn't believe you. She thought you were the one who killed Patricia and made up the story about someone firing through the window. Yes. Yeah. She made Fields and me promise to say neither of us left the house. Well, when you came and proved we had... She called up the police and confessed to, to say you... She said she was old and it didn't matter if she went to jail. It was her way of giving me a new start. Hoping I'd change my ways. Have you? I just told you the truth. I wonder. You know, you remind me of the boy who cried wolf. Uh, tell me about Frankie's scheme to beat the horses. How does it work? I don't know. All I know is he always has a winning ticket. Seems I cash dozens of them. Doesn't he ever cash any of them? No, it's always me. Why? Well, I don't know why. I want to, I guess. It, it was fun, I know. What about Bronson? He's in on it. Who's he? He's an artist. An artist? He said he was a book dealer. Oh, he has a bookshop, all right, but well, he's really an artist. He does fine detail work. I've seen some of it. Lithograph? Yes. Engraving. A counterfeiter, maybe. Well, of course, that's it. That's why Dunn always has the winning ticket. Bronson makes up a win ticket ahead of time for every horse in the race. No matter which horse wins, Dunn wins. A very fancy idea. Now, tell me one thing more, Cora. How did you know Patricia was in town? How did you know where she was staying? Well, I overheard Moose and Frankie talk about it. Frankie was angry. Frankie Dunn, yes. She was afraid he'd found, find out she was in town. Where's Frankie staying? He's got a suite at the Sutherland. 613. All right. Oh, Cora. Yes? For yours and your mother's sake, I hope you're finally telling the truth. <laughs> Open. Come on in, Moose. I'm waiting for... Sank. Hello, Frankie. 
Hmm. Overcoat on. Where are you going, Sunday? I am going someplace. Yes, but not where you think. You're going to change places with Mrs. Allison. That's very funny. Oh, I know all about the counterfeiting, Frankie. And I know Cora was used to front for you. You, with your reputation, couldn't keep cashing so many win tickets. Somebody would begin to wonder. But uh, Cora was uh, relatively safe. However, that isn't the important thing, is it? No. Patricia's murder is. That's right, Saint. That's the important thing. Now, get out of my way. I got a gun in this overcoat pocket. I don't want to have to kill you because I'm saving these bullets for someone else. Oh, who? The one who really killed my Patricia. I don't mean Mrs. Allison. Who do you mean? A kid with too much money, no sense, and less feeling. Cora Allison. Oh, but she said she didn't do it. She says a lot of things. But I believe her this time. She's a changed girl. Ruffled, but wiser. And I don't think she killed Patricia. You got an alibi, Frankie? Yeah. A real good one. I loved her. Is that why she was so scared of you? She knew I wanted her out of town till the job with Bronson was finished. She knew if I knew she was in town, I'd have slapped her around and sent her home. Well, I must say you have a unique way of showing affection. It's my way. Oh, it's very touching, thank you. But I don't think that alibi would stand up in court. Yeah, well, this one will. Both Moose and I were in the bar of this hotel when Patricia was killed. And the house stick and six other people saw us, so I guess you made a mistake. Now get out of my way, Sane. I got a date with Cora. You're not going to kill Cora. Take your hands off I me. I said you're not going to kill her. Sane, I didn't ask for trouble with you, but you're going to get it. There's your phone, done. Answer it. Answer it yourself. All right. I will. Hello? Frankie. Frankie. It's Moose. I get a bullet in me. Listen to me. Listen to me. What is it, Moose? Bronson, Frankie. Bronson. Bronson. Hang up the telephone, young man. I'll tell you all about myself firsthand. I don't think you have to, Bronson. I already know. It's been a merry-go-round, and I got a lot of lead rings, but you're the gold one. Yes. You killed Patricia because she knew the deal you and Frankie were on. She never wanted Frankie to be in on it, and you thought she'd dropped the wrong information to the police. So everyone who knows about it has to go. Patricia, Moose... Me? Yes, young man. It seems that it is now your turn. Now, Bronson, it's your turn. Frankie. Frankie. All right, Frankie. You even things up. Give me the gun. It's no good to anyone now except ballistics. have been listening to another transcribed adventure of The Saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. And now, here is our star, Tom Conway. Ladies and gentlemen, in our cast you heard Gail Page as Cora and Peggy Weber as Patricia. Ida Reese Merrin played Mrs. Allison. Barney Phillips was Moose. Tony Barrett, Frankie, the butler, was played by Fred Shield. Bronson, Bill Conrad. Glenn Vernon was the elevator boy. Eddie was played by High Appleback. This is Tom Conway inviting you to join us again next week at the same time for another exciting adventure of The Saint. Good night. script of The Saint was written by Larry Roman. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Safier production and is directed by Helen Mack. Tom Conway is soon to be seen in Warner Brothers' production, Painting the Clouds with Sunshine. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer, Don Stanley. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Be sure to hear three more top mystery shows coming your way today on NBC.
Continuing now, their screen actor Lloyd Nolan as hard-hitting Martin Kane, Flat Eye. Then actor Carlton Young comes to the NBC microphone as the Whisperer. And listen tonight for Adventure in the Catacombs of Rome with Mr. Motto. Tonight, hear the American form of the air on NBC.